This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, see LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Recording by Hugh McGuire, Mike Trevino, Jenny Collin, Colin Robertson, Andrew Skinner, Alan Espen, Wilson Blakey, Ulysses, Part One. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead, bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and a razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him by the mild morning air. He held the bowl aloft and intoned, Introibo ad alteri dei. Halted, he peered down the dark, winding stairs and called up coarsely. Come up, Kinch! Come up, you fearful Jesuit! Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the ground. Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gunrest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country and the awaking mountains. Then, catching sight, of Stephen Dedalus. He bent towards him and made rapid crosses in the air, gurgling in his throat and shaking his head. <clears throat> Stephen Dedalus, displeased and sleepy, leaned his arms on top of the staircase and looked coldly at the shaking, gurgling face that blessed him, equine in its length, and at the light, untonsured hair, grained and hued like pale oak, Buck Mulligan peeped an instant under the mirror and then covered the bowl smartly. Back to barracks, he said sternly. He added in a preacher's tone, For this, O oh dearly beloved, is the genuine Christine. Body and soul, blood and wounds. Slow music, please. Shut your eyes, gents. One moment. A little trouble about those white corpuscules. Silence all. He peered sideways up and gave a long, low whistle of call, then paused a while in rapt attention, his even white teeth glistening here and there with gold points. Chrysotomos. Two strong, shrill whistles answered through the calm. Thanks, old chap, he cried briskly. That will do nicely. Switch off the current, will you? <clears throat> He skipped off the gunrest and looked gravely at his watcher, gathering about his legs the loose folds of his gown. The plump shadowed face and the sullen oval jaw recalled a prelate, patron of arts in the Middle Ages. A pleasant smile broke quietly over his lips. The mockery of it, he said gaily, your absurd name, an ancient Greek. He pointed his finger in friendly dress. And <laughs> he pointed his finger in friendly jest and went over to the parapet, laughing to himself. Stephen Dedalus stepped up, followed him wearily halfway, and sat down on the edge of the gunrest, watching him still as he propped his mirror on the parapet, dipped the brush in the bowl, and lathered his cheeks and neck. Buck Mulligan's gay voice went on. My name is absurd too, Malachi Mulligan, two dactyls, but it has a Hellenic ring, hasn't it? Tripping and sunny like the buck himself. We must go to Athens. Will you come if I can get the ant to fork out twenty quid? 
He laid the brush aside and, laughing with delight, cried, Will he come, the jejun Jesuit? Ceasing, he began to shave with care. Tell me, Mulligan, Stephen said quietly. Yes, my love. How long is Haynes going to stay in this tower? Buck Mulligan showed a shaven cheek over his right shoulder. God, isn't he dreadful, he said frankly. A ponderous Saxon. He thinks you're not a gentleman. God, these bloody English, bursting with money and indigestion. Because he comes from Oxford, you know, Dedalus. You have the real Oxford manner. He can't make you out. Oh, my name for you is the best. Kinch, the knife blade. He shaved warily over his chin. He was raving all night about a black panther, Stephen said. Where is his gun case? A woeful lunatic, Mulligan said. Were you in a funk? I was, Stephen said, with energy and growing fear. <clears throat> Out here in the dark with a man I don't know, raving and moaning to himself about shooting a black panther? You saved men from drowning. I'm not a hero, however. If he stays on here, I am off. Buck Mulligan frowned at the lather on his razor blade. He hopped down from his perch and began to search his trouser pockets hastily. Scudder, he cried thickly. He came over to the gun rest and, thrusting a hand into Stephen's upper pocket, said, Lend us a loan of your nose rag to wipe my razor. Stephen suffered him to pull out and hold up on show by its corner a dirty crumpled hand handkerchief. Buck Mulligan wiped the razor blade neatly. Then, gazing over the handkerchief, he said, The bard's nose rag. A new art color for our Irish poets. It's not green. You can almost taste it, can't you? He mounted to the parapet again and gazed out over Dublin Bay his fair oak-pale hair stirring slightly. God, he said quietly, isn't the sea what algae calls it, a grey sweet mother? The snot-green sea, the scrotum-tightening sea, epionipa panton. Ah, Daedalus, the Greeks, I must teach you. You must read them in the original. Thalata, Thalata, she is our great sweet mother. Come and look. Stephen stood up and went over to the parapet. Leaning on it, he looked down on the water and on the mail boat clearing the harbour mouth of Kingstown. Our mighty mother, Buck Mulligan said. He turned abruptly, his great searching eyes from the sea to Stephen's face. The aunt thinks you killed your mother, he said. That's why she won't let me have anything to do with you. Someone killed her, Stephen said gloomily. You could have knelt down, damn it, Kinch. When you were dying, when your dying mother asked you, Buck Mulligan said. I'm hyperborean as much as you. But to think your mother begging you with her last breath to kneel down and pray for her? And you refused. There's something sinister in you. He broke off and lathered again slightly, his farther cheek. A tolerant smile curled his lips. But a lovely murmur, he murmured to himself. Kinch, the loveliest murmur of them all. He shaved evenly with care in silence, seriously. Stephen, an elbow rested on the jagged granite, leaned his palm against his brow, and gazed at the fraying edge of his shiny black coat sleeve. Pain. That was not yet the pain of love, fretted his heart. Silently in a dream, she had come to him after her death, her wasted body within its loose brown grave's clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath, that had bent upon him, mute, reproachful, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Across the threadbare cuff edge, he saw... The sea hailed as a great sweet mother by the well-fed voice beside him. The ring of bay and skyline held a dull green mass of liquid. A bowl of china and had stood beside her deathbed, holding the green sluggish bile which she had torn up from her rotting liver by fits of loud groaning, vomiting. Buck Mulligan wiped again his razor blade. Ah, poor dog's body, he said in a kind voice. I must give you a shirt and a few nose rags. How are the second-hand breeks? They fit well enough, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan attacked the hollow beneath his underlip. The mockery of it, he said contentedly. 
Second leg they should be. God knows what poxy bowsy left them off. I have a lovely pair with a hair striped grey. You'll look spiffing in them. I'm not joking, Kinch. You look damn well when you're dressed. Thanks, Stephen said. I can't wear them if they're grey. He can't wear them, Buck Mulligan told his face in the mirror. Etiquette is etiquette. He kills his mother, but he can't wear grey trousers. He folded his razor neatly, and with stroking palps of finger felt the smooth skin. Stephen turned his gaze from the sea to the plump face with its smoke-blue mobile eyes. That fellow I was with in the ship last night, said Buck Mulligan. Say you have GPI, he's up in Dottyville with Connolly Norman. General paralysis of the insane. He swept the mirror a half circle in the air to flash the tidings abroad in sunlight now radiant on the sea. His curling shaven lips laughed and the edges of his white glittering teeth. Laughter seized all his strong well-knit trunk. Look at yourself, he said. You dreadful bard. Stephen bent forward and peered at the mirror held out to him, cleft by a crook cracked on end. As he and others see me, who chose this face for me, this dog body to rid of vermin? It asked me to. I pinched it out of the skivvy's room, Buck Mulligan said. It does her all right. The ant always keeps pains looking servants for Malachi. Lead him not into temptation. And her name is Ursula. Laughing again, he brought the mirror away from Stephen's peering eyes. The rage of Caliban had not seen his face in a mirror, he said. If while they were only alive to see you, drawing back and pointing, Stephen said with bitterness, it is a symbol of Irish art, the cracked looking glass of a servant. Buck Mulligan suddenly linked his arm in Stephen's and walked with him round the tower. His, <clears throat> his razor and mirror clacking in the pocket where he had trust them. It's not fair to tease you like that, Rick. Whoops. <clears throat> Shut up, sorry. <clears throat> it's not fair to tease you like that, Kinch, is it? He said kindly. God knows you have more spirit than any of them. Pirate again. He fears the lancet of my art as I fear that of his, the coal steel pen. <clears throat> Cracked looking glass of a servant. Tell that to the oxy shop downstairs and touch him for a guinea. He's thinking with money and thinks you're not a gentleman. His old fellow made his tin by selling jalap to Zuzulus or some bloody swindle or other. God, Kinch, if you and I could only work together, we might do something for the highland. Illy nice. <laughs> Hello, nice. Hello, nice. <laughs> Crankly, Cran Cranley's arms, his arm. And to think of your having to beg from these swine. I'm the only one that knows where, what you are. Why don't you trust me more? What have you up your nose against me? Is it Ains? If he makes any noise here, it will bring down Seymour and will give him a rage, raging war. Oof. I'll... Oof. If he makes any noise... Ear. If, <laughs> if he makes any noise here, I'll bring down Seymour. We'll give him a raging worse than they gave Clive Kemp. <laughs> I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> Young shouts of moneyed voices in Clive Kemp Torp's rooms. <laughs> Palifaces, they hold their ribs with laughter, one clasping another. Oh, I shall expire. Break the news her gently, Aubrey. I shall die. With slip ribbons of his shirt whipping the air, he ups and hobbles around the table. With trousers down at heels, chased by Addis of Magdalen, 
with the trailers, the tailors, <laughs> with the tailors shears. Oh, I can't go through all this. I can't go through all this. Was it really? Yeah. <laughs> it's difficult. Come back. Come yeah. yeah. A scared calf's face, gilded with marmalade. I don't want to be debagged. Don't you play the giddy ox with me. Shouts from the open window. Startling evening in the quadrangle. A deaf gardener, aproned, masked with Matthew Arnold's face, pushes his mower on the somber lawn, watching narrowly the dancing motes of grass elms. To ourselves, new paganism. Omphalos. Let him stay, Stephen said. There's nothing wrong with him except at night. Then what is it? Buck Milligan asked impatiently. Cough it up. I'm quite frank with you. What have you against me now? They halted, looking towards the blunt cape of Bryhead that lay on the water like the snout of a sleeping whale. Stephen freed his arm quietly. Do you wish me to tell you? He asked. Yes, what is it? Buck Milligan answered. I don't remember anything. He looked in Stephen's face as he spoke. A light wind passed his brow, fanning softly his fair, uncombed hair and, st and stirring silver points of anxiety in his eyes. Stephen, depressed by his own voice, said, Do you remember the first day I went to your house after my mother's death? Buck Mulligan frowned quickly and said, What? Where? I, I can't remember anything. I remember only ideas and sensations. Why? What happened in the name of God? You were making tea, Stephen said, and I went across the landing to get more hot water. Your mother and some visitor came out of the drawing room. She asked you who was in your room. Yes, Buck Mulligan said. What did I say? I forget. You said, Stephen answered, Oh, it's only Daedalus whose mother is heartly dead. You said, Stephen answered, oh, it's only Daedalus, whose mother is beastly dead. A flush with ma which made him seem younger and more engaging rose to Buck Mulligan's cheek. Did I say that, he asked? Well, what harm is that? He shook his constraint from him nervously. And what is death, he asked. Your mother's, or yours, or my own? You saw, you saw only your mother die. I see them pop off every day in the matter in Richmond and cut up into tripes in the dissecting room. It's a beastly thing and nothing else. It simply doesn't matter. You wouldn't kneel down to pray for your mother on her deathbed when she asked you. Why? Because you have the cursed Jesuit strain in you, only it's injected the wrong way. To me, it's all a mockery and a beastly. Her cerebral lobes are not functioning. She calls the doctor Sir, Pe Sir Petal Teasel and picks buttercups off the quilt. Her, hu humor her till it's over. You crossed her last... You, humor her till it's over. You crossed her last wish in death and yet you sulk with me because I don't whinge like some hired mute from La Louette's. Absurd! I suppose I did say it. I didn't mean to offend the memory of your mother. He had spoken himself into boldness. Stephen, shielding the gaping wounds which the words had left in his heart, said very coldly, I am not thinking of the offense to my mother. Of what then? Buck Mulligan asked. Of the offense to me, Stephen answered. Buck Mulligan swung around on his heel. Oh, an impossible person, he exclaimed. He walked off quickly round the parapet, Stephen stood at his post, gazing over the calm sea towards the headland. Sea and headland now grew dim. Pulses were beating in his eyes, veiling their sight, and he felt the fever of his cheeks.
A voice within the tower called loudly. Are you there, Mulligan? I'm coming, Buck Mulligan answered. He turned towards Stephen and said, Look at the sea. What does it care about offenses? Chuck Loyola, Kinch, and come on down. The Sazenge wants his morning rashers. His head halted again for a moment at the top of the staircase, level with the roof. Don't mope, all, don't mope over it all the day, he said. I'm inconsequent. Give up the moody brooding. His head vanished, but the drone of his descending voice boomed o o out over the star head. And no more turn aside and brood upon love's bitter mystery, for Fargus rules the brazen cars. Wood shadows floated silently by through the morning peace from the stairhead seaward where he gazed. Inshore and further out, the mirror of water whitened, spurned by light-shot hurrying feet. White breast of the dim sea. The twinning stresses, two by two. A hand plucking the hamp strings, merging their twinning cords. Wave-white wedded words shimmering on the dim tide. A cloud began to, cl to cover the sun slowly, shadowing the bay in deeper green. It lay behind him a bowl of bitter waters. Fergus's song. I sang it alone in the house, holding down the long, dark chords. Her door was open. She wanted her music, silent with awe and pity. I went to her bedside. She was crying in her wretched bed. For those words, Stephen... Love's bitter mystery. Where now? Her secrets, old feather fans, tasseled dance cards, powdered with musk, a god of amber beads in her locked drawer. A birdcage hung in the sunny window of her house where she, when she was a girl. She heard old Royce sing in the pantomime of Turco, the terrible, and laughed with others when, she, when he sang, I am the boy that can enjoy invisibility. Phantasmal mirth, folded away, musk perfumed. And no more turn aside and brood. Folded away in the memory of nature with her toys, memories beset her brooding brain, her glass of water from the kitchen tap when she approached from the sacrament, a cored apple filled with brown sugar, roasting for her at the hob of the, on the dark autumn evening, her shapely fingernails reddened by the by the blood of squashed lice from the children's shirts. In a dream, silently, she had come to him, her wasted body within its loose grave clothes, giving off an odor of wax and rosewood. Her breath bent over him with mute secret words, a faint odor of wetted ashes. Her glazing eyes staring out of death to shake and bend my soul. On me alone, the ghost candle to light her agony ghostly light on the tortured face, her hoarse, loud breath rattling in horror, while all prayed on her knees, her eyes on me to strike me down. Lilata, retunlinum, te confessorum, terma, circumerit, imbiolatinum, te virginum, chorus, expatidit. Gal, chewer of corpses. No, mother, let me be and let me live. Kinch ahoy! Buck Mulligan's voice sang from, the, from within the tower. It came nearer up the staircase, calling again. Stephen, still trembling at his soul's cry, heard warm running sunlight in the air behind him friendly words. To Dallas, come now. Come down like a good mosey. Breakfast is ready. Haynes is apologizing for waking us last night. It's all right. I'm coming, Stephen said, turning. Do for Jesus' sake, Buck Mulligan said, for my sake and for all our sakes. His head disappeared and reappeared. I told him your symbol of Irish art. He says it's very clever. Touch him for a quid, will you? A guinea, I mean. I get paid this morning, Stephen said. The school kip? Buck Mulligan said. How much? Four quid? Lend us one. If you want, Stephen said. Four shining sovereigns, Buck Mulligan cried with delight, will have a glorious drunk to astonish the druidy druids. Four omnipotent so sovereigns. 
He flung up his hands and tramped down the, stown, the stone stairs, singing out of a tune with a cockney accent. Oh, won't we have a merry time, drinking whiskey, beer, and wine on Coronation, Coronation Day. And don't we have a merry time on Coronation Day. Warm sunshine marrying over the sea. The nickel shaving bowl shone forgotten on the parapet. Why should I bring it down or leave it there all day, forgotten friendship? He went over to it, held it in his hands a while, feeling its coolness, smelling the calmy solver of the lather in which the brush was struck. in which the brush was stuck. So I carried the boat of incense then to, to <laughs> Klongawas. I am another now and yet the same, a servant too, a server of the servant. In the gloomy doomed living room of the tower, Buck Mulligan groaned from, from moved brisk, uh, form moved briskly about the hearth to and fro, hiding and revealing its yellow glow. Two shafts of soft daylight fell across the flag floor from the high barbic barbicans, and at the meeting of their rays, a cloud of coal smoke and fumes of fried grease floated, turning. We'll be choked, Buck Mulligan said. Haynes opened that door. Will ya? Haynes, open that door, will ya? Stephen laid the shaving bowl on the locker. A tall figure rose from the hammock where it had been sitting, went to the doorway, and pulled open the inner doors. Have you the key? A voice asked. Dedalus has it, Buck Mulligan said. Janie Mack, I'm choked, he howled without looking up from the fire. Kinch! It's in the lock, Stephen said, coming forward. The key scraped around, scraped around harshly twice, and when the heavy door had been set ajar, welcome light and bright air entered. Haynes stood at the doorway looking out. Stephen hailed his unended valise to the, to the table and sat down to wait. Buck Mulligan tossed the fry onto the dish beside him. Then he carried the dish and a large teapot over to the table, set them down heavily, and sighed with relief. A melton, he said, as the candle remarked when, but hush, not a word more on the subject. Kitch, wake up. Bread, butter, honey, Haynes, come in. The grub is ready. Bless us, O oh Lord, and thy gifts. Where's the sugar? Oh, Jay, there's no milk. Stephen fetched the loaf and the pot from pot of honey from the butter cooler from the locker. Buck Mulligan sat down in a sudden pet. What sort of kip is this, he said. I told her to come after eight. We can drink it black, Stephen said. There's a lemon in the locker. Oh, damn you and your Paris fads, Buck Mulligan said. I want Sandy Cove milk. Haynes came in from the doorway and said quietly, that woman is coming up with the milk. The blessings with you, the blessings of God on you, Buck Mulligan cried, jumping up from his chair. Sit down. Pour out, pour out the tea there. The sugar is in the bag. Here, I can't go fumbling at the damn eggs. He hacked through the fry on the dish and slapped it out on three plates, saying, In nomine patres et fili et spiritus sancti. Haines sat down to pour out the tea. I'm giving you two lumps each, he said, but I say Mulligan, you do make strong tea, don't you? Buck Mulligan, hewing thick slices of loaf, said in an old woman's wheedling voice, When I makes tea, I makes tea, as my old grandmother Grogan said. And when I makes water, I makes water. By Jove, it is tea, Hain said. Buck Mulligan went on, hewing and wheedling. So do I, Miss Kyle, says she. Be God, ma'am, says Kyle. God send you, don't make them in the one pot. He lunged forward towards messmates, in turn a, six, a thick slice of bread impaled in his knife. That's folks, he said very earnestly, for your book, Haynes, five lines of text and ten pages of notes about the folk and the fish gods of Dundrum, printed by the weird sisters in the ear of the big wind. He turned to Stephen and asked in a fine puzzled voice, lifting his brows, can you recall, brother, is mother's grogan's 
tea and water pot spoken of in Mabigon's, or is it in Up <laughs> Upanishad's? I doubt it, said Stephen gravely. Do you now, Buck Mulligan said in the same tone. Your reasons, pray? I fancy, Stephen said, as he ate, it did not exist in or out of the Mabigon. <laughs> Mother Groggins was, one imagines, a kinswoman of Marianne. Buck Mulligan's face smiled with delight. Charming, he said in a finical sweet voice, showing his white teeth and blinking his eyes pleasantly. Do you think she was quite charming? Then, suddenly, overclouding all his features, he growled in a hoarsened, rasping voice as he hewed again vigorously at the loaf. For old Marianne, she doesn't care a damn, but hissing up her petticoats. He crammed his mouth with fry and munched and droned. The doorway was darkened in by an entering form. The milk, sir. Come in, ma'am, Mulligan said. Kinch, get the jug. An old woman came forward and stood by Stephen's <laughs> elbow. <laughs> That's a lovely morning, sir, she said. Glory be to God. <laughs> to whom? Mulligan said, glancing at her. <laughs> To who, Mulligan? <laughs> to who, Mulligan said, glancing at her. Ah, to be sure. Stephen reached back and took the milk jug from the locker. The Islanders, Mulligan said to Haynes casually, speak frequently of the collector of prepuces. How much, sir? asked the old woman. A quart, Stephen said. He watched her pour into the measure and then into the jug, rich white milk, not hers. Old shrunken paps. She poured again a measure full. <laughs> and a tilly. Old and secret, she had entered from a morning world. Maybe a messenger. She praised the goodness of the milk, pouring it out. Crouching by a patient cow at daybreak in the lush field, a witch on her toadstool, her wrinkled fingers quick at the squirting dugs. They lowed about her whom they knew, do silky cattle. Silk of the kind and poor old woman, names given her in old times. A wandering crone, lowly form of an immortal serving, her conqueror and her gay betrayer. Their coming, their common cook queen, a messenger from the secret morning. To serve or to upbraid, whether he could not tell, but scorn to beg her favor. "'Tis indeed, ma'am," Buck Mulligan said, boring, pouring milk into their cups. "'Taste it, sir,' she said. Oh. He drank at her bidding. "'If we could only live on good food like that,' he said to her somewhat loudly, "'we wouldn't have the country full of rotten teeth and rotten guts. "'Living in a bog swamp, eating cheap food in the streets paved with dust, "'horse dung and consumptive spits. "'Are you a medical student, sir?' The old woman asked. I am, ma'am, Buck Mulligan answered. Stephen listened in a scornful silence. She bows her old head to a voice that speaks to her loudly. Her bone setter, her medicine man, me she slights. To the voice they will shrive and oil for the grave all there is of her but her woman's unclean loins. Of man's flesh may not in God's likeness the serpent's prey. And to the loud voice that now bids her be silent with wondering and steady eyes. Do you understand what he? Do you understand what he says? Stephen asked her. Is it French you are talking, sir? The old woman said to Haynes. Haynes spoke to her again a longer speech, confidently. Irish, Buck Mulligan said. Is there Gaelic on you? I thought it was Irish. She said by the sound of it. Are you from the west, sir? I'm an Englishman, Haynes answered. He's English, Buck Mulligan said, and he thinks we ought to speak Irish in Ireland. 
Sure, we ought to, the old one said, and I'm ashamed I don't speak the language myself. I'm told it's a grand language by them that knows. Grand is no name for it, said Buck Mulligan. Wonderful entirely. Fill us out some more tea, Kinch. Would you like a cup, ma'am? No, thank you, sir, the old man said, slipping the ring of the milk can on her forearm and about to go. Haynes said to her, Have you your bill? We had better pay her, Mulligan, hadn't we? Stephen filled the three cups. Bill, sir, she said, halting. Well, it's seven mornings, a pint, a two pence, a seven twos is a shilling, and two pence over in these three mornings. And a quart at four pence is three quarts, is a shilling, and one and two is two and two, sir. <laughs> Buck Mulligan sighed, and having filled his mouth with a crust thickly buttered on both sides, stretched forth his legs and began to search his trouser pockets. Pay up and look pleasant, Haynes said to him, smiling. Stephen filled a third cup and a spoonful of tea coloring faintly the thick, rich milk. Buck Mulligan brought up a florin, twisted it round in his fingers, and cried, A miracle! He passed it along the table towards the woman, saying, Ask nothing more of me, sweet. All I can give you, I give. Stephen laid the coin in her eager hand. We'll owe two pence, he said. Time enough, sir, she said, taking the coin. Time enough. Good morning, sir. She curtsied and went out, followed by Buck Mulligan's tender chant. Heart of my heart, were it more, more would be laid at your feet. He turned to Stephen and said, Seriously, Dedalus, I'm stony. Hurry out to your school kip and bring us back some money. Today the bards must drink and junk it. Ireland expects that every man this day will do his duty. Okay. That reminds me, Haynes said. <laughs> Rising. That I have to visit your national library today. Our swim first, Buck Mulligan said. He turned to Stephen and asked blandly, Is this the day of your monthly wash, Kinch? Then he said to Haynes, The unclean bard makes a point of washing once a month. All Ireland is washed by the Gulf Stream, Stephen said, as he let honey trickle over his slice of the loaf. Haynes from the corner, where he was knotting easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke. I intend to make a collection of your saving sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub. A genbite of inwit, conscience. Yet there's a spot. That one about the crackled looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table and said with a warmth tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. Well, I mean it, Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. I was just thinking of it when the poor old creature came in. Would I make money by it, Stephen asked. Haynes laughed and, as he took his soft gray hat from the holdfast of the hammock, said, I don't know, I'm sure. He strolled out to the doorway. Buck Mulligan bent across to Stephen and said with coarse vigor, You put your hoof in it now. What did you say that for? Well, Stephen said, the problem is to get money. From whom? From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think. I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, 
and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, to tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for. Why don't you play them as I do to hell with them all? Let us get out of the kip. He stood up gravely, ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets onto the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them, and to his dangling watch chain. His hand plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. Agenbite of inwit. God will simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi. A limp black missile flew out of his talking hands. And there's your Latin quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going towards the door. Come on, Kinch. You have eaten all we left, I suppose, resigned. He passed out with grave words and gait, saying well nigh with sorrow. And going forth, he met Butterfly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out and as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in, it, in his inner pocket. At the foot of the ladder, Buck Mulligan asked, Did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, preceding them. He walked on. Behind him he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leather shoots of ferns or, or grasses. Down, sir. How dare you, sir? Haynes asked. Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State of war for War, Stephen added over his shoulder. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower and said at last, Rather bleak in wintertime, I should say. Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built, Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea. But ours is the Omphalus. What is your idea of Hamlet? Haynes asked Stephen. No, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I'm not equal to Thomas Aquinas, the f 55 reasons he has made to prop it up. Wait till I have a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat. You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It, can't wait. it can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haynes said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We've grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haynes said, beginning to point at Stephen. He, he himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise round his neck and bending in loose laughter said to Stephen's ear, Oh, shade of Kinch the elder, Japhet in search of a father. We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haynes, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward again, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haynes explained to Stephen as they followed. The, this tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore. That beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant towards Stephen, but did not speak. In the bright silent instant, Stephen saw his own image in cheap, dusty mourning between their grey attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haynes said, bringing them to halt again.
Eyes, pale as the sea, the wind had freshened, paler, firm and prudent. The sea's ruler, he gazed southward over the bay, empty save for the smoke plume of the mail boat, vague on the bright skyline, and a sail tacking by the muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, it's, he said, bemused. The father and the son ID, the son striving to be atoned by the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blighty, broadly smiling face. He looked at them, his well-shaped mouth open happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdraw all shrewd ascents, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved the doll's head to and fro, the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever heard. You heard. Come again. I'm the queerest young fellow that ever you heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph, in the, with Joseph the joiner, I cannot agree. So ears to disciples, disciples, disciples. <laughs> You're all laughing at me. <laughs> so ears to disciples and Calvary. He held up a forefinger of warning. If anyone thinks that I am divine, He'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine, but I have to bring what. But I have to bring water and wish it were plain that I make when the, sh oof, that I that I make when the wine becomes water again. <laughs> what happened? I got cut. <laughs> He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plant in farewell and, running forward to the brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins or wings of one about to rise in the air and chanted, Goodbye now, goodbye. Write down all I said. And tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead. What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly. And all of it's breezy. Goodbye now. Goodbye. He capered before them down towards the 40-foot hole. Fluttering his wing-like hands, leaping nimbly, Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh air that bore back to them his brief bird-like cries. Haynes, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, We oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen, Stephen answered. Oh, Haynes said, you've heard it before. Three times a day after meals, Stephen said dryly. You're not a believer, are you, Haynes asked. I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word. Creation from nothing and, and miracles and a personal God. There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me, Stephen said. Haynes, Haynes stopped to take out a smooth silver case in which twinkled a green stone. He sprang it open with his thumb and offered it. Thank you, Stephen said, taking a cigarette. Haynes helped himself and snapped the case too. He put it back in his side pocket and took from his waistcoat pocket a nickel tinderbox. Sprang it open too, and having lit a cigarette, held the flaming spunk towards Stephen in the shell of his hands. Yes, of course, he said, as they went on again. Either you believe or you don't, isn't it? Personally, I couldn't stomach that idea of a personal God. You don't stand for that, I suppose. You behold in me, Stephen said with grim displeasure a horrible example of free thought. He walked on, waiting to be spoken to, trailing his ash plant by his side. Its feral followed lightly on the path, squealing at his heels. My familiar, after me, calling me Stephen, a wavering line along the path, 
They will walk on it tonight, coming here in the dark. He wants that key. It is mine. I paid the rent. Now I eat his salt bread. Give him the key, too. All. He will ask for it. That was in his eyes. After all, Haynes began. Stephen turned and saw that the cold gaze which had measured him was not all unkind. After all, I should think you were able to free yourself. You are your own master, it seems to me. I am a servant of two masters, Stephen said, an English and an Italian. Italian, Haynes said. A crazy queen, old and jealous, kneel down before me. And the third, Stephen said. And there is who wants me for odd jobs. Italian? Haynes said again. What do you mean? The Imperial British State, Stephen answered, his color rising, and the Holy Roman Catholic and Apocalyptic Church. Haynes detached from his underlip some fibers of tobacco before he spoke. I can understand that, he said calmly. An Irishman think like that, I dare say. We feel in England that we have treated you fair, rather unfairly. It seems history is to blame. The proud, potent titles clanged over Stephen's memory the triumph of their brazen bells. A unum sanctum catholicum, a apotolicum escoscum. The slow growth and change of right and dogma like his own rare thoughts. A chemistry of stars. Symbol of the apostles in the, in the mass of, for Pope Marcellus. The voices blended, singing alone, aloud in affirmation. And behind their chant, the vigilant angel of the church, militant, disarmed, and menaced in her hyzerex. A horde of heresies fleeing with mitres awry. Photius with the, and the brood of mockers of whom Mulligan was one. And Arius wearing his life long upon constant ability of the, the son with the father and Valentine, spurning upon Christ's terrene body, and the subtle African hierarch Sabulus, who held that the father was himself his own son. Words Mulligan had spoken a moment since in a mockery to the stranger. Idle mockery. The void awaits surely all them that weave the wind. A menace, a disarming and, wor a, disarming and a worsting from those embattled angels of the church. Michael's host who defends who defend her ever in the honor of conflict with their lances and their shields. Hear, hear, prolonged a clause. Zut! Nom de Dieu! Of course I'm a Britisher, Haynes' voice said, and I feel as one. I don't want to see my country fall onto the, into the hands of German Jews either. That's our national problem, I'm afraid, just now. Two men stood at the verge of the cliff watching. Businessmen. Boatsman. She's making for Bullock Harbor. The boatsman nodded toward the north of the bay with some disdain. There's five fathoms out there, he said. It'll be swept up that way when the tide comes in about one. It's nine days today. The man, was, the man that was drowned, a sail veering about the blank bay waiting for a swollen bundle to bob up, roll over to the, to the sun a, a puffy face, salt white. Here I am. They followed the winding path down to the creek. Buck Mulligan stood on a stone in shirt sleeves, his unclipped tie rippling over his shoulder. A young man clinging to a spur of rock near, his, near him moved slow, slowly frogwise, his green legs in the deep jelly of the water. Is the brother with you, Malachi? Deep in Westmeath. With the, mat, with the Bannons. Still there? I got a card from Bannon. Says he found a sweet young thing down there. Photo girl, he calls her. Snapshot, eh? Brief exposure. <laughs> Buck Mulligan sat down to unlace his boots. An elderly man shot up near the spur of a rock, a blowing red face. He scrambled up by those stones, water glistening on his plate on its, and on its garland of gray hair, 
water riling over his chest and paunch and spilling jets out of his black sagging loincloth. Buck Mulligan made his way to scramble past and glancing at Haynes and Stephen, crossed himself piously with his thumbnail at, at, at brow and lips and breastbone. Seymour's back in town, the young man said, ga gasping his spur of rock. Chucking medicine, going in for the army. Ah, go to the god, Buck Mulligan said. Going over, going over next week to Stu. You know that Red Carlisle girl, Lily? Yes. No. Maybe. Seymour's back in town, the young... Oh, are you going here, Malachi? Yes, make room in the bed. The young man shoved himself backward through the water and reached the middle of the creek in, the two, long, in two long cream strokes. Hang sat down on the stone smoking. Are you not coming in, Buck Mulligan? Later on, Haines said. Not on my breakfast. Stephen turned away. I'm going, Mulligan, he said. Give us the key, Kinch. Buck Mulligan said, to keep my chemise flat. Stephen handed him the key. Buck Mulligan laid it across his heaped clothes. And two pence, he said, for a pint. Throw it there. Stephen threw two pennies on the soft heap. Dressing, undressing. Buck Mulligan, erect, with joined hands before him, said solemnly, He who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord. Thus spoke Zarthustra. His plump body plunged. We'll see you again, Haynes said. Alan, we need you. Turning as Stephen walked up the path and smiling at wild Irish. Horn of a bull, hoof of a horse, smile of a Saxon. The ship, Buck Mulligan cried. Half twelve. Good, Stephen said. He walked along the upward curving path. Liata Riutilium Turma Circulum Det Jubilatium E Virginum. The priest gray nimbus in a niche where he dressed discreetly. I will not sleep here tonight. Home also I cannot go. A voice sweetened and sustained. Called, called him from the, from the sea, sea. Turning, turning the curve and he waved his hand. hand. It, it called, called again, a the sleek brown head, a seal's, far out on the water, round, round usurper. usurper. End of part one. Sorry, section one. <laughs> <laughs> This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 2 
"'You, Cochrane, what city sent for him?' "'Tarentum, sir.' "'Very good. Well?' "'There was a battle, sir.' "'Very good. Where?' The boy's blank face asked the blank window. Fabled by the daughters of memory, and yet it was in some way, if not as memory fabled it. A phrase, then, of impatience, thud of Blake's wings of excess. I hear the ruin of all space, shattered glass and toppling masonry, and time one livid final flame. What's left us, then? I forget the place, sir. 279 B.C. Asculum, Stephen said, glancing at the name and date in the Gorsgard book. Yes, sir. And he said, Another victory like that, and we are done for. That phrase the world had remembered. A dull ease of the mind. From a hill above a corpse-strewn plain, a general speaking to his officers leaned upon his spear. Any general, to any officers. They lend ear. "'You, Armstrong,' Stephen said. "'What was the end of Pyrrhus?' "'End of Pyrrhus, sir?' "'I know, sir. Ask me, sir,' Coman said. "'Wait. You, Armstrong, do you know anything about Pyrrhus?' A bag of fig-rolls lay snugly in Armstrong's satchel. He curled them between his palms at whiles, and swallowed them softly. Crumbs adhered to the tissue of his lips— a sweetened boy's breath, well-off people, proud that their eldest son was in the navy. Vico Road, Dalkey. Pyrrhus, sir? Pyrrhus, a peer. All laughed. Mirthless, high, malicious laughter. Armstrong looked round at his classmates, silly glee in profile. In a moment they will laugh more loudly, "'aware of my lack of rule and of the fees their papas pay.' "'Tell me now,' Stephen said, poking the boy's shoulder with the book. "'What is a peer?' "'A peer, sir,' Armstrong said. "'A thing out in the water, a kind of a bridge. "'Kingstown Pier, sir.' Some laughed again, mirthless but with meaning. Two in the back bench whispered, "'Yes, they knew.' had never learned nor ever been innocent. All. With envy he watched their faces, Edith, Ethel, Gertie, Lily, their likes, their breaths too sweetened with tea and jam, their bracelets tittering in the struggle. Kingstown Pier, Stephen said. Yes, a disappointed bridge. The words troubled their gaze. How, sir? Coman asked. A bridge is across a river. For Haynes' chapbook, no one here to hear, tonight deftly amid wild drink and talk, to pierce the polished mail of his mind, what then? A jester at the court of his master, indulge and disesteemed, winning a clement master's praise. Why had they chosen all that part, not wholly for the smooth caress? For them, too, history was a tale like any other too often heard, their land a pawn-shop. Had Pyrrhus not fallen by a bedlam's hand in Argos, or Julius Caesar not been knifed to death? They are not to be thought away. Time has branded them, and fettered they are lodged in the room of the infinite possibilities they have ousted. But can those have been possible, seeing that they never were? Or was that only possible which came to pass? Weave, weaver of the wind. Tell us a story, sir. Oh, do, sir, a ghost story. Where do you begin in this? Stephen asked, opening another book. Weep no more, Coman said. Go on, then, Talbot. And the story, sir? After, Stephen said. Go on, Talbot. A swarthy boy opened a book and propped it nimbly under the breastwork of his satchel. He recited jerks of verse with odd glances at the text. Weep no more, woeful shepherds, weep no more, for Lycidas, your sorrow, is not dead, sunk though he be beneath the watery floor. 
It must be a movement, then, an actuality of the possible as possible. Aristotle's phrase formed itself within the gabbled verses, and floated out into the studious silence of the library of St. Genevieve, where he had read, sheltered from the sin of Paris, night by night. By his elbow a delicate Siamese conned a handbook of strategy. Fed and feeding brains about me, under glow-lamps, impaled, with faintly beating feelers, and in my mind's darkness a sloth of the underworld, reluctant, shy of brightness, shifting her dragon scaly folds. Thought is the thought of thought, tranquil brightness. The soul is in a manner all that is, the soul is the form of forms. Tranquillity sudden, vast, candescent, form of forms. Talbot repeated. Through the dear might of him that walked the waves, through the dear might. Turn over, Stephen said quietly. I don't see anything. What, sir? Talbot asked simply, bending forward. His hand turned the page over. He leaned back and went on again, having just remembered. Of him that walked the waves. Here also over these craven hearts his shadow lies, and on the scoffer's heart and lips and on mine. It lies upon their eager faces who offered him a coin of the tribute. To Caesar what is Caesar's, to God what is God's. A long look from dark eyes, a riddling sentence to be woven and woven on the church's looms. Aye. Riddle me, riddle me, Randy Rowe, my father gave me seeds to sow. Talbot slid his closed book into his satchel. "'Have I heard all?' Stephen asked. "'Yes, sir. Hockey at ten, sir. Half day, sir, Thursday.' "'Who can answer a riddle?' Stephen asked. They bundled their books away, pencils clacking, pages rustling. Crowding together, they strapped and buckled their satchels, all gabbling gaily. "'A riddle, sir. Ask me, sir.' "'Oh, ask me, sir. A hard one, sir.' "'This is the riddle,' Stephen said. "'The cock crew, the sky was blue, the bells in heaven were striking eleven. "'Tis time for this poor soul to go to heaven.' "'What is that?' "'What, sir? Again, sir, we didn't hear.' "'Their eyes grew bigger as the lines were repeated. "'After a silence, Cochran said, "'What is it, sir? We give it up.' Stephen, his throat itching, answered, "'The fox burying his grandmother under a holly-bush.' He stood up and gave a shout of nervous laughter, to which their cries echoed dismay. A stick struck the door, and a voice in the corridor called, "'Hockey!' They broke asunder, sidling out of their benches, leaping them. Quickly they were gone, and from the lumber-room came the rattle of sticks and clamour of their boots and tongues. Sergeant, who alone had lingered, came forward slowly, showing an open copy-book. His thick hair and scraggy neck gave witness of unreadiness, and through his misty glasses weak eyes looked up, pleading. On his cheek, dull and bloodless, a soft stain of ink lay, date-shaped, recent, and damp as a snail's bed. He held out his copy-book. The word SUMS was written on the headline. Beneath were sloping figures, and at the foot a crooked signature with blind loops and a blot. Cyril Sargent. His name and seal. "'Mr. Deasy told me to write them out all again,' he said, "'and show them to you, sir.' Stephen touched the edges of the book. Futility. "'Do you understand how to do them now?' he asked. "'Numbers eleven to fifteen, Sergeant answered. "'Mr. Deasy said I was to copy them off the board, sir.' "'Can you do them yourself?' Stephen asked. "'No, sir.' Ugly and futile, lean neck and thick hair, and a stain of ink, a snail's bed. Yet some one had loved him, borne him in her arms and in her heart, but for her the race of the world would have trampled him under foot, 
a squashed, boneless snail. She had loved his weak watery blood drained from her own. Was that then real? The only true thing in life? His mother's prostrate body the fiery Columbanus in holy zeal bestrode. She was no more, the trembling skeleton of a twig burnt in the fire, an odour of rosewood and wetted ashes. She had saved him from being trampled under foot, and had gone, scarcely having been. A poor soul gone to heaven, and on a heath beneath winking stars a fox, red reek of rapine in his fur, with merciless bright eyes, scraped in the earth, listened, scraped up the earth, listened, scraped and scraped. Sitting at his side, Stephen solved out the problem. He proves by algebra that Shakespeare's ghost is Hamlet's grandfather. Sergeant peered askance through his slanted glasses. Hockey sticks rattled in the lumber room, the hollow knock of a ball and calls from the field. Across the page the symbols moved in grave Morris, in the mummery of their letters, wearing quaint caps of squares and cubes. Give hands, traverse, bow to partner. So, Imps of fancy of the moors. Gone too from the world, Averroes and Moses Maimonides, dark men in mien and movement, flashing in their mocking mirrors the obscure soul of the world, a darkness shining in brightness which brightness could not comprehend. Do you understand now? Can you work the second for yourself? Yes, sir. In long shaky strokes, Sergeant copied the data. Waiting always for a word of help, his hand moved faithfully the unsteady symbols, a faint hue of shame flickering behind his dull skin. Amor matris, subjective and objective genitive. With her weak blood and whey-sour milk she had fed him, and hid from sight of others his swaddling bands. Like him I was, these sloping shoulders, this gracelessness. My childhood bends beside me. Too far for me to lay a hand there once or lightly. Mine is far, and his secret as our eyes. Secrets, silent, stony, sit in the dark palaces of both our hearts. Secrets weary of their tyranny. Tyrants, willing to be dethroned. The sum was done. It is very simple— Stephen said as he stood up. "'Yes, sir, thanks,' Sergeant answered. He dried the page with a sheet of thin blotting paper, and carried his copy-book back to his bench. "'You had better get your stick and go out to the others,' Stephen said as he followed towards the door the boy's graceless form. "'Yes, sir.' In the corridor his name was heard, called from the playfield. "'Sergeant!' "'Run on,' Stephen said. "'Mr. Deasy is calling you.' He stood in the porch and watched the laggard hurry towards the scrappy field where sharp voices were in strife. They were sorted in teams, and Mr. Deasy came away stepping over wisps of grass with gaitered feet. When he had reached the schoolhouse, voices again contending called to him. He turned his angry white moustache. "'What is it now?' he cried continually, without listening." "'Cochrane and Halliday are on the same side, sir,' Stephen said. "'Will you wait in my study for a moment,' Mr. Deasy said, "'till I restore order here.' And as he stepped fussily back across the field, his old man's voice cried sternly, "'What is the matter? What is it now?' Their sharp voices cried about him on all sides. Their many forms closed round him the garish sunshine bleaching the honey of his ill-dyed head. Stale, smoky air hung in the study with the smell of drab, abraded leather of its chairs. As on the first day he bargained with me here. As it was in the beginning, is now. On the sideboard the tray of Stuart coins, base treasure of a bog, and never shall be. And snug in their spoon-case of purple plush, faded, the twelve apostles having preached to all the Gentiles, world without end. A hasty step over the stone porch and in the corridor. 
Blowing out his rare moustache, Mr. Deasy halted at the table. First, our little financial settlement,' he said. He brought out of his coat a pocket-book bound by a leather thong. It slapped open, and he took from it two notes, one of joined halves, and laid them carefully on the table. Two, he said, strapping and stowing his pocket-book away. And now his strong-room for the gold. Stephen's embarrassed hand moved over the shells heaped in the stone, heaped in the cold stone mortar, whelks and money-cowries and leopard-shells, and this whirled as an emir's turban, and this the scallop of St. James. An old pilgrim's hoard, dead treasure, hollow shells. A sovereign fell, bright and new, on the soft pile of the tablecloth. Three, Mr. Deasy said, turning his little savings box about in his hand. These are handy things to have, see? This is for sovereigns, this is for shillings, sixpences, half-crowns, and here crowns, see? He shot from it two crowns and two shillings. Three twelve, he said. I think you'll find that's right. Thank you, sir, Stephen said, gathering the money together with shy haste and putting it all in a pocket of his trousers. "'No thanks at all,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You have earned it.' Stephen's hand, free again, went back to the hollow shells. Symbols, too, of beauty and of power. A lump in my pocket. Symbols soiled by greed and misery. "'Don't carry it like that,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You'll pull it out somewhere and lose it. "'You just buy one of these machines. "'You'll find them very handy.' "'Answer something.' "'Mine would be often empty,' Stephen said. "'The same room and hour, the same wisdom, and I the same. Three times now. Three nooses round me here. Well, I can break them in this instant if I will.' "'Because you don't save,' Mr. Deasy said, pointing his finger. "'You don't know yet what money is. Money is power. When you have lived as long as I have, I know, I know, if youth but knew—' What does Shakespeare say? Put but money in thy purse. Iago, Stephen murmured. He lifted his gaze from the idle shells to the old man's stare. He knew what money was, Mr. Deasy said. He made money. A poet, yes, but an Englishman, too. Do you know what is the pride of the English? Do you know what is the proudest word you will ever hear from an Englishman's mouth? The sea's ruler. His sea-cold eyes looked on the empty bay. It seems history is to blame, on me and on my words unhating. That on his empire, Stephen said, the sun never sets. Bah! Mr. Deasy cried. That's not English. A French Celt said that. He tapped his savings box against his thumbnail. I will tell you, he said solemnly, what is his proudest boast. I paid my way. Good man, good man. I paid my way. I never borrowed a shilling in my life. Can you feel that? I owe nothing. Can you? Mulligan, nine pounds, three pairs of socks, one pair brogues, ties. Curran, ten guineas. McCann, one guinea. Fred Ryan, two shillings. Temple, two lunches. Russell, one guinea. Cousins, ten shillings. Bob Reynolds, half a guinea, Curler, three guineas, Mrs. McKernan, five weeks' board. The lump I have is useless. For the moment, no, Stephen answered. Mr. Deasy laughed with rich delight, putting back his savings-box. I knew you couldn't, he said joyously, but one day you must feel it. We are a generous people, but we must also be just. I fear those big words, Stephen said, which make us so unhappy. Mr. Deasy stared sternly for some moments over the mantelpiece at the shapely bulk of a man in tartan filibegs, Prince Albert. Albert Edward, Prince of Wales. 
"'You think me an old fogey and an old Tory,' his thoughtful voice said. "'I saw three generations since O'Connell's time. "'I remember the famine in forty-six. "'Do you know that the Orange Lodges agitated for a repeal of the Union twenty years before O'Connell did, "'or before the prelates of your communion denounced him as a demagogue? "'You Fenians forget some things.' glorious, pious, and immortal memory, the lodge of diamond in Armagh, the splendid behung with corpses of papishes, horse, masked and armed, the planter's covenant, the black north and true blue Bible, croppies lie down. Stephen sketched a brief gesture. I have rebel blood in me too, Mr. Deasy said, on the spindle side, but I am descended from Sir John Blackwood, who voted for the Union. We are all Irish, all king's sons. Alas, Stephen said. Per vias rectus, Mr. Deasy said firmly, was his motto. He voted for it, and put on his top boots to ride to Dublin from the Ards of Down to do so. Lal the ral the ra, the rocky road to Dublin. A gruff squire on horseback with shiny top boots. Soft day, Sir John. Soft day, Your Honour. Day, day. Two top boots jog dangling on to Dublin. Lal the ral the ra. Lal the ral the raddy. That reminds me, Mr. Deasy said. You can do me a favour, Mr. Dedalus, with some of your literary friends. I have a letter here for the press. Sit down a moment. I have just to copy the end. He went to the desk near the window, pulled in his chair twice, and read off some words from the sheet on the drum of his typewriter. "'Sit down. Excuse me,' he said over his shoulder. "'The dictates of common sense. Just a moment.' He peered from under his shaggy brows at the manuscript by his elbow, and, muttering, began to prod the stiff buttons of the keyboard slowly, sometimes blowing as he screwed up the drum to erase an error." Stephen seated himself noiselessly before the princely presence. Framed around the walls, images of vanished horses stood in homage, their meek heads poised in air. Lord Hastings' repulse, the Duke of Westminster's shot over, the Duke of Beaufort's Ceylon, Prix de Paris, 1866. Elfin riders sat them, watchful of a sign. He saw their speeds, backing King's colours, and shouted with the shouts of vanished crowds. "'Full stop,' Mr. Deasy bade his keys. But prompt ventilation of this all-important question. "'Where Cranley led me to get rich quick, hunting his winners among the mud-splashed brakes, amid the balls of bookies on their pitches and reek of the canteen, over the motley slush. Fair rebel, fair rebel, even money the favourite, ten to one the field.' Dicers and thimble riggers we hurried by after the hooves, the vying caps and jackets, and past the meat-faced woman, a butcher's dame, nuzzling thirstily her clove of orange. Shouts rang shrill from the boy's playfield, and a whirring whistle. Again, a goal. I am among them, among their battling bodies, in a medley, the joust of life. "'You mean that knock-kneed mother's darling who seems to be slightly crossick? "'Jousts. Time shocked rebounds, shock by shock. "'Jousts, slush and uproar of battles, the frozen death-spew of the slain, "'a shout of spear-spikes baited with men's bloodied guts.' "'Now then,' Mr. Deasy said, rising. "'He came to the table, pinning together his sheets. "'Stephen stood up. "'I have put the matter into a nutshell,' Mr. Deasy said. "'It's about the foot-and-mouth disease. "'Just look through it. "'There can be no two opinions on the matter.' "'May I trespass on your valuable space, "'that doctrine of laissez-faire which so often in our history, "'the cattle trade, "'the way of all our old industries, "'Liverpool ring which jockeyed the Galway harbour scheme, "'European conflagration, Grain supplies through the narrow waters of the channel, the pluter-perfect imperturb imperturbability of the Department of Agriculture, pardon the classical allusion, Cassandra, 
by a woman who was no better than she should be, to come to the point at issue. "'I don't mince words, do I?' Mr. Deasy asked as Stephen read on. "'Foot and mouth disease, known as Cox preparation, serum and virus, percentage of salted horses, rinderpest, emperor's horses at Mertzteg, lower Austria, veterinary surgeons, Mr. Henry Blackwood Price, courteous offer a fair trial, dictates of common sense, all-important question, in every sense of the word take the bull by the horns, thanking you for the hospitality of your columns. I want that to be printed and read, Mr. Deasy said. You will see at the next outbreak they will put an embargo on Irish cattle, and it can be cured, it is cured. My cousin, Blackwood Price, writes to me it is regularly treated and cured in Austria by cattle doctors there. They offer to come over here. I am trying to work up influence with the department. Now I am going to try publicity. I am surrounded by difficulties, by intrigues, by backstairs influence, by— He raised his forefinger and beat the air oddly before his voice spoke. "'Mark my words, Mr. Dedalus,' he said. "'England is in the hands of the Jews, in all the highest places, her finance, her press, and they are the signs of a nation's decay. Wherever they gather they eat up the nation's vital strength. I have seen it coming these years. As sure as we are standing here the Jew merchants are already at their work of destruction. Old England is dying.' He stepped swiftly off his eyes coming to blue life as they passed a broad sunbeam. He faced about and back again. Dying, he said again, if not dead by now. The harlot's cry from street to street shall weave old England's winding sheet. His eyes, open wide in vision, stared sternly across the sunbeam which he halted, in which he halted. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear, Jew or Gentile, is he not? They sinned against the light, Mr. Deasy said gravely, and you can see the darkness in their eyes, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day. On the steps of the Paris Stock Exchange, the gold-skinned men quoting prices on their gemmed fingers, gabble of geese, they swarmed loud, uncouth about the temple, their heads thick plotting under maladroit silk hats. Not theirs, these clothes, this speech, these gestures. Their full, slow eyes belied the words, their gestures eager and unoffending, but knew the rancors massed about them, and knew their zeal was in vain. Vain patience to heap and hoard. Time surely would scatter all a hoard heaped by the roadside, plundered and passing on. Their eyes knew their years of wandering, and, patient, knew the dishonours of their flesh. "'Who has not?' Stephen said. "'What do you mean?' Mr. Deasy asked. He came forward a pace and stood by the table. His under jaw fell sideways, open uncertainly. "'Is this old wisdom? He waits to hear from me.' History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. From the playfield the boys raised a shout, a whirring whistle. Goal! What if that nightmare gave you a back kick? The ways of the Creator are not our ways, Mr. Deasy said. All human history moves towards one great goal, the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb towards the window, saying, "'That is God.' "'Hooray! I Hooray!' "'What?' Mr. Deasy asked. "'A shout in the street,' Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. Mr. Deasy looked down, and held for a while the wings of his nose tweaked between his fingers. Looking up again, he set them free. "'I am happier than you are,' he said. We have committed many errors and many sins. A woman brought sin into the world, for a woman who was no better than she should be, Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus. Ten years the Greeks made war on Troy. 
a faithless wife, first brought the strangers to our shore here. Macmorrow's wife and her layman, O'Rourke, Prince of Brefney. A woman, too, brought Parnell low. Many errors, many failures, but not the one sin. I am a struggler now at the end of my days, but I will fight for the right till the end. For Ulster will fight, and Ulster will be right. Stephen raised the sheets in his hand. "'Well, sir,' he began. "'I foresee,' Mr. Deasy said, "'that you will not remain here very long at this work. "'You were not born to be a teacher, I think. "'Perhaps I am wrong.' "'A learner, rather,' Stephen said. "'And here what will you learn more?' "'Mr. Deasy shook his head. "'Who knows,' he said. "'To learn one must be humble. "'But life is the great teacher.' Stephen rustled the sheets again. "'As regards these,' he began. "'Yes,' Mr. Deasy said. "'You have two copies there, if you can have them published at once. "'Telegraph. Irish Homestead. "'I will try,' Stephen said, "'and let you know to-morrow. "'I know two editors slightly.' "'That will do,' Mr. Deasy said briskly. "'I wrote last night to Mr. Field, M.P.' There is a meeting of the Cattle Traders Association to-day at the City Arms Hotel. I asked him to lay my letter before the meeting. You see if you can get it into your two papers. What are they? The Evening Telegraph. That will do, Mr. Deasy said. There is no time to lose. Now I have to answer that letter from my cousin. Good morning, sir, Stephen said, putting the sheets in his pocket. Thank you. "'Not at all,' Mr. Deasy said, as he searched the papers on his desk. "'I like to break a lance with you, old as I am.' "'Good morning, sir,' Stephen said again, bowing to his bent back. He went out by the open porch and down the gravel path under the trees, hearing the cries of voices and crack of sticks from the playfield. The lions couchant on the pillars as he passed out through the gate— toothless terrors. Still, I will help him in his fight. Mulligan will dub me a new name, the Bullock-befriending Bard. Mr. Dedalus! Running after me. No more letters, I hope. Just one moment. Yes, sir, Stephen said, turning back at the gate. Mr. Deasy halted, breathing hard and swallowing his breath. "'I just wanted to say,' he said, "'Ireland, they say, has the honour of being the only country "'which never persecuted the Jews. "'Do you know that? "'No. "'And do you know why?' "'He frowned sternly on the bright air. "'Why, sir?' Stephen asked, beginning to smile. "'Because she never let them in,' Mr. Deasy said solemnly. "'A cough-ball of laughter leaped from his throat,' dragging after it a rattling chain of phlegm. He turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arms waving to the air. "'She never let them in!' he cried again through his laughter, as he stamped on gaitered feet over the gravel of the path. "'That's why!' On his wise shoulders, through the checkerwork of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins, End of chapter 2. Read by Kara Schallenberg on March 3rd, 2006, in Oceanside, California, and left completely unedited at Hugh's request. Hope you enjoyed it. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. Today's reading by Miette and Philip. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 3. Ineluctable modality of the visible. At least that, if no more, thought through my eyes. 
signatures of all things I am here to read, sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot, snot green, blue silver rust, coloured signs, limits of the diaphan, but, he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies before, of them coloured. How? By knocking his sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bold he was and a millionaire, maestro di cola che sano. Limit of the diaphan in. Why in? Diaphan, adiaphan. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate, if not a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it howsomever. I am a stride at a time. A very short space of time through very short times of space. Five, six. The... Nakinande. Exactly. And that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No, Jesus! If I fell over a cliff, that beetle's oar is base. Fell through the... Nebinyande. Ineluctably. I am getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it, they do. My two feet in his boots are at the ends of his legs. Nebinyande. Sounds solid. Made by the mallet of Los Demiurgos. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Mount Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick, wild sea money. Domini Dizi Kenzeme. Won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeline the Mare? Rhythm begins, you see. I hear a catalectic tetrameter of iams marching. No, a gallop. Deline the Mare. Open your eyes now, I will. One moment. Has all vanished since. If I open and am forever in the black adiaphan, basta. I will see if I can see. See now. There all the time without you, and ever shall be, world without end. They came down the steps from Leahy's terrace prudently, Frau and Zimmer, and down the shelving shore flabbily, their splayed feet sinking in the silted sand. Like me, like Algy, coming down to our mighty mother, number one swung lordily her midwife's bag, the others gump picked in the beach. From the liberties... Out for the day. Mrs. Florence McCabe, relict of the late Patrick McCabe, deeply lamented of Bride Street. One of her sisterhood lugged me squealing into life, creation from nothing. What has she in the bag? A Miss Birth with a trailing navel cord, hushed in ruddy wool. The cords of all link back, strand entwining cable of all flesh. That is why mystic monks... Will you be as gods? Gaze in your omphalos. Hello, Kinch here. Put me on to Edenville, Aleph, Alpha, Not, Not, One. Spouse and helpmate of Adam Cademan. Eva, naked Eve. She had no navel. Gaze. Belly without blemish. Bulging big, a buckler of taut vellum. No, white-heaped corn. Orient and immortal. Standing from everlasting to everlasting. Womb of sin. Wombed in sin darkness I was too, made not begotten. By them the man with my voice in my eyes, and a ghost woman with ashes on her breath. They clasped and sundered, did the couple's, coupler's will. From before the ages he willed me, and now may not will me away or ever. Alex Eterna stays about him. Is that then the divine substance wherein father and son are consubstantial? Where is poor dear Arius to try conclusions, warring his life long upon the contransmagnificand jubantantiality? Ill starred, here see Ark in a Greek water closet. He breathed his laugh, euthanasia. With a beaded mitre and a crozier, stalled upon his throne, widower of a widowed sea, with upstiffed omorphorian, with clotted hinderpants. Hairs romped round him, nicking his eager airs. They're coming waves. 
white maned seahorses chomping, bright wind bridled the steeds of Manan. I mustn't forget his letter for the press. And after the ship, half twelve. By the way, go easy with that money like a good young imbecile. Yes, I must. His pace slackened. Here. Am I going to Aunt Sarah's or not? My consubstantial father's voice. Did you see anything of your artist brother Stephen lately? No? Sure, he's not down in Strasbourg Terrace with his Aunt Sally. Couldn't he fly a bit higher than that, eh? And, 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 and tell us, Stephen, how is Uncle C? Oh, weeping God, the things I married into. To boys up in the hayloft, the drunken little cost drawer and his brother, the cornet player. Highly respectable gondoliers. And skiwayed Walter, serving his father, no less. Sir, yes, sir, no, sir. Jesus wept, and no wonder by Christ. I pull the wheezy bell of their shuttered cottage, and wait. They take me for a dun, peer out from the coin of vantage. It's Stephen, sir. Let him in, let Stephen in. A bolt drawn back, and Walter welcomes me. We thought you were someone else. In his broad bed, Uncle Richie, pillowed and blanketed, extends over the hillock of his knees a sturdy forearm. Clean-chested, he has washed the upper moiety. Morrow, nephew. He lays against the lapboard whereon he drops his bills of costs for the eyes of Master Guff and Master Shapland Tandy, filling consents and common searches and a writ of deuces tecum. A burgook frame over his bald head. Wild wreck was got. The drone of his misleading whistle brings Walter back. Yes, sir. Malt for Richie and Stephen. Tell mother, where is she? Bathing Chrissy, sir. Papa's little bed pal, lump of love. No, Uncle Richie. Call me Richie. Damn your lithia water. It lowers. Whusky. Uncle Richie, really? Sit down or by the law, Harry, I'll knock you down. Walter squints vainly for a chair. He has nothing to sit down upon, sir. He has nowhere to put it, you mug. Bring our Chippendale chair. Would you like a bite of something? None of your damned lordy dole airs here. The rich of a rush of fried with a herring? Sure? So much the better. We have nothing in the house but backache peels. Pills. Aleta. He drones bars at Fernando's Aria de Sortita, the grandest number, Stephen, in the whole opera. Listen. His tuneful whistle sounds again, finely shaded with rushes of the air, his fists big drumming on his padded knees. This wind is sweeter. Houses of decay, mine, his, and all. You told the Clongo's gentry you had an uncle, a judge and an uncle, a general in the army. Come out of them, Stephen. Beauty is not there, nor in the stagnant bay of Marsh's library where you read the fading prophecies of Joachim Abbas. For whom? The hundred-headed rabble of the cathedral close. A hater of his kind ran from them to the wood of madness, his mane foaming in the moon, his eyeball stars. Horium, horse nostril, the oval equine faces. Temple, Buck Mulligan, Foxy Campbell, Lantern Jaws, Abbas Father, Furious Dean, what offense laid fire to their brains? Puff, Descende Calve ut ne amplius de Calveris. Garland of gray hair on his culminated head. See him, me, clamoring down to the footpace. Descende, clutching a monstrance. Basilisk guide, get down, bald pole. Choir gives back menace and echo, assisting about the altar's horns, the snorted Latin of jack priests moving burly in their albs, tonsured and oiled and gelded, fat with the fat of kidneys of wheat. And at the same instant, perhaps a priest round the corner is elevating it. 
Dring, dring. And two streets off another looking it into a pix. Dring, a dring. And in a lady chapel another taking housel all to his own cheek. Dring, dring. Down, up, forward, back. Dan Oakham thought of that invincible doctor. A misty English morning, the imp hypostasis tickled his brain, bringing his host down and kneeling his... He heard twine with his second bell, the first bell in the transept. He is lifting this. And, rising, heard... Now I am lifting. There two bells. He is kneeling. Twang and diphthong. Cousin Stephen, you will never be a saint. Isle of saints. You were awfully holy, weren't you? You prayed to the Blessed Virgin that you might not have a red nose. You prayed to the devil in Serpentine Avenue that the fubsy window in front might lift her clothes still more from the wet street. Oh, see, si, Seto, sell your soul for that, do. Dyed rags pinned round a squall. More, tell me more, more still. On the top of the house, tram alone crying to the rain. Naked women! Naked women! What about that, eh? What about what? What else were they invented for? Reading two pages apiece of seven books every night, eh? I was young. You bowed to yourself in the mirror, stepping forward to applause, earnestly, striking face. Hooray for the goddamned idiot, hooray! No one saw, tell no one. Books you were going to write with letters for titles. Have you read his F? Oh, yes, but I prefer Q. Oh, yes, but Q, uh, W is wonderful. Oh, yes, W. Remember your epiphanies written on green oval leaves? Deeply deep. Copies to be sent if you die to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria. Someone was to read them there after a few thousand years of Maha Mavantara, Pico della Mirandola, like I very like a whale. When one reads these strange pages of one long gone, one feels that one is at one with one who wants. The grainy sand had gone from under his feet. His boots trod again a damp, crackling mast, razor shells, squeaking pebbles, that on the unnumbered pebbles beats, wood sieved by the ship warm, lost armada, Unwholesome sand flats waited to suck his treading soles, breathing upward sewage breath. A pocket of seaweed smoldered in sea fire under a midden of man's ashes. He coasted them, walking warily. A porter bottle stood up, stog to its waist, in the cakey sand dough. A sentinel, isle of dreadful thirst. Broken hoops on the shore, at the land, a maze of dark cunning nets. Farther away, chalk scrawled back doors, and on the higher beach, a drying line with two crucified shirts, rings end, wigwams of brown steersmen and master mariners, human shells. He halted. I've passed the way to Aunt Sarah's. Am I not going there? Seems not. No one about. He turned northeast and crossed the firmer sands toward the pigeon house. Qui vous a mis dans cette fichue position? C'est le pigeon, Joseph. Patrice, home on furlough, lapped warm milk with me in the bar McMahon, son of the wild goose, Kevin Egan of Paris. My father's a bird. He lapped the sweet lace show with pink young tongue, plump bunny's face. Lap, lapin. He hopes to win the gros lot. About the nature of women he read in Michelet. But he must send me La Vie de Jesus by M. Leo Taxil. Lent it to his friend. C'est tout vous savez. Moi, je suis socialiste. Je ne crois pas en l'existence de Dieu. Faut pas le dire à mon père. Il croit? What is, how do you say that? Quoi? Il croit? Mon père, oui. Schluss. He laughs. My Latin quarter hat. God, we simply must dress the character. I want puce gloves. You were a student, weren't you? Of what in the other devil's name? 
Persian. P C N, you know? Physique, chemique, and naturel. Aha. Eating your goat's worth of mu en cive, flesh pots of Egypt, elbowed by a belching cabman. Just say in the most natural tone, when I was in Paris, Goul Miche, I used to, yes, used to carry punched tickets to prove an alibi if they arrested you for murder somewhere. Justice. On the night of the 17th of February, 1904, the prisoner was seen by two witnesses. One fellow did it. Other, me. Hat, tie, overcoat, nose. Louis, c'est moi. You seem to have enjoyed yourself. Proudly walking. Whom were you trying to walk like? Forget, a dispossessed. With mother's money order, eight shillings, the banging door of the post office slammed in your face by the usher. Hunger toothache. Encore du minutes. Look, clock. Must get fair mate. Hire dog. Shoot him to bloody bits with a bang shotgun. Bits, man. Spattered walls, all brass buttons. Bits all crack in place. Clack back. Not hurt? Oh, that's all right. Shake hands. See what I mean? See? Oh, that's all right. Shake a shake. Oh, that's all only all right. You were going to do wonders. What? Missionary to Europe after fiery Columbanus. Fiacre and Scotus on their creepy stools in heaven split from their pint pots. Loud Latin laughing. UG, UG. Pretending to speak broken English as you dragged your valise. Porch of three pence across the slimy pier at New Haven. Coma? Rich booty you brought back. Le tutu. Five tattered numbers of pantalon blanc. A culotte rouge. A blue French telegram. Curiosity to show. Mother dying. Come home, father. The aunt thinks you killed your mother. That's why she won't. Then here's a health to Mulligan's aunt, and I'll tell you the reason why. She always kept things decent in the Hannigan family. His feet marched in sudden proud rhythm over the sand furrows, along by the boulders of the south wall. He stared at them proudly, piled stone mammoth skulls, gold light on sea, on sand, on boulders. The sun is there, the slender trees... The lemon houses. Paris, rawly walking, crude sunlight on her lemon streets. Moist pith of farls of braid, the frog green wormwood, her matin incense caught the air. Beluomo rises from the bed of his wife's lover's wife, the kerchiefed housewife's astir, a saucer of ascetic acid in her hand. In Rodos Yvonne and Madeleine, new make their tumbled beauties, shattering with gold teeth, chausson of pastry, their mouths yellowed with the puce of flambreton. Faces of Paris men go by, their well pleased pleasures, curled conquistadores. Noon slumbers. Kevin Egan rolls gunpowder cigarettes through fingers smeared with printer's ink. Sipping his green fairy as Patrice is white. About us gobblers fork spiced beans down their gullets. On demi set, ye? A jet of coffee steam from the burnished cauldron. She serves me at his beck. Il est Irlandais? Hollandais? Non, fromage. Deux Irlandais, nu, Irlande. Vous avez? Ah, oui. She thought you wanted a cheese. Hollandais. You're postprandial. Do you know that word? Postprandial. There was a fellow I once knew in Barcelona, a queer fellow, used to call it his postprandial. Well, you do it. Slaint. Around the slab tables, the tangle of wind breaths and grumbling gorges. His breath hangs over a saucer stained plates, the green fairy's fang thrusting between his lips. Of Ireland. The Dalcassians of hopes, conspiracies of Arthur Griffith now, A.E. Pimander, good shepherd of men, to yoke me as his yoke fellow, our crimes, our common cause, 
You're your father's son. I know the voice. His fustian shirt, sanguine flower, trembles its Spanish tassels at his secrets. M. Drumont, famous journalist, Drumont. I know what he called Queen Victoria. Old hag with yellow teeth. Vile ogressa with Don't Jean's. Maud Gaume, beautiful woman. La Patrie, Mademoiselle Milio, Felix Ford, you know how he died? Licentious men, the Froken, Bon à tout faire, who rubs male nakedness in the bath at Uppsala. Moi fair, she said, tous les messieurs. Not this, monsieur, I said. Most licentious custom. Bath, a most private thing. I wouldn't let my brother, not even my own brother. Most lascivious thing. Green eyes, I see you, fang, I feel. Lascivious people. The blue fuse burns deadly between hands and burns clear. Loose tobacco shreds catch fire. A flame and acrid smoke light our corner. Raw face bones under his peep of dear boy's hut. How the head centre got away. Authentic version. Got up as a young bride. Man. Veil orange blossoms. Drove out the road to Malahide. Deed. Faith. Of lost leaders the betrayed. Wild escapes. Disguises clutched at. Gone. Not here. Spurned lover. I was a strapping young gossin at that time, I tell you. I'll show you my likeness one day. I was. Faith. Lover. For her love he prowled with Colonel Richard Burke, tainest of his sept, under the walls of Clerkenwell, and, crouching, saw a flame of vengeance hurl them upward in the fog. Shattered glass and toppling masonry. In gay Paris he hides, Egan of Paris, unsought by any save by me. Making his day's stations, the dingy printing case, his three taverns, the Montmartre lair he sleeps short night in, rue de la Goutte d'Or, damascened with fly-bound faces of the gone. Loveless, landless, wifeless. She is quite nicely comfy without her outcast man, Madame in Rue Guite de Lecour, Canary and two book lodges. Peachy cheeks, a zebra skirt, frisky as a young thing's, spurned and undespairing. Tell Pat you saw me, won't you? I wanted to get poor Pat a job one time. Mon fils, soldier of France. I taught him to sing the boys of Kilkenny our stout roaring blades. No, that old lay. I taught Patrice that. Old Kilkenny, St. Canis, Strongbow's Castle on the Nore, goes like this. Oh, oh, he takes me Napatandi by the hand. Oh, oh, the boys of Kilkenny. Weak wasting hand on mine. They have forgotten Kevin Egan, not he them. Remembering thee, O oh, Sion. He had come near the edge of the sea, and wet sand slapped his boots. The new air greeted him, harping in wild nerves, wind of wild air and seeds brightness. Here, I am not walking out to the Kish light ship, am I? He stood suddenly, his feet beginning to sink slowly in the quaking soil. Turn back. Turning, he scanned the shore south, his feet sinking again slowly in new sockets. The cold domed room of the tower waits. Through the barbicans, the shaft of light are moving ever, slowly, ever, as my feet are sinking, creeping duskward on the dial floor. Blue dusk, nightfall, deep blue night. In the darkness of the dome they wait. Their pushed back chairs, my obelisk valise, around a board of abandoned platters. Who to clear it? He has the key. I will not sleep there when this night comes, a shut door of a silent tower, entombing their blind bodies... The panther sahib and his pointer call. No answer. He lifted his feet up from the suck and turned back by the mold of boulders. Take all, keep all. My soul walks with me, form of forms. So in the moon's mid-watches I pace the path above the rocks in sable silvered, hearing Elsinore's tempting flood. The flood is following me. I can watch it flow past from here. Get back then by the pool beg road to the strand there. He climbed over the sedge and ely oarweeds and sat on a stool of rock, 
resting his asp ash plant in a grike. A bloated carcass of a dog lolled on the bladder rack. Before him, the gunwale of a boat sunk in sand. Un coche en sable. Louis Villot called Gautier's prose. These heavy sands are language tied in wind have silt our language tied in wind have silted here, and these the stone heaps of dead builders, a warren of weasel rats. Hide gold there, try it. You have some. Sands and stones, heavy of the past, Sir Lout's toys. Mind you don't get one bang on the air. I'm the bloody well gigant rolls all them bloody well boulders, bones for my stepping stones. Fee for fum. I smell the bloods of the Irishman. A point. Live dog grew into sight running across the sweep of sand. Lord, is he going to attack me? Respect his liberty. You will not be master of others or their slave. I have my stick. Sit tight. From farther away, walking shoreward across from the crested tide. Figures. Two. The two marriers. They have tucked it safe among the bulrushes. Peekaboo, I see you. No, the dog, he is running back to them. Who? Gullies of the Lucklands ran here to the beach in quest of prey, their blood beaked prows riding low on a molten pewter surf. Dane Vikings, talks of tomahawks a glitter on their breasts when Malachi wore the colour of gold. A school of tailhide whales stranded in hot noon, spouting, hobbling in the shallows. Then from the starving cagework city, a horde of jerkined dwarves, my people, with flayers' knives, running, scaling, hacking in green blubbery whale meat. Famine, plague, and slaughters, their blood is in me, their lusts my waves. I moved among them on the frozen liffy, that I, a changeling, among the sputtering resin fires. I spoke to no one, none to me. The dog's bark ran towards him, stopped, ran back. Dog of my enemy. I just simply stood pale, silent, bared about. Terabilia meditans. A primrose doublet, fortune's nerve, smiled on my fear. For that are you pining, the bark of their applause. Pretenders live their lives. The Bruce's brother, Thomas Fitzgerald, silken knight, Perkin Warbeck, York's false scion, in breeches of silk, of white rose ivory, wonder of a day. And Lambert Simnel, with a tail of nuns and sutlers, a scullion crowned. All king's sons, a paradise of pretenders then and now. He saved men from drowning, and you shake at a cur's yelping. But the courtiers who mocked Guido or in awe, Saint-Michel, were in their own house. House of, we don't want any of your medieval abstrusiosities. Would you do what he did? A boat would be near, a life buoy. Naturalique, put there for you. Would you or would you not? The man that was drowned nine days ago off Maiden's Rock. They're waiting for him now. The truth spit it out, I would want to. I would try. I am not a strong swimmer. Water cold, soft. When I put my face into it, in the basin it clone glows, can't see. Who's behind me? Out quickly, quickly. Do you see the tide flowing quickly in on all slides, sheeting the loads of sand quickly? Shell cuckoo are coloured. If I had land under my feet, I want his life still to be his, mine to be mine. A drowning man, his human eyes screamed to me out of horror of his death. I, with him together down, I could not save her. Waters, bitter death, lost. A woman and a man. I see her skirties, pinned up by bet. Their dog ambled about a bank of dwindling sand, trotting, sniffing on all sides looking for something lost in a past life, suddenly made off like a bounding hare, ears flung back, chasing the shadow of a low-skimming gull. The man's shrieked whistle struck his limp ears. 
He turned, bounded back, came nearer, trotted on twinkling shanks. On a field tenny a buck, trippant, proper, unattired. At the lace fringe of the tide he halted with stiff forehoofs, sea award pointed seaward pointed ears, his snout lifted, barked at the wave noise, herds of sea morse. They serpented towards his feet, curling, unfurling many crests, every ninth breaking, plashing from far, from farther out, waves and waves, cockle pickers. They waited a little way in the water and stooping, soused their bags and lifting them again, waded out. The dog yelped, running to them, reared up and pawed them, dropping on all fours, again reared up at them with mute bearish fawning. Unheeded, he kept by them as... They came towards the drier sand, a rag of wolf's tongue, red panting from his jaws. His speckled body ambled ahead of them and then loped off at a calf's gallop. The carcass lay on his path. He stopped, sniffed, stalked round it. Brother, nosing closer, went round it, sniffing rapidly like a dog all over the dead dog's bedraggled fell. Dog skull, dog sniff, eyes on the ground, moved to one's great goal. Ah, poor dog's body. Here lies poor dog body's body. Tatters, out of that, you mongrel! Cry brought him skulking back to his master and a blunt bootless kick sent him unscathed across a split of sand. Oh. Crouched in <laughs> flight. He slunk back in a curve. Doesn't see me. Along by the edge of the mole, he lolloped, dawdled, smelt a rock, and from under a cocked hind leg, pissed against it. He trotted forward and lifting again his hind leg, Pissed quick short at an unsmelt rock. Simple pleasures of the poor. His hind paws then scattered the sand. Then his forepaws dabbled and delved. Something he buried there, his grandmother. He rooted in the sand again with the fury of his claws, soon ceasing, a pard, a panther, gotten spouse breech, vulturing the dead. That's my favorite. After he woke me last night, the same dream, or was it? Wait, open hallway, street of harlots. Remember, Harun al Rashid? I am almosting it. That man led me, spoke. I was not afraid. The melon he had, he held against my face. Smiled, cream fruit smell. That was the rule, said. In, come. Red carpet sprayed. You will see who. Shouldering their bags, they trudged the red Egyptians. His blued feet out of turned-up trousers slapped the clammy sand, a, du a dull brick muffler strangling his unshaven neck. With woman's steps she followed, the ruffian in his strolling mart. Spoils slung at her back, loose sand and shell grit crusted her bare feet, about her with windrow face hair trailed. Behind her lord, his helpmate, being a wasp to Romeville. When night hides her body's flaws, calling under her brown shawl from an archway where dogs have mired. Her fancy way is treating two royal Dublins in a lufflens of black pits. Boss her, rapping rogues run lingo, or oh, far. Oh. Oh, my dimber whopping dell, a she fiend's whiteness under her rancid rags. Fum bally's lay in the night, the tanyard smells. White thy fumbles, red thy gown, and thy quarren's dainty ease. Couch a hog's head with me then, in the dark man's clip and kiss. Moros delitaction, Aquinas turnbelly calls this. Frate porcospino. Unfallen Adam rode and not rutted. Call away, let them. Thy quarren's dainty ease. Language no whit worse than his. Monk words, marry beads jabber on their girdles. Rogue words, tough nuggets putter in their pockets. Passing now. A side eye at my hamlet hat. If I were suddenly naked here as I sit, I am not. Across the sands of all the world, followed by the sun's flaming sword to the west, trekking to evening lands, she trudges, schleps, trains, drags, trascines her load, a tide westering, moon drawn in her wake. Tides myriad islanded within her, blood not mine. Oinopa ponton, 
a wine-dark sea. Behold the handmaid of the moon. In sleep the wet sign calls her hour, bids her rise. Bride-bed, child-bed, bed of death, ghost-candled. Omnis caro ad te veniet. He comes, pale vampire, through storm his eyes. His back sails bloodying the sea, mouth to her mouth's kiss. Here, put a pin in that chap, will you, my tablets? Mouth to her kiss. No, must be two of them. Glue em well, mouth to her mouth's kiss. His lips lipped and mouthed fleshless lips of air. Mouth to her moomb, oomb, all wooming tomb. His mouth molded issuing breath, unspeeched, ooey ha, roar of cataractic planets, globed, blazing, roaring, way away, 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 paper, the banknotes, blast them, old Deezy's letter, here, thanking you for the hospitality, tear the blank end off, turning his back to the sun, he bent over far to a table of rock and scribbled words. That's twice I forgot to take slips from the library counter. His shadow lay over the rocks as he banked, ending. Why not endless Uh-oh. till the... F- Uh-oh. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Why not endless till the farthest star? Darkly they are there behind this light, darkness shining in the brightness, delta of Cassiopeia, worlds. Me sits there with his auger's roar of ash, in borrowed sandals, by day beside a livid sea, unbeheld in violet night, walking beneath a rain of uncouth stars. I throw this ended shadow from me, man shape in eluctable, call it buck. Endless, would it be mine, form of my form? Who watches me here? Who does? Whoever anywhere will read these written words. Signs on a white field. Somewhere to someone in your flutiest voice. The good bishop of Cloyne took the veil of the temple out of his shovel hut. Veil of space with coloured emblems hatched on its field. Hold hard. Coloured on a flat. Yes, that's right. Flat I see. Then think distance. Near. Far. Flat I see. East. Back. Ah, see now? Falls back suddenly, frozen in stereoscope. Click does the trick. You find my words dark. Darkness is in our souls, do you not think? Flutier. Our souls, shame wounded by our sins, cling to us yet more. A woman to her lover clinging. The more, the more. She trusts me, her hand, gentle, the long-lashed eyes. Now where the blue hell am I bringing her beyond the veil? Into the ineluctable modality of the ineluctable visuality. She, she, she. What she? The virgin at Hodge's Figgis Widows on Monday? Looking in for one of the alphabet books you were going to write? Keen glance you gave her. Wrist through the braided jesse of her sunshade. She lives in Leeson Park with the grief and kickshaws, a lady of letters. Talk that to someone else. Stevie, a pick-me-up. Bet she wears those curse of God stays suspenders and yellow stockings darned with lumpy wool. Talk about apple dumplings. Piutosto. Where are your wits? Touch me. Soft eyes, soft, soft, soft hand. I'm lonely here. Oh, touch me soon, now. What is that word known to all men? I'm quiet here, alone. Sad, too. Touch, touch me. He lay back at a full stretch over the sharp rocks, cramming the scribbled note and pencil into a pock his hat, his hat down on his eyes. That is Kevin Egan's movement I made. Nodding for his nap, Sabbath sleep. Et vidit dus. Et errant valde bona. Allo, bonjour. Welcome as the flowers in May. Under its leaf, he watched through peace cock twittering lashes the 
the southing sun. I am caught in this burning scene, Pan's hour, the faunal noon, Among gum-heavy serpent plants, Milk-oozing fruits, Where on the tawny waters leaves lie wide, Pain is far. And no more turn aside and brood. His gaze brooded on his broad-toed boots, a box cast off, neighbor nine under. He counted the creases of rock's leather wherein another's foot had nestled warm. The foot that beat the ground in tripudium, foot I dislove. But you were delighted when Esther Oswald's shoe went on you. Girl I knew in Paris. Tiens, quel petit pied! Staunch framed a brother soul. Wild's love that dare not speak its name. His arm, Cranley's arm, he now will leave me, and the blame, as I am, as I am, all or not at all. In long lassoes from the cook lake, the water flowed full, covering green gold in the lagoons of sand, rising, flowing. My ash plant will float away. I shall wait. No, they will pass on, passing, chafing against the low rocks, swirling, passing. Better get this job over quick. Listen, a four-worded wave speech. See, su, hiss. Precise ooze. Vehement breath of waters amid sea snakes, rearing horses, rocks. In cups of rocks it slops, flop, slop, slap, bounded in barrels, and spent, its speech ceases. It flows purling, widely flowing, floating, foam pool, flower unfurling. Under the upswelling tide he saw the writhing weeds lift languidly and sway reluctant arms, hising up their petticoats in whispering water, swaying and upturning coy silver fronds. Day by day, night by night, lifted, flooded, and let fall. Lord, they are weary, and, whispered too, they sigh. St. Ambrose heard it, sighs of leaves and waves, waiting, awaiting the fullness of their times. Dibus at noctibus inurius patiens in gemiscuch. To no end gathered, vainly then released, forth flowing, wending back, loom of the moon. Weary too in sight of lovers, lascivious men, and naked women, women, shining in her court. She draws a toil of waters. Five fathoms out there. Full fathom five thy father lies. At one, he said. Found drowned. High water at Dublin Bar. Driving before it a loose drift of rubble. Fan shoals of fishes, silly shells. A corpse rising salt white from the undertow. Bobbing apace, apace, a porpoise landward. There he is. Hook it quick. Pull. Sunk though he be beneath the watery floor, we have him. Easy now. Bag of corpse gas sopping in foul brine. A quiver of minnows. Fat of a spongy tidbit. Flash through the slits of his buttoned trouser fly. God becomes man, becomes fish, becomes barnacle. Goose becomes featherbed mountain. Dead breaths I living breathe. Tread dead dust devours a uranus offal from all dead. Hauled stark over the gunwale, he breathes upward the stench of his green grave, his leprous nose hole snoring to the sun. A sea change, this, brown eyes, salt blue, sea death, mildest of all deaths known to man. Old Father Ocean, pre de Paris, beware of imitations. Just you give it a fair trial. We enjoyed ourselves immensely. Come, I thirst, clouding over. No black clouds anywhere, are there? thunderstorm. All bright he falls, proud lightning of the intellect. Lucifer, Dico, Ki, Nezkit, Okasum. No. My cockle hat and staff and his my sandal shoon. Where? To evening lands. Evening will find itself. He took the hilt of his ash plant, 
lunging with it softly, dallying still. Yes, evening will find itself in me, without me. All days make their end. By the way, next, when it is Tuesday, will be the longest day. Of all the glad new year, mother, the rum-tum tiddly-tum. Lawn Tennyson, gentleman poet. G-I-A. Gia. For the old hag with the yellow teeth. And Monsieur Drummond, gentleman journalist. Gia. My teeth are very bad. Why, I wonder. Feel. That one is going too. Shells. Ought I go to a dentist, I wonder, with that money? That one? This? Toothless Kinch, the Superman. Why is that, I wonder? Or does it mean something, perhaps? My handkerchief. He threw it, I remember. Did I not take it up? His hand groped vainly in his pockets. No, I didn't. Better buy one. He laid the dry snot picked from his nostril on a ledge of rock. Carefully. For the rest, let look who will. Behind. Perhaps there is someone. He turned his face over a shoulder. Rear regardant. Moving through the air, high spars of a three-master. Her sails brailed up on the cross trees, homing upstream. Silently moving, a silent ship. End of chapter three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, section four. <laughs> Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices fried with crust crumbs, fried hencods rose. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of faintly scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen softly, writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid light air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right. She didn't like her plate full. Right. He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob, and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat. Its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly around a leg of the table with tail on high. Oh, there you are, Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked again stiffly around a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Purr, scratch my head. Purr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the life black form, clean to see, the gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. The cat cried. They call them stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive, too. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower? No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chicken she is, he said mockingly. Afraid of the chook-chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Cruel. Her nature. Curious mice never squeal. Seem to like it. The cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame-closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. 
He watched the dark eye slits narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went down to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubbled milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. She cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining wirely in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after. Why? They shine in the dark, perhaps the tips, or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs? No, no good, no good eggs with this drought. Want pure, fresh water. Thursday, not a good day either for mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter, a shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Lugach's. While the kettle is boiling, she, she lapped slower, then licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? To lap better, all porous holes. Nothing she can eat? He glanced round him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty. Thin bread and butter she likes in the morning. Still, perhaps once in a way. He said softly in the bare hall, I'm going round the corner, be back in a minute. And when he had heard his voice say it, he added, You don't want anything for breakfast? A soft, sleepy grunt answered, mm. No, she didn't want anything. He heard then a warm, heavy sigh, softer, as she turned over and the loose brass quats of the bedstead jingle. Must get those settled, really. Pity. All the way from Gibraltar. Forgotten any little Spanish she knew. Wonder what her father gave for it. Old style. Ah, yes, of course. Bought it at the governor's auction. Got a short knock. Hard as nails at a bargain, old Tweety. Yes, sir. At Plevna, that was. I rose from the ranks, sir, and I'm proud of it. Still, he had brains enough to make that corner in stamps. Now that was far seen. His hand took his hat from the peg over his initialed heavy overcoat and his lost property office second-hand waterproof. Stamps. Sticky back pictures. Dare say lots of officers are in the swim, too. Of course they do. The sweated legend in the crown of his hat told him mutely, Plaza's high grand ha. He peeped quickly inside the leather headband. White slip of paper, quite safe. On the doorsteps he felt in his hip pocket for the latch key, not there. In the trousers I left off, must get it. Potato I have, creaky wardrobe, no use disturbing her. She turned over sleepily that time. He pulled the hall door to after him very quietly, more, till the foot leaf dropped gently over the threshold. A limp lid, look shut. All right till I come back anyhow. He crossed to the bright side, avoiding the loose cellar flap of number 75. The sun was nearing the steeple of George's church. Be a warm day, I fancy. Especially in these black clothes, feel it more. Black conducts, reflects, refracts, is it? The heat. But I couldn't go in that light suit. Make a picnic of it. His eyelids sank quietly often as he walked in happy warmth. Boland's bread band delivering with trays are daily, but she prefers yesterday's loaves, turnovers, crisp crowns hot. Makes you feel young. Somewhere in the east, early morning, set off at dawn. Travel round in front of the sun. Steal a day's march on it. Keep it up. Forever never grow a day older, technically. Walk along a strand, strange land. Come to a city gate, sentry there, old ranker too, old Tweety's big mustaches, leaning on a long kind of spear. Wander through on streets, turbaned faces going by, dark caves of carpet shops, 
big man, Turco the Terrible, seated cross-legged, smoking a coiled pipe. Cries of sellers in the streets. Drink water scented with fennel sherbet. Dander all day long. Might meet a robber or two. Well, meet him. Getting on to sundown. The shadows of the mosques among the pillar priest with the scroll rolled up. A shiver of the trees, signal the evening wind. I pass on, fading gold sky. A mother watches me from her doorway. She calls her children home in their dark language. High wall, beyond strings twanged. Night sky, moon, violet. Color of Molly's new garters. Strings, listen. A girl playing one of those instruments. What do you call them? Dulcimers. I pass. Probably not a bit like it, really. Kind of stuff you read in the track of the sun. Sunburst on the title page. He smiled, pleasing himself. What Arthur Griffin said about the headpiece over the Freeman leader. A home rule sun rising up in the northwest from the laneway behind the Bank of Ireland. He prolonged his pretty smile. I could touch that. Home rule sun rising up in the northwest. He approached Larry O'Rourke's. From the cellar grating floated up the flabby gush of porter. Through the open doorway, the bar squirted out whiffs of ginger, tea dust, biscuit mush. Good house, however, just the end of city traffic. For instance, McGalley's down there, in G as position. Of course, if they ran a tram line along the North Circular from the cattle market to the quays, value would go up like a shot. Bald head over the blind, cute old codger. No use canvassing him for an ad. Still, he knows his own business best. There he is, sure enough, my bold Larry, leaning against the sugar bin in his shirt sleeves, watching the aproned curate swab up with mop and bucket. Simon Dallas takes him off to a tea with his eyes screwed up. Do you know what I'm going to tell you? What's that, Mr. O'Rourke? Do you know what? The Russians. They'd only be an eight o'clock breakfast for the Japanese. Stop and say a word. About the funeral, perhaps. Sad thing about poor Dingham, Mr. O'Rourke. Turning into Dorset Street, he said freshly in greeting through the doorway. Good day, O'Rourke. Good day to you. Lovely weather, sir. Tis all that. Tis all that. Oh, sorry. Where do they get the money? Coming up red-headed curates from the country, latrium, rinsing empties, an old man in the cellar. Then, lo and behold, they blossom out as Adam Finn latters or down talons. Then, thin of the competition, general thirst, good puzzle, would be cross Dublin without passing a pub. Save it, they can't. Off the drunks, perhaps. Put down three and carry five. What is that? A bob here and there, dribs and drabs. On the wholesale orders, perhaps. Doing a double shuffle with the town travellers. Square it with the boss, and we'll split the job. See? How much would that tot to off the porter in the month? Say, ten barrels of stuff? Say you got ten pence per cent off. Zero more. Fifteen? He passed St. Joseph's National School. Brats. Clamour. Windows open. Fresh air helps a memory. Or a lilt. Anbiish. Defigy. Killer men. Opicure. Rustovi. W. Boys are they? Yes. Inish Turk, Inish Shark, Inish Boffin, but they're jog free. Mine, Sliev, Bloom. He halted before Delgucci's window, staring at the hanks of sausages, polonies, black and white. Fifteen multiplied by. The figures whitened in his mind, unsolved, displeased. He let them fade. The shiny links packed with force meat fed his gaze and he breathed in tranquility with the lukewarm breath of the cooked spiced pig's blood. 
A kidney oozed blood gouts on the willow patterned dish, the last. He stood by the next door's girl at the counter. Would she buy it too? Calling the items from a slip in her hand, chapped, washing soda, and a pound and a half of Denny's sausages. His eyes rested on her vigorous hips. Wood, his name is. Wonder what he does. Wife is oldish. New blood. No followers allowed. Strong pair of arms. Whacking a carpet on the clothesline. She does whack it. By George. The way her crooked skirt swings at each whack. The ferreted-eyed pork butcher folded the sausages. He had snipped off with his blotchy fingers. Sausage pink. Sound meat there, like a stale-fed heifer. He took a page up from the pile of cut sheets. The model farm at Kinnereth on the lake shore of the Tiberius can become ideal winter sanatorium. Moss Montefiore, I thought he was. Farmhouse, wall round it, blurred cattle cropping. He held the page from him. Interesting. Read it nearer. The title, the blurred cropping cattle, the page rustling. A young white heifer. Those mornings in the cattle market, the beasts lowering in their pens, branded sheep, flop and fall of dung, the breeders in hobnailed boots trudging through the litter, slapping a palm on the ripened hindquarter. There's a prime one. Up peeled switches in their hands. He held the page aslant patiently, bending his senses and his will, his soft subject gaze at rest, the crooked skirt swinging, whack by whack by whack. The port butcher snapped two sheets from the pile, wrapped up her prime sausages, and made a red grimace. Now, my miss, he said. She tendered a coin, smiling boldly, holding her thick wrist out. Thank you, my miss, and one shilling threepence change for you, please. Mr. Boom pointed quickly to catch up and walk behind her if she went slowly, behind her moving hands. Pleasant to see the first thing in the morning. Hurry up, damn it. Make hay while the sun shines. She stood outside the shop in sunlight and sauntered lazily to the right. He sighed down his nose. They never understand. Soda chapped hands, crusted toenails too, brown scapulars in tatters, defending her both ways. The sting of disregard glowed to weak pleasure within his breast. For another, a constable off duty, cuddling her in Eccles Lane, they like them sizable, prime sausage. Zero, please, Mr. Policeman. I'm lost in the wood. Threepence, please. His hand accepted the moist, tender gland and slipped it into his side pocket. Then it fetched up three coins from his trousers pocket and laid them on the rubber prickles. They lay, were read quickly, and quickly slid, disc by dicks, into the till. Thank you, sir. Another time. A speck of eager fire from the foxy eyes thanked him. He withdrew his gaze after an instant. No, better not. Another time. Good morning, he said, moving away. Good morning, sir. No sign. Gone. What matter? He walked back along Dorset Street, reading gravely. Agendath Natan Planters Company to purchase waste sandy tracts from Turkish government and plant with eucalyptus trees. Excellent for shade, fuel and construction. Orange groves and immense melon fields north of Jaffa. You pay 80 marks and they plant a dunam of land for you with olives, oranges, almonds or citrons. Olives cheaper. Oranges need artificial irrigation. Every year you get a sending of the crop. Your name entered for life as owner in the Book of the Union can pay ten down in the balance in yearly installments. 
Liebestrasse, 34, Berlin, West 15. Nothing doing. Still an idea behind it. He looked at the cattle, blurred in silver heat, silver powdered olive trees, quiet long days, pruning, ripening. Olives are packed in jars, eh? I have a few left from Andrews. Molly spitting them out, knows the taste of them now. Oranges in tissue paper, packed in crates. Citrons, too. Wonder, is poor Citron still in St. Kevin's Parade? And Mastiansky with the old Sither. Pleasant evenings we had then. Molly in Citron's basket chair. Nice to hold, cool waxen fruit, hold in the hand, lift it to the nostrils and smell the perfume. Like that, heavy, sweet, wild perfume. Always the same, year after year. They fetched high prices too, Moisa told me. Our Buddhist place, pleasant street, pleasant old times. Must be without a flaw, he said. Coming all that way, Spain, Gibraltar, Mediterranean, the Levant. Crates lined up on the quayside at Jaffa. Chap ticking them off in a book. Navvies handling them barefoot in soiled dungarees. There's, what do you call him out of? How do you? Doesn't see. Chap, you know, just to salute, bit of a bore. His back is like that Norwegian captain's. Wonder if I'll meet him today. Watering cart. To provoke the rain. On earth as it is in heaven. A cloud began to cover the sun, slowly, holy, gray, far. No, not like that. A barren land, bare waste, volcanic lake, the dead sea, no fish, weedless, sunk deep in the earth. No wind could lift those waves, gray metal, poisonous, foggy waters. Brimstone, they called it, raining down, the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Edom, all dead names, a dead sea in a dead land, gray and old old now. It bore the oldest, the first race, a bent hag crossed from Cassidy's, clutching a nagging bottle by the neck. The oldest people wandered far away over all the earth, captivity to captivity, multiplying, dying, being born everywhere. It lay there now. Now it could bear no more dead and old woman's, the gray sunken cunt of the world. Desolation. Gray horror seared his flesh. Folding the page into his pocket, he turned into Echo Street, hurrying homeward. Cold oil slid along his veins, chilling his blood, age crusting him with a salt cloak. Well, I am here now. Yes, I am here now. Morning mouth bad images. Got up wrong side of the bed. Must begin again those sandals exercises on the hands down. Blotchy brown brick houses. Number 80 still unlet. Why is that? Valuation is only 28. Towers, Battersby, North, MacArthur. Parlor windows plastered with bills. Plasters on a sore eye to smell the gentle smoke of tea. Fume of the pan, sizzling butter. Be near her, ample, bed-warmed flesh. Yes, yes. Quick, warm sunlight came running from Berkeley Road, swiftly, in slim sandals, along the brightening footpath. Runs, she runs to meet me, a girl with gold hair on the wind. Two letters and a card lay on the hall floor. He stooped and gathered them. Mrs. Marion Bloom. His quickened heart slowed at once. Bold hand, Miss Marion. Poldy! Entering the bedroom, he half closed his eyes and walked through warm yellow twilight towards her tousled head. Who are the letters for? He looked at them. Mullingar, Millie. A letter for me from Millie, he said carefully, and a card to you, and a letter for you. He laid her card and letter on the twill bedspread near the curve of her knees. Do you want the blind up? Letting the blind up by gentle tugs halfway, his backward eye saw her glance at the letter and tuck it under her pillow. That do, he asked, turning. She was reading the card, propped on her elbow. She got the things, she said. He waited till she had laid the card aside and curled herself back slowly with a snug sigh. Hurry up with that tea, she said. I'm parched. The kettle is boiling, he said. But he delayed to clear the chair, her striped petticoat, tossed soiled linen, and lifted in, all, in an armful on the foot of the bed. As he went down the kitchen stairs, she called, Poldy! What? Scald the teapot. On the boil, sure enough, a plume of steam from the spout. 
He scalded and rinsed out the teapot and put in four full spoons of tea, tilting the kettle then to let the water flow in. Having set it to draw, he took off the kettle, crushed the pan flat on the live coals, and watched the lump of butter slide and melt. While he unwrapped the kidney, the cat mewed hungrily against him. Give her too much meat, she won't mouse. So they won't eat pork, kosher. Here, he let the blood-smeared paper fall to her and dropped the kidney amid the sizzling butter sauce. Pepper? He sprinkled it through his fingers, ringwise from the chipped egg cup. Then he slid open his letter, glancing down the page and over. Thanks, New Tam, Mr. Collin, Lock Owl Picnic, Young Student, Blazes Bowl, and Seaside Girls. The tea was drawn. He filled his own mustache cup, sham crown, derby, smiling. Silly Millie's birthday gift. Only five she was then. Uh, no, wait, four. I gave her the ambroid necklace she broke, putting pieces of folded brown paper in the letterbox for her. He smiled, pouring. Oh, Millie Bloom, you are my darling. You are my looking glass from night to morning. I'd rather have you without a farthing than Katie Keon with their ass and garden. Poor old Professor Goodwin. Dreadful old case. Still, he was a courteous old chap. Old-fashioned way he used to bow Molly off the platform. And the little mirror in his silk hat. The night Millie brought it into the parlor. <gasps> Look what I found in Professor Goodwin's hat! We all laughed. Sex breaking out even then. Her little piece she was. He prodded a fork into the kidney and slapped it over, then fitted the teapot on the tray. Its hump bumped as he took it up. Everything on it? Bread and butter, four, sugar, spoon, cream, yeah. He carried it upstairs, his thumb hooked in the teapot handle. Nudging the door open with his knee, he carried the tray in and set it on the chair by the bedhead. What a time you were, she said. He set the, she set the pillow brasses jingling as she raised herself briskly, an elbow on the pillow. He looked calmly down on her bulk and between her large, soft bubs, sloping within her nightdress like a she-goat's udder. The warmth of her couched body rose on the air, mingling with the fragrance of the tea she poured. A strip of torn envelope peeped from under the dimpled pillow. In the act of going, he stayed to straighten the bedspread. Who was the letter from? he asked. Bold hand, Marion. Oh, Boylan, she said. He's bringing the program. What are you singing? La Chia Darem with J.C. Doyle, she said, and, and Love's Old Sweet Song. Her full lips drinking smiled. Rather stale smell that incense leaves next day, like flou foul flower water. Would you like the window open a little? She doubled a slice of bread in her mouth, asking, What time is the funeral? Eleven, I think, he answered. I didn't see the paper. Following the pointing of her finger, he took up a leg of her soiled drawers from the bed. No? Then a twisted gray garter looped round a stocking, rumpled shiny sole. No, that book. Other stocking? Her petticoat? It must have fell down, she said. He felt here and there. Voglio e non vore. Wonder if she pronounces that right, Voglio. Not in the bed, must have slid down. He stooped and lifted the valence. The book, fallen, sprawled against the bulge of the orange-keyed chamber pot. Show here, she said. I put a mark in it. There's a word I want to ask you. She swallowed a draft of tea from her cup and hel held by the knot handle, and having wiped her fingers smartly on the blanket, began to search the text with her, with her hairpin till she reached the word. Met him what? he asked. Here, she said. What does that mean? He leaned downward and read near her polished thumbnail. Metempsychosis? Yeah. Who's he when he's at home? Metempsychosis, he said, frowning. It's Greek, from the Greek. That means the transmigration of souls. Oh, rocks, she said. Tell us in plain words. He smiled, glancing askance at her mocking eyes. Same young eyes. First night after the charades, Dolphin's Barn. He turned over the smudged pages. Ruby, the pride of the ring. Hello, illustration. Fierce Italian with carriage whip. Must be Ruby pride of the on the floor naked. She kindly lent. The monster mafia desisted and flung his victim from him with an oath. Cruelty behind it all. Doped animals, trapeze at hanglers. Had to look the other way. Mob gaping. Break your neck and we'll break our sides. Families of them. Bone them young so they met him psychosis. That we live with after death. 
our souls, that a man's soul after he's di he dies, dignum soul. Did you finish it? He asked. Yeah, she said. There's nothing smutty in it. Was she in love with the first fellow all the time? Never read it. Do you want another? Yes. Get another of Paul de Cox. Nice name he has. She poured more tea into her cup, watching it flow sideways. Must get that Capel Street Library book renewed, or they'll write to Kearney, my guarantor. Oh, reincarnation, that's the word. Some people believe, he said, that we go on living in another body after death that we lived before. They call it reincarnation, that we all lived before on the earth thousands of years ago, or some other planet. They say we've forgotten it. They say, some say they remember their past lives. The sluggish cream wound curdling spirals through her tea. Bet reminded her of the word metempsychosis. An example would be better. An example? The bath of the nymph over the bed, given away with the Easter number of photo bits. Splendid masterpiece in art colors. Tea before you put milk in? Not unlike her with her hair down, slimmer. Three and six I gave for the frame. She said it would look nice over the bed, naked nymphs, grease, and for all instance, and for instance, all the people that lived then. He turned the pages back. Metempsychosis, he said, is what the ancient Greeks called it. They used to believe you could be changed into an animal or a tree, for instance, what they called nymphs, for example. Her spoons ceased to stir up the sugar. She gazed straight before her, inhaling through her arched nostrils. There's a smell of burn, she said. Did you leave anything on the fire? <gasps> the kidney, he cried suddenly. He fitted the book roughly into his inner pocket and stubbing his toes against the broken commode, hurried out toward the smell, stepping hastily down the stairs with a flurried stalk's legs. Pungent smoke shot up in an angry jet from a side of the pan. By prodding a prong of the fork under the kidney, he detached it and turned it turtle on its back, only a little burnt. He tossed it off the pan onto a plate and let the scanty brown gravy trickle over it. Cup of tea now. He sat down, cut and buttered a slice of the loaf. He shore away the burnt flesh and flung it to the cat. Then he put a forkful into his mouth, chewing with discernment the toothsome pliant meat, done to a turn. A mouthful of tea, then he cut away the dyes of bread, sopped one in the gravy and put it in his mouth. What was that about some young student and a picnic? He creased out the letter at his side, reading it slowly as he chewed, sopping another dye of bread in the gravy and raising it to his mouth. Dearest Papley, thanks ever so much for the lovely birthday present. It suits me splendid. Everyone says I'm quite the belle in my new tan. I got mummy's lovely box of creams and I'm writing. They are lovely. I'm getting on swimming in the photo business now. Mr. Coglin took one of me, and Mrs. will send when developed. We did great biz yesterday. Fair day and all the beef to the heels we're in. We are going to Loch Owl on Monday with a few friends to make a scrap picnic. Give my love to Mummy and to yourself a big kiss and thanks. I hear them at the piano downstairs. There is to be a concert in the Grenville Arms on Saturday. There is a young student comes here some evenings named Bannon. His cousins or something are big swells. And he sings Boylan's, I was on the pop of writing Blazer's Boylan's, song about those seaside girls. Tell him Silly Millie sends his best respects. I must now close with fondest love, your fond daughter, Millie. P.S. Excuse bad writing, am in hurry. Bye-bye, M. Fifteen yesterday, curious fifteenth of the month too, her first birthday away from home, separation, remember the summer morning she was born, running to knock up Mrs. Thornton in Denzel Street, jolly old woman, lots of babies she must have helped into the world, she knew from the first poor little Rudy wouldn't live, well, God is good sir, she knew at once, he would be eleven now if he had lived, his vacant face stared pityingly at the postscript, excuse bad writing, hurry, Piano downstairs, coming out of her shell. Row with her in the XL cafe about the bracelet. Wouldn't eat her cakes or speak or look, sauce box. He sopped other dyes of bread in the gravy and ate piece after piece of kidney. Twelve and six a week. Not much. Still, she might do worse. Music hall stage, young student. He drank a draught of cooler tea to wash down his meal. Then he read the letter again, twice. Oh well. 
she knows how to mind herself. But if not, no, nothing has happened. Of course it might. Wait, in any case, until it does. A wild piece of goods, of slim legs running up the staircase. Destiny ripening now. Vain, very. He smiled with troubled affection at the kitchen window. Day I caught her in the street, pinching her cheeks to make them red, anemic a little, was given milk too long. On the errands king that day, round the kish, damned old tub pitching about, not a bit funky. Her pale blue scarf loose in the wind with her hair. All dimpled cheeks and curls, your head it simply swirls. Seaside girls, torn envelope hands, stuck in his trousers pockets, Javi off for the day, singing. Friend of the family, swirls, he says, peer with lamps, summer evening band, those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Millie too, young kisses, the first, far away now past, Mrs. Marion, Redding, lying back now, counting the strands of her hair, smiling, braiding. A soft qualm, regret, flowed down his backbone, increasing. Will happen, yes, prevent, useless, can't move. Girl's sweet, light lips will happen too. He felt the flowing qualm spread over him, useless to move now, lips kissed, kissing kissed, full gluey women's lips. Better where she is down there, away, occupier, wanted a dog to pass the time. Might take a trip down there, August, bank holiday, only two and six return, six weeks off, however. Might work a press pass or through McCoy. The cat, having cleaned all her fur, returned to the meat-stained paper, nosed at it and stalked to the door. She looked back at him, mewing, Wants to go out. Wait before a door sometime. It will open. Let her wait. Has the fidgets. Electric thunder in the air. Was washing at her ear with her back to the fire, too. He felt heavy, full. Then a gentle loosening of his bowels. He stood up, undoing the waistband of his trousers. The cat mewed at him. Meow, he said in answer. Wait till I'm ready. Heaviness, hot day coming, too much trouble to fag up the stairs to the landing. A paper, he liked to read at stool, hope no ape comes knocking just as I'm... In the table drawer he found an old number of titbits. He folded it under his armpit, went to the door and opened it. The cat went up in soft bounds, ah, wanted to go upstairs, curl up in a ball on the bed. Listening, he heard her voice. Come, come, pussy, come. He went out through the back door into the garden, stood to listen towards the next garden. No sound. Perhaps hanging clothes out to dry. The maid was in the garden. Fine morning. He bent down to regard a lean file of spearmint growing up the wall. Make a summer house here. Scarlet runners, Virginia creepers, Want to manure the whole place over, scabby soil, a coat of liver of sulfur, all soil like that without dung, household slops, loam. What is this that is? The hens in the next garden, their droppings are very good top dressing. Best of all, though, are the cattle, especially they, when they are fed on those oil cakes, mulch of dung. Best thing to clean ladies' kid gloves. Dirty cleans. Ashes, too. Reclaim the whole place. Grow peas in that corner there. Lettuce. Always have fresh greens, then. Still, gardens have their drawbacks. That bee or blue bottle here, Whit Monday. He walked on. Where's my hat, by the way? Must have put it back on the peg. Or hanging up on the floor. Funny, I don't remember that. Hall stand too full. Four umbrellas, her rain cloak. Picking up the letters. Drago's shop bell ringing. Queer, I was just thinking that moment. Brown brilliantined hair over his collar. Just had a wash and brush up. Wonder, have I time for a bath this morning? Terra Street. Chap in the pay box. There got away James Stevens, they say. O'Brien. Deep voice that fellow Dlugach has. Agenda, what is it? Now, my miss, enthusiast.
He kicked open the crazy door of the Jake's. Better be careful not to get these trousers dirty for the funeral. He went in, bowing his head under the low lintel. Leaving the door ajar, amid the stench of moldy lime wash and stale cobwebs, he undid his braces. Before sitting down, he peered through a chink at the next door windows. The king was in his counting house. Nobody. A squat on the cuck stool, he folded out his paper, turning its pages over on his bared knees. Something new and easy. No great hurry. Keep it a bit. Our prize titbit. Matcham's Master Stroke. Written by Mr. Philip Beaufoy, Playgor Playgoers Club, London. Payment at the rate of one guinea a column has been made to the writer. Three and a half. Three pounds, three, three pounds, thirteen, six. Quietly he read, restraining himself. The first column and, yielding but resisting, began the second. Midway, his last resistance yielding, he allowed his bowels to ease themselves quietly as he read, reading still patiently, that slight constipation of yesterday quite gone. Hope it's not too big, bring on piles again. No, just right. So, ah, uh, costive. One tabloid of Cascara Sagrada. Life might be so. It did not move or touch him, but it was something quick and neat. Print anything now. Silly season. He read on, seated, calm above his own rising smell. Neat, certainly. Matcham often thinks of the masterstroke by which he won the laughing witch who now begins and ends morally, hand in hand. Smart. He glanced back through what he had read and, while feeling his water flow quietly, he envied kindly Mr. Beaufoy who had written it and received payment of three pounds thirteen and six. Might manage a sketch by Mr. and Mrs. L. M. Bloom. Invent a story for some proverb. Which? Time I used to try jotting down on my cuff what she said dressing. Dislike dressing together. Nicked myself shaving. Biting her nether lip. Hooking the placket of her skirt. Timing her. 9.15. Did Roberts pay you yet? 9.20. What had Greta Conroy on? 9.23. What possessed me to buy this comb? 9.24. I'm swelled after all that cabbage, a speck of dust on the patent leather of her boot. Rubbing smartly in turn each welt against her stocking calf. Morning after the bazaar dance when May's band played Poncielli's Dance of the Hours. Explain that. Morning hours. Noon. Then evening coming on. Then night hours. Washing her teeth. That was the first night. Her head dancing her fantastics clicking. Is that Boylan well off? He has money. Why? I noticed he had a good rich smell off his breath dancing. No use humming then. Allude to it. Strange kind of music that last night. The mirror was in shadow. She rubbed her hand glass briskly on her woolen vest against her full wagging bub. Peering into it, lines in her eyes. It wouldn't pan out somehow. Evening hours, girls in gray gauze. Night hours then, black with daggers and eye masks. Poetical idea, pink, then golden, then gray, then black. Still true to life also, day, then the night. He tore away half the prize story sharply and wiped himself with it. Then he girded up his trousers, braced and buttoned himself. He pulled back the jerky, shaky door of the jakes and came forth from the gloom into the air. In the bright light, lightened and cooled in limb, he eyed carefully his black trousers, the ends, the knees, the huffs of the knees. What time is the funeral? Better find out in the paper. A creak and a dark whir in the air high up. The bells of George's church. They told the hour, loud, dark, iron. Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. 
Quarter two. There again, the overtone following through the air. A third. Poor Dignum. Does have a couple End of section four. Read by David Cozy. Kasumi. Susan Hooks. Robin Hunt. Todd McQuillan. Kristen McQuillan. Jeremy Hidley. Tokyo, Japan, November, December 7th, 2005. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses, Chapter 5. By lorries along Sir John Rogerson's Quay, Mr. Bloom walked soberly, past Windmill Lane, Leesk's The Linseed Crusher, the Postal Telegraph Office. Could have given that address, too, and passed the sailor's home. He turned from the morning noises of the quayside, and walked through Lime Street. By Brady's cottages a boy for the skins lolled, his bucket of offal linked, smoking a chewed fagbutt. A smaller girl with scars of eczema on her forehead eyed him, listlessly holding her battered cask hoop. Tell him if he smokes he won't grow. Oh, let him. His life isn't such a bed of roses. Waiting outside pubs to bring Da home. Come home to Ma, Da. Slack hour. Won't be many there. He crossed Townsend Street, past the frowning face of Bethel. L, yes. House of Aleph Beth, and past Nichols the Undertaker. At eleven it is. Time enough. Dare say Corny Kelleher bagged the job for O'Neill's, singing with his eyes shut. Corny. Met her once in the park, in the dark. What a lark. Police tout. Her name and address she then told with my turalum turalum te. Oh, surely he bagged it. Bury him cheap in a whatchamacallit. With my turalum 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 turalum. In Westland Row, he halted before the windows of the Belfast and Oriental Tea Company and read the legends of lead-papered packets, choice blend, finest quality family tea. Rather warm, tea. Must get some from Tom Kernan. Couldn't ask him at a funeral, though. While his eyes still read blandly, he took off his hat quietly, inhaling his hair oil, and sent his right hand with slow grace over his brow and hair. Very warm morning. Under their dropped lids, his eyes found the tiny bow of the leather headband inside his high-grade hat. Just there, his right hand came down into the bowl of his hat. His fingers found quickly a card behind the headband and transferred it to his waistcoat pocket. So warm. His right hand once more slowly went over his brow and hair. Then he put on his hat again, relieved, and read again. Choice blend, made of the finest Ceylon brands, the Far East. Lovely spot it must be. The garden of the world, big lazy leaves to float about on, cactuses, flowering meads, snaky lianas, they call them. Wonder is it like that. Those Singalese lobbing about in the sun in dolce far niente, not doing a hand's turn all day, sleep six months out of twelve, too hot to quarrel influence of the climate, lethargy, flowers of idleness. The air feeds most, as oats, hothouse in botanic gardens, sensitive plants, water lilies, petals too tired to, sleeping sickness in the air, walk on rose leaves, imagine trying to eat tripe and cow heel. Where was the chap I saw in that picture somewhere? 
Ah, yes, in the Dead Sea, floating on his back, reading a book with a parasol open. Couldn't sink if you tried, so thick with salt. Because the weight of the water... Uh, no, the weight of the body in the water is equal to the weight of the... what? Or is it the volume is equal to the weight? It's a law, something like that. Vance in high school, cracking his finger joints, teaching... The college curriculum. Cracking curriculum. What is weight really when you say the weight? Thirty-two feet per second per second. Law of falling bodies per second per second. They all fall to the ground. The earth. It's the force of gravity of the earth is the weight. He turned away and sauntered across the road. How did she walk with her sausages? Like that something. As he walked, he took the folded freeman from his side pocket, unfolded it, rolled it lengthwise in a baton, and tapped it at each sauntering step against his trouser leg. Careless air. Just drop in to see. Per second, per second. Per second for every second it means. From the curbside he darted a keen glance through the door of the post office. Too late, box. Post here. No one. In. He handed the card through the brass grill. Are there any letters for me? he asked. While the postmistress searched a pigeonhole he gazed at the recruiting poster with soldiers of all arms on parade and held the tip of his baton against his nostrils, smelling fresh-printed rag paper. No answer, probably. Went too far last time. The postmistress handed him back through the grill his card with a letter. He thanked her and glanced rapidly at the typed envelope. Henry Flower, Esquire, care of P.O. Box, Westland Row, City. Answered anyhow. He slipped card and letter into his side pocket, reviewing again the soldiers on parade. Where's old Tweedy's regiment? Cast-off soldier. There, bearskin cap and hackle plume. No, he's a grenadier. Pointed cuffs. There he is, Royal Dublin Fusiliers, red coats. Too showy. That must be why the women go after them. Uniform. Easier to enlist and drill. Maud Gon's letter about taking them off O'Connell Street at night. Disgrace to our Irish capital. Griffith's paper is on the same tack now, an army rotten with venereal disease, overseas or half-seas over empire. Half-baked they look, hypnotized like eyes front, mark time, table, able, bed, id. The king's own. Never see him dress up as a fireman or a bobby. A mason? Yes. He strolled out of the post office and turned to the right. Talk, as if that would mend matters. His hand went into his pocket, and a forefinger felt its way under the flap of the envelope, ripping it open in jerks. Women will pay a lot of heed, I don't think. His fingers drew forth the letter, the letter and crumpled the envelope in his pocket. Something pinned on, photo, perhaps, hair, and no. McCoy, get rid of him quickly. Take me out of my way. Hate company when you... Hello, Bloom, where are you off to? Hello, McCoy, nowhere in particular. How's the body? Fine, how are you? Oh, just keep him alive, McCoy said. His eyes on the black tie and clothes. He asked with low respect. Is there any... No oh, trouble, I hope. I, I see you're... Oh, no, Mr. Bloom said. Poor Dignam, you know. The funeral is today. To be sure, poor fellow. So it is. What time? A photo it isn't. A badge, maybe. Uh, eleven, Mr. Bloom answered. I must try to get out there, McCoy said. Eleven, is it? I only heard it last night. Who is telling me? Uh, Hollahan, you know Hoppy. 
I know. Mr. Bloom gazed across the road at the outsider drawn up before the door of the Grosvenor. The porter hoisted the valise up on the well. She stood still, waiting, while the man, husband, brother, like her, searched his pockets for change. Stylish kind of coat with that roll collar. Warm for a day like this. Looks like blanket cloth. Careless stand of her with her hands in those patch pockets, like that haughty creature at the polo match. Women all for caste till you touch the spot. Handsome is and handsome does. Reserved about to yield. The honourable Mrs. and Brutus is an honourable man. Possess her once, take the starch out of her. I was with Bob Doran. He's on one of his periodical bends, and what do you call him? A bantam Lyons, uh, just down there in Conway's we were. Doran Lyons in Conway's. She raised a gloved hand to her hair. In came Hoppy. Having a wet. Drawing back his head and gazing far from beneath his veiled eyelids, he saw the bright fawn skin shine in the glare, the braided drums. Clearly I can see today. Moisture about gives long sight, perhaps. Talking of one thing or another. Lady's hand. Which side will she get up? And he said, sad thing about our poor friend Paddy. What Paddy, I said. Poor little Paddy Dignam, he said. Off to the country. Broadstone, probably. High brown boots with laces dangling. Well-turned foot. What is he foostering over that change for? Sees me looking. Eye out for other fellows, always. Good fallback. Two strings to her bow. Why, I said. What's wrong with him, I said. Proud, rich, silk stockings. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He moved a little to the side of McCoy's talking head, getting up in a minute. What's wrong with him, he said. He's dead, he said, and faith he filled up. Is it Paddy Dignam, I said. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. I was with him no later than Friday last, or Thursday was it, in the arch. I yes, he said, he's gone. He died on Monday, poor fellow. Watch, watch. Silk, flash, rich stockings, white watch. A heavy tram car honking its gong slewed between. Lost it. Curse your noisy pug nose. Feels locked out of it. Paradise and the Perry. Always happening like that. The very moment. Girl in Eustace Street, halfway Monday. Was it settling her garter? Her friend covering the display of it. Esprit de corps. Well, what are you gaping at? Yes, yes, Mr. Bloom said after a dull sigh. Another gone. One of the best, McCoy said. The tram passed. They drove off towards the loop-line bridge, her rich gloved hand on the steel grip. Flicker, flicker, the lace flare of her hat in the sun. Flicker, flick. Wife well, I suppose, McCoy's changed voice said. Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tip-top, thanks. He unrolled the newspaper baton idly and read idly. What is home without plum trees potted meat? Incomplete. With it... An abode of bliss. My missus has got an engagement. At least it's not settled yet. Valise tack again. By the way, no harm. I'm off that, thanks. Mr. Bloom turned his large lidded eyes with unhasty friendliness. My wife, too, he said. She's going to sing at a swagger affair in the Ulster Hall, Belfast, on the 25th. That's so, McCoy said. Glad to hear that, old man. Who's getting it up? Mrs. Marion Bloom, not up yet. Queen was in her bedroom eating bread and... No book. Blackened court cards laid along her thigh by sevens. Dark lady and fair man. Letter. Cat, furry, black ball. Torn strip of envelope. 
Love's old sweet song comes love's old. It's a kind of tour, don't you see? Mr. Bloom said thoughtfully. Sweet song. There's a committee formed, part shares and part profits. McCoy nodded, picking at his mustache double. Oh, well, he said, that's good news. He moved to go. Well, glad to see you're looking fit, he said. Meet you knocking around. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. Tell you what, McCoy said. You might put down my name at the funeral, will you? I'd like to go, but I mightn't be able, you see. There's a drowning case at Sandy Cove may turn up, and then the coroner and myself would have to go down if the body is found. You just shove in my name if I'm not there, will you? I'll do that, Mr. Bloom said, moving to get off. That'll be all right. Right, McCoy said brightly. Thanks, old man. I'd go if I possibly could. Well, till all. Just C.P. McCoy will do. That will be done, Mr. Bloom answered firmly. Didn't catch me napping that wheeze, the quick touch, soft mark. I'd like my job. Valise I have a particularly fancy for leather, capped corners, riveted edges, double action, lever lock. Bob Cowley lent him his for the Wicklow Regatta concert last year and never heard tidings of it from that good day till this. Mr. Bloom, strolling towards Brunswick Street, smiled. My missus has just gotten. Reedy, freckled soprano. Cheese-pairing nose. Nice enough in its way, for a little ballad. No guts in it. You and me, don't you know, in the same boat. Soft soaping. Give you the needle, that would. Can't he hear the difference? Think he's that way inclined a bit. Against my grain, somehow. Thought that Belfast would fetch him. I hope that smallpox up there doesn't get worse. Suppose she wouldn't let herself be vaccinated again. Your wife and my wife. Wonder, is he pimping after me? Mr. Bloom stood at the corner, his eyes wandering over the multicolored hoardings. Cantrell and Cochrane's ginger ale. Aromatic, Cleary's summer sale. No, he's going on straight. Hello, Leah tonight. Mrs. Bandman Palmer, like to see her again in that. Hamlet she played last night, male impersonator. Perhaps he was a woman. Why, Ophelia committed suicide. Poor Papa. How he used to talk of Kate Bateman in that. Outside the Adelphi in London, waited all the afternoon to get in, year before I was born, that was, sixty-five, and Ristori in Vienna. What is this the right name is? By Mosenthal it is. Rachel, is it? No. The scene he was always talking about where the old blind Abraham recognizes the voice and puts his fingers on the face. Nathan's voice. His son's voice. I hear the voice of Nathan who left his father to die of grief and misery in my arms. Who left the house of his father and left the God of his father. Every word is so deep, Leopold. Poor Papa. Poor man. I'm glad I didn't go into the room to look at his face that day. Oh dear, oh dear. Phew. Well, perhaps it was best for him. Mr. Bloom went round the corner and passed the drooping nags of the hazard. No use thinking of it any more. Nosebag time. Wish I hadn't met that McCoy fellow. He came nearer and heard a crunching of gilded oats, the gently chomping teeth. Their full buck eyes regarded him as he went by, amid the sweet oaten reek of horse piss. Their El Dorado... Poor jugginses. Damn all they know or care about anything with their long noses stuck in their nose bags. Too full for words. Still they get their feet all right and their doss. Gelded too. 
a stump of black gutta percha wagging limp between their haunches. Might be happy all the same that way. Good poor brutes they look. Still, their neigh can be very irritating. He drew the letter from his pocket and folded it into the newspaper he carried. Might just walk into her here. The lane is safer. He passed the cabman's shelter. Curious, the life of drifting cabbies. All weathers, all places, time are set down. No will of their own. Voglio e non. Like to give them an odd cigarette. Sociable. Shout a few flying syllables as they pass. He hummed. La si derem la mano. La 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 la. He turned into Cumberland Street, going on some paces, halted in the lee of the station wall. No one. Mead's timber yard, piled bulks, ruins, and tenements. With careful tread he passed over a hopscotch court with its forgotten picky stone. Not a sinner. Near the timber yard a squatted child at marbles alone, shooting the taw with a cunny thumb. A wise tabby, a blinking sphinx, watched from her warm sill. Pity to disturb them. Mohammed cut a piece out of his mantle not to wake her. Open it. And once I played marbles when I went to that old dame's school. She liked Minonette, Mrs. Ellis's, and Mr. He opened the letter within the newspaper. A flower, I think it's a... A yellow flower with flattened petals. Not annoyed, then. What does she say? Dear Henry, I got your last letter to me, and thank you very much for it. I'm sorry you did not like my last letter. Why did you enclose the stamps? I'm awfully angry with you. I do wish I could punish you for that. I called you naughty boy because I do not like that other word. Please tell me, what is the real meaning of that word? Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? I do wish I could do something for you. Please tell me what you think of poor me. I often think of the beautiful name you have. Dear Henry, when will we meet? I think of you so often you have no idea. I have never felt myself so much drawn to a man as you. I feel so bad about it. Please write me a long letter and tell me more. Remember, if you do not, I will punish you. So now you know what I will do to you, you naughty boy, if you do not write. Oh, how I long to meet you. Henry, dear, do not deny my request before my patience are exhausted. Then I will tell you all. Goodbye now, naughty darling. I have such a bad headache day, and write by return to your longing Martha. P.S. Do tell me what kind of perfume does your wife use. I want to know. He tore the flower gravely from its pinhole, smelt its almost no smell, and placed it in his heart pocket. Language of flowers. They like it because no one can hear, or a poison bouquet to strike him down. Then walking slowly forward, he read the letter again, murmuring here and there a word. Angry tulips with you, darling man-flower, punish your cactus if you don't please poor forget-me-not. How I long violets to hear roses when we soon anemone meet all naughty night-stock wife Martha's perfume. Having read it all, he took it from the newspaper and put it back in his side pocket. Weak joy opened his lips, changed since the first letter. Wonder did she wrote it herself, doing the indignant. A girl of good family like me, respectable character, could meet one Sunday after the rosary. Thank you, not having any. Usual love scrimmage, then running round corner, bad as a row with Molly. A cigar has a cooling effect, narcotic. Go further next time. Naughty boy. Punish. Afraid of words, of course. Brutal, why not? Try it anyhow. A bit at a time. 
Fingering still the letter in his pocket, he drew the pin out of it. Common pin, eh? He threw it on the road, out of her clothes somewhere, pinned together. Queer the number of pins they always have. No roses without thorns. Flat Dublin voices bawled in his head, those two sluts that night in the coombe, linked together in the rain. Oh, Mary lost the pin of her drawers. She didn't know what to do, to keep it up, to keep it up. It? Them. Such a bad headache. Has her roses, probably. We're sitting all day typing. I focus bad for stomach nerves. What perfume does your wife use? Now, could you make out a thing like that? To keep it up. Martha. Mary. I saw that picture somewhere. I forget now. Old master or faked for money. He is sitting in their house talking mysterious. Also the two sluts in the coom would listen. To keep it up. Nice kind of evening feeling. No more wandering about. Just loll there. Quiet dusk. Let everything rip. Forget. Tell about places you've been. Strange customs. The other one jar on her head was getting the supper, fruit, olives, lovely cool water out of a well, stone cold like the hole in the wall at Ashtown. Must carry a paper goblet next time I go to the trotting matches. She listens with big dark soft eyes. Tell her, more and more, all, then a sigh, silence, long, long, long rest. Going under the railway arch, he took out the envelope, tore it swiftly in shreds, and scattered them towards the road. The shreds fluttered away, sank in the dank air, a white flutter, then all sank. Henry Flower. You could tear up a cheque for a hundred pounds in the same way. Simple bit of paper. Lord Ivy once cashed a seven-figure cheque for a million in the Bank of Ireland. Shows you the money to be made out of porter. Still, the other brother, Lord Ardelon, has to change his shirt four times a day, they say. Skin breeds lice or vermin. A million pounds. Wait a moment. Two pence a pint, four pence a quart, eight pence a gallon of porter. No, one and four pence a gallon of porter. One and four into twenty, fifteen about... Yes, exactly. Fifteen millions of barrels of porter. What am I saying? Barrels, gallons, about a million barrels all the same. An incoming train clanked heavily above his head, coach after coach. Barrels bumped in his head. Dull porter slopped and churned inside. The bungholes sprang open and a huge dull flood leaked out, flowing together, winding through mud flats all over the level land, a lazy, pooling swirl of liquor bearing along wide-leaved flowers of its froth. He had reached the open back door of All Hallows. Stepping into the porch, he doffed his hat, took the card from his pocket, and tucked it again behind the leather headband. Damn it! I might have tried to work McCoy for a pass to Mullingar. Same note as on the door. Sermon by the very Reverend John Conmee, S.J., on St. Peter Claver, S.J., and the African mission. Prayers for the conversion of Gladstone they had, too, when he was almost unconscious. The Protestants are the same. Convert Dr. William J. Walsh, D.D., to the true religion. Save China's millions. Wonder how they explain it to the heathen Chinese. Prefer an ounce of opium. Celestials. Rank heresy for them. Buddha, their god, lying on his side in the museum taking it easy with his hand under his cheek, jaw sticks burning, not like Ecce Homo, crown of thorns and cross. Clever idea, St. Patrick the Shamrock. Chopsticks? Con me. Martin Cunningham knows him. Distinguished looking. Sorry I didn't work him about getting Molly into the choir instead of that Father Farley, who looked a fool but wasn't. 
They're taught that. He's not going out in bluey specks with the sweat rolling off him to baptize blacks, is he? The glasses would take their fancy flashing. Like to see them sitting round in a ring with blub lips entranced, listening, still life, lap it up like milk, I suppose. Cold smell of sacred stone called him. He trod the worn steps, pushed the swing door and entered softly by the rear. Something going on. Some sodality. Pity so empty, nice discreet place to be next some girl. Who is my neighbor? Jammed by the hour to slow music. That woman at midnight mass. Seventh heaven. Women knelt in the benches with crimson halters round their necks, heads bowed. A batch knelt at the altar rails. The priest went along by them, murmuring, holding the thing in his hands. He stopped at each, took out a communion, shook a drop or two. Are they in water? Off it and put it neatly into her mouth. Her hat and head sank. Then the next one. Her hat sank at once. Then the next one, a small old woman. The priest bent down to put it into her mouth, murmuring all the time, Latin. The next one. Shut your eyes and open your mouth. What? Corpus. Body. Corpse. Good idea, the Latin. Stupefies them first. Hospice for the dying. They don't seem to chew it, only swallow it down. Rum idea, eating bits of a corpse. Why, the cannibals cotton to it. He stood aside, watching their blind masks pass down the aisle one by one and seek their places. He approached a bench and seated himself in its corner, nursing his hat and newspaper. These pots we have to wear. We ought to have hats modeled on our heads. They were about him here and there, with heads still bowed in their crimson halters, waiting for it to melt in their stomachs. Something like those matzo. It's that sort of bread, unleavened shoe bread. Look at them. Now I bet it makes them feel happy, lollipop. It does, yes. Bread of angels, it's called. There's a big idea behind it, kind of kingdom of God is within you feel. First communicants, hokey-pokey, penny a lump. Then feel all like one family party. Same in the theatre, all in the same swim. They do, I'm sure of that. Not so lonely in our confraternity. Then come out a bit spreeish, let off steam. Thing is, if you really believe in it, Lourdes cure, waters of oblivion and the knock apparition, statues bleeding, old fellow asleep near the confession box, hence those snores, blind faith, safe in the arms of kingdom come, lulls all pain, wake this time next year. He saw the priest stow the communion cup away, well in and kneel an instant before it showing a large grey boot sole from under the lace affair he had on. Suppose he lost the pin of his. He wouldn't know what to do to. Bald spot behind letters on his back. I-N-R-I? -I? No. I-H-S. Molly told me one time I asked her. I have sinned. Or no. I have suffered, it is. And the other one? Iron nails ran in. Meet one Sunday after the rosary. Do not deny my request. Turn up with a veil and black bag. Dusk and the light behind her. She might be here with a ribbon round her neck and do the other thing all the same on the sly. Their character. That fellow that turned Queen's evidence on the Invincibles he used to receive the... Carey was his name, the communion every morning. This very church, Peter Carey, yes. No, Peter Claver, I'm thinking of. Dennis Carey. And just imagine that, wife and six children at home, and plotting that murder all the time. Those craw thumpers. Now that's a good name for them. There's always something shifty looking about them. They're not straight men of business either. Oh, no, she's not here. The flower. No, no. By the way, did I tear up that envelope? Yes, under the bridge. The priest was rinsing out the chalice. Then he tossed off the dregs smartly. 
wine. Makes it more aristocratic than, for example, if he drank what they used to, Guinness's Porter or some temperance beverage, Wheatley's Dublin Hop Bitters or Cantrell and Cochrane's Ginger Ale Aromatic. Doesn't give them any of it. Shoe wine. Only the other. Cold comfort. Pious fraud, but quite right. Otherwise they'd have one old boozer worse than another coming along, cadging for a drink. Queer the whole atmosphere of the... Quite right. Perfectly right, that is. Mr. Bloom looked back towards the choir. Not going to be any music. Pity. Who has the organ here, I wonder? Old Glynn, he knew how to make that instrument talk. The vibrato. Fifty pounds a year, they say, he had in Gardner Street. Molly was in fine voice that day. The stabat mater of Rossini. Father Bernard Vaughan's sermon first. Christ or Pilate? Christ, but don't keep us all night over it. Music they wanted. Foot drill stopped. Could hear pin drop. I told her to pitch her voice against that corner. I could feel the thrill in the air, the full, the people looking up. Qui est homo? Some of that old sacred music, splendid. Mercadante. Seven last words. Mozart's twelfth mass, Gloria in that. Those old popes keen on music, on art and statues and pictures of all kinds. Palestrina, for example, too. They had a gay old time while it lasted. Healthy, too, chanting regular hours, then brew liquors, Benedictine, green chartreuse. Still, having eunuchs in their choir, that was coming it a bit thick. What kind of voice is it? Must be curious to hear after their own strong basses. Connoisseurs. Suppose they wouldn't feel anything after all. Kind of a placid, no worry fall into flesh, don't they? Gluttons, tall, long legs. Who knows? Eunuch. One way out of it. He saw the priest bend down and kiss the altar and then face about and bless all the people. All crossed themselves and stood up. Mr. Bloom glanced about him and then stood up, looking over the risen hats. Stand up at the gospel, of course. Then all settled down on their knees again and he sat back quietly in his bench. The priest came down from the altar, holding the thing out from him, and he and the mass boy answered each other in Latin. Then the priest knelt down and began to read off a card. O oh God, our refuge and our strength. Mr. Bloom put his face forward to catch the words. English, throw them a bone. I remember slightly. How long since your last mass? glorious and immaculate virgin, Joseph, her spouse, Peter and Paul. More interesting if you understood what it was all about. Wonderful organization clearly goes like clockwork. Confession. Everyone wants to. Then I will tell you all. Penance. Punish me, please. Great weapon in their hands. More than doctor or solicitor. Woman dying to. And I shh sh 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 And did you cha 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 And why did you look down at her ring to find an excuse Whispering gallery walls have ears Husband learned his surprise God's little joke Then out she comes Repentance Skin deep Lovely shame, pray at an altar, hail Mary and holy Mary, flowers, incense, candles melting, hide her blushes. Salvation Army blatant imitation, reformed prostitute will address the meeting. How I found the Lord, square-headed chaps those must be in Rome. They work the whole show, and don't they rake in the money too? Bequests also to the P.P. for the time being in his absolute discretion. Masses for the repose of my soul to be said publicly with open doors, monasteries, and convents. The priest in that fermana will case in the witness box. No brow beating him. He had his answer pat for everything. 
liberty and exaltation of our holy mother, the church, the doctors of the church. They mapped out the whole theology of it. The priest prayed. Blessed Michael, archangel, defend us in the hour of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God restrain him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God thrust Satan down to hell, and with him those other wicked spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. The priest and the mass boy stood up and walked off. All over. The women remained behind, thanksgiving. Better be shoving along, brother Buzz. Come round with the plate, perhaps. Pay your Easter duty. He stood up. Hello. Were those two buttons of my waistcoat open all the time? Women enjoy it, never tell you. But we... Excuse, miss, there's a... Whew, just a... Whew, fluff. With their skirt behind. Placket unhooked. Glimpses of the moon. Annoyed if you don't. Why didn't you tell me before? Still, like you, better untidy. Good job it wasn't farther south. He passed discreetly, buttoning down the aisle and out through the main door into the light. He stood a moment, unseeing by the cold black marble bowl, while before him and behind two worshippers dipped furtive hands in the low tide of holy water. Trams. A car of Prescott's dye works. A widow in her weeds. Notice because I'm in mourning myself. He covered himself. How goes the time? Quarter past. Time enough yet. Better get that lotion made up. Where is this? Ah, yes, the last time. Swenny's in Lincoln Place. Chemists rarely move. They are green and gold beacon jars too heavy to stir. Hamilton Long's founded in the year of the flood. Huguenot churchyard near there. Visit some day. He walked southward along Westland Row, but the recipe is in the other trousers. Oh, and I forgot that latch key too bore this funeral affair. Oh, well, poor fellow, it's not his fault. When was it I got it made up last? Wait. I changed a sovereign, I remember. First of the month it must have been, or the second. Oh, he can look it up in the prescriptions book. The chemist turned back page after page, sandy, shriveled smell he seems to have, shrunken skull and old quest for the philosopher's stone, the alchemists. Drugs age you after mental excitement. Lethargy, then. Why? Reaction. A lifetime in a night gradually changes your character, living all the day among herbs, ointments, disinfectants, all his alabaster, lily pots, mortar and pestle, ac dist fol lor te virid, Smell almost cure you like the dentist's doorbell. Dr. Whack. He ought to physic himself a bit. A lectuary or emulsion. The first fellow that picked an herb to cure himself had a bit of pluck. Simples. Want to be careful. Enough stuff here to chloroform you. Test. Turns blue litmus paper red. Chloroform. Overdose of laudanum. Sleeping draughts, love filters, paragoric poppy syrup, bad for cough, clogs the pores of the phlegm, poisons the only cures, remedy where you least expect it, clever of nature. About a fortnight ago, sir. Yes, Mr. Bloom said. He waited by the counter, inhaling slowly the keen reek of drugs. The dusty, dry smell of sponges and loofahs. A lot of time taken up telling your aches and pains. Sweet almond oil and tincture of benzoin, Mr. Bloom said, and then orange flower water. It certainly did make her skin so delicate white like wax. And white wax also, he said. Brings out the darkness of her eyes. Looking at me, the sheet up to her eyes. Spanish, smelling herself, when I was fixing the links in my cuffs. Those homely recipes are often the best. Strawberries for the teeth, nettles, and rainwater. 
Oatmeal, they say, steeped in buttermilk. Skin food. One of the old queen's sons, the Duke of Albany, was it? Had only one skin. Leopold, yes. Three we have. Warts, bunions and pimples to make it worse. But you want a perfume, too. What perfume does your... Peau de Spagne. That orange flower water is so fresh. Nice smell these soaps have. Pure curd soap. Time to get a bath round the corner. Hammam, Turkish, massage. Dirt gets rolled up in your navel. Nicer if a nice girl did it. Also, I think I... Yes, I do it in the bath. Curious longing I. Water to water. Combine business with pleasure. Pity no time for massage. Feel fresh then all the day. Funeral be rather glum. Yes, sir, the chemist said. That was two and nine. Have you brought a bottle? No, Mr. Bloom said. Make it up, please. I'll call later in the day and I'll take one of these soaps. How much are they? Four pence, sir. Mr. Bloom raised a cake to his nostrils. Sweet, lemony wax. I'll take this one, he said. That makes three and a penny. Yes, sir, the chemist said. You can pay all together, sir, when you come back. Good, Mr. Bloom said. He strolled out of the shop, the newspaper baton under his armpit, the cool, wrappered soap in his left hand. At his armpit, Bantam Lyon's voice and hand said, Hello, Bloom. What's the best news? Is that today's? Show us a minute. Shaved off his mustache again by Jove, long, cold upper lip, to look younger. He does look balmy, younger than I am. Bantam Lyon's yellow, black-nailed fingers unrolled the baton. Wants a wash, too. Take off the rough dirt. Good morning. Have you used Pear's soap? Dandruff on the shoulders. Scalp wants oiling. I want to see about that French horse that's running today, Bantam Lyon said. Where the bugger is it? He rustled the pleated pages, jerking his chin on his high collar. Barber's itch. Tight collar, he'll lose his hair. Better leave him paper and get shut of him. You can keep it, Mr. Bloom said. Ascot, gold cup, uh, wait, Bantam Lyons muttered. Half a mo, uh, maximum the second. I was going to throw it away, Mr. Bloom said. Bantam Lyons raised his eyes suddenly and leered weakly. What's that? His sharp voice said. I say you can keep it, Mr. Bloom answered. I was going to throw it away that moment. Bantam Lyons doubted an instant, leering, then thrust the outspread sheets back on Mr. Bloom's arms. I'll risk it, he said. Here, thanks. He sped off towards Conway's corner. God speed, scut. Mr. Bloom folded the sheets again to a neat square and lodged the soap in it, smiling. Silly lips of that chap. Betting. Regular hotbed of it lately. Messenger boys stealing out to put on sixpence. Raffle for a large, tender turkey. Your Christmas dinner for three pence. Jack Fleming embezzling to gamble, then smuggled off to America. Keeps a hotel now. They never come back. Flesh pots of Egypt. He walked cheerfully towards the mosque of the baths. Remind you of a mosque? Red baked bricks, the minarets? College sports today, I see. He eyed the horseshoe poster over the gate of College Park. Cyclist doubled up like a cod in a pot. Damn bad ad. Now, if they had made it round like a wheel, then the spokes, sports, 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 and the hub a big college. Something to catch the eye. There's Hornblower standing at the porter's lodge. Keep him on hands. Might take a turn in there on the nod. How do you do, Mr. Hornblower? How do you do, sir? Heavenly weather, really. If life was always like that. Cricket weather. Sit around under sunshades, over after over, out. They can't play it here. Duck for six wickets. Still Captain Culler broke a window in the Kildare Street Club with a slog to square leg. Donny Brook fair more in their line. In the skulls we were a cracking when McCarthy took the floor. Heat wave won't last. Always passing the stream of life. 
which in the stream of life we trace is dearer than them all. Enjoy a bath now, clean trough of water, cool enamel, the gentle, tepid stream. This is my body. He foresaw his pale body reclined in it, at full, naked, in a womb of warmth, oiled by scented, melting soap, softly laved. He saw his trunk and limbs rip rippled over and sustained, buoyed lightly upward, lemon yellow, his navel, bud of flesh, and saw the dark, tangled curls of his bush floating, floating hair of the stream around the limp father of thousands, a languid floating flower. End of chapter 5 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gazina. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 6. Martin Cunningham first poked his silk hatted head into the creaking carriage and, entering deftly, seated himself. Mr. Power stepped in after him, curving his height with care. Come on, Simon. After you, Mr. Bloom said. Mr. Deedleys covered himself quickly and got in, saying, Yes, yes. Are we all here now? Martin Cunningham asked. Come along, Bloom. Mr. Bloom entered and sat in the vacant place. He pulled the door to after him and slammed it twice till it shut tight. He passed an arm through the arm strap and looked seriously from the open carriage window at the lowered blinds of the avenue. One dragged aside, an old woman peeping, nose white flattened against the pane. Thanking her stars, she was passed over. Extraordinary the interest they'd taken a corpse. Glad to see us go, we give them such trouble coming. Job seems to suit them. Hugger-mugger in corners. Slop about in slipper-slappers for fear he'd wake. Then getting it ready, laying it out. Molly and Mrs. Fleming making the bed. Pull it more to your side. Our winding sheet. Never know who will touch you dead. Wash and shampoo. I believe they clip the nails and the hair. Keep a bit in an envelope. Grows all the same after. Unclean job. All waited. Nothing was said. Stowing in the wreaths, probably. I am sitting on something hard. Ah, that soap. In my hip pocket. Better shift it out of that. Wait for an opportunity. All waited. Then wheels were heard from in front, turning. Then nearer. Then horses' hoofs. A jolt. Their carriage began to move creaking and swaying. Other hoofs and creaking wheels started behind. The blinds of an avenue passed and number nine with its crepe knocker, door ajar, at walking pace. They waited still, their knees jogging, till they had turned and were passing along the tram tracks. Tritonville Road, quicker. The wheels rattled, rolling over the cobbled causeway, and the crazy glasses shook rattling in the door frames. What way is he taking us? Mr. Power asked through both windows. Irish town, Martin Cunningham said. Ring's End, Brunswick Street. Mr. Deedleys nodded, looking out. That's a fine old custom, he said. I am glad to see it has not died out. All watched a while through their windows, caps and hats lifted by passers. Respect. The carriage swerved from the tram track to the smoother road, past Watery Lane. Mr. Bloom at gaze saw a lithe young man, clad in mourning, a wide hat. There's a friend of yours gone by, Deedalus, he said. Who's that? Your son and heir. Where is he? Mr. Deedalus said, stretching over across. The carriage, passing the open drains and mounds of 
ridded up roadway before the tenement houses lurched round the corner and, sw swerving back to the tram-track, rolled on noisily with chattering wheels. Mr. Dedalus fell back, saying, Was that Mulligan cad with him? His fidus acatis. No, Mr. Bloom said, he was alone. Down with his Aunt Sally, I suppose, Mr. Dedalus said, the Golding faction, the drunken little costrawer and Chrissy's. And Chrissy, Papa's little lump of dung, the wise child that knows her own father. Mr. Bloom smiled joylessly on Ringsend Road. Wallace Brothers, the bottle works, Dodder Bridge. Richie Golding and the legal bag. Golding, Collis and Ward, he calls the firm. His jokes are getting a bit damp. Great card he was. Waltzing in Stamer Street with Ignatius Gallagher on a Sunday morning, the landlady's two hats pinned on his head. Out on the rampage all night. Beginning to tell him now. That backache of his, I fear. Wife ironing his back. Thinks he'll cure it with pills. All breadcrumbs they are. About 600% profit. He's in with a low-down crowd, Mr. Dedalus snarled. That mulligan is a contaminated, bloody, double-nyed ruffian by all accounts. His name stinks all over Dublin. But with the help of God and his blessed mother, I'll make it my business to write a letter one of those days to his mother or his aunt, or whoever she is, that will open her eyes as wide as a gate. I'll tickle his catastrophe, believe you me. He cried above the clatter of the wheels. I won't have her bastard of a nephew ruin my son. A counter-jumper's son. Selling tapes in my cousin, Peter Paul Swineys. Not likely. He ceased. Mr. Bloom glanced from his angry moustache to Mr. Power's mild face, and Martin Cunningham's eyes and beard gravely shaking. Noisy, self-willed man, full of his son. He is right. Something to hand on. If little Rudy had lived, see him grow up. Hear his voice in the house, walking beside Molly in an Eton suit. My son. Me in his eyes. Strange feeling it would be. From me, just a chance. Must have been that morning in Raymond Terrace. She was at the window watching the two dogs at it, by the wall of the cease to do evil. And the sergeant grinning up. She had that cream gown on with a rip she never stitched. Give us a touch, Poldy. God, I'm dying for it. How life begins. Got big then. Had to refuse the Greystones concert. My son inside her. I could have helped him on in life. I could. Make him independent. Learn German, too. Are we late? Mr. Power asked. Ten minutes, Martin Cunningham said, looking at his watch. Molly, Millie, something watered down, had tomboy oaths. Oh, jumping Jupiter, ye gods and little fishes. Still, she's a dear girl, soon be a woman, Mullinger, dearest Papley, young student. Yes, yes, a woman, too. Life, life. The carriage heeled over and back, their four trunks swaying. Corny might have given us a more commodious yoke, Mr. Power said. He might, Mr. Dedalus said, if he hadn't that squint troubling him. Do you follow me? He closed his left eye. Martin Cunningham began to brush away the crust crumbs from under his thighs. What is this? He said, in the name of God. Crumbs? Someone seems to have been making a picnic party here lately, Mr. Power said. All raised their thighs and eyed with disfavour the mildewed, buttonless leather of the seats. Mr. Dedalus, twisting his nose, frowned downward and said, Unless I'm greatly mistaken. What do you think, Martin? It struck me too, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Bloom set his thigh down. Glad I took that bath. Feel my feet quite clean, but I wish Mrs. Fleming had darned these socks better. Mr. Dedalus sighed resignedly. After all, he said, it's the most natural thing in the world. Did Tom Kernan turn up? Martin Cunningham asked, twirling the peak of his beard gently. 
Yes, Mr. Bloom answered. He's behind with Ned Lambert and Hines. And Corny Kelleher himself? Mr. Power asked. At the cemetery, Martin Cunningham said. I met McCoy this morning, Mr. Bloom said. He said he'd try to come. The carriage halted short. What's wrong? We stopped. Where are we? Mr. Bloom put his head out of the window. The Grand Canal, he said. Gasworks. Whooping cough, they said. Cures. Good job Millie never got it. Poor children. Doubles them up black and blue in convulsions. Shame, really. Got off lightly with illnesses compared. Only measles. Flaxseed tea. Scarlatina. Influenza epidemics. Canvassing for death. Don't miss this chance. Dog's home over there. Poor old Athos. Be good to Athos, Leopold. Is my last wish. Thy will be done. We obey them in the grave. A dying scrawl. He took it to heart, pined away. Quiet brute. Old men's dogs usually are. A raindrop spat on his hat. He drew back and saw an instant of shower spray dots over the grey flags. A part. Curious. Like through a colander. I thought it would. My boots were creaking, I remember now. The weather is changing, he said quietly. A pity it did not keep up fine, Martin Cunningham said. Wanted for the country, Mr. Power said. There's the sun again coming out. Mr. Dedalus, peering through his glasses towards the veiled sun, hurled a mute curse at the sky. It's as uncertain as a child's bottom, he said. We're off again. The carriage turned again its stiff wheels, and their trunks swayed greatly. Martin Cunningham twirled more, quiet, more quickly the peak of his beard. Tom Kernan was immense last night, he said, and Paddy Leonard taking him off to his face. Oh, draw him out, Martin, Mr. Power said eagerly. Wait till you hear him, Simon, on Ben Dollard's singing of The Croppy Boy. Immense, Martin Cunningham said pompously. His singing of that simple ballad, Martin, is the most trenchant rendering I have heard in the whole course of my experience. Trenchant, Mr. Power said laughing. He's dead nuts on that. And the retrospective arrangement. Did you read Dan Dawson's speech? Martin Cunningham asked. I did not then, Mr. Dedalus said. Where is it? In the paper this morning. Mr. Bloom took the paper from his inside pocket. That book I must change for her. No, no, Mr. Dedalus said quickly. Later on, please. Mr. Bloom's glance travelled down the edge of the paper, scanning the deaths. Callan, Coleman, Dignam, Fawcett, Lowry, Nauman, Peak. What peak is that? Is it the chap who was in Crosby and Elaine's? No. No, Sexton, Erbright, inked characters fast fading on the frayed breaking paper. Thanks to the little flower, sadly missed, to the inexpressible grief of his, aged eighty-eight after a long and tedious illness. Month's mind, Quinlan, on whose soul sweet Jesus have mercy. It is now a month since dear Henry fled, to his home up above in the sky, where his family weeps and mourns his loss, hoping some day to meet him on high. I tore up the envelope? Yes. Where did I put her letter after I read it in the bath? He patted his waistcoat pocket. There, all right. Dear Henry fled, before my patients are exhausted. National School, Meads Yard, The Hazard. Only two there now, nodding, full as a tick. Too much bone in their skulls, the other trotting round with a fare. An hour ago I was passing there, the Jarvis raised their hats. A pointsman's back straightened itself upright, suddenly against the tramway standard by Mr. Bloom's window. Couldn't they invent something automatic, so that the wheel itself much handier? Well, but that fellow would lose his job then. 
Well, but then another fellow would get a job making the new invention. Ancient concert rooms. Nothing on there. A man in a buff suit with a crepe armlet. Not much grief there. Quarter morning. People in law, perhaps. They went past the bleak pulpit of St. Mark's, under the railway bridge, past the Queen's Theatre, in silence. Hoardings. Eugene Stratton, Mrs. Bantman Palmer. Could I go see Lee tonight, I wonder? I said I. Or the Lily of Killarney? Elster Grimes Opera Company. Big, powerful change. Wet, bright bills for next week. Fun on the Bristol. Martin Cunningham could work a pass for the gaiety. Have to stand a drink or two. As broad as it's long. He's coming in the afternoon. Her songs. Plasters. Sir Philip Crampton's memorial fountain bust. Who was he? How do you do? Mr. Cunningham said, raising his palm to his brow in salute. He doesn't see us, Mr. Power says. Yes, he does. How do you do? Who? Mr. Dedalus asked. Blazes Boylan, Mr. Power said. There he is, airing his quiff. Just that moment I was thinking. Mr. Dedalus bent across to salute. From the door of the red bank, the white disc of a straw hat flashed reply. Spruce figure passed. Mr. Bloom reviewed the nails on his left hand, then those of his right hand. The nails, yes. Is there anything more in him that they she sees? Fascination. Worst man in Dublin. That keeps him alive. They sometimes feel what a person is. Instinct. But a type like that? My nails. I am just looking at them, well paired. And after, thinking alone, body getting a bit softy. I would notice that, from remembering. What causes that? I suppose the skin can't contract quickly enough when the flesh falls off. But the shape is there. The shape is there still. Shoulders, hips, plump. Night of the dance dressing. Shift stuck between the cheeks behind. He clasped his hands between his knees and, satisfied, sent his vacant glance over their faces. Mr. Power asked, How is the concert tour getting on, Bloom? Oh, very well, Mr. Bloom said. I hear great accounts of it. It's a good idea, you see. Are you going yourself? Well, no, Mr. Bloom said. In point of fact, I have to go down to County Clare on some private business. You see, the idea is to, tr to tour the chief towns. What you lose on one, you can make up on the other. Quite so, Mr. Cunningham said. Mary Anderson is up there now. Have you good artists? Louis Werner is touring her, Mr. Bloom said. Oh, yes, well, we'll have all top knobbers. J.C. Doyle and John McCormick, I hope, and the best, in fact. And Madame... Mr. Power said, smiling, last but not least. Mr. Bloom unclasped his hands in a gesture of soft politeness and clasped them. Smith O'Brien. Someone has laid a bunch of flowers there. Woman. Must be his death day. For many happy returns. The carriage wheeling by Farrell's statue united noiselessly their unresisting knees. Oot. A dull-garbed old man from the curbstone tendered his wares, his mouth opening. Oot. Four bootlaces for a penny. Wonder why he was struck off the rolls. Had his office in Hume Street. Same house as Molly's namesake, Tweedy, Crown solicitor for Waterford. Has that silk hat ever since. Relics of old decency. Mourning, too. Terrible come down, poor wretch. Kicked about like snuff at a wake. O'Callaghan on his last legs. And Madame. Twenty past eleven. Up. Mrs. Fleming is in to clean. Doing her hair, humming. Voglio e non vorrei. No. Vorrei e non. Looking at the tips of her hairs to see if they are split. 
mi trema un poco il. Beautiful on that tre her voice is, weeping tone. A thrush, a throstle. There is a word throstle that expresses that. Her eyes passed lightly over Mr. Power's good-looking face, greyish over the ears. Madame, smiling. I smiled back. A smile goes a long way. Only politeness, perhaps. Nice fellow. Who knows, is that true about the woman he keeps? Not pleasant for the wife. Yet, they say, who was it told me? There is no carnal. You would imagine that would get played out pretty quick. Yes, it was Crofton, met him one evening, bringing her a pound of rump steak. Who is this she was? Barmaid at Jury's. Or the Moira, was it? They passed under the huge cloaked liberator's form. Martin, Cun Martin Cunningham nudged Mr. Power. Of the tribe of Reuben, he said. A tall, black-bearded figure, bent on a stick, stumping round the corner of Elvery's elephant house, showed them a curved hand open in his spine. In all his pristine beauty, Mr. Power said. Mr. Deedless looked after the stumping figure and said mildly, The devil break the hasp of your back. Mr. Power, collapsing in laughter, shaded his face from the window as the carriage passed Gray's statue. We have all been there, Martin Cunningham said broadly. His eyes met Mr. Bloom's eyes. He caressed his beard, adding, Well, nearly all of us. Mr. Bloom began to speak with sudden eagerness to his companions' faces. That's an awfully good one that's going the rounds about Reuben J. and the Sun. About the boatman? Mr. Power asked. Yes, isn't it awfully good? What is that? Mr. Dietlers asked. I didn't hear it. There was a girl in the case, Mr. Bloom began, and he determined to send him to the Isle of Man out of harm's way, but when they were both... What? Mr. Dietlers asked. That confirmed bloody hobbledy-doy, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Bloom said. They were both on the way to the boat, and he tried to drown... Drown Barabbas, Mr. Dedalus cried. I wish to Christ he did. Mr. Power sent a long laugh down his shaded nostrils. No, Mr. Bloom said, the son himself. Martin Cunningham thwarted his speech rudely. Reuben and the son were piking it down the quay next the river on their way to the Isle of Man boat, and the young chiseller suddenly got loose and over the wall with him into the Liffey. For God's sake, Mr. Dedalus exclaimed in fright. Is he dead? Dead? Martin Cunningham cried. Not he. A boatman got a pole and fished him out by the slack of the breeches, and he was handed up to the father on the quay, more dead than alive. Half the town was there. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, but the funny part is. And Reuben J., Martin Cunningham said, gave the boatman a florin for saving his son's life. A stifled sigh came from under Mr. Power's hand. Oh, he did, Martin Cunningham affirmed, like a hero, a silver florin. Isn't it awfully good? Mr. Bloom said eagerly. One and eightpence too much, said Mr. Dedalus dryly. Mr. Power's choked laugh burst quietly in the carriage. Nelson's pillow. Eight plums a penny. Eight for a penny. We had better look a little serious, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Dedalus sighed. Ah, then indeed, he said. Poor little Paddy wouldn't grudge us a laugh. Many a good one, he told himself. The Lord forgive me, Mr. Power said, wiping his wet eyes with his fingers. Poor Paddy. I little thought a week ago when I saw him last and he was in his usual health that I'd be driving after him like this. He's gone from us. As decent a little man as ever wore a hat, Mr. Dedalus said. He went very suddenly. Breakdown, Martin Cunningham said. Heart. He tapped his chest sadly. Blazing face, red hot. Too much John Barleycorn. Cure for a red nose. Drink like the devil till it turns Adelaide. A lot of money he spent colouring it. Mr. Power gazed at the passing houses with rueful apprehension. 
He had a sudden death, poor fellow, he said. The best death, Mr. Bloom said. Their wide, open eyes looked at him. No suffering, he said. A moment and all is over. Like dying in sleep. No one spoke. Dead side of the street, this. Dull business by day, land agents, temperance hotel, Faulkner's Railway Guide, Civil Service College, Guilds, Catholic Club, the industrious blind. Why? Some reason. Sun or wind. At night, too. Chummies and slavies. Under the patronage of the late Father Matthew. Foundation stone for Parnell. Breakdown. Heart. White horses with white frontlet plumes came round the rotunda corner, galloping. A tiny coffin flashed by, in a hurry to bury. A mourning coat. Unmarried. Black for the married. Piebald for bachelors. Done for a nun. Sad, Martin Cunningham said. A child. A dwarf's face, mauve and wrinkled like little Rudy's was. A dwarf's body, weak as putty, and a white-lined deal box. Burial friendly society pays. Penny a week for a sort of turf. Our little bagger baby meant nothing. Mistake of nature. If it's healthy, it's from the mother. If not, from the man. Better luck next time. Poor little thing, Mr. Dedalus said. It's well out of it. The carriage climbed more slowly the hill of Rutland Square. Rattle his bones. Over the stones. Only a pauper. Nobody owns. In the midst of life, Martin Cunningham said. But the worst of all, Mr. Power said, is the man who takes his own life. Martin Cunningham drew out his watch briskly, coughed, and put it back. The greatest disgrace to have in the family, Mr. Power added. Temporary insanity, of course, Martin Cunningham said decisively. We must take a charitable view of it. They say a man who does it is a coward, Mr. Dieselis said. It is not for us to judge, Martin Cunningham said. Mr. Bloom, about to speak, closed his lips again. Martin Cunningham's large eyes, looking away now. Sympathetic human man he is, intelligent, like Shakespeare's face. Always a good word to say. They have no mercy on that here, or infanticide. Refuse Christian burial. They used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave, as if it wasn't broken already. Yet sometimes they repent too late. Found in the riverbed, clutching rushes. He looked at me. On that awful drunkard of a wife of his. Setting up house for her, time after time, and then pawning the furniture on him every Saturday almost. Leading him the life of the damned. Wear the heart out of a stone, that. Monday morning, start afresh. Shoulder to the wheel. Lord, she must have looked a sight that night Dedalus told me he was in there, drunk about the place and capering with Martin's umbrella. And they call me the jewel of Asia, of Asia, the geisha. He looked away from me. He knows. Rattle his bones. That afternoon of the inquest, the red-labelled bottle on the table... The room in the hotel was hunting pictures. Stuffy it was. Sunlight through the slats of the Venetian blind. The coroner's sunlit ears, big and hairy. Boots giving evidence. Thought he was asleep first. Then saw little yellow streaks on his face. Had slipped down to the foot of the bed. Verdict, overdose. Death by misadventure. The letter. For my son Leopold. No more pain. Wake no more. Nobody owns. The carriage rattled swiftly along Blessington Street, over the stones. We are going the pace, I think, Martin Cunningham said. God grant he doesn't upset us on the road, Mr. Power said. I hope not, Mr. Cunningham said. That will be a great race tomorrow in Germany. The Gordon Bennett. Yes, by Jove, 
Mr. Dedalus said. That would be worth seeing, Faith. As they turned into Berkeley Street, a street organ near the basin sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. Has anybody here seen Kelly? K-E-W-E-Y. Dead march from Saul. He's as bad as old Antonio. He left me on my own yo. Pirouette? The mater misericordiae. Eccles Street. My house down there. Big place. Ward for incurables there. Very encouraging. Our Lady's Hospice for the dying. Dead house. Handy underneath. Where old Mrs. Riordan died. They looked terrible, the woman. Her feeding cup and rubbing her mouth with a spoon. Then the screen around her bed for her to die. Nice young student that was dressed that bite the bee gave me. He's gone over the lying-in hospital, they told me, from one extreme to the other. The carriage galloped around the corner, stopped. What's wrong now? A divided drove of branded cattle past the windows, lowing, slouching by on padded hoofs, whisking their tails slowly on their cottled bony croups. Outside them and through them ran rattled sheep, bleating their fear. Emigrants, Mr. Power said. Hoo! The drover's voice cried, his switch sounding on their flanks. Hoo! Out of that! Thursday, of course. Tomorrow is killing day. Springers. Cuff sold them about twenty-seven quid each. For Liverpool, probably. Roast beef for old England. They buy up all the juicy ones. And then the fifth quarter lost. All that raw stuff. Hide, hair, horns. Comes to a big thing in a year. Dead meat trade. By-products of the slaughterhouses for tanneries, soap, margarine. Wonder if that dodge works now getting dicky meat off the train at Clonsilla. The marriage moved on through the drove. I can't make out why the corporation doesn't run a tram line from the park gate to the quays, Mr. Bloom said. All those animals could be taken in trucks down to the boats. Instead of blocking up the thoroughfare, Mr. Cunningham said. Quite right, they ought to. Yes, Mr. Bloom said, and another thing I often thought is to have municipal funeral trams, like they have in Milan, you know. Run the line out to the cemetery gates and have special trams, hearse and carriage and all. Don't you see what I mean? Oh, that'd be damned for a story, Mr. Dedalus said. Pullman car and saloon dining room. A poor lookout for Corney, Mr. Power added. Why? Mr. Bloom said turning to Dedalus. Wouldn't it be more decent than galloping two abreast? Well, there's something in that, Mr. Dedalus granted. And, Martin Cunningham said, we wouldn't have scenes like that when the hearse capsized round Dumphy's and upset the coffin onto the road. That was terrible, Mr. Powell's shocked face said, and the corpse fell about on the road. Terrible. First round Dumphy's. Mr. Dedalus said, nodding, Gordon Bennett Cup. Praises be to God, Martin Cunningham said piously. Bomb, upset. A coffin bumped out onto the road, burst open. Paddy Dignam shot out and rolling over, stiff in the dust in a brown habit too large for him. Red face, grey now, mouth fallen open, asking what's up now. Quite right to close it. Looks horrid open. Then the insides decompose quickly. Much better to close up all the orifice. Yes, also. With wax. The sphincter's loose. Seal up all. Dunphys, Mr. Power announced as the carriage turned right. Dunphys corner. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. A pause by the wayside tip-top position for a pub. Expect we'll pull up here on the way, back to drink his health. Pass round the consolation. Elixir of life. But suppose now it did happen. Would he bleed if a nail, say, cut him on in the knocking about? He would and he wouldn't, I suppose. 
Depends on where. The circulation stops. Still, some might ooze out of an artery. It would be better to bury them in red, the dark red. In silence they drove along Fibsborough Road. An empty horse trotted by, coming from the cemetery. Looks relieved. Cross Guns Bridge, the Royal Canal. Water roaring through the sluices. A man stood on his dropping barge between clamps of turf. On the towpath, by the lock, a slack-tethered horse, aboard of the Boogaboo. Their eyes watched him. On the slow, weedy waterway, he had floated on his raft, coastward, over Ireland, drawn by a haulage rope, past beds of reed, over slime, mud-choked bottles, carrion dogs. Athlone, Mullingar, Moy Valley. I could make a walking tour to see Millie by the canal. Or cycle down. Hire some old croc. Safety. Wren had one the other day, at the auction, but a lady's. Developing waterways. James McCann's hobby, to row me over the ferry. Cheaper transit. By easy stages. Houseboats. Camping out. Also horses. To heaven by water. Perhaps I will, without writing. Come as a surprise. Lake Slip. Clonsilla. Dropping down lock by lock to Dublin. With turf from the Midland bogs. Salute. He lifted his brown straw hat. Saluting Paddy Dignam. They drove on past Brian Boromy House. Hear it now. Near it now. I wonder how our friend Fogarty is getting on, Mr. Power said. Better ask Tom Kernan, Mr. Dedalus said. How is that? Martin Cunningham said. Left him weeping, I suppose? Though lost to sight, Mr. Dedalus said. To memory dear. The carriage steered left for Finglass Road. The stonecutter's yard on the right. Last lap. Crowded on the spit of land, silent shapes appeared, white, sorrowful, holding out calm hands, knelt in grief, pointing. Fragments of shapes, hewn, in white silence, appealing, the best obtainable. Thos H. Denani, monumental builder and sculptor. Past. On the curbstone before Jimmy Geary, the sextons, an old tramp set, grumbling, emptying the dirt and stones out of his huge dust-brown yawning boot, after life's journey. Gloomy gardens then went by, one by one, gloomy houses. Mr. Power pointed. That is where Childs was murdered, he said, the last house. So it is, Mr. Dedalus said, a gruesome case. Seymour Bush got him off, murdered his brother. Or so they said. The Crown had no evidence, Mr. Power said. Only circumstantial, Martin Cunningham added. That's the maxim of the law. Better for ninety-nine guilty to escape than for one innocent person to be wrongfully condemned. They looked. Murderous ground. It passed darkly. Shuttered, tenantless, unweeded garden. Whole place gone to hell. Wrongfully condemned. Murder. The murderer's image in the eye of the murdered. They love reading about it. Man's head found in a garden. Her clothing consisted of. How she met her death. Recent outrage. The weapon used. Murderer is still at large. Clues. A shoelace. The body to be exhumed. Murder will out. Cramped in this carriage. She mightn't like me to come that way without letting her know. Must be careful about women. Catch them once with their pants down. Never forgive you after. Fifteen. The high railings of prospect rippled past their gaze. Dark poplars. Rare white forms. Forms more frequent. White shapes thronged amid the trees. White forms and fragments st streaming by mutely, sustaining vain gestures on the air. A felly harshed against the curbstone, stopped. Martin Cunningham put out his arm, and, wrenching back the handle, shoved the door open with his knee. He stepped out. Mr. Power and Mr. Dedalus followed. 
Change that soap now. Mr. Bloom's hand unbuttoned his hip pocket swiftly and transferred the paper-stuck soap to his inner handkerchief pocket. He stepped out of the carriage, replacing the newspaper his other hand still held. Paltry funeral, coach and three carriages. It's all the same. Pallbearers, gold reins, requiem mass, firing a volley, pomp of death. Beyond the hind carriage, a hawker stood by his barrow of cakes and fruit. Simnel cakes, those are, stuck together. Cakes for the dead, dog biscuits. Who ate them? Mourners coming out. He followed his companions. Mr. Kernan and Ned Lambert followed, Hines walking after them. Corny Kelleher stood by the opened hearse and took out the two wreaths. He handed one to the boy. Where is that child's funeral disappeared to? A team of horses passed from Finglass with toiling, plodding tread, dragging through the funereal silence a creaking wagon on which lay a granite block. The wagoner marching at the head saluted. Coffin now. Got here before us, dead as he is. Horse looking round at it with plumes skewways. Dull eye, collar tight on his neck, pressing on a blood vessel or something. Do they know what they cart out here every day? Must be twenty or thirty funerals every day. Then mount to Rome for the Protestants. Funerals all over the world, everywhere, every minute. Shoveling them under by the cartload, double quick. Thousands every hour. Too many in the world. Mourners came out through the gates. Woman and a girl. Lean-jawed harpy. Hard woman at a bargain. Her bonnet awry. Girl's face, stained with dirt and tears, holding the woman's arm. Looking up at her for a sign to cry. Fish's face bloodless and livid. The mutes shouldered the coffin and bore it in through the gates. So much dead weight. Felt heavier myself stepping out of that bath. First the stiff, then the friends of the stiff. Corny Kelleher and the boy followed with their wreaths. Who is that beside them? Ah, the brother-in-law. All walked after. Martin Cunningham whispered, I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before, Bloom. What? Mr. Power whispered. How so? His father poisoned himself, Martin Cunningham whispered. Had the Queen's Hotel in Ennis. You heard him say he was going to Clare. Anniversary. Oh, God. Mr. Power whispered. First I heard of it. Poisoned himself? He glanced behind him to where a face with dark, thinking eyes followed towards the Cardinal's mausoleum speaking. Was he insured? Mr. Bloom asked. I believe so, Mr. Kernan answered, but the policy was heavily mortgaged. Martin is trying to get the youngster into Artane. How many children did he leave? Five. Ned Lambert said, says he'll try to get one of the girls into Todd's. A sad case, Mr. Bloom said gently. Five young children. A great blow to the poor wife. Mr. Kernan added. Indeed, yes, Mr. Bloom agreed. Has the laugh at him now? He looked down at the boots he had blacked and polished. She had outlived him, lost her husband, more dead for her than for me. One must outlive, one must outlive the other, wise men say. There are more women than men in the world. Condole with her. Your terrible loss. I hope you'll soon follow him. For Hindu widows only. She would marry another. Him? No. Yet who knows after? Widowhood not the, not the thing since the old queen died. Drawn on a gun carriage. Victoria and Albert. Frogmore memorial mourning. But in the end she put a few violets in her bonnet. Vain in her heart of hearts. All for a shadow. Consort not even a king. Her son was the substance, something new to hope for, not like the past she wanted back, waiting. It never comes. One must go first, alone under the ground, and lie no more in her warm bed. How are you, Simon? Ned Lambert said softly, clasping hands. 
Haven't seen you for a month of Sundays. Never better. How are all in Cork's own town? I was down there for the Cork Park races on Easter Monday, Ned Lambert said. Same old six and eightpence. Stopped with Dick Tivy. And how is Dick the solid man? Nothing between himself and heaven, Ned Lambert answered. By the holy Paul, Mr. Dedalus said in subdued wonder. Dick Tivy bald? Martin is going to get up a whip for the youngsters, Ned Lambert said, pointing ahead. A few bob a skull, just to keep them going till the insurance is cleared up. Yes, yes, Mr. Dedalus said dubiously. Is that the eldest boy in front? Yes, Ned Lambert said, with the wife's brother. John Henry Menton is behind. He put down his name for a quid. I'll engage he did, Mr. Dedalus said. I often told poor Paddy he ought to mind that job. John Henry is not the worst in the world. How did he lose it? Ned Lambert asked. Liquor, what? Many a good man's fault, Mr. Dedalus said with a sigh. They halted about the door of the mortuary chapel. Mr. Bloom stood behind the boy with a wreath, looking down at the sleek combed hair and at the slender furrowed neck inside his brand new collar. Poor boy! Was he there when the father? Both unconscious. Lighten up at the last moment and recognize for the last time. All he might have done. I owe three shillings to old Grady. Would he understand? The mutes bore the coffin into the chapel. Which end is his head? After a moment he followed the others in, blinking in the screened light. The coffin lay on its bier before the chancel, four tall yellow candles at its corners. Always in front of us, Corny Kelleher, laying a wreath at each four corner, beckoned to the boy to kneel. The mourners knelt here and there in praying desks. Mr. Bloom stood behind near the front, and when all had knelt, dropped carefully his unfolded newspaper from his pocket, and knelt his right knee upon it. He fitted his black hat gently on his left knee, and holding its brim, bent over piously. A server bearing a brass bucket with something in it came out through a door. The white-smocked priest came after him, tidying his stole with one hand, balancing with the other a little book against his toad's belly. Who'll read the book? Aye, said the rook. They halted by the beer, and the priest began to read out of his book with a fluent croak. Father Coffey. I knew his name was like a coffin. Domine namine. Bully about the muzzle he looks. Bosses the show muscular Christian. Woe betide any one that looks crooked at him. Priest. Thou art Peter. Burst sideways like a sheep in clover, Dedalus says you will, with a belly on him like a poisoned pup. Most amusing expressions that man finds. Hoon. Burst sideways. Non interest in judicium cum servo tuo domine makes them feel more important to be prayed over in Latin. Requiem mass, crepe weepers, black-edged notepaper, your name on the altar list, chilly place this. Want to feed well, sitting in there all morning in the gloom, kicking his heels, waiting for the next please. Eyes of a toad, too. What swells him up that way? Molly gets swelled after cabbage, Air of the place, maybe. Looks full up of bad gas. Must be an infernal lot of bad gas around the place. Butchers, for instance. They get like raw beefsteaks. Who was telling me? Mervyn Brown. Down in the vaults of St. Werber's lovely old organ, 150. They have to bore a hole in the coffins sometimes to let out the bad gas and burn it. Out it rushes, blue. One whiff of that and you're a goner. My kneecap is hurting me. Ow. That's better. The priest took a stick with a knob at the end of it, out of the boy's bucket, and shook it over the coffin. 
Then he walked to the other end and shook it again. Then he came back and put it back in the bucket. As you were before you rested. It's all written down. He has to do it. Ad ne nos inducas in tentationem. The server piped the answers in the treble. I often thought it would be better to have boy servants. Up to fifteen or so. After that, of course... Holy water that was, I expect. Shaking sleep out of it. He must be fed up with that job, shaking that thing over all the corpses they trot up. What harm if you could see what he was shaking it over? Every mortal day a fresh batch, middle-aged men, old women, children, women dead in childbirth, men with beards, bald-headed businessmen, consumptive girls with little sparrows' breasts. All the year round, he prayed the same thing over them all and shook water on top of them, sleep, on dignum now, in paradisum. Said he was going to paradise, or is in paradise. Says that over everybody. Tiresome kind of a job. But he has to say something. The priest closed his book and went off, followed by the server. Corny Kelleher opened the side doors, and the grave diggers came in, hoisted the coffin again, carried it out, and shoved it on their cart. Corny Kelleher gave one wreath to the boy and one to the brother-in-law. All followed them out of the side doors into the mild grey air. Mr. Bloom came last, folding his paper again into his pocket. He gazed gravely at the ground till the coffin cart wheeled off to the left. The metal wheels ground the gravel with a sharp grating cry, and the pack of blunt boots followed the trundled barrow along a lane of sepulchres. The re, the ra, the re, the ra, the roo. Lord, I mustn't build here. The O'Connell circle, Mr. Dedalus said about him. Mr. Power's soft eyes went up to the apex of the lofty cone. He's at rest, he said, in the middle of his people, old Dano. But his heart is buried in Rome. How many broken hearts are buried here, Simon? Her grave is over there, Jack, Mr. Dedalus said. I'll soon be stretched beside her. Let him take me whenever he likes. Breaking down, he began to weep to himself quietly, stumbling a little in his walk. Mr. Power took his arm. She's better where she is, he said kindly. I suppose so, Mr. Dedalus said with a weak gasp. I suppose she's in heaven, if there is a heaven. Corny Kelleher stepped aside from his rank and allowed the mourners to plod by. Sad occasions, Mr. Kernan began politely. Mr. Bloom closed his eyes and sadly twice bowed his head. The others are putting on their hats, Mr. Kernan said. I suppose we can do so too. We are the last. The cemetery, this cemetery, is a treacherous place. They covered their heads. The reverend gentleman read the service too quickly, don't you think? Mr. Kernan said with reproof. Mr. Bloom nodded gravely, looking in the bl quick bloodshot eyes. Secret eyes, secret searching. Mason, I think. Not sure. Beside him again. We are the last, in the same boat. Hope he'll say something else. Mr. Kernan added, The service of the Irish church used in Mount Jerome is simpler, more impressive, I must say. Mr. Bloom gave prudent assent. The language, of course, was another thing. Mr. Kernan said with solemnity, I am the resurrection and the life. That touches a man's inmost heart. It does, Mr. Bloom said. Your heart, perhaps, but what price the fellow in the six feet by two with his toes to the daisies? No touching that. Seat of the affections. Broken heart. A pump, after all pumping thousands of gallons of blood every day. One fine day it gets bunged up, and there you are. Lots of them lying around here. Lungs, hearts, livers, old rusty pumps. Damn the thing else. The resurrection and the life. Once you are dead, you are dead. That last day idea. Knocking them all up out of their graves. Come forth, Lazarus. And he came fifth and lost the job. Get up, last day. 
than every fellow mousing around for his liver and his lights and the rest of his traps. Find damn all of himself that morning. Pennyweight of powder in his skull. Twelve grams, one pennyweight. Troy measure. Corny Kelleher fell into step at their side. Everyone went off A1, he said. What? He looked at them from his drawling eye. Policeman's shoulders. With your turaloom, turaloom. As it should be, Mr. Kernan said. What, eh? Corny Kelleher said. Mr. Kernan assured him. Who is that chap behind with Tom Kernan? John Henry Menton asked. I know his face. Ned Lambert glanced back. Bloom, he said. Madame Marion Tweedy, that was, is, I mean, the soprano. She's his wife. Oh, to be sure, John Henry Menton said. I haven't seen her for some time. She was a fine-looking woman. I danced with her, wait, fifteen, seventeen golden years ago, at Matt Dillon's in Roundtown. And a good armful she was. He looked behind through the others. What is he? he asked. What does he do? Wasn't he in the stationery line? I fell foul of him one evening, I remember, at Bowles. Ned Lambert smiled. Yes, he was, he said, in Wisdom Healy's, a traveller for blotting paper. In God's name, John Henry Menton said. What did she marry a coon like that for? She had plenty of game in her then. Has still, Ned Lambert said. He does some canvassing for ants. John Henry Menton's large eyes stared ahead. The barrow turned into a side lane. A portly man, ambushed among the grasses, raised his hat in homage. The grave diggers touched their caps. John O'Connell, Mr. Power said, pleased. He never forgets a friend. Mr. O'Connell shook all their hands in silence. Mr. Dedalus said, I am come to pay you another visit. My dear Simon, the caretaker answered in a low voice, I don't want your custom at all. Saluting Ned Lambert and John Henry Menton, he walked on at Martin Cunningham's side, puzzling two long keys at his, at his back. Did you hear that one? he asked them. About Malkai from the coom? I did not, Martin Cunningham said. They bent their silk hats in concert, and Hines inclined his ear. The caretaker hung his thumbs in the loops of his gold watch chain, and spoke in a discreet tone to their vacant smiles. They tell the story, he said, that two drunks came out here one foggy evening to look for the grave of a friend of theirs. They asked for Mulcahy from the coom, and were told where he was buried. After traipsing about in the fog, they found the grave, sure enough. One of the drunks spelt out the name, Terence Mulcahy. The other drunk was blinking up at a statue of our saviour the widow had got put up. The caretaker blinked up at one of the sepulchres they passed. He resumed. And, after blinking up at the sacred figure, not a bloody bit like the man, says he. That's not Malkahi, says he, whoever done it. Rewarded by smiles, he fell back and spoke with Corny Kelleher, accepting the dockets given him, turning them over and scanning them as he walked. That's all done with a purpose, Martin Cunningham explained to Hines. I know, Hines said. I know that. To cheer a fellow up, Martin Cunningham said. It's pure good-heartedness. Damn the thing else. Mr. Bloom admired the caretaker's prosperous bulk. All want to be on good terms with him. Decent fellow, John O'Connell. Real good sort. Keys, like keys add. No fear of anyone getting out. No pass-out checks. Habeas corpus. I must see about that ad after the funeral. Did he write Bald's Bridge on the envelope I took to cover when she disturbed me writing to Martha? Hope it's not chucked in the dead letter office. Be the better off a shave. Grey sprouting beard. That's the first sign when the hairs come out grey and temper getting cross. Silver threads among the grey. Fancy being his wife. Wonder he had the gumption to propose to any girl. Come out and live in the graveyard. Dangle that before her. It might thrill her first, courting death. Shades of night hovering there with all the dead stretched about. 
The shadows of the tombs when churchyards yawn and Daniel O'Connell must be a descendant, I suppose. Who is this used to say he was a queer breedy man, great Catholic all the same, like a big giant in the dark? Will o' the wisp, gas of graves. Want to keep her mind off it to conceive it all. Women especially are so touchy. Tell her a ghost story in bed to make her sleep. Have you ever seen a ghost? Well, I have. It was pitch dark night. The clock was on the stroke of twelve. Still they'd kiss all right if properly keyed up. Whores in Turkish graveyards. Learn anything if taken young. You might pick up a young widow here. Men like that. Love among the tombstones. Romeo, splice of pleasure. In the midst of death we are in life. Both ends meet, tantalizing for the poor dead. Smell of grilled beefsteaks to the starving, gnawing their vitals. Desire to grig people. Molly wanting to do it at the window. Eight children he has anyway. He has seen a fair share go under in his time, lying around him field after field, holy fields. More room if they buried them standing. Sitting or kneeling you couldn't. Standing? His head might come up some day above ground in a landslip with his hand pointing. All honeycombed the ground must be, oblong cells. And very neat he keeps, he keeps it too, trim grass and edgings. His garden, Major Gamble calls Mount Jerome. Well, so it is. Ought to be flowers of sleep. Chinese cemeteries with giant poppies growing produce the best opium, Mastiansky told me. The botanic gardens are just over there. It's the blood sinking in the earth gives new life. Same idea as those Jews they said killed the Christian boy. Every man his price. Well-preserved fat corpse, gentleman, epicure, invaluable for fruit garden. A bargain. By carcass of William Wilkinson, auditor and accountant, lately deceased. Three pounds thirteen and six, with thanks. I dare say the soil will be quite fat with corpse manure, bones, flesh, nails, charnel houses. Dreadful. Turning green and pink decomposing. Rot quick in damp earth. The lean old ones tougher. Then a kind of a tallowy, kind of cheesy. They begin to get black, black treacle oozing out of them. Then dried up. Death moths. Of course the cells of whatever they are go on living, changing about. Live forever, practically. Nothing to feed on, feed on themselves. But they must breed a devil of a lot of maggots. Soil must be simply swirling with them. Your head is simply swirls. Those pretty little seaside girls. He looks cheerful enough over it. Gives him a sense of power, seeing all the others go under first. Wonder how he looks at life. Cracking his jokes, too. Warms the cockles of his heart. The one about the bulletin. Spurgeon went to heaven 4 a.m. this morning. 11 p.m. closing time. Not arrived yet. Peter. The dead themselves, the men anyhow, would like to hear an odd joke or the women to know what's in fashion. A juicy pear or ladies punch, hot, strong and sweet. Keep out the damp. You must laugh sometimes, so better to do it that way. Grave diggers in Hamlet. Shows the profound knowledge of the human heart. Down to joke about the dead for two years at least. De mortuis nil nisi prius. Got out of mourning first. Hard to imagine his funeral. Seems a sort of joke. Read your own obituary notice. They say you live longer. Gives you second wind. New lease of life. How many have you for tomorrow? The caretaker asked. Two, Corny Kelleher said. Half ten and eleven. The caretaker put the papers in his pocket. The barrow had ceased to trundle. The mourners split and moved to each side of the hole, stepping with care around the graves. The grave diggers bore the coffin and set its nose on the brink, looping the bands round it. Burying him, we come to bury Caesar. His Ides of March or June, 
He doesn't know who is here, nor care. Now who is that lanky-looking galoot over there in the Macintosh? Now who is he, I'd like to know. Now I'd give a trifle to know who he is. Always someone turns up you never dreamt of. A fellow could live on his, on his lonesome all his life. Yes, he could. Still, he'd have to get someone to sod him after he died, so he could dig his own grave. We all do. Only man buries. No, ants too. First thing strikes anybody. Bury the dead. Say Robin Crusoe was true to life. Well, then Friday buried him. Even Friday buries a Thursday, if you come to look at it. Oh, poor Robinson Crusoe. How could you possibly do so? Poor Dignam, his last lie on the earth, in this box. When you think of them all, it does seem a waste of wood, all gnawed through. They could invent a handsome beer with a kind of panel sliding, let it down that way. Eh, hey, but well, they might object to be buried out of another fellow's. They're so particular. Lay me in my native earth, a bit of clay from the holy land, only a mother and dead-born child ever buried in the one coffin. I see what it means, I see. To protect him as long as possible, even in the earth. The Irishman's house is his coffin. Embalming in catacombs, mummies, the same idea. Mr. Bloom stood far back, his hat in his hand, counting the bared heads. Twelve. I'm thirteen. No, the chap in the Macintosh is thirteen. Death's number. Where the deuce did he pop out of? He wasn't in the chapel, that I'll swear. Silly superstition, that, about thirteen. Nice soft tweed Ned Lambert has in that suit. Tinge of purple. I had one like that when we lived in Lombard Street West. Dressy fellow he was once. He used to change three suits in a day. Must get that grey suit of mine turned by Messias. Hello, it's died. His wife forgot he's not married, or his landlady ought to have picked out those threads for him. The coffin dived out of sight, eased down by the men straddled on the grave trestles. They struggled up and out, and all uncovered. Twenty. Pause. If we were all suddenly somebody else, far away a donkey braid, rain, no such ass. Never see a dead one, they say, shame of death, they hide. Also poor papa went away. Gentle sweet air blew round the bared heads in a whisper, whisper. The boy by the grave head held his wreath with both hands, staring quietly at the black open space. Mr. Bloom moved behind the portly, kindly caretaker. Well-cut frock coat, weighing them up, perhaps, to see which will go next. Well, it is a long rest. Feel no more. It's the moment you feel. Must be damned unpleasant. Can't believe it at first. Mistake must be. Someone else. Try the house opposite. Wait, I wanted to. I haven't yet. Then darkened death chamber. Light they want, whispering all around you. Would you like to see a priest? Then rambling and wandering, delirium all you hid your life. The death struggle. His sleep is not natural. Press his lower eyelid. Watching is his nose pointed in his jaw, sinking are the soles of his feet yellow. Pull the pillow away and finish it off on the floor, since he's doomed. Devil in that picture of sinner's death, showing him a woman dying to embrace her in his shirt. Last act of Lucia. Shall I never more behold thee? Bam! He expires, gone at last. People talk about you a bit, forget you. Don't forget to pray for him. Remember him in your prayers, even Parnell, Ivy Day dying out. Then they follow, dropping into a hole one after the other. We are praying now for the repose of his soul. Hoping you're well, and not in hell. Nice change of air. Out of the frying pan of life, into the fire of purgatory. Does he ever think of the hole waiting for himself? They say you do when you shiver in the sun. Someone walking over it. Call boy's warning. Near you. Mine over there, towards Finglas, the plot I bought. 
Mama, poor Mama, and little Rudy. The grave diggers took up their spades and flung heavy clods of clay in the coffin, in on the coffin. Mr. Bloom turned away his face. And if he was alive all the time? Phew! By jingo, that would be awful. No, no, he is dead, of course. Of course he is dead. Monday he died. They ought to have some law to pierce the heart and make sure, or an electric clock or a telephone in the coffin and some kind of a canvas air hole. Flag of distress. Three days. Rather long to keep them in summer. Just as well to get shut off them as soon as you are sure there's no. The clay fell softer. Begin to be forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. The caretaker moved away a few paces and put on his hat. Had enough of it. The mourners took heart of grace, one by one, covering themselves without show. Mr. Bloom put on his hat and saw the portly figure make his way, its way deftly through the maze of graves. Quietly, sure of his ground, he traversed the dismal fields. Hines jotting down something in his notebook. Ah, the names. But he knows them all. No, coming to me. I am just taking the names, Hines said below his breath. What is your Christian name? I am not sure. L, Mr. Bloom said. Leopold. And you might put down McCoy's name, too. He asked me to. Charlie, Hines said, writing. I know. He was on the Freeman once. So he was before he got the job in the morgue under Louis Byrne. Good idea, a post-mortem for doctors. Find out what they imagine they know. He died of a Tuesday. Got the run. Levanted with the cash of a few ads. Charlie, you're my darling. That was why he asked me to. Oh, well, there's no harm. I saw to that, McCoy. Thanks, so, chap. Much obliged. Leave him under an obligation. Costs nothing. And tell us, Hines said, do you know that fellow in the... fellow was over there in the... He looked around. Macintosh. Yes, I saw him, Mr. Bloom said. Where is he now? Macintosh, Hines said, scribbling. I don't know who he is. Is that his name? He moved away, looking about him. No, Mr. Bloom began, turning and stopping. I say, Hines. Didn't hear. What? Where has he disappeared to? Not a sign. Well, of all the... Has anyone here seen? K-E-double-L. Become invisible. Good Lord, what became of him? A seventh grave digger came beside Mr. Bloom to take up an idle spade. Oh, excuse me. He stepped aside nimbly. Clay, brown, damp, began to be seen in the hole. It rose, nearly over. A mound of damp clods rose more, rose, and the grave diggers rested their spades, all uncovered again for a few instants. The boy propped his wreath against a corner, the brother in law his on a lump. The grave diggers put on their caps and carried their earthy spades towards the burrow. They knocked the blades lightly on the turf, clean, one bent to pluck from the haft a long tuft of grass. One, leaving his mates, walked slowly on with shouldered weapon, its blade blue-glancing. Silently, at the grave head, another coiled the coffin band, his navel cord. The brother-in-law, turning away, placed something in his free hand, thanks and silence. Sorry, sir, trouble. Head shake. I know that. For yourselves, just. The mourners moved away slowly without aim, by devious paths, staying at wilds to read a name on a tomb. Let us go round by the chief's grave, Hines said. We have time. Let us, Mr. Power said. They turned to the right, following their slow, th their slow thoughts. With awe, Mr. Power's blank voice spoke. Some say he is not in that grave at all, that the coffin was filled with stones that one day he will come again. Hines shook his head. Parnell will never come again, he said. He's there, all that was mortal of him. Peace to his ashes. Mr. Bloom walked unheeded along his grove by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, stone hopes, praying with upcast eyes, 
old Ireland's hearts and hands. More sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living. Pray for the repose of the soul of. Does anybody really? Plant him and have done with him. Like down a coal shoot, coal shoot. Then lump them together to save time. All souls day. Twenty-seventh I'll be at his grave. Ten shillings for the gardener. He keeps it free of weeds. Old man himself. Bent down double with his shears clipping. Near death's door. Who passed away? Who departed this life? As if they did it of their own accord. Got the shove, all of them. Who kicked the bucket? More interesting if they told you what they were. So and so, we'll write. I travelled for cork lino. I paid five shillings in the pound. Or a woman's with her saucepan. I cooked good Irish stew. Eulogy on a country churchyard. It ought to be that poem of whose is it? Wordsworth or Thomas Campbell. Entered into rest, the Protestants put it. Oh, Dr. Murrens. The great physician called him home. Well, it's God's acre for them. Nice country residence. Newly plastered and painted. Ideal spot to have a quiet smoke and read the church times. Marriage ads, they never try to beautify. Rusty wreaths hung on knobs, garlands of bronze foil. Better value that for the money. Still, the flowers are more poetical. The other gets rather tiresome, never withering. Expresses nothing. Immortelles. A bird sat tamely perched on a poplar branch. Like stuffed. Like the wedding present Alderman Hooper gave us. Who? Not a budge out of him. Knows there are no catapults to let fly at him. Dead animal even sadder. Silly Millie burying the little dead bird in the kitchen matchbox. A daisy chain and bits of broken chainies on the grave. The sacred heart that is, showing it. Heart on his sleeve. Ought to be sideways and red it should be painted like a real heart. Ireland was dedicated to it, or whatever that. Seems anything but pleased. Why this infliction? Would birds come then and peck like the boy with a basket of fruit? But he said no because they ought to have been afraid of the boy. Apollo, that was. How many? All these here once walked round Dublin. Faithful departed. As you are now, so once we were we. Besides, how could you remember everybody? Eyes walk, voice. Well, the voice, yes. Gramophone. Have a gramophone in every grave, or keep it in the house. After dinner on a Sunday. Put on poor old great-grandfather. cra rock. Hello, hello, hello. Or more fully glad crack. Awfully glad to see you again. Hello, hello. I'm of... <laughs> Remind you of the voice like a photograph reminds you of the face. Otherwise you couldn't remember the face after 15 years, they say. For instance, who? For instance, some fellow that died when I was in Wisdom Ely's. It's strooch. A rattle of pebbles. Wait, stop. He looked down intently into a stone crypt. Some animal. Wait, there he goes. An obese grey rat toddled along the side of the crypt, moving the pebbles. An old stager, great-grandfather, he knows the ropes. The grey alive crushed itself in under the plinth, wriggled itself in under it. Good hiding place for treasure. Who lives there? I'll lay the remains of Robert Emery. Robert Emmett was buried here by torchlight, wasn't he? Making his rounds. Tail gone now. One of those chaps would make short work of a fellow. Pick the bones clean, no matter what it was, who it was. Ordinary meat for them. A corpse's meat gone by. Well, and what's cheese? Corpse of milk. I read in the voyages in China that the Chinese say a white man smells like a corpse. Cremation better. Priests dared against it. Devilling for the other firm. Wholesale burners and Dutch oven dealers. Time of the plague. 
quicklime fever pits to eat them. Lethal chamber, ashes to ashes. Or bury at sea. Where is that Parsi tower of silence, eaten by birds? Earth, fire, water. Drowning, they say, is the pleasantest. See your whole life in a flash. But being brought back to life? No. Can't bury in the air, however. Out of a flying machine. Wonder does the news go about whenever a fresh one is let down. Underground communication. We learned that from them. Wouldn't be surprised. Regular square feed for them. Flies come before he's well dead. Got wind of dignum. They wouldn't care about the smell of it. Salt white crumbling mush of corpse. Smell. Taste like raw white turnips. The gates glimmered in front. Still open. Back to the world again. Enough of this place. Brings you a bit nearer every time. Last time he was here was Mrs. Sinico's funeral. Poor papa, too. The love that kills. And even scraping up the earth at night with a lantern like that case I read of to get at fresh buried females or even putrefied with running grave sores. Give you the creeps after a bit. I will appear to you after death. You will see my ghost after death. My ghost will haunt you after death. There was another world after death named Hell. I do not like that other world, she wrote. No more do I. Plenty to see and hear and feel yet. Feel live, warm beings near you. Let them sleep in their maggoty beds. They are not going to get me this innings. Warm beds. Warm, full-blooded life. Martin Cunningham emerged from a side path, talking gravely. Solicitor, I think. I know his face. Minton, John Henry, solicitor. Commissioner for oaths and affidavits. Dignam used to be in his office. Matt Dillon's long ago. Jolly Matt. Convivial evenings. Cold foul cigars. The Tantalus glasses. Heart of gold, really. Yes, Minton. Got his rag out that evening on the bowling green because I sailed inside him. Pure fluke of mine. The bias. Why, he took such a rooted dislike to me. Hate at first sight. Molly and Flowey Dillon linked under the lilac tree, laughing. Fellow always like that, mortified if women are by. Got a dinge on the side of his hat. Carriage, probably. Excuse me, sir, Mr. Bloom said beside them. They stopped. Your hat is a little crushed, Mr. Bloom said, pointing. John Henry Menton stared at him for an instant, without moving. There, Martin Cunningham helped, pointing also. John Henry Menton took off his hat, bulged out the dinge and smoothed the nap with care on his coat sleeve. He clapped the hat on his head again. It's all right now, Martin Cunningham said. John Henry Menton jerked his head down in acknowledgement. Thank you, he said shortly. They walked on towards the gates. Mr. Bloom, chap-fallen, drew behind a few places so as not to overhear. Martin laying down the law. Martin could wind a sappy head like that round his little finger without his seeing it. Oyster eyes. Never mind. Be sorry after, perhaps, when it dawns on him. Get the pull over him that way. Thank you. How grand we are this morning. This is the end of section 6 of Ulysses by James Joyce. Read by Gazina in a cafe in Valletta, June 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 7 In the heart of the Hibernian metropolis Before Nelson's pillar tramps slowed, shunted, changed trolley, started for Black Rock, Kingstown, and Dalkey, Klonsky, Rathgar, and Terenur, Palmerston Park, and Upper Rathmines, Sandy Mount Green, Rathmines, Ringsend, and Sandy Mount Tower, Herald's Cross, the horse Dublin United Tramway Company's timekeeper balled them off. Rathgar and Terenure? 
Come on, Sandy Mount Green. Right and left, parallel clanging, ringing a double-decker and a single-deck, moved from their railhead, swerved to the downline, glided parallel. Start, Palmerson Park. The wearer of the crown. Under the porch of the general post office, shoeblacks called and polished. Parked in North Princess Street, His Majesty's Vermilion mail cars, bearing on their sides the royal initials E.R., received loudly flung sacks of letters, postcards, letter cards, parcels, insured and paid, for local, provincial, British, and overseas delivery. Gentlemen of the Press Gross-booted draymen rolled barrels dull-thudding out of Prince's stores and bumped them up the brewery float. On the brewery float bumped dull-thudding barrels rolled by gross-booted draymen out of Prince's stores. There it is, Red Murray said. Alexander Keyes. Just cut it out, will you, Mr. Bloom said, and I'll take it round to the telegraph office. The door of Rutledge's office creaked again. Davy Stevens, minute in a large cape coat, a small felt hat crowning his ringlets, passed out a roll of papers under his cape, a king's courier. Red Murray's long shears sliced out the advertisement from the newspaper in four clean strokes, scissors and paste. I'll go through the printing works, Mr. Bloom said, taking the cut square. Of course, if he wants a par, Red Murray said earnestly, a pen behind his ear, we can do him one. Right, Mr. Bloom said with a nod, I'll rub that in. We. Oui. William Braden, Esquire of Oakland's Sandy Mount. Red Murray touched Mr. Bloom's arms with the shears and whispered, Braden. Mr. Bloom turned and saw the liveried porter raise his lettered cap as a stately figure entered between the newsboards of the weekly Freeman and National Press and the Freeman's Journal and National Press. Dull fed in Guinness's barrels, it passed statelily up the staircase, steered by an umbrella, a solemn beard-framed face. The broadcloth back ascended each step, back. All of his brains are in the nape of his neck, Simon Dedalus says, welts of flesh behind on him. Fat folds of neck, fat neck, fat neck. "'Don't you think his face is like our savior? Red Murray whispered. The door of Rutledge's office whispered. They always build one door opposite another for the wind to, way in, way out. Our savior, beard-framed oval face, talking in the dark. Mary, Martha, steered by an umbrella sword to the footlights. Mario the tenor. "'Or like Mario,' Mr. Bloom said. "'Yes,' Red Murray agreed, but Mario was said to be the very picture of our savior. "'Jesus Mario, with rougy cheeks, doublet and spindle legs, hand on his heart,' in Martha. The Crozier and the Pen. His grace phoned down twice this morning, Red Murray said gravely. They watched the knees, legs, boots vanish. Neck. A telegram boy stepped in nimbly, threw an envelope on the counter, and stepped off post-haste with a word. Freeman! Mr. Bloom said slowly, Well, he is one of our saviors also. A meek smile accompanied him as he lifted the counter-flap as he passed in through a side door and along the warm dark stairs and passage, along the now reverberating boards. But will he save the circulation? Thumping, thumping. He pushed in through the glass swing door and entered, stepping over strewn packing paper. Through a lane of clanking drums he made his way toward Nanetti's reading closet. Hines here, too, account of the funeral, probably. Thumping, thump. With unfeigned regret, it is, we announce the dissolution of a most respected Dublin Burgess. This morning, the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam. Machines. Smash a man to atoms if they got him caught. Rule the world today. His machineries are pegging away, too. Like these, got out of hand. Fermenting. Working away, tearing away, and that old grey rat tearing to get in. How a great daily organist turned out. Mr. Bloom halted behind the foreman's spare body, admiring a glossy crown. Strange he never saw his real country. Ireland, my country. Member for College Green. He boomed that workaday worker tack for all it was worth. It's the ads and side features sell a weekly, not the stale news in the official gazette. Queen Anne is dead. Published by authority in the year 1000 and de men situate in the town of Rosnalis, barony of Tinnehinch. To all whom it may concern, schedule pursuant to statute showing return of number of mules and jennets exported from Bellina. Nature Notes. Cartoons. Phil Blake's weekly Pat and Bull story. Uncle Toby's page for tiny tots, country bumpkins' queries, Dear Mr. Editor, what is a good cure for flatulence? I'd like that part. Learn a lot teaching others. The personal note, M.A.P., mainly all pictures, shapely bathers on golden strand, world's biggest balloon, double marriage of sisters celebrated, two bridegrooms laughing heartily at each other, Caprani, too, printer, more Irish than the Irish. The machines clanked in three-four time. Thump, thump, thump. Now if he got paralyzed there, and no one knew how to stop them, they'd clank on and on the same, print it over and over and up and back, monkey-doodle the whole thing. 
Want a cool head. Well, get it into the evening edition, Councillor, Hines said. Soon be calling him my Lord Mayor. Long John is backing him, they say. The foreman, without answering, scribbled press on a corner of the sheet and made a sign to a typesetter. He handed the sheet silently over the dirty glass screen. Right, thanks, Hines said, moving off. Mr. Bloom stood in his way. If you want to draw, the cashier is just going to lunch, he said, pointing backward with his thumb. Did you? Hines asked. Mm, Mr. Bloom said, look sharp and you'll catch him. Thanks, old man, Hines said. I'll tap him, too. He hurried on eagerly toward the Freeman's journal. Three bob I lent him in Makers. Three weeks. Third hint. We see the canvasser at work. Mr. Bloom laid his cutting on Mr. Nanetti's desk. Excuse me, counselor, he said. This ad, you see, keys, you remember? Mr. Nanetti considered the cutting a while and nodded. He wants it in for July, Mr. Bloom said. The foreman moved his pencil toward it. But wait, Mr. Bloom said, he wants it changed. Keys, you see, he wants two keys at the top. Hell of a racket they make. He doesn't hear it. Iron nerves. Maybe he understands what I... The foreman turned round to hear patiently, and lifting an elbow began to scratch slowly in the armpit of his alpaca jacket. Like that, Mr. Bloom said, crossing his forefingers at the top. Let him take that in first. Mr. Bloom, glancing sideways up from the cross he had made, saw the foreman's sallow face, think he has a touch of jaundice, and beyond the obedient reels feeding in huge webs of paper. Clank it, clank it, miles of it unreeled. What becomes of it after? Oh, wrap-up meat, parcels, various uses, a thousand and one things. Slipping his words deftly into the pauses of the clanking, he drew swiftly on the scarred woodwork. House of Keys. Like that, see? Two crossed keys here. A circle, then here the name. Alexander Keys, tea, wine, and spirit merchant. So on. Better not teach him his own business. You know yourself, counselor, just what he wants. Then round the top in leaded, the house of keys. You see? Do you think that's a good idea? The foreman moved his scratching hand to his lower ribs and scratched there quietly. The idea, Mr. Bloom said, is the house of keys. You know, counselor, the makes parliament. Innuendo of home rule. Tourists, you know, from the Isle of Man. Catches the eye, you see. Can you do that? I could ask him, perhaps, about how to pronounce that folio. But then, if he didn't know, only make it awkward for him. Better not. We can do that, the foreman said. Have you the design? I can get it, Mr. Bloom said. It was in a Kilkenny paper. He has a house there, too. I'll just run out and ask him. Well, you can do that, and just a little par calling attention. You know the usual. High-class, licensed premises. Long-felt wants, so on. The foreman thought for an instant. We can do that, he said. Let him give us a three months renewal. A typesetter brought him a limp galley page. He began to check it silently. Mr. Bloom stood by, hearing the loud throbs of cranks, watching the silent typesetters at their cases. Orthographical. Wanting to be sure of his spelling, proof fever, Martin Cunningham forgot to give us his spelling bee conundrum this morning. It is amusing to view the unpar one or an alleled embara two R's, is it? Double estment of a harassed peddler while gauging A.U. the symmetry with a Y of a peeled pear under a cemetery wall. Silly, isn't it? Cemetery put in, of course, on account of the symmetry. I should have said when he clapped on his topper. Thank you. I ought to have said something about an old hat or something. No, I could have said, looks as good as new now. See his fizz then. The nethermost deck of the first machine jodged forward its flyboard with silk the first batch of choir-folded papers. Almost human the way it silk to call attention, doing its level best to speak. That door, too, creaking, asking to be shut. Everything speaks in its own way. Noted churchman, an occasional contributor. The foreman handed back the galley page suddenly, saying, Wait, where's the archbishop's letter? It's to be repeated in the telegraph. Where's what's-his-name? He looked about him round his loud, unanswering machines. Monks, sir? A voice asked from the casting box. Aye, where's Monks? Monks? Mr. Bloom took up his cutting. Time to get out. Then I'll get the design, Mr. Nanetti, he said, and you'll give it a good place, I know. Monks? Yes, sir? Three months renewal. Want to get some wind off my chest first. Try it anyhow. Rub in August. Good idea. Horse show month. Ballsbridge. Tourists over for the show. A day father. He walked on through the case-room, passing an old man, bowed, spectacled, aproned. Old Monks, the day-father. Queer lot of stuff he must have put through his hands in his time. Obituary notices, pubs ads, speeches, divorce suits, found drowned. Nearing the end of his tether now. Sober, serious man, with a bit in the savings-bank, I'd say. Wife a good cook and washer. 
daughter working a machine in the parlor. Plain Jane, no damn nonsense. And it was the feast of the Passover. He stayed in his walk to watch a typesetter neatly distributing type. Reads it backwards first. Quickly he does it. Must require some practice, that. Poor Papa with his Haggadah book, reading backwards with his finger to me. Pesach. Next year in Jerusalem. Dear, oh dear, all that long business about that brought us out of the land of Egypt and into the house of bondage. Alleluia, Shema, Israel, Adonai, Elohenu. No, that's the other one. Then the twelve brothers, Jacob's sons, and then the lamb and the cat and the dog and the stick and the water and the butcher, and then the angel of death kills the butcher and he kills the ox and the dog kills the cat. Sounds a bit silly till you come to look into it well. Justice it means, but it's everybody eating everybody else. That's what life is, after all. How quickly he does that job. Practice makes perfect. Seems to see with his fingers. Mr. Bloom passed on out of the clanking noises through the gallery onto the landing. Now am I going to tram it out all the way and then catch him out, perhaps. Better phone him up first. Number? Yes. Same as Citron's house. Twenty-eight. Twenty-eight double four. Only once more that soap. He went down the house staircase. Who the deuce scrawled all over these walls with matches? Looks as if they did it for a bet. Heavy, greasy smell there always is in those works. Lukewarm glue in Tom's next door when I was there. He took out his handkerchief to dab his nose. Citron lemon. Ah, the soap I put there. Lose it out of that pocket. Putting back his handkerchief, he took out the soap and stowed it away, buttoned, into the hip pocket of his trousers. What perfume does your wife use? I could go home still. Tram. Something I forgot. Just to see before dressing. No, here. No. A sudden screech of laughter came from the evening telegraph office. Know who that is? What's up? Pop in a minute to phone. Ned Lambert it is. He entered softly. Aaron, green gem of the silver sea. The ghost walks, Professor McHugh murmured softly, biscuitfully, to the dusty window pane. Mr. Dedalus, staring from the empty fireplace at Ned Lambert's quizzing face, asked of it sourly, "'Agonizing Christ, wouldn't it give you a heartburn on your arse?' Ned Lambert, seated on the table, read on. "'Or again, note the meanderings of some purling rill as it babbles on its way, though quarrelling with the stony obstacles, to the tumbling waters of Neptune's blue domain, mid mossy banks, fanned by gentlest zephyrs, played on by the glorious sunlight or neath the shadows cast o'er its pensive bosom by the overarching leafage of the giants of the forest. "'What about that, Simon?' he asked over the fringe of his newspaper. "'How's that for high?' "'Changing his drink,' Mr. Dedalus said. Ned Lambert, laughing, struck the newspaper on his knees, repeating— the pensive bosom and the overarsing leafage. Oh, boys, oh, boys. And Xenophon looked upon Marathon, Mr. Dedalus said, looking again in the fireplace and to the windows, and Marathon looked on the sea. That will do, Professor McHugh cried from the window. I don't want to hear any more of the stuff. He ate off the crescent of water biscuit he had been nibbling, and, hungered, made ready to nibble the biscuit in his other hand. Highfalutin stuff, bladder bags, Ned Lambert is taking a day off, I see. Rather upsets a man's day, a funeral does. He has influence, they say. Old Chatterton, the vice-chancellor, is his grand-uncle or his great-grand-uncle. Close on ninety, they say. Sub-leader for his death written this long time, perhaps. Living to spite them, might go first himself. Johnny, make room for your uncle. The right honourable hedges heir Chattington. Dare say he writes him an odd shaky check or two on gale days. Windfall when he kicks out. Alleluia. "'Just another spasm,' Ned Lambert said. "'What is it?' Mr. Bloom asked. "'A recently discovered fragment of Cicero,' Professor McHugh answered, with pomp of tone. "'Our lovely land.' "'Short but to the point. "'Whose land?' Mr. Bloom said simply. "'Most pertinent question,' the professor said between his chews, with an accent on the who's. "'Dan Dawson's land,' Mr. Dedalus said. "'Is it his speech last night?' Mr. Bloom asked. Ned Lambert nodded. "'But listen to this,' he said. The doorknob hit Mr. Bloom in the small of the back as the door was pushed in. "'Excuse me,' J. J. O'Malloy said, entering. Mr. Bloom moved nimbly aside. "'I beg yours,' he said. "'Good day, Jack. Come in, come in. Good day. How are you, Dedalus? Well, and yourself?' J. J. O'Malloy shook his head. "'Sad.' "'Cleverest fellow at the junior bar he used to be. Decline, poor chap.' That hectic flush spells finis for a man. Touch and go with him. 
What's in the wind, I wonder? Money worry. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. You're looking extra. Is the editor to be seen? J. J. O'Molloy asked, looking towards the inner door. Very much so, Professor McHugh said. To be seen and heard. He's in his sanctum with Lenehan. J. J. O'Molloy strolled to the sloping desk and began to turn back the pink pages of the file. Practice dwindling. A might have been. Losing heart. Gambling. Debts of honor. Reaping the whirlwind. Used to get good retainers from D. and T. Fitzgerald. Their wigs to show the grey matter. Brains on their sleeve like the statue in Glasnevin. Believe he does some literary work for the Express with Gabriel Conroy. Well-read fellow. Miles Crawford began on the Independent. Funny the way those newspaper men veer about when they get wind of a new opening. Weathercocks, hot and cold in the same breath, wouldn't know which to believe. One story good till you hear the next. Go for one another bald-headed in the papers, and then all blows over. Hail fellow well met the next moment. Ah, listen to this for God's sake, Ned Lambert pleaded. Or again, if we but climb the serried mountain peaks. Bombast, the professor broke in testily. Enough of the inflated windbag. Peaks, Ned Lambert went on, towering high on high to bathe our souls, as it were. Bathe his lips, Mr. Daedalus said. Blessed and eternal God. Yes, is he taking anything for it? As twere, in the peerless panorama of Ireland's portfolio, unmatched, despite their well-praised prototypes and other vaunted prize regions, for very beauty, of bosky grove and undulating plain and luscious pastureland of vernal green, steeped in the transcendent translucent glow of our mild mysterious Irish twilight. His native Doric. The moon, Professor McHugh said. He forgot Hamlet that mantles the vista far and wide, and wait till the glowing orb of the moon shine forth to irradiate her silver effulgence. Oh, Mr. Dedalus cried, giving vent to a hopeless groan. Shite and onions! That'll do, Ned. Life is too short. He took off his silk hat, and, blowing out impatiently his bushy moustache, Welsh combed his hair with raking fingers. Ned Lambert tossed the newspaper aside, chuckling with delight. An instant after a hoarse bark of laughter burst over Professor McHugh's unshaven, black-spectacled face. There we daw, he cried. What weather upset. All very fine to jeer at it now in cold print, but it goes down like hot cake, that stuff. He was in the bakery line, too, wasn't he? Why they call him Doughy Daw. Feathered his nest well, anyhow. Daughter engaged to that chap in the inland revenue office with the motor. Hooked that nicely. Entertainments, open house, big blowout, Weatherup always said that. Get a grip of them by the stomach. The inner door was opened violently, and a scarlet beaked face, crested by a comb of feathery hair, thrust itself in. The bold blue eyes stared about them, and the harsh voice asked, What is it? And here comes the sham squire himself, Professor McHugh said grandly. Get out of that, you bloody old pedagogue, the editor said in recognition. "'Come, Ned,' Mr. Dedalus said, putting on his hat. "'I must get a drink after that.' "'Drink,' the editor cried. "'No drinks served before mass.' "'Quite right, too,' Mr. Dedalus said, going out. "'Come on, Ned.' Ned Lambert sidled down from the table. The editor's blue eyes roved toward Mr. Bloom's face, shadowed by a smile. "'Will you join us, Miles?' Mr. Lambert asked. Memorable battles recalled. "'North Cork Militia,' the editor cried, striding to the mantelpiece. "'We won every time.' North Cork and Spanish officers. Where was that, Miles? Ned Lambert asked, with a reflective glance at his toe-caps. In Ohio, the editor shouted. So it was, Bigad, Ned Lambert agreed. Passing out, he whispered to J. J. O'Molloy, Incipient jigs, sad case. Ohio, the editor crowed, in high treble from his uplifted scarlet face. My Ohio! A perfect critic, the professor said, long, short, and long. O oh, harp Aeolian! He took a reel of dental floss from his waistcoat pocket, and, breaking off a piece, twanged it smartly between two and two of his resonant, unwashed teeth. Bing-bang, bing-bang. Mr. Bloom, seeing the coast clear, made for the inner door. "'Just a moment, Mr. Crawford,' he said. "'I just want to phone about an ad.' He went in. "'What about that leader this evening?' Professor McHugh asked, coming to the editor and laying a firm hand on his shoulder. "'That'll be all right,' Miles Crawford said, more calmly. "'Never you fret. Hello, Jack, that's all right.' "'Good day, Miles,' J. J. O'Molloy said, letting the pages he held slip limply back on the file. "'Is that Canada Swindle case on today?' The telephone whirred inside. Twenty-eight. No, twenty. Double four. Yes.' "'Spot the winner.' 
Lenahan came out of the inner office with sports tissues. "'Who wants a dead cert for the gold cup?' he asked. "'Scepter with O'Madden up.' He tossed the tissues onto the table. Screams of newsboys barefoot in the hall rushed near, and the door was flung open. "'Hush,' Lenahan said. "'I hear feet stoops.' Professor McHugh strode across the room and seized the cringing urchin by the collar as the others scampered out of the hall and down the steps. The tissues rustled up in the draft, floated softly in the air-blue scrawls, and under the table came to earth. "'It wasn't me, sir. It was the big fellow shoved me, sir.' "'Throw him out and shut the door,' the editor said. "'There's a hurricane blowing.' Lenahan began to paw the tissues up from the floor, grunting as he stooped twice. "'Waiting for the racing special, sir,' the newsboy said. "'It was Pat Farrell shoved me, sir.' He pointed to two faces peering in round the doorframe. "'Him, sir.' "'Out of this with you,' Professor McHugh said gruffly. He hustled the boy out and banged the door, too. J. J. O'Malloy turned the files crackingly over, murmuring, seeking. Continued on page six, column four. "'Yes, evening telegraph here,' Mr. Bloom phoned from the inner office. "'Is the boss—' "'Yes, telegraph.' "'To where?' "'Aha, which auction rooms?' "'I see. Right, I'll catch him.' A collision ensues. The bell whirred again as he rang off. He came in quickly and bumped against Lenahan, who was struggling up with the second tissue. "'Pardon, monsieur,' Lenahan said, clutching him for an instant and making a grimace. "'My fault,' Mr. Bloom said, suffering his grip. "'Are you hurt? I'm in a hurry.' "'Knee,' Lenahan said. He made a comic face and whined, rubbing his knee. "'The accumulation of the Anno Domini.' "'Sorry,' Mr. Bloom said. He went to the door and, holding it ajar, paused. J. J. O'Malloy slapped the heavy pages over. The noise of two shrill voices, a mouth organ, echoed in the bare hallway from the newsboys squatted on the doorsteps. We are the boys of Wexford who fought with heart and hand. Exit Bloom. I'm just running round to Bachelor's Walk, Mr. Bloom said, about this ad of keys. Want to fix it up. They tell me he's round there in Dillon's. He looked indecisively for a moment at their faces. The editor, who, leaning against the mantel-shelf, had propped his head on his hand, suddenly stretched forth an arm amply. "'Be gone,' he said. "'The world is before you.' "'Back in no time,' Mr. Bloom said, hurrying out. J. J. O'Malloy took the tissues from Lenehan's hand and read them, blowing them apart gently, without comment. "'He'll get that advertisement,' the professor said, staring through his black-rimmed spectacles over the cross-blind. "'Look at the young scamps after him.' "'Show! Where?' Lenehan cried, running to the window." A street cortege. Both smiled over the cross-blind at the file of capering newsboys in Mr. Bloom's wake, the last zigzagging white on the breeze a mocking kite, a tail of white bow-knots. "'Look at the young gutter snipe behind him, hue and cry,' Lenehan said, "'and you'll kick. Oh, my rib risible! Taking off his flat spogs in the walk, small nines steal upon marks.' He began to mazurka in swift caricature across the floor on sliding feet past the fireplace to J. J. O'Molloy, who placed the tissues in his receiving hands. "'What's that?' Miles Crawford said with a start. "'Where are the other two gone?' "'Who?' the professor said, turning. "'They're gone round to the Oval for a drink. Paddy Hooper is there with Jack Hall. Came over last night.' "'Come on, then,' Miles Crawford said. "'Where's my hat?' He walked jerkily into the office behind, parting the vent of his jacket, jingling his keys in his back pocket. They jingled then in the air and against the wood as he locked his desk drawer. "'He's pretty well on,' Professor McHugh said in a low voice. "'Seems to be,' J. J. O'Malloy said, taking out a cigarette case in murmuring meditation. "'But it is not always as it seems. Who has the most matches?' The Calumet of Peace He offered a cigarette to the professor and took one himself. Lenehan promptly struck a match for them and lit their cigarettes in turn. J. J. O'Molloy opened his case again and offered it. "'Thank you, vous, Lenehan said, helping himself. The editor came from the inner office, a straw hat awry on his brow. He declaimed in song, pointing sternly at Professor McHugh. "'Twas rank and fame that tempted thee, twas empire charmed thy heart.' The professor grinned, locking his long lips. "'Eh, you bloody old Roman empire,' Miles Crawford said. He took a cigarette from the open case. Lenehan, lighting it for him with quick grace, said, "'Silence for my brand-new riddle.' "'Imperium Romanum,' J. J. O'Molloy said gently. "'It sounds nobler than British or Brixton. The word reminds one somehow of fat in the fire.' Miles Crawford blew his first puff violently towards the ceiling. "'That's it,' he said. "'We are the fat. 
You and I are the fat in the fire. We haven't got the chance of a snowball in hell. The grandeur that was Rome. Wait a moment, Professor McHugh said, raising two quiet claws. We mustn't be led away by words, by sounds of words. We think of Rome, imperial, imperious, imperative. He extended elocutionary arms from frayed stained shirt cuffs, pausing. What was their civilization? Vast, I allow, but vile. Cloacae, sewers, the Jews in the wilderness and on the mountaintop said, It is meet to be here. Let us build an altar to Jehovah. The Roman, like the Englishman who follows in his footsteps, brought to every new shore on which he set his foot, on our shore he never set it, only his cloacal obsession. He gazed about him in his toga, and he said, It is meet to be here. Let us construct a water-closet. Which they accordingly did do, Lenehan said. Our old ancient ancestors, as we read in the first chapter of Guinnesses, were partial to the running stream. They were nature's gentlemen, J. J. O'Molloy murmured. But we have also Roman law. And Pontius Pilate is its prophet, Professor McHugh responded. Do you know that story about Chief Baron Pallas? J. J. O'Molloy asked. It was at the Royal University dinner. Everything was going swimmingly. First my riddle, Lenehan said. Are you ready? Mr. O'Madden Burke, tall in copious grey of Donegal Tweed, came in from the hallway. Stephen Dedalus, behind him, uncovered as he entered. Entrez, mes enfants, Lenehan cried. I escort a suppliant, Mr. O'Madden Burke said melodiously. Youth led by experience visits notoriety. How do you do, the editor said, holding out a hand. Come in, your governor is just gone. Lenehan said to all, Silence! What opera resembles a railway line? Reflect, ponder, excogitate, reply. Stephen handed over the typed sheets, pointing to the title and signature. Who? the editor asked. Bit torn off. Mr. Garrett Deasy, Stephen said. That old pelters, the editor said. Who tore it? Was he short taken? On swift sail flaming from storm and south, he comes, pale vampire, mouth to my mouth. Good day, Stephen, the professor said, coming to peer over their shoulders. Foot and mouth. Are you turned? Bullock befriending bard. Shindy in well-known restaurant. Good day, sir, Stephen answered, blushing. The letter is not mine. Mr. Garrett Deasy asked me to. Oh, I know him, Miles Crawford said, and I knew his wife, too. The bloodiest told tartar God ever made. By Jesus, she had the foot-and-mouth disease, and no mistake. The night she threw the soup in the waiter's face in the star and garter. A woman brought sin into the world. For Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus, ten years the Greeks, O'Rourke, Prince of Brefney. Is he a widower? Stephen asked. Ay, a grass one, Miles Crawford said, his eye running down the typescript. Emperor's horses, Habsburg, an Irishman saved his life on the ramparts of Vienna. Don't you forget, Maximilian Carl O'Donnell, Graf von Tyrconnell in Ireland, sent his heir over to make the king an Austrian field marshal now. Going to be trouble there one day. Wild geese. Oh, yes, every time. Don't you forget it. The moot point is, did he forget it? J. J. O'Molloy said quietly, turning a horseshoe paperweight. Saving princes is a thank-you job. Professor McHugh turned on him. And if not, he said. I'll tell you how it was, Miles Crawford began. A Hungarian it was one day. Lost causes. Noble Marquess mentioned. We were always loyal to lost causes, the professor said. Success for us is the death of the intellect and of the imagination. We were never loyal to the successful. We serve them. I teach the blatant Latin language. I speak the tongue of a race, the acme of whose mentality is the maxim, time is money. Material domination. Dominus, Lord, where's the spirituality? Lord Jesus, Lord Salisbury, a sofa in a West End club. But the Greek... Kyrie eleison. A smile of light brightened his dark-rimmed eyes, lengthened his long lips. The Greek, he said again, Kyrios, shining word, the vowels the Semite and the Saxon know not. Kyrie, the radiance of the intellect. I ought to profess Greek, the language of the mind. Kyrie eleison. The closet-maker and the cloaca-maker will never be lords of our spirit. We are liege subjects of the Catholic chivalry of Europe that foundered at Trafalgar and of the Empire of the Spirit, not an imperium that went under with the Athenian fleets at Aegospotomy. Yes, yes, they went under. Pyrrhus, misled by an oracle, made a last attempt to retrieve the fortunes of Greece, loyal to a lost cause. He strode away from them towards the window. They went forth to battle, Mr. O'Madden Burke said grayly, but they always fell. Boo-hoo, Linehan wept with a little noise, owing to a brick received in the latter half of the matinee. 
Poor, poor, poor Pyrrhus! He whispered then near Stephen's ear. Lenehan's Limerick There's a ponderous pundit McHugh, who wears goggles of ebony hue. As he mostly sees double, to wear them, why trouble? I can't see the Joe Miller, can you? In mourning for Sallust, Mulligan says, whose mother is beastly dead. Miles Crawford crammed the sheets into a side pocket. That'll be all right, he said. I'll read the rest after. That'll be all right. Lenehan extended his hands in protest. But my riddle, he said, what opera is like a railway line? Opera? Mr. O'Madden Burke's sphinx face re-riddled. Lenehan announced gladly. The Rose of Cast Steel. See the wheeze? Rose of Cast Steel? Gee. He poked Mr. O'Madden Burke mildly in the spleen. Mr. O'Madden Burke fell back with grace on his umbrella, feigning a gasp. Help, he sighed. I feel a strong weakness. Lenehan, rising to tiptoe, fanned his face rapidly with the rustling tissues. The professor, returning by way of the files, swept his hand across Stevens and Mr. O'Madden Burke's loose ties. Paris, past and present, he said, you look like communards. Like fellows who had blown up the Bastille, J. J. O'Molloy said in quiet mockery. Or was it you shot the Lord Lieutenant of Finland between you? You look as though you had done the deed, General Bobrikov. Omnium gatherum. We were only thinking about it, Stephen said. All the talents, Miles Crawford said. Law, the classics. The turf, Lenehan put in. Literature, the press. If Bloom were here, the professor said, the gentle art of advertisement. And Madame Bloom, Mr. O'Madam Burke added, the vocal muse, Dublin's prime favourite. Lenehan gave a loud cough. Ahem, he said, very softly. Oh, for a fresh of breath air. I caught a cold in the park. The gate was open. You can do it. The editor laid a nervous hand on Stephen's shoulder. I want you to write something for me, he said. Something with a bite in it. You can do it. I see it in your face. In the lexicon of youth. See it in your face. See it in your eye. Lazy, idle little schemer. Foot and mouth disease, the editor cried in scornful invective. Great nationalist meeting in Boris in Ossery. All balls, bulldozing the public. Give them something with a bite in it. Put us all into it, damn it, soul, father, son, and holy ghost, and Jakes McCarthy. We can all supply mental pabulum, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Stephen raised his eyes to the bold, unheeding stare. He wants you for the press gang, J. J. O'Molloy said. The Great Gallagher you can do it, Miles Crawford repeated, clenching his hand in emphasis. Wait a minute, we'll paralyze Europe, as Ignatius Gallagher used to say when he was on the Charon, doing billiard-making in the Clarence. Gallagher, that was a pressman for you. That was a pen. You know how he made his mark? I'll tell you, that was the smartest piece of journalism ever known. That was in 81, 6th of May, time of the Invincibles. Murder in the Phoenix Park, before you were born, I suppose. I'll show you. He pushed past them to the files. Look at here, he said, turning. The New York World cabled for a special. Remember that time? Professor McHugh nodded. New York World, the editor said, excitingly pushing back his straw hat. Where it took place. Tim Kelly, or Kavanaugh, I mean. Joe Brady and the rest of them. Where Skin the Goat drove the car. Whole route, you see? Skin the Goat, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Fitzharris. He has that cabman's shelter, they say, down there at Butt Bridge. Hollihan told me. You know Hollihan? Hop and carry one, is it? Miles Crawford said. And poor Gumley is down there too, so he told me, minding stones for the corporation. A night watchman. Stephen turned in surprise. Gumley, he said. You don't say so. A friend of my father's, is it? Never mind Gumley, Miles Crawford cried angrily. Let Gumley mind the stones, see they don't run away. Look at here, what did Ignatius Gallagher do? I'll tell you. Inspiration of genius. Cabled right away. Have you weekly freeman of 17 March? Right, have you got that? He flung back pages of the files and stuck his finger on a point. Take page four, advertisement for Bransom's coffee, let us say. Have you got that? Right. The telephone word. A distant voice. I'll answer it, the professor said, going. B is Parkgate. Good. His finger leaped and struck point after point, vibrating. T is Vice Regal Lodge. C is where murder took place. K is Knockmaroon Gate. The loose flesh of his neck shook like a cock's wattles. An ill-starched dicky jotted up, and with a rude gesture he thrust it back into his waistcoat. Hello. Evening telegraph here. Hello. Who's there? Yes. Yes. F to P is the route Skin the Goat drove the car for an alibi. Inchicore, Roundtown, Windy Arbor, Palmerston Park, Ranelagh. F-A-B-P. Got that? 
X is Davy's public house in Upper Leeson Street. The professor came to the inner door. Bloom is at the telephone, he said. Tell him to go to hell, the editor said promptly. X is Davy's public house, see? Clever, very. Clever, Lenehan said, very. Gave it to them on a hot plate, Miles Crawford said, the whole bloody history. Nightmare from which you will never awake. I saw it, the editor said proudly. I was present. Dick Adams, the best bloody corkman the Lord ever put the breath of life in, and myself. Lenehan bowed to a shape of air, announcing, Madam, I'm Adam, and Abel was I ere I saw Elba. History, Miles Crawford cried. The old woman of Prince's Street was there first. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth over that, out of an advertisement. Gregor Gray made the design for it. They gave him the leg up. Then Patty Hooper worked Tepe, who took him on to the star. Now he's got in with Blumenfeld. That's press. That's talent. He was all their daddies. The father of scared journalism, Lenahan confirmed, and the brother-in-law of Chris Callanan. Hello, are you there? Yes, he's still here. Come across yourself. Where do you find a pressman like that now, eh? The editor cried. He flung the pages down. Clam Dever, Lenahan said to Mr. O'Madden Burke. Very smart, Mr. O'Madden Burke said. Professor McHugh came from the inner office. Talking about the Invincibles, he said, did you see that some hawkers were up before the recorder? Oh, yes, yes, J. J. Molloy said eagerly. Lady Dudley was walking home through the park to see all the trees that were blown down by the cyclone last year, and she thought she'd buy a view of Dublin. And it turned out to be a commemoration postcard of Joe Brady, or Number One, or Skin the Goat, right outside the Vice Regal Lodge, imagine. They're only in the Hook and Eye Department, Miles Crawford said. Pshaw, press in the bar. Where have you a man now at the bar like those fellows, like Whiteside, like Isaac Butt, like Silvertund O'Hagan? Ah, bloody nonsense, only in the halfpenny place. His mouth continued to twitch unspeaking in nervous curls of disdain. Would anyone wish that mouth for her kiss? How do you know? Why did you write it, then? Rhymes and Reasons Mouth, South. Is the mouth South some way? Or the South a mouth? Must be some. South, pout, out, shout, drouth. Rhymes. Two men dressed the same, looking the same, two by two. La tua pace, che parlar ti piace. Ventrem che il vento, come fa si tace. He saw them three by three, approaching girls in green, in rose, in russet, entwining, per la perso in mauve, in purple, che la pacifica ora fiamma, gold of oriflame, de rimerar fe più ardenti. But I, old men, penitent, leaden-footed, under dark neath the night, mouth south, tomb womb. Speak up for yourself, Mr. O'Maddenberg said. Sufficient for the day. J. J. O'Malloy, smiling palely, took up the gauge. My dear Miles, he said, flinging his cigarette aside, you put a false construction on my words. I hold no brief, as at present advised, for the third profession qua profession, but your cork legs are running away with you. Why not bring in Henry Grattan and Flood and Demosthenes and Edmund Burke? Ignatius Gallagher, we all know, in his Chapelisode boss, Harmsworth of the Farthing Press, and his American cousin of the Bowery Gutter Sheet, not to mention Paddy Kelly's budget, Pew's occurrences, and our watchful friend the Skibberine Eagle. Why bring in a master of forensic eloquence like Whiteside? Sufficient for the day is the newspaper thereof. Links with bygone days of yore. Grattan and Flood wrote for this very paper, the editor cried in his face. Irish volunteers, where are you now? Established 1763. Dr. Lucas, who have you now like Don Philpot Curran? Pshaw. Well, J. J. O'Malloy said, Bush K.C., for example. Bush, the editor said. Well, yes, Bush, yes. He has a strain of it in his blood. Kendall Bush, or, I mean, Seymour Bush. He would have been on the bench long ago, the professor said, only for... but no matter. J. J. O'Malloy turned to Stephen and said quietly and slowly, One of the most polished periods I think I ever listened to in my life fell from the lips of Seymour Bush. It was in that case of fratricide, the child murder case. Bush defended him. And in the porches of mine ear did pour. By the way, how did he find that out? He died in his sleep, or the other story, Beast with the Two Backs. What was that? the professor asked. Talia, Magistra Artium. He spoke on the law of evidence, J. J. O'Malloy said, of Roman justice as contrasted with the earlier Mosaic Code, the Lex Talionis, and he cited the Moses of Michelangelo in the Vatican. Ha! A few well-chosen words, Lenehan prefaced. Silence. Pause. J. J. O'Malloy took out his cigarette case. False law, something quite ordinary. 
Messenger took out his matchbox thoughtfully and lit his cigar. I have often thought, since looking back over that strange time, that it was that small act, trivial in itself, that striking of the match, that determined the whole aftercourse of both our lives. A polished period. J. J. O'Molloy resumed, moulding his words. He said of it, that stony effigy in frozen music, horned and terrible, of the human form divine, that eternal symbol of wisdom and of prophecy, which, if aught that the imagination or the hand of sculptor has wrought in marble of soul transfigured and of soul transfiguring deserves to live, deserves to live. His slim hand with a wave graced echo and fall. Fine, Miles Crawford said at once. The divine afflatus, Mr. O'Maddenburg said. You like it? J. J. O'Molloy asked Stephen. Stephen, his blood wooed by grace of language and gesture, blushed. He took a cigarette from the case. J. J. O'Molloy offered his case to Miles Crawford. Lenehan lit their cigarettes as before and took his trophy, saying, Much of us thank of us. A man of high morale. Professor McGinnis was speaking to me about you, J. J. O'Molloy said to Stephen. What do you think really of that hermetic crowd, the Opal Hush poets, A. E. the Master Mystic? The Blavatsky woman started it. She was a nice old bag of tricks. A. E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer that you came to him in small hours of the morning to ask him about planes of consciousness. McGinnis thinks you must have been pulling A. E.'s leg. He is a man of the very highest morale, McGinnis. Speaking about me. What did he say? What did he say? What did he say about me? Don't ask. No, thanks, Professor McHugh said, waving the cigarette case aside. Wait a moment. Let me say one thing. The finest display of oratory I ever heard was a speech made by John F. Taylor at the College Historical Society. Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon, the present Lord Justice of Appeal, had spoken, and the paper under debate was an essay, new for those days, advocating the revival of the Irish tongue. He turned towards Mild Crawford and said, You know Gerald Fitzgibbon, then you can imagine the style of his discourse. He is sitting with Tim Healy, J. J. O'Molloy says, rumour has it, on the Trinity College Estates Commission. He is sitting with a sweet thing, Miles Crawford said, in a child's frock. Go on, well. It was the speech, mark you, the professor said, of a finished orator, full of courteous haughtiness and pouring in chastened diction, I will not say the vials of his wrath, but pouring the proud man's contumely on the new movement. It was then a new movement. We were weak, therefore worthless. He closed his long, thin lips an instant, but eager to be on, raised an outspanned hand to his spectacles, and with trembling thumb and ring-finger touching lightly the black rims, steadied them to a new focus. Impromptu In ferial tone he addressed J. J. O'Molloy. Taylor had come there, you must know, from a sick-bed. That he had prepared his speech I do not believe, for there was not even one shorthand writer in the hall. His dark, lean face had a growth of shaggy beard round it. He wore a loose white silk neckcloth, and altogether he looked, though he was not, a dying man. His gaze turned at once, but slowly, from J. J. O'Molloy's toward Stephen's face, and then bent at once to the ground, seeking. His unglazed linen collar appeared behind his bent head, soiled by his withering hair. Still seeking, he said. When Fitzgibbon's speech had ended, John F. Taylor rose to reply. Briefly, as well as I can bring them to mind, his words were these. He raised his head firmly. His eyes bethought themselves once more. Witless shellfish swam in the gross lenses to and fro, seeking outlet. He began. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, great was my admiration in listening to the remarks addressed to the youth of Ireland, a moment since, by my learned friend. It seemed to me that I had been transported into a country far away from this country, into an age remote from this age, that I stood in ancient Egypt, and that I was listening to the speech of some high priest of that land addressed to the youthful Moses. His listeners held their cigarettes poised to hear, their smokes ascending in frail stalks that flowered with his speech. And let our crooked smokes, noble words coming, look out, could you try your hand at it yourself? And it seemed to me that I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest raised in a tone of like haughtiness and like pride. I heard his words, and their meaning was revealed to me. From the Fathers It was revealed to me that those things are good which yet are corrupted, which neither, if they were supremely good, nor unless they were good, could be corrupted. Ah, curse you, that's St. Augustine. Why will you Jews not accept our culture, our religion, and our language? You are a tribe of nomad herdsmen. We are a mighty people. You have no cities or wealth. 
our cities are hives of humanity, and our galleys, trireme and quadrireme, laden with all manner merchandise, furrow the waters of the known globe. You have but emerged from primitive conditions. We have a literature, a priesthood, an age-long history and a polity. Nile, child, man, effigy, by the Nile bank the babe Marie's kneel, cradle of bulrushes, a man supple in combat, stone-horned, stone-bearded, heart of stone. You pray to a local and obscure idol. Our temples, majestic and mysterious, are the abodes of Isis and Osiris, of Horus and Amun-Ra. Yours serfdom, awe and humbleness, ours thunder and the sea. Israel is weak, and few are her children. Egypt is a host, and terrible are her arms. Vagrants and day-laborers are you called. The world trembles at our name. A dumb belch of hunger cleft his speech. He lifted his voice above it boldly. But, ladies and gentlemen, had the youthful Moses listened to and accepted that view of life, had he bowed his head and bowed his will and bowed his spirit before the arrogant admonition, he would never have brought the chosen people out of their house of bondage, nor followed the pillar of cloud by day. He would never have spoken with the Eternal amid lightnings on Sinai's mountain top, nor ever have come down with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance, and bearing in his arms the tables of the law, graven in the language of the outlaw. He ceased, and looked at them, enjoying a silence. Ominous for him. J. J. O'Molloy said, not without regret, and yet he died without having entered the land of promise. A sudden at the moment, though from lingering illness often previously expectorated demise, Lenehan added, and with a great future behind him. The troop of bare feet was heard rushing along the hallway and pattering up the staircase. That is oratory the professor said, uncontradicted, gone with the wind, hosts at Mulligmast and Terra of the Kings, miles of ears of porches, the tribune's words howled and scattered to the four winds, a people sheltered within his voice, dead noise, a cassock records of all that ever anywhere wherever was, love and laud him, me no more. I have money. Gentlemen, Stephen said, as the next motion on the agenda paper, may I suggest that the House do now adjourn? You take my breath away. "'It is not, perchance, a French compliment,' Mr. O'Madden Burke asked. "'Tis the hour, methinks, when the wine-jug, metaphorically speaking, "'is most grateful in ye ancient hostelry. "'That it be, and hereby, is resolutely resolved. "'All that are in favour say I,' Lenehan announced. "'The contrary, no. "'I declare it carried. "'To which particular boozing shed? "'My casting vote is Mooney's.' "'He led the way, admonishing, "'We will sternly refuse to partake of strong waters, will we not? "'Yes, we will not, by no manner of means.' Mr. O'Madden Burke, following close, said with an ally's lunge of his umbrella, "'Lay on, Macduff!' "'Chip off the old block,' the editor cried, clapping Stephen on the shoulder. "'Let us go. Where are those blasted keys?' He fumbled in his pocket, pulling out the crushed type-sheets. "'Foot and mouth. I know. That'll be all right. That'll go in. Where are they? That's all right.' He thrust the sheets back and went into the inner office. "'Let us hope.' J. J. O'Molloy, about to follow him in, said quietly to Stephen, "'I hope you will live to see it published. Miles, one moment.' He went into the inner office, closing the door behind him. "'Come along, Stephen,' the professor said. "'That is fine, isn't it? It has the prophetic vision. Fuitilium, the sack of windy Troy, kingdoms of this world. The masters of the Mediterranean are fellaheen to-day.' The first newsboy came pattering down the stairs at their heels, and rushed out into the street, yelling, "'Racing special!' Dublin, I have much, much to learn. They turned to the left along Abbey Street. I have a vision, too, Stephen said. Yes, the professor said, skipping to get into step. Crawford will follow. Another newsboy shot past them, yelling as he ran. Racing special. Dear dirty Dublin. Dubliners. Two Dublin vestals, Stephen said, elderly and pious, have lived fifty and fifty-three years in Fumbley's Lane. Where is that? the professor asked. "'Off black pits,' Stephen said. "'Damp night reeking of hungry dough. "'Against the wall, face glistering tallow under her fustian shawl. "'Frantic hearts, a cassock records. "'Quicker, darlint. "'On now, dare it. Let there be life.' "'They went to see the views of Dublin from the top of Nelson's pillar. "'They save up three and ten pence in a red tin letter-box money-box. "'They shake out the threepenny bits and sixpences "'and coax out the pennies with the blade of a knife. Two and three in silver and one in seven in coppers.' They put on their bonnets and best clothes and take their umbrellas for fear it may come to rain. Life on the Raw 
They buy one and four pennyworth of brawn and four slices of panloaf at the North City dining rooms in Marlborough Street from Miss Kate Collins, proprietress. They purchase four and twenty ripe plums from a girl at the foot of Nelson's pillar to take off the thirst of the brawn. They give two threepenny bits to the gentleman at the turnstile and begin to waddle slowly up the winding staircase, grunting, encouraging each other, afraid of the dark, panting, one asking the other, have you the brawn, praising God and the Blessed Virgin, threatening to come down, peeping at the air slits. Glory be to God, they had no idea it was that high. Their names are Anne Kearns and Florence McCabe. Anne Kearns has the lumbago, for which she rubs on lordis water, given her by a lady who got a bottleful from a passionist father. Florence McCabe takes a crabine and a bottle of double X for supper every Saturday. Antithesis, the professor said, nodding twice. Vestal virgins, I can see them. What's keeping our friend? He turned. A bevy of scampering newsboys rushed down the steps, scattering in all directions, yelling, their white papers fluttering. Hard after them, Miles Crawford appeared on the steps, his hat aureoling his scarlet face, talking with J. J. O'Molloy. "'Come along,' the professor cried, waving his arm. He set off again to walk by Stephen's side. Return of Bloom "'Yes,' he said, "'I see them.' Mr. Bloom, breathless, caught in a whirl of wild newsboys near the offices of the Irish Catholic and Dublin Penny Journal, called, "'Mr. Crawford, a moment. Telegraph, racing special.' "'What is it?' Miles Crawford said, falling back a pace. A newsboy cried in Mr. Bloom's face, "'Terrible tragedy in Rathmines! A child bit by a bellows!' Interview with the editor. "'Just this ad,' Mr. Bloom said, pushing through towards the steps, puffing and taking the cutting from his pocket. "'I spoke with Mr. Keyes just now. He'll give a renewal for two months, he says, after he'll see. But he wants a par to call attention in the telegraph, too, the Saturday pink.' and he wants it copied if it's not too late, I told Councillor Nanetti from the Kilkenny people. I can have access to it in the National Library. House of Keys, don't you see? His name is Keys. It's a play on the name, but he practically promised he'd give the renewal. But he wants just a little puff. What will I tell him, Mr. Crawford? Will you tell him he can kiss my arse? Miles Crawford said, throwing out his arm for emphasis. Tell him that straight from the stable. A bit nervy. Look out for squalls. All off for a drink arm in arm, Lenehan's yachting cup on the cadge beyond. Usual blarney. Wonder, is that young Daedalus the moving spirit? Has a good pair of boots on him to-day. Last time I saw him he had his heels on view. Been walking in muck somewhere, careless chap. What was he doing in Irish town? Well, Mr. Bloom said, his eyes returning, if I can get the design I suppose it's worth a short par. He'd give the ad, I think. I'd tell him. K.M.R.I.A. "'He can kiss my royal Irish arse,' Miles Crawford cried loudly over his shoulder. "'Any time he likes, tell him.' While Mr. Bloom stood weighing the point and about to smile, he strode on jerkily. Raising the wind. "'Nullabona, Jack,' he said, raising his hand to his chin. "'I'm up to here. I've been through the hoop myself. I was looking for a fellow to back a bill for me no later than last week. Sorry, Jack, you must take the will for the deed, with a heart and a half if I could raise the wind anyhow.' J. J. O'Molloy pulled a long face and walked on silently. They caught up on the others and walked abreast. When they have eaten the brawn and the bread and wiped their twenty fingers in the paper the bread was wrapped in, they go nearer to the railings. "'Something for you,' the professor explained to Miles Crawford. Two old Dublin women on the top of Nelson's pillar.' "'Some column. That's what Waddler once said.' "'That's new,' Miles Crawford said. "'That's copy. Out for the waxies, Dargo. Two old trickies, what?' "'But they are afraid the pillar will fall,' Stephen went on. "'They see the roofs and argue about where the different churches are. "'Raftmine's Blue Dome, Adam and Eve's, St. Lawrence O'Toole's. "'But it makes them giddy to look, so they pull up their skirts.' "'Those slightly rambunctious females. "'Easy all,' Miles Crawford said. "'No poetic license. We're in the archdiocese here.' "'And settled down on their striped petticoats, "'peering up at the statue of the one-handled adulterer. "'One-handled adulterer?' The professor cried, I like that. I see the idea. I see what you mean. Dames donate Dublin sits speed pill. Velocitous aeroliths belief. It gives them a crick in their necks, Stephen said, and they are too tired to look up or down or to speak. They put the bag of plums between them and eat the plums out of it, one after another, wiping off with their handkerchiefs the plum juice that dribbles out of their mouths and splitting the plum stones slowly out between the railings. He gave a sudden loud young laugh as a close. Lenehan and Mr. O'Madden Burke, hearing, turned, beckoned, and led on across toward Mooney's. 
Finished, Miles Crawford said, so long as they do no worse. Sophist wallops haughty Helen square on proboscis, Spartans Nash Molars, Ithacan's vow pen is champ. You remind me of Antisthenes, the professor said, a disciple of Gorgias the Sophist. It is said of him that none could tell if he were bitterer against others or against himself. He was the son of a noble and a bondwoman, and he wrote a book in which he took away the palm of beauty from Argive Helen and handed it to poor Penelope. Poor Penelope, Penelope Rich. They made ready to cross O'Connell Street. Hello there, Central. At various points along the eight lines, tramcars with motionless trolleys stood in their tracks, bound for or from Rathmines, Rathfarnham, Blackrock, Kingstown, and Dalkey, Sandymount Gring, Ringsend, and Sandymount Tower, Donnybrook, Palmerston Park, and Uthbur Rathmines, all still becalmed in short circuit. Hackney cars, cabs, delivery wagons, mail vans, private broughams, aerated mineral water floats with rattling crates of bottles, rattled, rolled, horse-drawn rapidly. What, and likewise where? But what do you call it? Miles Crawford asked. Where do they get the plums? Virgilian says pedagogue, sophomore plumps for old man Moses. Call it, wait, the professor said, opening his long lips to reflect. Call it, let me see, call it, Deus nobis haec otia fecit. No, Stephen said, I call it a piscasite of Palestine, or the parable of the plums. I see, the professor said. He laughed richly. I see, he said again, with new pleasure. Moses and the promised land. We gave him that idea, he added to J. J. O'Molloy. Horatio is sinecure this fair June day. J. J. O'Molloy sent a weary sidelong glance toward the statue and held his peace. I see, the professor said. He halted on Sir John Gray's pavement island and peered aloft at Nelson through the meshes of his wry smile. Diminished digits prove too titillating for frisky frumps, and wimbles flow wangles, yet can you blame them? One-handled adulterer, he said, smiling grimly. That tickles me, I must say. Tickled the old ones, too, Miles Crawford said, if the God Almighty's truth was known. End of chapter 7「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri, in February 2006. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 8. Part 1. Pineapple rock, lemon plat, butterscotch, a sugar-sticky girl shoveling scoopfuls of creams for a Christian brother, some school treat, bad for their tummies, lozenge and comfort manufacturer to His Majesty the King, God, save, our, sitting on his throne sucking red jujubes white, a somber Y.M.C.A. young man watchful among the warm, sweet fumes of Graham Lemons placed a throwaway in a hand of Mr. Bloom. Heart-to-heart -heart talks. Blue... Me? No. Blood of the Lamb. His slow feet walked him riverward, reading, Are you saved? All are washed in the blood of the Lamb. God wants blood victim. Birth, hymen, martyr, war... Foundation of a building, sacrifice, kidney burnt offering, druids, altars. Elijah is coming. Dr. John Alexander Dowie, restorer of the church in Zion, is coming. Is coming, is coming, is coming, all heartily welcome. Paying game. Tory and Alexander last year. Polygamy. His wife will put the stopper on that. Where was that ad some Birmingham firm, the luminous crucifix? Our Saviour. Wake up in the dead of night and see him on the wall, hanging. Pepper's ghost idea. Iron nails ran in. Phosphorus it must be done with. If you leave a bit of codfish, for instance, I could see the bluey silver over it. Night I went down to the pantry in the kitchen. Don't like all the smells in it waiting to rush out. What was it she wanted? The Malaga raisins. Thinking of Spain, before Rudy was born. The phosphorescence, that bluey-greeny, very good for the brain. From Butler's Monument House corner he glanced along Bachelor's Walk. 
Daedalus's daughter there still, outside Dylan's auction rooms. Must be selling off some old furniture. Knew her eyes at once from the father. Lobbing about waiting for him. Home always breaks up when the mother goes. Fifteen children he had. Birth every year, almost. That's in their theology, or the priest won't give the poor woman the confession, the absolution. Increase and multiply. Did you ever hear such an idea? Eat you out of house and home. No families themselves to feed. Living on the fat of the land. Their butteries and larders. I'd like to see them do the black fast Yom Kippur. Cross buns. One meal and a collation for fear he'd collapse on the altar. A housekeeper of one of those fellows, if you could pick it out of her. Never pick it out of her. Like getting L.S.D. out of him. Does himself well. No guests. All for number one. Watching his water. Bring your own bread and butter. His reverence. Mum's the word. Good Lord, that poor child's dress is in flitters. Underfed she looks, too. Potatoes and marge. Marge and potatoes. It's after they feel it. Proof of the pudding. Undermines the Constitution. As he set foot on O'Connell Bridge, a puff ball of smoke plumed up from the parapet. Brewery barge with export stout. England. Sea air sours it, I heard. Be interesting some day. Get a pass through Hancock to see the brewery. Regular world in itself. Vats of porter wonderful. Rats get in, too. Drink themselves bloated as big as a collie floating. Dead drunk on the porter. Drink till they puke again like Christians. Imagine drinking that. Rats. Vats. Well, of course, if we knew all the things. Looking down, he saw, flapping strongly, wheeling between the gaunt quay walls, gulls. Rough weather outside. If I threw myself down. Reuben J.'s son must have swallowed a good bellyful of that sewage. One and eight pence too much. Hmm. It's the droll way he comes out with the things. Knows how to tell a story, too. They wheeled lower, looking for grub. Wait. He threw down among them a crumpled paper ball. Elijah, thirty-two feet per sec, is come. Not a bit. The ball bobbed unheeded on the wake of swells, floated under by the bridge piers. Not such damn fools. Also the day I threw that stale cake out of Aaron's king, picked it up in the wake fifty yards astern. Live by their wits. They wheeled, flapping. The hungry famished gull flaps o'er the waters dull. That is how poets write, the similar sounds. But then Shakespeare has no rhymes, blank verse. The flow of the language it is. The thoughts. Solemn. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain time to walk the earth. Two apples a penny, two for a penny. His gaze passed over the glazed apples, serried on her stand. Australians they must be this time of year. Shiny peels, polishes them up with a rag or a handkerchief. Wait, those poor birds. He halted again, and bought from the old apple-woman two Banbury cakes for a penny, and broke the brittle paste and threw its fragments down into the liffy. See that? The gulls swooped silently, two, then all from their heights, pouncing on prey. Gone, every morsel. Aware of their greed and cunning, he shook the powdery crumb from his hands. They never expected that. Manna. Live on fish, fishy flesh they have. All seabirds, gulls, sea goose. Swans from Anna Liffey swim down here sometimes to preen themselves. No accounting for tastes. Wonder what kind is swan meat. Robinson Crusoe had to live on them. They wheeled, flapping weakly. I'm not going to throw any more. Penny, quite enough. Lot of thanks I get, not even a caw. They spread foot and mouth disease, too. If you cram a turkey, say, on chestnut meal, it tastes like that. Eat pig like pig. But then why is it that saltwater fish are not salty? How is that? His eyes sought answer from the river, and saw a rowboat rock at anchor on the treacly swells, lazily its plastered board. Kino's eleven. Trousers. Good idea, that. Wonder if he pays rent to the corporation. How can you own water, really? It's always flowing in a stream, never the same. 
which in the stream of life we trace. Because life is a stream. All kinds of places are good for ads. That quack doctor for the clap used to be stuck up in all the greenhouses. Never see it now. Strictly confidential. Dr. High Franks. Didn't cost him a red like McGinney, the dancing master, self-advertisement. Got fellows to stick them up, or stick them up himself, for that matter, on the QT, running in to loosen a button. Fly by night. Just the place, too. Post no bills. Post a hundred and ten pills. Some chap with a dose burning him. If he... Oh! Eh? No! No! No, no, I don't believe it. He wouldn't, surely. No, no. Mr. Bloom moved forward, raising his troubled eyes. Think no more about that. After one. Time ball on the ballast office is down. Dunsink time. Fascinating little book, that is, of Sir Robert Ball's. Parallax. I never exactly understood. There's a priest. Could ask him. Pear. It's Greek. Parallel. Parallax. Met him pike hoses, she called it, till I told her about the transmigration. Oh, rocks! Mr. Bloom smiled, oh, rocks, at two windows of the ballast office. She's right, after all. Only big words for ordinary things on account of the sound. She's not exactly witty. Can be rude, too. Blurt out what I was thinking. Still, I don't know. She used to say Ben Dollard had a bass barrel-tone voice. He has legs like barrels, and you'd think he was singing into a barrel. Now, isn't that wit? They used to call him Big Ben. Not half as witty as calling him Bass Barrel Tone. Appetite like an albatross. Get outside of a baron of beef. Powerful man he was at stowing away number one base. Barrel of base. See? It all works out. A procession of white-smocked sandwichmen marched slowly towards him along the gutter. Scarlet sashes across their boards. Bargains. Like that priest they are this morning. We have sinned. We have suffered. He read the scarlet letters on their five tall white hats. H-E-L-Y-S. Wisdom Healy's. Why, lagging behind, drew a chunk of bread from under his foreboard, crammed it into his mouth and munched as he walked. Our staple food. Three bob a day, walking along the gutters, street after street. Just keep skin and bone together, bread and skilly. They are not boil. No. M. Glade's men. Doesn't bring in any business, either. I suggested to him about a transport show-cart with two smart girls sitting inside, writing letters, copy-books, envelopes, blotting paper. I bet that would have caught on. Smart girls writing something catch the eye at once. Everyone dying to know what she's writing. Get twenty of them round you, if you stare at nothing. Have a finger in the pie. Women, too. Curiosity. Pillar of salt. Wouldn't have it, of course, because he didn't think of it himself first. Or the ink bottle I suggested with a false stain of black celluloid. His ideas for ads like plum trees potted under the obituaries. Cold meat department. You can't lick em. What? Our envelopes. Hello, Jones, where are you going? Can't stop, Robinson. I am hastening to purchase the only reliable ink eraser. Can sell. Sold by Healy's Limited, 85 Dame Street. Well, out of that ruck I am. Devil of a job it was collecting accounts of those convents. Tranquilla convent. That was a nice nun there, really sweet face. Wimple suited her small head. Sister? Sister. I am sure she was crossed in love by her eyes. Very hard to bargain with that sort of a woman. I disturbed her at her devotions that morning, but glad to communicate with the outside world. Our great day, she said. Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Sweet name, too. Carmel. She knew I. I think she knew, by the way, she. If she had married, she would have changed. I suppose they really were short of money. Fried everything in the best butter all the same. No lard for them. My heart's broke, eating, dripping. They like buttering themselves in and out. Molly, tasting it, her veil up. Sister? Pat Claffy, the pawnbroker's daughter. It was a nun, they say, invented barbed wire. He crossed Westmoreland Street when apostrophe S had plodded by. Rover Cycle Shop. Those races are on today. How long ago is that? 
Gear Phil Gilligan died. We were in Lombard Street West. Wait, was it Tom's? Got the job in Wisdom Healy's year we married. Six years. Ten years ago. Ninety-four he died, yes. That's right, the big fire at Arnott's. Val Dillon was Lord Mayor. The Glencree dinner. Alderman Robert O'Reilly emptying the port into his soup before the flag fell. Bob Bob, lapping it for the inner alderman. Couldn't hear what the band played. For what we have already received, may the Lord make us. Milly was a kitty then. Molly had that elephant-gray dress with the braided frogs. Man tailored with self-covered buttons. She didn't like it, because I sprained my ankle first day she wore choir picnic at the sugar loaf. As if that. Old Goodwin's tall hat done up with some sticky stuff. Flies picnic, too. Never put a dress on her back like it. Fitted her like a glove, shoulders and hips. Just beginning to plump it out well. Rabbit pie we had that day. People looking after her. Happy. Happier then. Snug little room, that was, with the red wallpaper. Dock rolls, one and ninepence a dozen. Millie's tubbing night. American soap I bought. Elderflower. Cozy smell of her bath water. Funny she looked, soaped all over. Shapely, too. Now, photography. Poor Papa's daguerreotype atelier he told me of. Hereditary taste. He walked along the curbstone. Stream of life. What was the name of that priestly-looking chap who was always squinting in when he passed? Weak eyes, woman. Stopped in Citroen St. Kevin's Parade. Pen something. Pen Dennis? My memory is getting... Pen? Of course it's years ago. Noise of the trams, probably. Well, if he couldn't remember the day father's name, that he sees every day. Bartell Darcy was the tenor, just coming out then, seeing her home after practice. Conceited fellow, with his waxed-up mustache, gave her that song, Winds That Blow From The South. Windy night that was, I went to fetch her. There was that lodge meeting on about those lottery tickets after Goodwin's concert, in the supper-room, or oak-room, of the mansion-house. He and I behind. Sheet of her music blew out of my hand against the high school railings. Lucky it didn't. Thing like that spoils the effect of a night for her. Professor Goodwin linking her in front. Shaky on his pins, poor old sot. His farewell concerts. Positively last appearance on any stage. May be for months, and may be for never. Remember her laughing at the wind. Her blizzard collar up. Corner of Harcourt Road. Remember that gust? Brfoo! Blew up all her skirts and her boa nearly smothered old Goodwin. She did get flustered in the wind. Remember when we got home, raking up the fire, and frying up those pieces of lap of mutton for her supper, with the chutney sauce she liked, and the mulled rum. Could see her in the bedroom from the hearth, unclamping the busk of her stays. White. Swish and soft flop her stays made on the bed. Always warm from her. Always liked to let herself out. Sitting there, after till near two, taking out her hairpins. Millie tucked up in Betty House. Happy. Happy. That was the night. Oh, Mr. Bloom, how do you do? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Breen? No use complaining. How is Molly those times? Haven't seen her for ages. In the pink, Mr. Bloom said gaily. Millie has a position down in Mullinger, you know. Go away. Isn't that grand for her? Yes, in a photographer's there. Getting on like a house on fire. How are all your charges? All on the baker's list. "'Mrs. Breen said. "'How many has she? No other in sight. "'You're in black, I see. You have no—' "'No,' Mr. Bloom said. "'I have just come from a funeral. "'Going to crop up all day, I foresee. "'Who's dead when, and what did he die of? "'Turn up like a bad penny.' "'Oh, dear me,' Mrs. Breen said. "'I hope it wasn't any near relation. "'May as well get her sympathy.' "'Dignum,' Mr. Bloom said. "'An old friend of mine.' He died quite suddenly, poor fellow. Heart trouble, I believe. Funeral was this morning. Your funeral's tomorrow while you're coming through the rye. Diddle, diddle, dum, dum, diddle, diddle. Sad to lose the old friends, Mrs. Breen's woman eyes said melancholily. Now that's quite enough about that. Just quietly. Husband. And your lord and master? 
Mrs. Breen turned up her two large eyes. Hasn't lost them anyhow. Oh, don't be talking, she said. He's a caution to rattlesnakes. He's in there now with his law books, finding out the law of libel. He has me heart scalded. Wait till I show you. Hot mock turtle vapor and steam of new-baked jam puffs roly-poly poured out from Harrison's. The heavy noon reek tickled the top of Mr. Bloom's gullet. Want to make good pastry, butter, best flour, demerara sugar, or they'd taste it with a hot tea. Or is it from her? A barefoot Arab stood over the grating, breathing in the fumes. Dead in the gnaw of hunger that way. Pleasure or pain, is it? Penny dinner. Knife and fork, chained to the table. Opening her handbag, chipped leather, hat pin. Ought to have a guard on those things. Stick it in a chap's eye in the tram. Rummaging. Open. Money. Please take one. Devils if they lose sixpence. Raise cane. Husband barging. Where's the ten shillings I gave you on Monday? Are you feeding your little brother's family? Soiled handkerchief. Medicine bottle. Pastille that was fell. What is she? There must be a new moon out, she said. He's always bad, then. Do you know what he did last night? Her hands ceased to rummage. Her eyes fixed themselves on him, wide in alarm yet smiling. What? Mr. Bloom asked. Let her speak. Look straight in her eyes. I believe you. Trust me. Woke me up in the night, she said. Dream he had a nightmare. Indiges. Said the ace of spades was walking up the stairs. The ace of spades, Mr. Bloom said. She took a folded postcard from her handbag. Read that, she said. He got it this morning. What is it? Mr. Bloom asked, taking the card. U P. U P. Up, she said. Someone taking a rise out of him. It's a great shame for them, whoever he is. Indeed it is, Mr. Bloom said. She took the card back, sighing. "'And now he's going round to Mr. Benton's office. "'He's going to take an action for ten thousand pounds,' he says. "'She folded the card into her untidy bag and snapped the catch. "'Same blue serge dress she had two years ago, the nap bleaching. "'Seen its best days. "'Wispish hair over her ears, and that dowdy toque, three old grapes to take the harm out of it. "'Shabby genteel. "'She used to be a tasty dresser. "'Lines round her mouth.' "'only a year or so older than Molly. "'See the eye that woman gave her passing. "'Cruel. The unfair sex. "'He looked still at her, "'holding back behind his look of his discontent. "'Pungent mock-turtle oxtail mulligatawny. "'I'm hungry, too. "'Flakes of pastry on the gusset of her dress. "'Daub of sugary flour stuck to her cheek. "'Rhubarb tart with liberal fillings. "'Rich fruit interior. "'Josie Powell, that was.' "'in Luke Doyle's long ago. "'Dolphin's Barn. The Charades. "'You. P. Up. "'Change the subject. "'Do you ever see anything of Mrs. Beaufoy?' "'Mr. Bloom asked. "'Mina Pierfoy?' she said. "'Philip Beaufoy, I was thinking. "'Playgoer's Club. "'Matcham often thinks of the master stroke. "'Did I pull the chain? "'Yes, the last act. "'Yes.' I just called to ask on the way in, is she over it? She's in the lying-in hospital in Hollis Street. Dr. Horn got her in. She's three days bad now. Oh, Mr. Bloom said, I'm sorry to hear that. Yes, Mrs. Breen said, and a house full of kids at home. It's a very stiff berth, the nurse told me. Oh, Mr. Bloom said. His heavy, pitying gaze absorbed her news. His tongue clacked in compassion. "'I'm sorry to hear that,' he said. "'Poor thing, three days. That's terrible for her.' Mrs. Breen nodded. "'She was taken bad on the Tuesday.' Mr. Bloom touched her funny bone, gently, warning her. "'Mind, let this man pass.' A bony form strode along the curbstone from the river, staring with a rapt gaze into the sunlight, through a heavy-stringed glass. Tight as a skull-piece a tiny hat gripped his head. From his arm, a folded dust coat, a stick, and an umbrella dangled to his side. Watch him, Mr. Bloom said. He always walks outside the lampposts. Watch. Who is he, if it's a fair question? Mrs. Breen asked. Is he Dotty? His name is Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdell Farrell, Mr. Bloom said, smiling. Watch. He 
"'He has enough of them,' she said. "'Dennis will be like that one of these days.' She broke off suddenly. "'There he is,' she said. "'I must go after him. "'Good-bye. Remember me to Molly, won't you?' "'I will,' Mr. Bloom said. He watched her dodge through passers towards the shop-fronts. Dennis Breen, in skimpy frock-coat and blue canvas shoes, shuffled out of Harrison's, hugging two heavy tomes to his ribs, blown in from the bay, like old times. He suffered her to overtake him without surprise, and thrust his dull gray beard towards her, his loose jaw wagging as he spoke earnestly. Mashuga, Off his chump! Mr. Bloom walked on again easily, seeing ahead of him in sunlight the tight skull piece, the dangling stick umbrella dust coat, going the two days. Watch him! Out he goes again! One way of getting on in the world, and that other old mosey lunatic in those duds. Hard time she must have with him. You, P, up. I'll take my oath, that's Alf Bergen, or Richie Golding. Wrote it for a lark in the Scotch house, I bet anything. Round to Menton's office, his oyster eyes staring at the postcard. Be a feast for the gods. He passed the Irish Times. There might be other answers lying there. Like to answer them all. Good system for criminals. Code. At their lunch now. Clerk with the glasses there doesn't know me. Oh, leave them there to simmer. Enough bother waiting through forty-four of them. Wanted. Smart lady typist to aid gentlemen in literary work. I called you naughty, darling, because I do not like that other world. Please tell me what is the meaning. Please tell me what perfume does your wife. Tell me who made the world. The way they spring those questions on you and the other one Lizzie Twig. My literary efforts have had the good fortune to meet with the approval of the eminent poet A. E., Mr. G. O. Russell. No time to do her hair drinking sloppy tea with a book of poetry. Best paper by long chalks for a small ad. Got the provinces now. Cook and general, ex cuisine, housemaid kept. Wanted live man for spirit counter. Resp girl, R. C., Wishes to hear of post in fruit or pork shop. James Carlyle made that. Six and a half per cent dividend. Make a big deal on Coates' shares. Cacanny. Cunning old Scotch hunks. All the toady news. Our gracious and popular viscerin. Bought the Irish field now. Lady Mountcashel has quite recovered after her confinement and rode out with the Ward Union stagehounds at the enlargement yesterday at Rathos. Uneatable fox. Pot hunters too. Fear and Jack's juices make it tender enough for them. Riding astride. Sit her horse like a man. Weight carrying huntress. No side saddle or pillion for her. Not for Joe. First to the meat and in at the death. Strong as a brood mare, some of those horsey women. Swagger around livery stables. Toss off a glass of brandy neat while you'd say knife. That one in the Grosvenor this morning. Up with her on the car, whish, whish. Stonewall or five-barred gate put her mount to it. Think that pug driver did it out of spite. Who is this she was like? Oh, yes, Mrs. Miriam Dandre that sold me her old wraps and black underclothes in the Shelbourne Hotel. Divorced Spanish-American. Didn't take a feather out of her my handling them, as if I was her clothes horse. Saw her in the vice-regal party when Stubbs, the park ranger, got me in with Waylon of the Express, scavenging what the quality left. High tea. Mayonnaise I poured on the plums, thinking it was custard. Her ears ought to have tingled for a few weeks after. Want to be a bull for her. Born courtesan. No nursery work for her, thanks. Poor Mrs. Purefoy. Methodist husband. Method in his madness. Saffron bun and milk and soda lunch in the educational dairy. Y. M. C. A. Eating with a stopwatch, thirty-two chews to the minute, and still his mutton-chop whiskers grew. Supposed to be well-connected. Theodore's cousin in Dublin Castle. One Tony relative in every family. Hardy annuals he presents her with. Saw him out at the three jolly topers marching along bareheaded, and his eldest boy carrying one in a market net. The squallers, poor thing, then having to give the breast year after year all hours of the night. Selfish those titis are. Dog in the manger, 
Only one lump of sugar in my tea, if you please. He stood at Fleet Street crossing. Luncheon interval. A sixpenny at Rose? Must look up that ad in the National Library. An eightpenny in the Burton. Better. On my way. He walked on past Bolton's Westmoreland house. Tea. 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 I forgot to tap Tom Kernan. Sss. Three days, imagine groaning on a bed with a vinegared handkerchief round her forehead, her belly swollen out. Phew! Dreadful, simply. Child's head too big, forceps, doubled up inside her, trying to butt its way out blindly, groping for the way out. Kill me, that would. Lucky Molly got over hers lightly. They ought to invent something to stop that. Life with hard labor. Twilight, sleep, idea. Queen Victoria was given that. Nine, she had. A good lair. Old woman that lived in a shoe, she had so many children. Suppose he was consumptive. Time someone thought about it instead of gassing about the what was it, the pensive bosom of the silver effligence. Flap doodle to feed fools on. They could easily have big establishments, whole thing quite painless out of all the taxes, give every child born five quid, at compound interest up to twenty-one five per cent, is a hundred shillings and five tiresome pounds, multiplied by twenty decimal system, encourage people to put by money save hundred and ten, and a bit twenty-one years want to work it out on paper, come to a tidy sum more than you think. Not stillborn, of course. They are not even registered. Trouble for nothing. Funny sight, two of them together, their bellies out, Molly and Mrs. Moisel. Mother's meeting. Pathesis retires for the time being, then returns. How flat they look all of a sudden after. Peaceful eyes, weight off their mind. Old Mrs. Thornton was a jolly old soul. All my babies, she said, the spoon of pap in her mouth before she fed them. Oh, that's yum yum yum. Got her hand crushed by old Tom Wall, son. His first bow to the public. Head like a prize pumpkin. Snuffy Dr. Murrin. People knocking them up at all hours. For God's sake, doctor, wife in her throes. Then keep them waiting months for their fee. Two attendants on your wife. No gratitude in people. Humane doctors, most of them. Before the huge high door of the Irish House of Parliament, a flock of pigeons flew. Their little frolic after meals. Who will we do it on? I pick the fellow in back. Here goes. Here's good luck. Must be thrilling from the air. Apjohn, myself, and Owen Goldberg up in the trees near Goose Green playing the monkeys. Mackerel, they called me. A squad of constables debouched from College Street, marching in Indian file. Goose step. Food heated faces. Sweating helmets patting their truncheons. After their feed with a good load of fat soup under their belts. Policeman's lot is off to happy one. They split up in groups and scattered, saluting towards their beats. Let out to graze. Best moment to attack one in pudding time. A punch in his dinner. A squad of others marching irregularly. Rounded trinity railings making for the station. Bound for their troughs. Prepare to receive cavalry. Prepare to receive soup. He crossed under Tommy Moore's roguish finger. They did right to put him up over a urinal, meeting of the waters, Ought to be places for women. Running into cake shops. Settle my hat straight. There is not in this wide world a valley. Great song of Julia Morkins. Kept her voice up to the very last. Pupil of Michael Balfe's, wasn't she? He gazed after the last broad tunic. Nasty customers to tackle. Jack Bower could a tale unfold. Father a G man. If a fellow gave them trouble being lagged, they let him have it hot and heavy in the bridewell. Can't blame them, after all, with the job they have, especially the young hornies. That horse policeman, the day Joe Chamberlain was given his degree in Trinity, he got a run for his money, my word he did. His horse's hoofs clattering after us down Abbey Street. Lucky I had the presence of mind to dive into Manning's, or I was souped. He did come a wallop, by George. Must have cracked his skull on the cobblestones. I oughtn't to have got myself swept along with those medicals. "'and the Trinity jibs in their mortar-boards, looking for trouble. "'Still, I got to know that young Dixon who dressed that sting for me in the Mater, "'and now he's in Hollis Street where Mrs. Purefoy. "'Wheels within wheels. "'Police whistle in my ears still. "'All skedaddled. "'Why he fixed on me. "'Give me in charge. 
Right here it began. Up the Boers! Three cheers for Doet! We'll hang Joe Chamberlain on a sour apple tree. Silly billies! Mob of young cubs yelling their guts out. Vinegar Hill! The Butter Exchange Band! Few years' time, half of them magistrates and civil servants. War comes on, into the army helter-skelter. Same fellows used to. Whether on the scaffold high. Never know who you're talking to. Corny Helleher, he has Harvey Duff in his eye. Like that Peter or Dennis or James Carey that blew the gaff on the Invincibles. Member of the corporation, too. Egging raw the youths on to get in the know, at the time drawing secret service pay from the castle. Drop him like a hot potato. Why those plain-clothes men are always courting slavies. Easily twig a man used to uniform. Square pushing up against a back door. Maul her a bit. Then the next thing on the menu. And who is the gentleman does be visiting there? Was the young master saying anything? Peeping Tom through the keyhole. Decoy duck. Hot-blooded young student fooling round her fat arms ironing. Are those yours, Mary? I don't wear such things. Stop, or I'll tell the missus on you. Out half the night. There are great times coming, Mary. Wait till you see. Ah, go along with your great times coming. Barmaids, too. Tobacco shop girls. James Stevens's idea was the best. He knew them. Circles of ten so that a fellow couldn't round on more than his own ring. Sin, fine. Back out, you. Get the knife. Hit in hand. Stay in. The firing squad. Turnkey's daughter got him out of Richmond, off from Lusk. Putting up in the Buckingham Palace Hotel under their very noses. Garibaldi. You must have a certain fascination. Parnell. Arthur Griffith is a square-headed fellow, but he has no go in him for the mob, or gas about our lovely land. Gammon and spinach. Dublin Bakery Company's Tea Room. Debating Societies. That republicanism is the best form of government— that the language question should take precedence of the economic question. Have your daughter inveigling them to your house. Stuff them up with meat and drink. Micklemas goose. Here's a good lump of thyme seasoning under the apron for you. Have another quart of goose grease before it gets too cold. Half-fed enthusiasts. Penny roll and a walk with the band. No grace for the carver. The thought that the other chap pays best sauce in the world. Make themselves thoroughly at home. Show us over those apricots, meaning peaches, the not far distant day. Home rule sun rising in the northwest. His smile faded as he walked, a heavy cloud hiding the sun slowly, shadowing Trinity's surly front. Trams passed one another, ingoing, outgoing, clanging. Useless words. Things go on same day after day. Squads of police marching out, back. Trams in, out. Those two loonies mooching about. Dignam carted off. Mina Purefoy, swollen belly on a bed groaning to have a child tugged out of her. One born every second somewhere. Other dying every second. Since I fed the birds, five minutes. Three hundred kicked the bucket. Other three hundred born, washing the blood off. All are washed in the blood of the lamb. Bawling. Ma! City full passing away. Other cityful coming, passing away too. Other coming on, passing on. Houses, lines of houses, streets, miles of pavements, piled up bricks, stones, changing hands. This owner that, landlord never dies, they say. Other steps into his shoes when he gets his notice to quit. They buy the place up with gold, and still they have all the gold. Swindling it somewhere. Piled up in cities, worn away age after age. Pyramids in sand, built on bread and onions. Slaves, Chinese wall, Babylon, big stones left, round towers. Rest rubble, sprawling suburbs, jerry-built. Kerwin's mushroom houses built of breeze. Shelter for the night. No one is anything. This is the very worst hour of the day. Vitality. Dull, gloomy. Hate this hour. Feel as if I had been eaten and spewed. Provost's house. The Reverend Dr. Salmon. Tinned salmon. Well, tinned in there. Like a mortuary chapel. Wouldn't live in it if they paid me. Hope they have liver and bacon today. 
Nature abhors a vacuum. The sun freed itself slowly and lit glints of light among the silverware opposite in Walter Sexton's window, by which John Howard Parnell passed unseeing. There he is, the brother, image of him, haunting face. Now that's a coincidence. Course hundreds of times you think of a person and don't meet him, like a man walking in his sleep. No one knows him. Must be a corporation meeting today. They say he never put on the city marshal's uniform since he got the job. Charlie Cavanaugh used to come out on his high horse, cocked hat, puffed, powdered, and shaved. Look at the woebegone walk of him. Eaten a bad egg. Poached eyes on a ghost. I have a pain. Great man's brother. His brother's brother. He'd look nice on the city charger. Drop into the DBC, probably, for his coffee. Play chess there. His brother used men as pawns. Let them all go to pot. Afraid to pass a remark on him. Freeze them up with that eye of his. That's the fascination, the name. All a bit touched. Mad Fanny and his other sister, Mrs. Dickinson, driving about with scarlet harness. Bolt upright like Sir Jim McArdle. Still David Sheehy beat him for South Meath. Apply for the Chiltern hundreds and retire into public life. The Patriots' Banquet. Eating orange peels in the park. Simon Daedalus said when they put him in Parliament that Parnell would come back from the grave and lead him out of the House of Commons by the arm. Of the two-headed octopus, one of whose heads is the head upon which the ends of the world have forgotten to come, while the other speaks with a Scotch accent, the tentacles, they pass from behind Mr. Bloom along the curbstone, beard and bicycle, young woman, and there he is too. Now that's really a coincidence, second time. Coming events cast their shadows before. With the approval of the eminent poet, Mr. Geo Russell, that might be Lizzie Twig with him. A. E. What does that mean? Initials, perhaps. Albert Edward, Arthur Edmund, Alphonsus Eb Ed L. Esquire. What was he saying? The ends of the world with a Scotch accent. Tentacles. Octopus. Something occult. Symbolism. Holding forth. She's taking it all in, not saying a word. To aid gentlemen in literary work. His eyes followed the high figure in homespun, beard and bicycle, a listening woman at his side. Coming from the vegetarian. Only wedge bobbles and fruit. Don't eat a beefsteak. If you do, the eyes of the cow will pursue you through all eternity. They say it's healthier. Wind and watery, though. Tried it. Keep you on the run all day, bad as a bloater. Dreams all night. Why do they call that thing they gave me nutsteak? Nutarians? Fruitarians? To give you the idea you were eating rump steak. Absurd. Salty, too. They cook in soda. Keep you sitting by the tap all night. Her stockings are loose over her ankles. I detest that. So tasteless. Those literary, ethereal people they are all. Dreamy, cloudy, symbolistic. Esthetes they are. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that kind of food you see produces the like waves of the brain, the poetical. For example, one of those policemen sweating Irish stew into their shirts. You couldn't squeeze a line of poetry out of him. Don't know what poetry is, even. Must be in a certain mood. The dreamy, cloudy gull waves o'er the waters dull. He crossed at Nassau Street corner and stood before the window of Yeats and Son, pricing the field glasses. Or will I drop into old Harris's and have a chat with young Sinclair? Well-mannered fellow, probably at his lunch. Must get those glasses of mine set right. Goers' lenses, six guineas. Germans making their way everywhere. Sell on easy terms to capture trade. Undercutting. Might chance on a pair in the railway, lost property office. Astonishing the things which people leave behind them in trains and cloakrooms. What do they be thinking about? Women, too. Incredible. Last year, travelling to Ennis, had to pick up that farmer's daughter's bra and hand it to her at Limerick Junction. Unclaimed money, too. There's a little watch up there on the roof of the bank to test those glasses by. His lids came down on the lower rims of his eye-rides. Can't see it. If you imagine it's there, you can almost see it. Can't see it. He faced about, and, standing between the awnings, held out his right hand at arm's length towards the sun. Wanted to try that often. Yes, completely. 
The tip of his little finger blotted out the sun's disk. Must be the focus where the rays cross. If I had black glasses. Interesting. There was a lot of talk about those sunspots when we were in Lombard Street West, looking up from the back garden. Terrific explosions they are. There will be a total eclipse this year, autumn sometime. Now that I come to think of it, that ball falls at Greenwich time. It's the clock is worked by an electric wire from Dunsink. Must go out there some first Saturday of the month. If I could get an introduction to Professor Jolie, or learn up something about his family. That would do, too. Man always feels complimented. Flattery where least expected. Nobleman, proud to be descended from some king's mistress, his foremother. Lay it on with a trowel. Cap in hand goes through the land. Now go in and blurt out what you know you're not to. What's parallax? Show this gentleman the door. Ah! His hand fell to his side again. Never know anything about it. Waste of time. Gas balls spinning about, crossing each other, passing. Same old ding-dong always. Gas, then solid, then world, then cold. Then dead shell drifting around, frozen rock like that pineapple rock. The moon. Must be a new moon out, she said. I believe there is. He went on by La Maison Claire. Wait. The full moon was the night we were Sunday fortnight, exactly. There is a new moon. Waiting down by the tulka. Not bad for a fair view moon. She was humming. The young May moon, she's beaming, love. He, other side of her. Elbow. Arm. He. Glowworms lay a lamp. Is gleaming, love. Touch. Fingers. Asking. Answer. Yes. Stop. Stop. If it was, it was. Must. Mr. Bloom, quick breathing, slowly are walking past Adam Court. With a keep quiet relief, his eyes took note that this is the street here, middle of the day, of Bob Doran's bottle shoulders. On his annual bend, M. Coy said, They drink in order to say or do anything, or cherchez la femme. Up in the comb, with chummies and street walkers, and then the rest of the year, sober as a judge. Yes, thought so. Sloping into the empire. Gone. Plain soda would do him good. Where Pat Kinsella had his harp theater before Whitbread ran the Queen's. Broth of a boy. Dion Boki called business with his harvest moon face in a pokey bonnet. Three pretty maids from school. How time flies, eh? Showing long red pantaloons under his skirts. Drinkers, drinking, laughed, spluttering. Their drink against their breath. More power, Pat. Coarse red. Fun for drunkards. Guffaw and smoke. Take off that white hat. His parboiled eyes. Where is he now? Beggar somewhere. The harp that once did starve us all. I was happier then. Or was that I? Or am I now I? Twenty-eight I was, she twenty-three. When we left Lombard Street West, something changed. Could never like it again after Rudy. Can't bring back time. Like holding water in your hand. Would you go back to then? Just beginning then. Would you? Are you not happy in your home, you poor little naughty boy? Wants to sew on buttons for me. I must answer. Write it in the library. End of Part 1 of Chapter 8 of Ulysses This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Annie Coleman in St. Louis, Missouri in March 2006. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 8, Part 2. Grafton Street, gay with housed awnings, lured his senses. Muslin prints, silk dames and dowagers, jingle of harnesses, hoof thuds low ringing in the baking causeway. Thick feet that woman has in the white stockings, hope the rain mucks them up on her. Country bred chaw bacon, all the beef to the heels were in, always gives a woman clumsy feet. Molly looks out of plum. He passed, dallying the windows of brown Thomas, silk mercers, cascades of ribbons, filmsy, 
flimsy china silks, a tilted urn poured from its mouth a flood of blood-hued poplin, lustrous blood. The Huguenots brought that here. La causa e santa, terra, terra. Great chorus that, terri, terra, must be washed in rainwater, meyer beer. Terra bum 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 pin cushions. I'm a long time threatening to buy one, sticking them all over the place. Needles and window curtains. He bared slightly his left forearm. Scrape nearly gone. Not today, anyhow. Must go back for that lotion. For her birthday, perhaps. June, July, August, September eighth. Nearly three months off. Then she mightn't like it. Women won't pick up pins. Say it cuts low. Gleaming silks, petticoats on slim brass rails, rays of flat silk stockings. Useless to go back. Had to be. Tell me all. High voices, sun-warm silk, jingling harnesses, all for a woman, home and houses, silk webs, silver, rich fruits, spike, spicy from Jaffa. Agendeth nateum, wealth of the world, a warm human plumpness settled down on his brain. His brain yielded. Perfume of embraces all him assailed. With hungered flesh obscurely, he mutely craved to adore. Duke Street, here we are, must eat. The Burton. Feel better, then. He turned Combridge's corner, still pursued. Jingling, hoof-thuds, perfumed bodies, warm, full. All kissed, yielded and deep summer fields tangled pressed grass in trickling hallways of tenements along sofas, creaking beds. Jack, love, darling, kiss me, Reggie, my boy, love. His heart astir, he pushed in the door of the Burton restaurant. Stink gripping his trembling breath, pungent meat juice, slush of greens, see the animals feed. Men, men, men. Perched on high stools by the bar, hats shoved back at the tables, calling for more bread, no charge, swilling, wolfing, gobfuls of sloppy food, their eyes bulging, wiping wetted mustaches. A pallid, suet-faced young man polished his tumbler knife, fork and spoon with his napkin. New set of microbes. A man with an infant sauce-stained napkin tucked round him shovel it, shoveled gurgling soup down his gullet. A man spitting back on his plate, half-masticated gristle, gums, no teeth to chew, chew, chew it, chump, chomp from the grill, bolting to get it over, sad boozer's eyes, spitting off more than he can chew. Am I like that? See ourselves as others see us. Hungry man is an angry man. Working tooth and jaw. Don't. Oh, a bone. That last pagan king of Ireland, Cormac, in the school poem, choked himself at Slutty, southward of the Boyne. Wonder what he was eating. Something galoptious. St. Patrick converted him to Christianity. Couldn't swallow it all, however. Roast beef and cabbage. Once do. Smells of men, his gorge rose. Spat in sawdust, Swedish, warmish cigarette smoke, reek of plugs, built beer, men's beery piss, the stale of ferment. Couldn't eat a morsel here. Fellow sharpening knife and fork to eat all before him. Old chap picking his tootles. Slight spasm, full chewing the cud. Before and after. Grace after meals. Look on this picture, then, on that. Scoffing up stew gravy with sopping sippets of bread. Look it off the plate, man. Get out of this. He gazed round the stooled and tabled eaters, tightening the wings of his nose. Two stouts, here. One corned and cabbage. That fellow ramming a knife full of cabbage down as if his life depended on it. Good stroke. Give me the fidgets to look. Safer to eat from his three hands. Tear it limb from limb, second nature to him, born with a silver knife in his mouth. That's witty, I think. Or no, silver means born rich, born with a knife. But then the illusion is lost. An ill-girt server gathered sticky, clattering plates. Rock, the head bailiff, standing at the bar, blew the foamy crown from his tankard. Well up, it splashed yellow near his boot. A diner, knife and fork upright, elbows on table, 
ready for a second helping stare towards it stared towards the food lift across his stained square of newspaper other chap telling him something with his mouth full sympathetic listener table talk i munched hum mun do unchester monk on bunch day ha huh? did you faith mr bloom raised two fingers doubtfully to his lips his eyes said not here don't see him out i hate dirty eaters he backed towards the door Get a light snack and Davy Burns. Stop gap. Keep me going. Had a good breakfast. Roast and mashed here. Pint of stout. Every fellow for his own tooth and nail. Gulp, grub, gulp, gob stuff. He came out into clearer air and turned back towards Grafton Street. Eat or be eaten. Kill. Kill. Suppose that communal kitchen years to come, perhaps all trotting down with porringers and tommy cans to be filled. Devour contents in the street. John Howard Parnell, example, the provost of Trinity. Every mother's son, don't talk of your provost and provost of Trinity. Provost of Trinity, women and children, cabmen, priests, parsons, field marshals, archbishops. From Aylesbury Road, Clyde Road, artisans' dwellings, North Dublin Union, Lord Mayor in his gingerbread coach, old queen in a bath chair. My plate's empty. After you, with our incorporated drinking cup, like Sir Philip Crampton's fountain. Rub off the microbes with your handkerchief. Next chap rubs on a new patch with his. Father O'Flynn would make hairs of them all. Have rows of all the, have rows all the same. All for number one. Children fighting for the scrapings of the pot. Want a soup pot as big as the Phoenix Park. Harpooning flitches and hind quarters out of it. Hate people all around you. City Arms Hotel. Table d'hote, she called it. Soup, joint and sweet. Never know whose thoughts you're chewing. Then who'd wash up all the plates and forks? Might be all feeding on tabloids that time. Teeth getting worse and worse. After all, there's a lot in that vegetarian fine flavor of things from the earth. Garlic, of course, it stinks after Italian organ grinders, crisp of onions, mushrooms, truffles. Pain to the animal, too. Pluck and draw fowl. Wretched brutes there at the cattle market, waiting for the pole-axe to split their skulls open. Moo. Poor trembling calves. Meh. Staggering bob. Bubble and squeak. Butcher's bucket's wobbly lights. Give us that brisket off the hook. Plup! Raw head and bloody bones. Flayed, glass-eyed sheep hung from their haunches. Sheep snouts, bloody papered sniveling nose jam on sawdust. Top and lashers going out. Don't maul them pieces, young one. Hot, fresh blood they prescribe for decline. Blood always needed, insidious. Lick it up, smoking hot, thick, sugary, famished ghosts. Ah, I'm hungry. He entered Davy Burns. Moral pub. He doesn't chat. Stands a drink now and then, but in leap year once in four. Cashed a check for me once. What will I take now? He drew his watch. Let me see. Shandy gaff? Hello, Bloom, Nosy Flynn said from his nook. Hello, Flynn. How's things? Tip top. Let me see. I'll take a glass of burgundy and... Let me see. Sardines on the shelves. Almost taste them by looking. Sandwich? Ham and his descendants mustard and bread there. Potted meats. What is home without plum trees potted meats? Incomplete. What a stupid ad. Under the obituary notices they stuck it. All up a plum tree. Dignum's potted meat. Cannibals wood with lemon and rice. White missionary too salty, like pickled pork. Expect the chief consumes the parts of honor. Ought to be tough from exercise. His wives in a row to watch the effect. There was a right royal old nigger who ate or something the somethings of the Reverend Mr. McTrigger. With it an abode of bliss. Lord knows what concoction. Calls, moldy tripes, windpipes, faked and minced up. Puzzle find the meat. Kosher. No meat and milk together. Hygiene, that was what they call now. Yom Kippur, fast spring cleaning of inside. 
peace and war depend on some fellow's digestion. Religions, Christmas turkeys and geese, slaughter of innocents, eat, drink, and be merry. Then casual wards full after, heads bandaged, cheese digests all but itself, mighty cheese. Have you a cheese sandwich? Yes, sir. Like a few olives, too, if they had them. Italian, I prefer. Good glass of burgundy, take away that. Lubricant. A nice salad, cool as a cucumber. Tom Kerning can dress. Puts gusto into it. Pure olive oil. Millie served me that cutlet with a, spring of with a sprig of parsley. Take one Spanish onion. God made food. The devil, the cook's. Deviled crab. Wife well? Quite well, thanks. A cheese sandwich, then. Gorgonzola, have you? Yes, sir. Nosy Flynn sipped his grog. Doing, doing any singing these times? Look at his mouth. Could whistle in his own ear. Flap ears to match. Music. Knows as much about it as my coachman. Still better tell him does no harm. Free ad. She's engaged for a big tour end of this month. You may have heard, perhaps. No. Oh, that's the style. Who's getting it up? The curate served. How much is it? Seven D, sir. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bloom cut his sandwich into slender strips. Mr. McTrigger, easier than the dreamy, creamy stuff. His five hundred wives had the time of their lives. Mustard, sir? Thank you. He studded under each lifted strip yellow blobs. Their lives. I have it. It grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Getting it up, he said. Well, it's like a company idea, you see. Part shares and part profits. Hey, now I remember, Nosy Flynn said, putting his hand in his pocket to scratch his groin. Who is this was telling me? Isn't Blazes Boylan mixing up in it? A warm shock of air, heat of mustard, launched on Mr. Bloom's heart. He raised his eyes and met the stare of a bilious clock. Two. Pub clock five minutes fast. Time going on. Hands moving. Two. Not yet. His midriff yearned then upward, sank within him, yearned more longly, longingly. Wine. He smell sipped the cordial juice and, bidding his throat strongly to speed it, set his wine glass delicately down. Yes, he said. He's the organizer in point of fact. No fear, no brains. Nosy Flynn snuffled and scratched, flea having a good square meal. He had a slice of luck, Jack Mooney was telling me, over that boxing match Myler Keogh won against that soldier in the Portobello barracks. By God, he had the little kipper down in the ca County Carlo, he was telling me. Hope that dewdrop doesn't come down into his glass. No, snuffled it up. For near a month, man, before it came off, sucking duck eggs by God till further orders. Keep him off the booze, see? Oh, by God, Blazes is a hairy chap. Davy Byrne came forward from the hind bar in tuck-stitched shirt sleeves, cleaning his lips with two wipes of his napkin. Herring's blush, whose smile upon each feature plays with such and such replete. Too much fat on the parsnips. And here's himself and pepper on him, Nosy Flynn said. Can you give us a good one for the gold cup? I'm off that, Mr. Flynn, Davy Byrne answered. I never put anything on a horse. You're right there, Nosy Flynn said. Mr. Bloom ate his strips of sandwich, fresh clean bread with relish of disgust pungent mustard, the feety savor of green cheese. Sip, sips of his wine soothed his palate. Not logwood, that. Tastes fuller this weather with the chill off. Nice quiet bar. Nice piece of wood in that counter. Nicely planed. Like the way it curves there. I wouldn't do anything in not. I wouldn't do anything at all in that line, Davy Byrne said. It ruined many a man, the same horses. Vintner's sweepstake. License for the sale of beer, wine, and spirits for consumption on the premises. Heads I win, tails you lose. "'True for you,' Nosy Flynn said. "'Unless you're in the know. "'There's no straight sport going now. "'Lenehan gets some good ones. "'He's giving a scepter today. "'Zinfandel's the favorite. "'Lord Howard de Walden's won at Epsom. 
Morney Cannon is riding him. I could have got seven to one against St. Amand a fortnight before. That's so, Davy Burton said. He went towards the window, and, taking up the petty cash book, scanned its pages. I could, faith, Nosey Flynn said, snuffling. That was a rare bit of horse flesh. St. Frusquin was her sire. She won in a thunderstorm. Rothschild's filly, with wading in her ears, blue jacket and yellow cap. "'Bad luck to Big Ben Dollard and his John O'Gaunt. "'He put me off it, eh?' "'He drank resignedly from his tumbler, "'running his fingers down the flutes. "'Eh,' he said, sighing. "'Mr. Bloom, champing standing, looked upon his sigh. "'Nosy numbskull. "'Will I tell him that horse Lenehan? "'He knows already. "'Better let him forget. "'Go and lose more. "'Fool and his money. "'Do drop coming down again.' Cold nose he'd have kissing a woman. Still, they might like that. Prickly beards they like. Dogs' cold noses. Old Mrs. Roared in with the rumbling stomach sky terrier in the City Arms Motel. Molly fondling him in her lap. Oh, the big doggy bow wow wowsy wowsy. Wine soaked and softened rolled pith of bread mustard a moment mawkish cheese. Nice wine it is. Taste it better because I'm not thirsty. Bath, of course, does that. Just a bite or two. Then about six o'clock I can. Six. Six. Time will be gone by then. She... Mild fire of wine kindled his veins. I wanted that badly. Felt so off-color. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobster's claws, all the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with a pin, off trees... Snails out of the ground, the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook. Silly fish learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know risky putting anything in your mouth. Poisonous berries, Johnny Majories, roundness you think good, gaudy color warns you off. One fellow told another, and so on. Try it on the dog first. Let on by the smell or the look. Tempting fruit. Ice cones. Cream. Instinct. Orange groves, for instance, need artificial irrigation. Blebaturatras. Yes, but what about oysters? Unslightly, like a clot of phlegm. Filthy shells, devil to open them, too. Who found them out? Garbage, sewage they feed on. Fizz and red bank oysters. Effect on the sexual. Aphrodis. He was in the red bank this morning. Was he oyster's old fish at table? Perhaps he young flesh in bed? No June has no R, no oysters? But there are people like things high. Tainted game. Jugged hair. First catch your hair. Chinese eating eggs, fifty years old, blue and green again. Dinner of thirty courses, each dish harmless might mix inside. Idea for a poison mystery. That Archduke Leopold, was it no, yes, or was it Otto, one of those Habsburgs? Or who was it used to eat the scruff off his own head? Cheapest lunch in town. Of course, aristocrats, then the others copy to be in the fashion. Millie, too, rock oil and flour. Raw pastry, I like myself. Half the catch of oysters they throw back in the sea to keep up the price. Cheap, no one would buy. Caviar, do the grand. Hawk and green glasses. Swell blowout. Lady this. Powdered bosom pearls. The elite. Creme de la creme. They want special dishes to pretend there. Hermit with a patter. Hermit with a platter of pulse keep down the stings of the flesh. Know me, come eat with me. Royal sturgeon, high sheriff, coffee, the butcher. Write to venisons of the forest from his ex. Send him back the half of a cow. Spread I saw down in the master of the roll's kitchen area. White-hatted chef like a rabbi. Combustible duck. Curly cabbage a la duchesse de parm. Just as well to write it on the bill of fares. You can know what, you've e what you've eaten. Too many drugs spoil the broth. I know it myself. Dosing it with Edward's desiccated soup. Geese stuffed silly for them. Lobsters boiled alive. Do take some ptarmigan. Wouldn't mind being a waiter in a swell hotel. Tips, evening dress, half-naked ladies. May I tempt you to a little more filet de lemon sole, Miss Dubedat? 
Yes, do, bedad. And she did, bedad. Who cannot name, I expect, that. A Miss Dubedat lived in Killiney, I remember. Dieu de la French. Still, it's the same fish, perhaps, old Mickey Hanlon of Moore Street ripped his... Ripped the guts out of making money, hand over fist, finger, and fish's gills, can't write his name on a check, think he was painting the landscape with his mouth twisted. Moo a achita, ha, ignorant as a kish of brogues, worth fifty thousand pounds. Stuck on the pane, two flies buzzed, stuck. Glowing wine on his palate, lingered, swallowed, crushing in the wine press grapes of burgundy. Sun's heat it is, seems to a secret touch telling me memory, touching his sense moistened remembered, hidden under wild ferns on health below us bay sleeping sky, no sound, the sky, the bay purple by the lion's head, green by drumleck, yellow green toward Sutton, fields of undersea, the lines, faint brown and grass buried cities, pillowed on my coat she had her hair, Earwigs in the heather scrub, my hand under her nape. You'll toss me all. Oh, wonder! Cool, soft with ointments, her hand touched me, caressed. Her eyes upon me did not turn away. Ravished over her I lay, full lips full open, kissed her mouth. Yum! Softly she gave me in her mouth the seed cake, warm and chewed. Mawkish pulp her mouth had mumbled, sweet sour of her spittle. Joy, I ate it. Joy. Young life, her lips that gave me pouting. Soft, warm, sticky gum jelly lips. Flowers her eyes were. Take me, willing eyes. Pebbles fell, she lay still. A goat, no one. High on Ben Houth, rhododendrons, a nanny goat, walking shore-footed, dropping currants. Screened under ferns, she laughed, warm-folded. Wildly, I lay on her, kissed her. Eyes, her lips, her upstretched neck beating, woman's breasts full in her blouse of nuns veiling, fat nipples upright. Hot, I tongued her. She kissed me. I was kissed. All yielding, she tossed my hair. Kissed, she kissed me. Me, and me now. Stuck, the flies buzzed. His downcast eyes followed the silent veining of the oaken slab. Beauty, it curves. Curves are beauty. Shapely goddesses, Vino, Venus, Juno, curves the world admires. Can see them, library museum standing in the round hall. Naked goddesses. Aids to digestion. They don't care what a man looks. All to see. Never speaking. I mean to say to fellows like Flynn. Suppose she did Pygmalion in Galatia. What would she say first? Mortal, put you in your proper place. Quaffing nectar at mess with God's golden dishes all ambrosial. Not like a tanner lunch we have. Boiled mutton, carrots and turnips, bottles of allsop. Nectar, imagine it drinking electricity. God's food. Lovely forms of women, sculpted Junonian. Immortal lovely. And we stuffing food in one hole and out behind. Food, child, blood, dung, earth, food. Have to feed it like stoking an engine. They have, no, never looked. All look today. Keeper won't see. Bend down, let something drop, see if she... Dribbling a quiet message from his bladder came to go to do not to do there to do. A man and ready he drained his glass to the lees and walked. Two men too they gave themselves, manly conscience. Lay with men lovers, a youth enjoyed her, to the yard. When, when the sound of his boots had ceased, Davy Byrne said from his book, What is this he is? Isn't he in the insurance line? He's out of that long ago. Nosy Flynn said. He does canvassing for the freeman. I know him well to see, Davy Byrne said. Is he in trouble? Trouble? Nosy Flynn said. Not that I heard of. Why? I noticed he was in mourning. Was he? Nosy Flynn says. 
"'So he was, Faith. I asked him how he was all at home. "'You're right, by God, so he was.' "'I never broached the subject,' David Byrne said he mainly. "'If I see a gentleman is in trouble that way, "'it only brings it up fresh in their minds.' "'It's not the wife, anyhow,' Nosy Flynn said. "'I met him the day before yesterday, "'and he, coming out of that Irish farm dairy "'John Wise Nolan's wife, has in Henry Street, "'with a jar of cream in his hand, "'taking it home to his better half. "'She's well nourished, I tell you.' "'Plover's on toast. "'And is he doing the freeman?' "'And is he doing for the freeman?' "'David Byrne said. "'Nosy Flynn pursed his lips. "'He doesn't buy cream on the ads he picks up. "'You can make bacon of that.' "'How so?' "'Davy Byrne asked, coming from his book. "'Nosy Flynn made swift passages in the air with juggling fingers. "'He winked. "'He's in the craft,' he said. "'Do you tell me so?' David Byrne said. "'Very much so,' Nosy Flynn said. "'Ancient, free, and accepted order. "'He's an excellent brother. "'Light, love, light, life, and love, by God. They give, him, "'They give him a leg up. "'I was told that by a... "'Well, I won't say who.' "'Is that a fact? "'Oh, it's a fine order,' Nosy Flynn said. "'They stick to you when you're down. "'I know a fellow was trying to get into it, "'but they're as close as damn it. "'By God, they did right to keep the woman out of it.' "'David Byrne smiled, yawned, nodded all in one. "'Yuck!' "'There was one woman,' Nosy Flynn said, "'hit herself in a clock to find out what they do be doing.' "'But be damned, they smelt her out and swore her in on the spot a master mason. "'That was one of the St. Legers of Donorel. "'David Byrne, sated after his yawn, said with tear-washed eyes, "'And is that a fact? Decent quiet man he is. "'I often saw him in here, and I never once saw him, you know, over the line.' "'God Almighty couldn't make him drunk,' Nosy Flynn said firmly. "'Slips off when the fun gets too hot. "'Didn't you see him look at his watch?' "'Ah, you weren't there. "'If you ask him to have a drink, first thing he does, "'he outs with his watch to see what he ought to imbibe. "'Declare to God he does.' "'There are some like that,' Davy Byrne says. "'He's a safe man, I'd say.' "'He's not too bad,' Nosy Flynn said, snuffling it up. "'He's been known to put his hand down to help a fellow. "'Give the, f give the devil his due. "'Oh, Bloom has his good points, but there's one thing he'll never do.' His hand scrawled a dry pen signature beside his grog. I know, Davy Byrne said. Nothing in black and white, Nosy Flynn said. Patty Leonard and Bantam Lyons came in. Tom Rochford followed, frowning, a planing hand on his claret waistcoat. Day, Mr. Byrne. Day, gentlemen. They paused at the counter. Who's standing? Patty Leonard asked. I'm sitting anyhow, Nosy Flynn answered. "'Well, what'll it be?' Patty Leonard asked. "'I'll take a stone ginger,' Bantam Lyons said. "'How much?' Patty Leonard cried. "'Since when, for God's sake? What's yours, Tom?' "'How was the main drainage?' Nosy Flynn asked, sipping. "'For answer, Tom Rochford pressed his hand to his breastbone and hiccuped. "'Would I trouble you for a glass of fresh water, Mr. Byrne?' he said. "'Certainly, sir.' Patty Leonard eyed his ailmates. "'Lord love a duck,' he said. "'Look at what I'm standing drinks to. "'Cold water and ginger pop. Two fellows that could suck whiskey off a sore leg. "'He has some bloody horse up his sleeve for the gold cup. "'A dead snip.' "'Zinfandel, is it?' Nosy Flynn asked. "'Tom Roachford split powder from a twisted paper "'into the water set before him. "'That cursed dyspepsia,' he said before drinking." "'Bread soda is very good,' Davy Byrne said. "'Tom Rochford nodded and drank. "'Is it Zinfandel?' "'Say nothing,' Bantam Lyons winked. "'I'm going to plunge five bob on my own.' "'Tell us if you're worth your salt and be damned to you,' "'Patty Leonard said. "'Who gave it to you?' "'Mr. Bloom, on his way out, raising three fingers in greeting. "'So long,' Nosy Flynn said. "'The others turned. "'That's the ma man that gave it to me,' Bantam Lyons whispered. Psh, Patty Leonard said with scorn. Mr. Burns, sir, we'll take two of your small Jamesons after that, and a stone ginger, Davy Byrne added civilly. Eh, Patty Leonard said, a sucking bottle for the baby. 
Mr. Bloom walked towards Dawson Street, his tongue brushing his teeth smooth. Something green it would have to be, spinach, say. Then, with those Rontgen rays, searchlight you could. At Duke Lane, a ravenous terrier choked up a sick, knuckly cud on the cobblestones and lapped it with new zest. Surfeit. Returned with thanks, having fully digested the contents. First sweet, then savory. Mr. Bloom coasted warily. Ruminants. His second course. Their upper jaw they moved. Wonder if Tom Rutchford will do anything with that invention of his. Wasting time explaining it to Flynn's mouth. Lean people, long mouths. Ought to be a hall or a place where inventors could go in and invent free. Of course, then you'd have all the cranks pestering. He hummed, prolonging in solemn echo the closes of the bars. Don Giovanni, a sinartico, mi invitasti. Feel better. Burgundy, good pick-me-up. Who distilled first? Some chap in the blues. Dutch courage. That Kilkenny people in the National Library now, I must. Bare, clean, closet tools waiting in the window of William Miller, plumber. Turn back his thoughts. They could, and watch it all the, all the way down, swallow a pin sometimes, come out of the ribs years after, tour around the body, changing biliary ducts, spleens, squirting liver gastric juices, gastric juice coils of intestines like pipes. But the poor buffer would have to stand all the time with his inside entrails on show. Science. Ah, can our teco. What does that teco mean? Tonight, perhaps. Don Giovanni, thou hast me invited to come to supper tonight. The rum, the rum dum. Doesn't go properly. Keys. Two months if I get to Nanetti, too. That'll be two pounds, ten, about two pounds, eight. Three hinds owes me, two, eleven. Prescott's dye works van over there. If I get Billy Prescott's ad, two, fifteen. Five guineas about, on the pig's back. Could buy one of those silk petticoats for Molly, color of her new garters. Today, today, not think. Tour the south, then. What about English watering places? Brighton, Margate, piers by moonlight, her voice floating out, those lovely seaside girls, against John Long's a drowsing loafer, lounged in heavy thought, gnawing a crusted knuckle. Handyman wants job, small wages, will eat anything. <coughs> Mr. Bloom turned at Gray's confectioner's window of unbought tarts and passed the Reverend Thomas Connellan's bookstore. Why I left the Church of Rome, bird's nest. Women run him. They say they used to give pauper children soup to change to Protestants in the time of the potato blight. Society over the way Papa went, too, for the conversion of poor Jews. Same bait, why we left the Church of Rome. A blind stripling stood tapping the curbstone with a slender cane. No tram in sight. Wants to cross. Do you want to cross? Mr. Bloom asked. The, the blind stripling did not answer. His wall face frowned weakly. He moved his head uncertainly. You're in Dawson Street, Mr. Bloom said. Molesworth Street is opposite. Do you want to cross? There's nothing in the way. The cane moved out trembling to the left. Mr. Bloom's eye followed its line and saw again the dye works van drawn up before Drago's, where I saw his brilliantined hair just when I was, horse drooping, driver in John Long's, slicking his droth. There's a van there, Mr. Bloom said, but it's not moving. I'll see you across. Do you want to go to the Molesworth Street? Yes, the stripling answered, South Frederick Street. Come, Mr. Bloom said. He touched the thin elbow gently, then took the limp, seeing hands to guide it forward. Say something to him. Better not do the condescending. They mistrust what you tell them. Pass a common r remark. The rain kept off. No answer. Stains on his coat. Slobbers his food, I suppose. Tastes all different for him. Have to be spoon-fed first. Like a child's hand, his hand, like Milly's was. Sensitive. Sizing me up, I dare say, from my hand. Wonder if he has a name. Van, keep his cane clear, clear of the horse's legs. 
Tired drudge get his doze. That's right, clear. Behind a bull, in front of a horse. Thanks, sir. Knows I'm a man. Voice. Right now? First turn to the left. The blind stripling tapped the curbstone and went on his way, drawing his cane back, feeling again. Mr. Bloom walked behind the eyeless feet, a flat-cut suit of herringbone tweed. Poor young fellow. How on earth did he know that van was there? Must have felt it. See things in their forehead, perhaps. Kind of sense of volume. Weight or size of it. Something blacker than the dark. Wonder what he... Wonder would he feel it if something was removed. Feel a gap. Queer idea of Dublin he must have, tapping his way round by the stones. Could he walk in a beeline if he hadn't that cane? Bloodless, pious face like a fellow going in to be a priest. Penrose, that was the chap's name. Look at all the things they can learn to do. Read with their fingers. Tune pianos. Or we are surprised they have any brains. Why we think a deformed person or a hunchback clever if he says something we might say. Of course the other senses are more. Embroider. Plate baskets. People ought to help. Work basket I could buy for Molly's birthday. Hates sewing. Might take an objection. Dark men, they call them. Sense of smell must be stronger, too. Smells on all sides bunched together. Each street, different smell. Each person, too. Then the spring, the summer, smells. Tastes? They say you can't taste wines with your eyes shut or a cold in the head. Also smoke in the dark, they say, get no pleasure. And with a woman, for instance, more shame not seeing. And with a woman, for instance, more shameless not seeing. That girl passing the Stewart Institution, head in the air. Look at me, I have them all on. Must be strange not to see her. Kind of a form in his mind's eye. The voice, temperatures, when he touches her with his fingers, must almost see the lines, the curves. His hands on her hair, for instance. Say it was black, for instance. Good, we call it black. Then passing over her white skin. Different feel, perhaps. Feeling of white. Post office. Must answer. Fag today. Send her a postal order, two shillings, half a crown. Accept my little present. Stationer's just here, too. Wait, think it over. With a gentle finger, he felt ever so slowly the hair combed back above his ears. Again. Fibers of fine, fine straw. Then gently his finger felt the skin of his right cheek. Downy hair there, too. Not smooth enough. The belly is the smoothest. No one about. There he goes into Frederick Street. Perhaps to Levenston's dancing academy piano. Might be settling my braces. Walking by Doran's public house, he slid his hand between his waistcoat and trousers and, pulling aside his shirt gently, felt a slack fold of his belly. But I know it's whitey yellow. Want to try in the dark to see. He withdrew his hand and pulled his dress too. Poor fellow. Quite a boy. Terrible, really terrible. What dreams would he have, not seeing? Life, a dream for him. Where is the justice being born that way? All those women and children, excursion, beanfest, burned and drowned in New York, holocaust, karma, they call that transmigration for sins you did in a past life, the reincarnation met him, pike hoses. Dear, dear, dear. Pity, of course, but somehow you can't cotton on to them some way. Sir Frederick Falconer going into the Freemasons' Hall. Solemn is Troy. After his good lunch in Earlsfort Terrace. Old legal cronies cracking a magnum. Tales of the bench and assizes and annals of the blue coat school. I sentenced him to ten years. I suppose he'd turn his nose up at that stuff I drank. Vintage wine for them, the year marked on a dusty bottle. Has his own ideas of justice in the recorder's court. Well-meaning old man. Police charge sheets crammed with cases get their percentage manufacturing crime. Sends them to the right about. The devil on moneylenders. Gave Reuben J. a great straw calling. Now he's really what they call a dirty Jew. Power those judges have. Crusty old topers and wigs. 
bear with a sore paw, and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Hello, placard. Myris Bazaar, His Excellency the Lord Lieutenant, 16th. Today it is, in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital. The Messiah was first given for that. Yes, Handel. What about going out there, Ballsbridge, drop in on keys? No use sticking to him like a leech, wear out my welcome. Sure to know someone on the gate. Mr. Bloom came to Kildare Street. First, I must. Library. Straw hat in sunlight, tan shoes, turned up trousers. It is. It is. His heart quapped softly. To the right, museum, goddesses. He swerved to the right. Is it? Almost certain. Won't look. Wine in my face. Why did I? Too heady. Yes, it is. The walk. Not see. Get on. Making for the museum gate with long, windy steps, he lifted his eyes. Handsome building. Sir Thomas Dean designed. Not following me? N <clears throat> Didn't see me, perhaps. Light in his eyes. The flutter of his breath came forth in short sighs. Quick. Cold statues, quiet there. Safe in a minute. No, didn't see me. After two, just at the gate. My heart! His eyes, beating, looked steadfastly at cream curves of stone. Sir Thomas Dean was the Greek architecture. Look for something, I. His hasty hand went quick into a pocket, took out red, unfolded agendeth nateum. Where did I? Busy looking. He thrust back quick Agendath. Afternoon, she said. I am looking for that. Yes, that. Try all pockets. Hanker. Freeman. Where did I? Ah, yes. Trousers. Potato. Purse. Where? Hurry, walk quietly. Moment more. My heart. His hand looking for the where did I put found in his hip pocket. Soap lotion have to call tepid paper stuck. Ah, soap. There I... Yes. Gate. Safe. End of chapter 8 Ulysses by James Joyce, Section 9. A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire, Michael Hind, Amanda Vlad, Colin Robertson, Wilson Blanton, Christine Myers, Andrew Skinner, Mike Trevino, Jean Francois Rondeau. Urbane, to comfort them, the Quaker librarian purred. And we have, have we not, those priceless pages of Wilhelm Meister, a great poet on a great brother poet, a hesitating soul taking arms against the sea of troubles torn by conflicting doubts as one sees in real life. He came a step, a sink pace forward, on a neat's leather creaking and a step backwards, a sink pace on the solemn floor, a noiseless attendant, setting open the door but slightly made him a noiseless beck. Directly, said he, creaking to go, albeit lingering, the beautiful, ineffectual dreamer who comes to grief against hard facts, one always feels that Goethe's judgments are so true, true in the larger analysis. Twice creakingly analysis, he corantoed off. Bald, most zealous by the door, he gave his large ear all to the attendant's words, heard them, and was gone. Two left. Monsieur de la Palisse, Stephen sneered, was alive fifteen minutes before his death. Have you found those six brave medicals? 
John Eglinton asked with elder's gall to write Paradise Lost at your dictation. The sorrows of Satan, he calls it. Smile, smile, Cranley, smile. First he tickled her, then he patted her, then he passed the female catheter, for he was a medical jolly old moddy. I feel you would need one more for Hamlet. Seven is dear to the mystic mind, the shining seven, W.B. calls them. Glitter-eyed, his rufous skull close to his green cap desk lamp sought the face, bearded amid dark greener shadow, and ole, holy-eyed, he laughed low, a Caesar's laugh of Trinity, unanswered. Orchestral Satan weeping many a road, tears such as angels weep. Ed elgi avia del cul fato trombetta. He holds my follies hostage. Cranley's eleven true wicklow women to free their sireland. gap toothed Kathleen her four beautiful green fields, the stranger in her house, and one more to hail him. Ave Rabbi. The Tinahi twelve. In the shadow of the glen he cooies for them. My soul, youth, I gave him night by night. God speed, God hunting. Mulligan has my telegram. Folly, persist. Our young Irish bards, John Eglinton is censured, have yet to create a figure which the world will set beside Saxon Shakespeare's Hamlet, though I admire him as old Ben did on this side idolatry. All these questions are purely academic, Russell oracled out of the shadow. I mean whether Hamlet is Shakespeare or James I or Essex, clergyman's discussions in the historicity of Jesus. Art has to re reveal to us ideas, formless spiritual essences. The supreme question about a work of art is out of how deep a life does it spring. The painting of Gustave Moreau is a painting of ideas. The deepest poetry of Shelley, the words of Hamlet, bring our mind into contact with the eternal wisdom. Plato's world of ideas. All the rest is the speculation of schoolboys for schoolboys. A.E. has been telling some Yankee interviewer, while tarnation strike me. The schoolmen were schoolboys first, Stephen said super politely. Aristotle was once Plato's schoolboy. And has remained so. One should hope, John Eglinton sedately said. One can see him, a model schoolboy, with his diploma under his arm. He laughed again at the now smiling bearded face, formless, spiritual, father, word, and holy breath. All father, the heavenly man, Hesios Christos, magician of the beautiful, the logos who suffers in us at every moment. This verily is that, I am fire upon the altar. I am the sacrificial butter. Dunlop, judge, the noblest Roman of them all. A.E., Arvel, the name in ineffable. In heaven height, K.H., their master, whose identity is no secret to adepts. Brothers of the great white lodge, always watching to see if they can help. The Christ with the bride sister, moisture of light, born of an ensouled virgin, repentant Sophia, departed to the plate of Buddhi. The life esoteric is not for ordinary person. O.P. must work off bad karma first, Mrs. Cooper Oakley once glimpsed. Our very illustrious sister, H.P.B.'s elemental. O oh, fie, out, unt, pufightful, you notent look, Mrs. So you notent when a lady's showing off her elemental. Mr. Best entered tall, young, mild, light, he bore in his hand with grace a notebook, new, large, clean, bright. That model schoolboy, Stephen said, would find Hamlet's musings about the afterlife of his princely soul, the improbable, insignificant, and undramatic monologue as shallow as Plato's. John Eglinton, frowning, said, waxing wroth, Upon my word, it makes my blood boil to hear anybody compare Aristotle with Plato. Which of the two, Stephen asked, would have banished me from his commonwealth? Unsheath your dagger definitions. Horseness is the whatness of all horse. Streams of tendency and eons they worship. 
God, noise in the street, very peripatetic. Space, what you damn well have to see. Through spaces smaller than red globules of man's blood, they creepy crawl after Blake's buttocks into eternity, of which this vegetable world is but a shadow. Hold to the now, the here, through which all future plunges to the past. Mr. Best came forward, amiable towards his colleague. Haynes is gone, he said. Is he? I was showing him Jubainville's book. He's quite enthusiastic, don't you know, about Hyde's love songs of Connaught. I couldn't bring him to hear the discussion. He's gone to Gill's to buy it. Bound thee forth my booklet quick to greet the callous public, writ, I ween, twas not my wish, in lean, unlovely English. The peat smoke's, the peat smoke's going to his head, John Eglinton opined. We feel in England, pertinent thief, gone. I smoked his backy, green twinkling stone, an emerald set in the ring of the sea. People do not know how dangerous love songs can be, the auric egg of Russell warned occultly. The movements which work revolutions in the world are born out of the dreams and visions in the peasant's heart of the hillside. For them, the earth is not an exploitable ground, but the living mother. The rarefied egg of the academy and the arena produced the six-shilling novel, the music hall song. France produces the finest flower of corruption in Malarmé, but the desirable life is revealed only to the poor of heart, the life of Homer's Phaeacians. From these words, Mr. Best turned an offending face to, unoffending face to Stephen. Mallarmé, don't you know, he said, has written these wonderful prose poems Stephen McKenna used to read to me in Paris. The one about Hamlet, he says, Il se promène, lisant, au livre de lui-même. Don't you know, reading the book of himself. He describes Hamlet given in a French town, don't you know, a, a provincial town. They advertised it. His free hand graciously wrote tiny signs in the air. Hamlet ou le distrait, pièce de Shakespeare. He repeated it to John Eglinton's new-gathered frown. Pièce de Shakespeare. Don't you know, it's, it's so French, the, the French point of view. Hamlet ou... The absent-minded beggar, Stephen ended. John Eglinton laughed. Yes, I suppose it would be, he said. Excellent people, no doubt, but distressingly short-sighted in some manners. Matters. Sumptuous and stagnant exaggeration of murder. A deathsman of the soul, Robert Greene called him. Stephen said. Not for nothing was he a butcher's son, wielding the sledded pole-axe and splitting in his, spitting in his palm. Nine lives are taken off for his father's one, our father who art in purgatory. Khaki hamlets don't hesitate to shoot. The blood-bolted shambles in Act Five is a forecast of the concentration camp sung by Mr. Swinburne. Cannily, I, his mute orderly, followed battles from afar. Whelps and dams of murderous foes whom none but he had spared. Between the Saxon smile and Yankee whelp, the devil in the deep sea. We will have it that Shakespeare is a ghost story, John Eglinton said for the Mr. Best's behoof. Like the fat boy in Pickwick, he wants to make our flesh creep. List, list, oh list. My flesh hears him creeping, hears if thou didst ever... What is a ghost, Stephen said with tingling energy? One who has faded into impalpability through death, through absence, through change of manners? Elizabeth in London lay as far from Stratford as corrupt Paris lies from virgin Dublin. Who is the ghost from limbo partum, patrum, returned to the world that has forgotten him? Who is King Hamlet? John Eglinton shifted his spare body, leaning back to judge, lifted. It is this hour of the day in mid-June, Stephen said, begging with a swift glance their hearing. The flag is up on the playhouse by the bankside. The bare Sackerson growls in the pit near it, Paris Garden. 
Canvas climbers who sailed with Drake chew their sausages among the groundlings. Local color. Work in all you know. Make them accomplices. Shakespeare has left the Huguenot's house in Silver Street and walks by the swan mews along the riverbank, but he does not stay to feed the pen, chivying her game with signets toward the rushes. The swan of Avalon has other thoughts. Composition of place. Ignatius Loyola, make haste to help me. The play begins. A player comes on under the shadow, made up of the cast-off male of a court buck, a well-set man with a bass voice. It is the ghost, the king, a king and no king, the, and the player is Shakespeare, who has studied Hamlet all the years of his life, which were not vanity in order to play the part of the specter. He speaks the word to Burbage, the young player who stands before him beyond the rack of Sarah calling him by name. Hamlet, I am thy father's spirit, but bidding him to list. To a son he speaks, the son of the soul, the prince, young Hamlet, and to the son of his body, Hamnet. Shakespeare, who has died in Stratford, that his namesake may live on forever. Is it possible that the player Shakespeare, a ghost by absence, and in the vesture of buried Denmark, a ghost by death, speaking his own words to his own son's name, had Hamnet Shakespeare lived, he would have been the Prince Hamlet's twin? Is it possible, I want to know, or probable, that he did not draw or foresee the logical conclusion of those pre premises? You are the disposed son, dispossessed son. I am the murdered father. Your mother is the guilty queen. And Shakespeare, born Hathaway? But this prying into the family life of a great man, Russell began impatiently. Art thou there, True Penny? Interesting only to the Paris clerk. I mean, we have the plays. I mean, we, we read the poetry of King Lear. What is, this, what is it to know how the poet lived? As for living, our servants can do that for us. Villiers de Lille has said, peeping and prying into the green room gossip of the day, the poet's thinking, the poet's debts. We have King Lear, and it is immortal. Mr. Best's face appealed to, agreed. Sirrah, that pound he lent you when you were hungry? Mary, I wanted it. Take thou this noble. Go to. You spent most of it in Georgina Johnson's bed, clergyman's daughter, agonbite of inwit. Do you intend to pay it back? Oh, yes. When? Now? Well, no. When then? I paid my way. I paid my way. Steady on. He's from Ben Bayant Boyne Water, the northeast corner. You owe it. Wait. Five months. Molecules all change. I'm other. I now. Other. I got pound. Buzz. Buzz. But I, Entelechy, form of forms, Am I by memory because under ever-changing forms, I that sinned and prayed and fasted, a child con me saved from pandies, I and I, I, A-E-I-O-U. Do you mean to fly in the face of the tradition of three centuries? John Eglinton's carping voice asked, her ghost, at least, has been laid forever. She died, for literature at least, before she was born. She died, Stephen retorted, 67 years after she was born. She saw him into and out of the world. She took his first embraces. She bore his children, and she laid pennies on his eyes to keep his eyelids closed when he lay on his deathbed. Mother's deathbed. Candle. The sheeted mirror. Who brought me into this world lies there, bronze lidded under few cheap flowers. Liliata rutilantium. I wept alone. 
John Eglinton looked in the tangled glowworm of his lamp. The world believes that Shakespeare made a mistake, he said, and got out of it as quickly and as best he could. Bosh, Stephen said rudely. A man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals of discovery. Portals of discovery open to let in the Quaker librarian, soft, creek-footed, bald, eared, and assiduous. A shrew, John Eglinton said shrewdly, is not a useful portal of discovery, one should imagine. What useful discovery did Socrates learn from Xanthippe? Dialectic, Stephen answered and from his mother how to bring thoughts into the world, what he learnt from his other wife, Myrto, absit nomen, Socratidonians, Epipsychidian, no man, not a woman, will ever know. But neither the midwife's lore nor the caudal lectures saved him from the archons of Sinn Féin and their noggin of hemlock. But Anne Hathaway, Mr. Best's voice said forgetfully, yes, we seem to be forgetting here as Shakespeare himself forgot her. His look went from brooder's beard to carper's skull to remind, to chide them not unkindly, then to the bald pink lollard costard, guiltless though maligned. He had a good groat's worth of wit, Stephen said, and no truant memory. He carried a memory in his wallet as he trudged to Romeville, whistling, The Girl I Left Behind Me. If the earthquake did not time it, we should know where to place poor Watt, sitting in his form, the cry of hounds, the studded bridle, and her blue windows. That memory, Venus and Adonis, lay in the bedchamber of every light of love in London. Is Catherine the shrew ill-favored? Hortensio calls her young and beautiful. Do you think the writer of Ant Antony and Cleopatra, a passionate pilgrim, had his eyes in the back of his head that he chose the ugliest doxy in all Warwickshire to lie with all? Good. He left her and gained the world of men. But his boy women are the women of a boy. Their life, thought, speech are lent them by males. He chose badly. He was chosen, it seems to me. If others have their will, Anne hath a way. By cock she was to blame. She put the comether on him, sweet and twenty-six, the gray-eyed goddess who bends over the boy Adonis, stooping to conquer as prologue to the swelling act, is a bold-faced Stratford wench who tumbles in a cornfield, a, young, a lover younger than herself. And my turn? When? Come. Ryefield, Mr. Best said brightly, gladly, raising his new book, gladly, brightly. He murmured then with blonde delight for all, between the acres of the rye, these pretty country folk would lie. Paris, the well-pleased pleaser. A tall figure in bearded homespun rose from shadow and unveiled its cooperative watch. I'm afraid I am due at the homestead. Wither away, exploitable ground. Are you coming? John Eglinton's active eyebrows asked. Shall we see you at Moore's tonight? Piper is coming. Piper! Mr. Best piped. Is Piper back? Peter Piper pecked a peck of pick of peck of pickled pepper. I don't, I don't know if I can. Thursday, we have our meeting. If I can get away in time. Yogi Bogey Box in Dawson Chambers. Isis unveiled. Their pally book. 
we tried to pawn. Cross-legged, under an umbral, umber shoot, he thrones an Aztec logos functioning on astral levels. Their oversoul, Mahamat, Mahamatma, the famous hermitess, await the light ripe for Chelship, ring round about him. Lewis H. Victory, T. Caulfield Irwin, Lotus Ladies, tend them, eth eyes, their pineal glands aglow, filled with his god, he thrones bud under plantain, golfer of souls, engulfer, he souls, she souls, shoals of souls, engulfed with wailing cree cries, whirled, whirling, they bewail. In quintessential triviality, for years in this flesh case, a she soul dwelt. They say we are to have a literary surprise, the Quaker librarian said, friendly and earnest. Mr. Russell, rumor has it, is gathering together a sheaf of our younger poets' verses. We are all looking forward anxiously. Anxiously, he glanced in the cone of lamplight where three faces lighted shone. See this. Remember. Stephen looked down at a wide, headless cobean hung on his ash plan handle over his knee. My cask and sword, touched lightly with two index fingers, Aristotle's experiment, one or two. Necessity is that in virtue of which it is impossible that one can be otherwise. Argal, one hat, is one hat. Listen, young Colum and Starkey, George Roberts is doing the commercial part. Longworth will give it a good puff in the express. Oh, Willie, I like Colum's drover. Yes, I think he has that queer thing, genius. Do you think he has genius, really? Yeats admired his line, as in wild earth a Grecian vase. Did he? I hope you'll be able to come tonight. Malachi Mulligan is coming, too. Moore asked him to bring Haynes. Did you hear Miss Mitchell, Mitchell, Mitchell's joke about Moore and Martin? That Moore is Martin's wild oats? Awfully clever, isn't, he? isn't it? They remind one of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza's. Panza. Our national epic has yet to be written, Dr. Surgeson says. Moore is the man for it, a knight of the rueful countenance here in Dublin. With a saffron kilt? O'Neill Russell? Oh yes, he must speak the grand old tongue. And his Dulcinea? James Stevens is doing some clever sketches. We are becoming important, it seems. Cordelia, Cordoglia, Cordoglio, Lear's loneliest daughter. Nux Houghton, now your best French polish. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell, Stephen said, rising. If you will be so kind as to give the letter to Mr. Norman. Oh, yes, if he considers it important, it will go in. We have so much correspondence. I understand, Stephen said. Thanks. Good it'll you. The pig's paper. <laughs> Bollock befriending. Singe has promised me an article for Dana, too. Are we going to be read? I feel we are. The Gaelic tongue wants something in Irish. I hope you will come around tonight. Bring Starkly. Stephen sat down. The Quaker librarian came from the leave-takers. Blushing, his mask said, Mr. Daedalus, your views are most illuminating. He creaked to and fro, tiptoeing up nearer heaven by the altitude of a chopine, and covered by the noise of outgoing, said low, Is it your view, then, that she was not faithful to the poet? Alarmed face asks me, Why did he come? Courtesy? or an inward light. When there is a reconciliation, Stephen said, there must have been first a sundering. Yes. 
Christ fox in leather trues, hiding, a runaway in blighted tree forks from hue and cry, knowing no vixen, walking lonely in the chaise. Women, he won to him, tender people, a whore of Babylon, ladies of justices, bully tapsters, wives, fox and geese, and in new place a slack dishonored body that once was comely, once as sweet, as fresh as cinnamon, now her leaves falling, all bare, frighted of the narrow grave and unforgiven. Yes, so you think, the door closed behind the outgoer. Rest suddenly possessed, the discreet vaulted cell, rest or warm and brooding air. A vestal's lamp. Here he ponders things that were not. What Caesar would have lived to do had he believed the soothsayer? What might have been? Possibilities of the possible as possible. Things not known. What name Achilles bore when he lived among women? Coffin thoughts around me in mummy cases, embalmed in spice or words. Thoth, god of libraries, a bird god, moony crowned. And I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest in painted chambers loaded with tile books. They are still. Once quick in the brains of men, still but an itch of death is in them to tell me in my ear a maudlin tale, urge me to wreck their will. Certainly, John Engleton mused, of all great men, he is the most enigmatic. We know nothing but that he lived and suffered, not even so much. Others abide our question. A shadow hangs over all the rest. But Hamlet is so personal, isn't it? Mr. Best pleaded. I mean, a kind of private paper, don't you know, of his private life. I mean, I don't care a button, don't you know, who was killed or who was guilty. He rested an innocent book on the edge of the desk, smiling his defiance. His private papers in the original. Ta and Bal, Arantir. Time ino shagart, put burla on it, little John, quoth little John Engleton. I was prepared for paradoxes from what Malachi Mulligan told us, but I may as well warn you that if you want to shake my belief that Shakespeare is Hamlet, you have a stern task before you. Bear with me. Stephen withstood the bane of miscreant eyes, glinting stern under wrinkled brows. A basilisk. And quando vedi l'uomo latica, Messer Brunetto, I thank thee for thy word. As we, our mother Dana, weave and unweave our bodies, Stephen said, from day to day, their molecules shuttled to and fro, so does the artist weave and unweave his image. And as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, through all my body has woven of new stuff time after time, so though the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth. In the intense instant of imagination, when the mind, Shelley says, is a fading coal that which I was, is that which I am, and that which, it, which in possibility I may come to be. So in the future, the sister of the past, I may see myself as I sit here now, but by reflect from, reflection from that which then I shall be. Drummond of Hawthornden helped you at that style. Yes, Mr. Best said youngly, I feel Hamlet, qu Hamlet quite young. The bitterness might be from the father, but the passages with Ophelia are surely from the son. Has the wrong sow by the lug? Is he in my father? I am his son. That mole is the last to go, Stephen said, laughing. John Angleton made a, a nothing-pleasing mow. 
If that were the birthmark of genius, he said, genius would be a drug in the market. The plays of Shakespeare's later years, which Renan admired so much breath and other spirit. The spirit of reconciliation, the Quaker librarian breathed. There can be no re reconciliation, Stephen said, if there has not been a sundering, said that. If you want to know what are the events which cast their shadow over the hell of time of King Lear, Othello, Hamlet, Troilus, and Cressida, look to see when and how the shadow lifts. What softens the heart of a man, shipwrecked in storms dire, tried, like another Ulysses, Pericles, Prince of Tyre, head recondicapped, buffeted, pride blighted, a child, a girl placed in his arms, Marina, the leaning of sophists towards the bypass, or apoph apocrypha, is a constant quantity, John Angleton de detected. The high roads are dreary, but they lead to the town. Good bacon gone musty. Shakespeare bacon's wild oats. Cipher jugglers going the high roads. Seekers on the great quest. What town, good masters? Mummed in names. A. E. Eon. McGee. John Eglinton. East of the sun, west of the moon. Tir na nog. Booted the twain and staved. How many miles to Dublin? Three score and ten, sir. Will we, will we be there by candlelight? Mr. Brandes accepts it, Stephen says, as the first play of the closing period. Does he? What does Mr. Sidney Lee, or Mr. Simon Lazarus, as some of there his name is, say of it? Marina, Stephen says, a child of storm. Miranda, a wonder. Perdita, that which was lost. What was lost is given back to him, his daughter's child. My dearest wife, Pericles says, was like this maid. Will any man love the daughter if he has not loved the mother? The art of being a grandfather, Mr. Best can murmur. L'art d'être grand. His own image to a man with that queer thing genius is the standard of all experience, material and moral. Such an appeal will touch him. The images of other males of his blood will repel him. He will see in them grotesque attempts of nature to foretell or repeat himself. The benign forehead of the Quaker librarian enkindled rosily with hope. I hope Mr. Dedalus will work out his theory for the enlightenment of the public. And we ought to mention another Irish commentator, Mr. George Bernard Shaw. Nor should we forget Mr. Frank Harris. His articles on Shakespeare in the Saturday Review were surely brilliant. Oddly enough, he too draws for us an unhappy re relation with the Dark Lady of the Sonnets. The favoured rival is William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke. I own that if the poet must be rejected, such a rejection would seem more in harmony with, what shall I say, our notions of what ought not to have been. Felicitously, he ceased and held a meek head among them, ox egg, prize of their fray. He thou's and these her with grave husband words. Dost love, Miriam? Dost love thy man? That may be too, Stephen says. There is a saying of Gotis which Mr. McGee likes to quote. Beware of what you wish for in youth, because you will get it in middle life. Why does he send to one who is a buona roba, a bay where all men ride, a maid of honour with a scandalous girlhood? a lordling to woo for him. He was himself a lord of language and had made himself a coistral gentleman and had written Romeo and Juliet. Why? Belief in himself has been untimely killed. He was overborne in a cornfield first, ryefield, I should say, and he will never be a victor in his own eyes after nor play victoriously in the game of laugh and lie down. Assumed Don Giovannism will not save him, no later undoing will undo the first undoing. The tusk of the boar has wounded him there where love lies a-bleeding. 
if the shrew is worsted, yet there remains to her woman's invisible weapon. There is, I feel in the words, some goad of the flesh driving him into a new passion, a darker shadow of the first, darkening even his own understanding of himself. A like fate awaits him and the two rages commingle in a whirlpool. They list, and in the porches of their ears I pour. The soul has been before stricken mortally, a poison poured in the porch of a sleeping ear. But those who are done to death in sleep cannot know the manner of their quell unless their creator endow their souls with that knowledge in the life to come. The poisoning and the beast with two backs that urged it King Hamlet's ghosts could not know of where of were he not endowed with knowledge by his creator. That is why the speech, his lean, unlovely English, is always turned elsewhere, backward. Ravisher and ravished, what he would but would not, go with him from Lucrece's blue-circled ivory globes to Imogen's breast, bare with its mole sink-spotted. He goes back, weary of the creation he has piled up to hide him from himself, an old dog licking an old sore. But because loss is his gain, he passes on towards eternity in undiminished personality, untaught by the wisdom he has written or by the laws he has revealed. His beaver is up. He is a ghost, a shadow now, the wind by Elsinore's rocks or what you will, the sea's voice, a voice heard only in the heart of him who is the substance of his shadow, the son consubstantial with the father. Amen, responded from the doorway. Hast thou found me, O oh mine enemy? Entracte. A ribald face, sullen as a dean's, Buck Mulligan came forwards then, blithe and motley, towards the greeting of their smiles. My telegram. You are speaking of the gaseous vertebrate, if I mistake not, he asked of Stephen. Primrose vested, he greeted gaily with his doffed panama, as with a bauble. They make him welcome. Vas du verlax, wirst du noch deinen. Brood of mockers, Fodius, Sudamalaki, Johann Most. He who himself begot, Midler of the Holy Ghost, and himself sent himself, Eigenbeier, between himself and others, who, put upon by his fiends, stripped and whipped, was nailed like bat to barn door, starved on cross tree, who let him bury, stood up, harrowed hell, fared into heaven, and there these nineteen hundred years sitteth on the right hand of his own self, but yet shall come in the latter day to doom the quick and dead, when all the quick shall be dead already. He lifts hands, veils fall, O oh, flowers, bells with bells with bells acquiring. Yes, indeed, the Quaker librarian said. A most instructive discussion, Mr. Mulligan, I'll be bound, has his theory too of the play and of Shakespeare. All sides of life should be represented. He smiled on all sides equally. Buck Mulligan thought, puzzled. Shakespeare, he said. I seem to know the name. A flying sunny smile rayed in his loose features. To be sure, he said, remembering brightly, the chap that writes like Singe. Mr. Best turned to him. Haynes missed you, he said. Did you meet him? He'll see you after at the DBC. He's gone to Gill's to buy Hyde's Love Songs of Canuck. I came to the museum, Buck Mulligan said. Was he there? The bard's fellow countrymen, John Eglinton answered, are rather tired, perhaps, of our brilliancies of theorizing. I hear that an actress played Hamlet for the 408th time last night in Dublin. Vining held that the prince was a woman. Has no one made him out to be an Irishman? Judge Barton, I believe, is searching for some clues. He swears, his highness not his lordship, by St. Patrick. The most brilliant of all is that the story of Wilde's, Mr. Best said, lifting his brilliant notebook, that portrait of Mr. W.H., where he proves that the sonnets were written by William Hughes, a man, of all, a man all Hughes. For Willie Hughes, is it not? The Quaker librarian asked. Or Huey Wills, Mr. William himself, W.H., who am I? I mean, for Willie Hughes, Mr. Best said, amending his gloss easily. Of course it's all paradox, don't you know? Hughes and Hughes and Hughes the color. But it's so typical the way he works it out. It's the very essence of wild, don't you know? The light touch. His glance touched their faces lightly as he smiled, a blonde, if he 
Tame Essence of Wild, You're Darn Witty, The Three Drams of Uzbek Whiskey Bottle You Drank with Dan Easy Ducats. How much did I spend? Oh, a few shillings. For a plump of pressmen. Humor wet and dry. Wit. You would give your five wits for youth's proud livery he, he pranks in. Liniments of gratified desire. There may be mo. Take her for me. In pairing time. Jove, a cool time, send them. Yea, to love her. Eve. Naked wheat bellied sin. A snake coils her. Fang in's kiss. Do you think it is only a paradox, the Quaker librarian was asking? The mocker is never taken seriously when he is most serious. They talk seriously of mocker's seriousness. Buck Mulligan's again heavy face eyed Stephen a while. Then, his head wagging, he came near, drew a folded telegram from his pocket. His mobile lips red, smiling with new delight. Telegram, he said, wonderful inspiration. Telegram, a papal bowl. He sat in a corner of the unlit desk, reading aloud joyfully. The sentimentalist is he who would enjoy without incurring the immense debtorship for a thing done. Signed, Daedalus. Where do you launch it from? The Kips? No. College Green. Have you drunk the four quid? The aunt is going to call on your substantial father. Telegram, Malachi Mulligan, the ship lower, Abbey Street. Oh, you peerless mummer. Oh, you priestified kinchite. Joyfully, he thrust the message and envelope into a pocket, but keened and querulous broke. It's what I'm telling you, Mr. Honey. It's queer and sick we were. Haynes and myself, the time himself brought it in. Twas murmur we did for a gallon potion, for a gallus potion would rouse a friar, I'm thinking, and he limp with leching. And we one hour and two hours and three hours in Connery sitting civil, waiting for pints apiece. He wailed. And we to be there, Mavrone, and you to be unbeknownst, sending us your conglomerations the way we have our tongues out of yard like the drouthy clerics to be fainting for a pussful. Stephen laughed. Quickly, warningfully, Buck Mulligan bent down. The tramper singe is looking for you, he said, to murder you. He heard you pissed on his hall door in glass hole. He's out in Pamputis to murder you. Me, Stephen exclaimed. That was your contribution to literature. Buck Mulligan gleefully bent back, laughing to the dark eavesdropping ceiling. Murder you, he laughed. Harsh gargoyle face and wo- that warred against me over our mess of hash of lights in Rue Saint-André des Arts. In words of words, for words, Palabras. Oisin with Patrick. Fonman, he met me in Clarmart Woods, brandishing a wine bottle. C'est Vendredi Saint. Mothering Irish. His image wandering, he met. I mine. I met a fool in the forest. Mr. Lister, an attendant, said from the door ajar, in which everyone can find his own. So Mr. Justice, Madden, in his diary of master silence, has found the hunting terms. Yes? What is it? There's a gentleman here, sir, the attendant said, coming forward and offering a card. From the freeman. He wants to see the files of the Kilkenny people for last year. Certainly, 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 is the gentleman. He took the eager card, glanced, not saw, laid down, unglanced, looked, asked, creaked, asked, is he... Oh, there! Brisk in a gillard, he was off and out. In the daylit corridor, he, wa- he talked with voluble pains of zeal, in duty bound, most fair, most kind, most honest, broad brim. This gentleman? Freeman's journal? Kilkenny people? To be sure. Good day, sir. Kilkenny? We have certainly. A patient silhouette waited, listening. All the leading provincial, Northern Whig, Cork examiner, and escort three, Guardian, 1903. Will you please? Evans, conduct this gentleman. If you just follow the attend, or please allow me, this way, please, sir. Voluble, dutiful, he led the way to all the provincial papers, a bowing, a bowing dark figure, following his hasty heels. The door closed. The sheeny, Buck Milligan cried. He jumped up and snatched the card. What's his name? Ikimos? Bloom, he rattled on. Jehovah, collector of prepuces, is no more. I found him over in the museum, where I went to hail the foam-born Aphrodite. The Greek mouth that has never twisted in prayer. Every day we must do homage to her. 
Life of life, the lips a kindle. Suddenly he turned to Stephen. He knows you. He knows your old fellow. Oh, I fear me. He is Greeker than the Greeks. His pig Galilean eyes were upon her misial groove. <laughs> Phoenus Calipish. <laughs> oh, the thunder of those loins. The god pursuing the maiden hid. We want to hear more, John Eglinton decided, with Mr. Best's approval. We begin to be interested in Mrs. S. Till now, we had thought of her, if at all, as a patient Griselda. A Penelope stay at home. Antisethism. <laughs> Pupil of Gorgas. Stephen said, took the palm of beauty from Kyrios Melanus. Prude dam. <laughs> Agrieve Helen, the woodman, mayor of Troy, in whom a score of heroes slept and handed it to poor Penelope. Twenty years he lived in London, and during part of that time he drew a salary equal to that of the Lord Chancellor of Ireland. His life was rich. His art more than the art of feudalism, as Walt Whitman called it, is the art of surfite. Hot herring pies, green mugs of sack, honey sauces, sugar of roses, march pain, gooseberried pigeons, ringo candies, Sir Walter Raleigh. When they arrested him, had half a million francs on his back, including a pair of fancy stays. The gone bin woman, Eliza Tordur, and under linen enough to vie with her of Sheba. Twenty years he dallied there, between conjugal love and its chaste delights of scoratory love and its foul pleasures. You know Manningham's story of the burgher's wife who bade Dick Barbage to her bed after she had said, seen him in Richard III and how Shakespeare, overhearing, without more ado about nothing, took the cow by the horns and, when Burbage came knocking at the gate, answered from the capon's blankets. William the Conqueror came before Richard III, and the gay lakin, Mistress Fitton, Mountain Cryo, and his dainty bird's nest. Lady Penelope Rich, a clean quality woman is suited for a player, and the punks of the bank side a penny a time. Cour la reine, encore vingt sous. Nous ferons de petites cochonneries. Minette, tu veux? The height of fine society, and Sir William Davenant of Oxford's mother, with her cup of canary for every cock canary. Buck Mulligan, his pious eyes upturned, prayed. Blessed Mary, Margaret Mary, any cock and Harry of six wives' daughters and other lady friends from neighbor seats as Lawn Tennyson, gentleman poet, sings. But all those twenty years, what do you do? Poor Penelope in Stratford was doing behind the diamond panes. Do and do, thing done. In a rosary of Fetter Lane of Gerard, herbalist, he walks. Great Auburn and Azard herba like her veins. Lids of Juno's eyes, violets, he walks. One life is all. One body. Do, but do. Afar in a reek of lust and squalor, hands are laid on whiteness. End of section 9A. Ulysses by James Joyce, Section 9. B. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Hugh McGuire, Michael Hind, Amanda Vlad, Colin Robertson, Wilson Blanton, Christine Myers, Andrew Skinner, Mike Trevino, Jean Francois Rondeau. Buck Mulligan rapped John Eglinton's desk sharply. 
Whom do you suspect? You challenge. Say that he is spurned lover in the sonnets, once spurned, twice spurned, but the Count Wanton spurned him for a lord, his drear me love. Love that dare not speak its name. As an Englishman, you mean, John, sturdy Eglinton put in, he loved a lord. Old, well, <clears throat> old wall where sudden lizards flash. At Sherrington, I watched him. It seems so, Stephen said. When he wants to do for him and for all other and singular unheard wombs, the holy office an ostler does for the stallion, maybe, like Socrates, he had a midwife to mother as he had a shrew to wife. But she, the jiglut wanton, did break a bed vow. Two deeds are rank in a ghost mind, a broken vow in the dull-brained yokel on whom her favor has declined. Deceased husband's brother, sweet Anne, I take it, was hot in the blood, once a wooer, twice a wooer. Stephen turned boldly in his chair. The burden of proof is with you, not with me, he said, frowning. If you deny that in the fifth scene of Hamlet, he has branded her with infamy. Tell me why there is no mention of her during the third four, 34 years between the day she married him and the day she buried him. All those women saw their men down and under. Mary, her good man John, and her poor dear Willem, when he went and died on her, raging that he was the first to go. Joan, her four brothers, Judith, her husband, and all her sons. Susan, her husband too, while Susan's daughter, Elizabeth, to use granddaddy's words, wed her second, having killed her first. Oh, yes, mention there is. In the years when he was living richly in royal London to pay a debt, she had to borrow forty shillings from her father's shepherd. Explain you then. Explain the swan song too, wherein he has commanded her to posterity. He faced their silence. To whom thus, Eglinton, you mean the will that has been explained, I believe, by jurist, she was entitled to her widow's dower. A common law, his legal knowledge was great, our judges tell us. Im Satan fleers, mocker. And therefore he left out her name from the first draft, but he did not leave out the presence of his granddaughter for his daughters, for his sister, for his old cronies in Stratford and in London. And therefore, when he was urged, as I believe, to name her, he has left her his second best bed. Left there is second best, best stabbed, second best. Left. Whoa. Whoa! Pretty country folk had few chattels then, John Eglinton observed, as they have still, if our peasant plays are true to type. He was a rich country gentleman, Stephen said, with a coat of arms and a landed estate in Stratford and a house in Ireland Yard, a capitalist shareholder, a bill promoter, a tithe farmer. Why did he not leave her best... Why did he not leave her his best bed if he wished her to snore away the rest of her nights in peace? It is clear that there are two beds, a best and a second best. Mr. Second Best Best said finally. Sopratio amensa et da thalamo bettered Buck Mulligan and was smiled on. Antiquity mentions famous beds. Second Eglinton puckered, bed smiling. Let me think. Antiquity mentions that stagger right school urchin and bald heathen sage, Stephen said, who was dying in exile frees and endows slaves, pays tribute to his elders, wills to be laid in earth near the bones of his dead wife, and bids his friends be kind to an old mistress. Don't forget... Nell Gwyn, Herpilis, and let her live in his villa. Do you mean he died so, 
Mr. Best asked with slight concern. I mean... He died dead drunk, Buck Mulligan capped. A quart of ale is a dish of a king. Oh, I must tell you what Dowden said. What? asked Best Glinton. Williams Shakespeare and Company Limited, the People's William, for terms apply, E. Dowden, Highfield House. Lovely, Buck Mulligan sapired amorously. I asked him what he thought of the charge of pedestry brought against the bard. He lifted his hands and said, All we can say is that life ran very high in those days. Lovely. Catamite. The sense of beauty leads us astray, says beautiful, beautiful sadness best to ugling Englinton. Steadfast John replied severe, The doctor can tell us what those words mean. You cannot eat your cake and have it. Sayest thou so? Will thy rest from us? From me, the palm of beauty? And the sense of property, Stephen said. He drew Shylock out of his own long pocket, the son of a malt jobber and money lender. He was himself a corn jobber and money lender with ten tods of corn hoarded in the famine riots. His borrowers had no doubt those divers of warships mentioned by Chettle Falstaff who reported his uprightness of dealing. He sued a fellow player for the price of a few bags of malt and extracted his pound of flesh in interest for every money lent. How else could Aubrey's ostler and callboy get rich quick? All events brought grist to his mill. Shylock chimes with jubating that followed the hanging and quartering of Queen's leech Lopez, his Jew's heart being plucked. Forth while the sheeny was yet alive, Hamlet and Macbeth, the coming to the throne of the Scotch philosopher, with a turn for which coasting the lost Amada is his jeer in love's labor lost, his pageants, his, the histories sail full-bellied on a tide of mafficking enthusiasm, Warwickshire Jesuits are tied and we have a porter's theory of equivocation, the sea venture come home from Bermudas and play Ren and admired as Written with pasty Caliban, our American cousin, the sugared sonnets follow Sidney's. As for Fay Elizabeth, otherwise Carrietty Bess, the gloss, gross virgin who inspired the merry wives of Windsor, let some merry hare from Almany grope his life long for deep hid meanings in the depth of the bucket basket. I think you're getting on very nicely. Just mix up a mixture of theological, philological. Philological. Mingo, Minxy, Mictum, Minger. Prove that he was a Jew, John Anglican dared expectantly. Your dean of studies holds he was a holy Roman. Suflamidus sum. He was made in Germany, Stefan replied, as the champion French polisher of Italian scandals. A myriad-minded man, Mr. Best reminded. Coleridge called him myriad-minded. Amplius... In societe humana hoc est maximum necessarium ut sit amiticum inter multos. St. Thomas, Stephen began. Ora pro nobis, Monk Mulligan groaned, sinking to a chair. There he keened a wailing rune. Pogmahon! Actual <laughs> macri! Et destroyed... We are from this day. <laughs> it's destroyed. We are <laughs> All smile. They're smiles. St. Thomas, Stephen, smiling, said, whose gore-bellied works I enjoy reading in the original, writing of incest from a standpoint different from that of the new Viennese school Mr. McGee spoke of, likens, likens it in his wise and curious way to an avarice of the emotions. He means that the love so given to one near in blood is covetously withheld from some stranger who it may be hungers for it. Jews, from Christians taxed with avarice, are of, are of all races the most given to intermarriage. Accusations are made in anger. The Christian laws which built up the hordes of the Jews for whom, as for the Lollards, storm with shelter, bound their affections to with hoops of steel. Whether the, these be sins or virtues, old Nobadaddy will tell us at doomsday leet, 
But a man who holds so tightly to what he calls his rights over what he calls his debts will hold tightly also to what he calls his rights over her whom he calls his wife. No, sir, smile neighbors shall covet his ox or his wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his jackass. Or his Jenny ass! Buck Mulligan antiphoned. Gentle Will is being roughly handled, gentle Mr. Best said gently. Which will? Gag sweetly, Buck Mulligan. We are getting mixed. The will to live, John Eglinton philosophized. For poor Anne, Will's widow, is the will to die. Request yet, Stephen prayed. What of all the will to do? It has vanished long ago. She lies laid out in stark stiffness in that second best bed. The mobbled queen, even though you prove that a bed in those days was as rare as a motor car is now and that its carvings were the wonder of seven parishes. In old age, she takes up with gospelers. One stayed at New Place and drank a quart of sack the town paid for, but in which bed he slept its skills not to be asked and heard she had a soul. She read or had read to her chapbooks, referring, preferring them to merry wives and losing her nightly waters on the Jordan. She thought over hooks and eyes of her believer's breeches and the most spiritual snuff-box to make up the most devout soul's sneeze. Venus had twisted her lips in prayer. Agonbite of inwit, remorse of conscience. It is an age of exhausted whoredom, groping for its god. History shows that to be true. <clears throat> Inquit. Eglintonus Chronologus. The ages succeed one another. But we have it on high authority that a man's worst enemies shall be those of his own house and family. I feel that Russell is right. What do we care for his wife and father? I would say that if only family poets have family lives. Falstaff was not a family man. I feel that the fat king is a supreme creation. Lean. He lay back, shy, deny thy kindred, the uncle gid. Shy, supping with the goddess, he sneaks the cup. A sire in Ultonian Antrim bade, him, bade it him. Visits him here on quarter days. Mr. McGee, sir, there's a gentleman here to see you. Me? Says he's your father, sir. Give me my words worth. Enter McGee, more Matthew, a rugged, rough, rug-headed kern in strossers with a buttoned codpiece, his nether stocks bemired with a clobber of ten forests, a wand of wilding in his hand. Your own? He knows your old fellow, the widower. Hurrying to her squalid death lair from gay Paris on a quayside, I touched his hand. The voice, new warmth, speaking. Dr. Bob Kenny is attending her. The eyes that wish me well, but do not know me. A father, father Stephen said, said battling, battling against, against hopelessness, hopelessness is a necessary, necessary evil. evil. He wrote the play in the months that followed his father's death. If you hold that he, a graying man with two marriageable daughters with 35 years of life, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, with 50 of experience is the beardless undergraduate from Wittenberg. Then you must hold that a seven-year-old seven -year -old mother is a lustful queen. No. The corpse of John Shakespeare does not walk the night. From hour to hour, hour it rots and rots. He rests, disarmed of fatherhood, having devised a mystical estate upon his son. Boccaccio Calendrio, Calendrino was the first and last man who felt himself with child. Fatherhood, in the sense of conscious begetting, is unknown to man is a mystical estate, an apostolic succession, from only begetter to only begotten. On, on that, that mystery, mystery, and not on the Madonna, Madonna, which the cunning Italian intellect flung to the mob of Europe, the church is founded and founded ir irremovably, because founded, like the world, macro and microcosm, upon the void, upon incertitude, upon unlikelihood, amor matris, subjective and objective genitive, may be the only true thing in life. Paternity may be a legal fiction. Who is the father of any son, that any son should love him, or he any son. What, what the, the hell, hell are you, are you driving, driving at? at? I know, shut up. Blast you. I have reasons. Amplius adduc eternum postea. Are you condemned to this? 
there are southern by a bodily shame so steadfast that the criminal annals of the world stained with all other incest and bestialities hardly record his breach sons with mothers sires with daughters lesbic sisters loves, loves that they dare not speak their name Nephews with grandmothers, jailbirds with keyholes, queens with prize bulls. The son unborn, Mars beauty born, he brings pain, divides affection, increases care, he is male. His growth is his father's decline, his youth his father's envy, his friends his father's enemy. And rue, monsieur le prince, I thought it. What links them in nature, an instant of blind rut? Am I father, if I were? Shrunken, uncertain hand. Sibelius, the African, subtlest hierarchy of all the beasts of the field, held that the father was himself his own son. The bulldog of Equin, with whom no word shall be impossible, refutes him. Well, if the father who is not a son be not a father, can the son who is not a father be a son? When Rutland Bacon Southam Shakespeare or another poet of the same name in the comely of errors wrote Hamlet he was not the father of his own son merely but being no more a son he was and felt himself the father of all his race the father of his own grandfather the father of his unborn grandson who by the same token never was born for nature as Mr. McGee understands her abhors perfection. Eglinton eyes, quick with pleasure, looked up shy brightly, gladly glancing a merry Puritan through the twisted Eglantine. Flatter. Rarely, but flatter. Himself his own father, son Mulligan told himself. Wait, I am big with child. I have an unborn child in my brain. Pallas Athena, a play. The play's the thing. Let me parturiate. He clasped at his paunch brow with both birth-aiding hands. As for his family, Stephen said, his mother's name lives in the forest of Arden. Her death brought from him the scene with Volumnia in Corianus. His boy son's death is the destine of young Arthur in King John. Hamlet the Black Prince. Is Hamnet Shakespeare. Who the girls in The Tempest... In the pericles, in winter's tale, are we know. Who Cleopatra, fleshpot of Egypt, and Cressid, and Venus are, we may guess. But there is another member of his family who is recorded. The plot thickens, John Eglinton said. The Quaker librarian, quaking, tiptoed in, quake, his mask, quake, with haste, quake, quack. Door closed. Cell. Day. They list three they. I, you, he, they. Come. Mess. He had three brothers, Gilbert, Edmund, Richard. Gilbert, in his old age, told some cavaliers he got a pass for nout, for Maester Gatherer. One time mass he did, and he seen his bird, Maester Wool the Playwriter. Up in London, in a wrestling play, with a man on back. The playhouse sausage filled Gilbert's soul. He is nowhere, but an Edmund and a Richard are recorded in the works of Sweet William. Names. What's in a name? Best. That is my name, Richard. Don't you know? I hope you're going to say a good word for Richard. Don't you know? For my sake. <laughs> Buck Mulligan. Piano. Dimiwendo. Then outspoke Medical Dick to his comrade Medical Davy. Stephen, in his trinity of black wills, the villain Shakebags, Iago, Richard Crookback, Edmund King Lear, to bear the wicked uncle's names. Nay, that last play was written or being written while his brother Edmund lay dying in S Southwark. Best. I hope Edmund is going to catch it. I don't want Richard. My name. <laughs> Quaker lies here. A tempo. 
But he that filches from me, my good name. Stephen. Strigendo. He has hidden his own name, a fair name, William. In the plays, a superhero, a clown there, as a painter of old Italy, set his face in a dark corner of his canvas. He has revealed it in the sonnets where there is will in overplus. Like John O'Gaunt, his name is dear to him, as dear as the coat of arms he toadied for. On a bend sable a spear or steeled argent. Honor ficca billeted in habitus, <laughs> dearer than his glory of greatest shake scene in the country. What's in a name? That is what we ask ourselves in childhood when we write the name that we are told is ours. A star, a day star, a fire drake rose at its birth. It shone by day in the heavens alone, brighter than Venus in the night, and by night it shone over Delta in Cassiopeia, the recumbent constellation which is the signature of his initial among the stars. His eyes watched it, low-lying on the horizon, eastward of the bear, as he walked by the slumberous sumbers fields at midnight, returning from Chaudhary and from her arms. Both satisfied, I, too. Don't tell them he was nine years old when it was quenched. And from her arms? Wait to be wooed and won. I, Meacock, who will woo you? Read the skies. Otto Mitter Emunios, Bose Stephanomos. Where's your configuration, Stephen, Stephen? Cut the bread even. S.D. Sua Donna Gia di Lui Gelindo Risolve di Non Amar S.D. What is that, Mr. Dedalus? The Quaker librarian asked. Was it a celestial phenomenon? A star by night, Stephen said. A pillar of the cloud by day. What's more to speak? Stephen looked at his hat, his stick, his boots. Stephanos, my crown, my sword. His boots are sporting the shape of my feet. Buy a pair. Holes in my socks. Handkerchief, too. You make good use of the name, John Eglinton allowed. Your own name is strange enough. I suppose it explains your fantastical humor. Me, McGee, and Mulligan. Fabulous artificer, uh, the hawk-like man you flew. Where to? New Haven, Dieppe, steerage, passenger... Paris and back, Lauping, Icarus, Pater, Ait, Sea bedabbled, fallen, weltering, lau, lapwing you are, lapwing be. Mr. Best eager quietly lifted his book to say. That's very interesting, because that brother motive, don't you know, we find also in the old Irish myths. Just what you say, the three brothers Shakespeare. In Grimm, too, don't you know, the fairy tales. The third brother that marries the sleeping beauty and wins the best prize. Best of best brothers, good, better, best. The Quaker librarian spring halted near. I should like to know, he said, which bother you. I understand you to suggest there was, a, there was misconduct with one of the brothers. But perhaps I am anticipating? He caught himself in the act, looked at all, refrained. An attendant from the doorway called, Mr. Leister, Father Deneen wants... Oh, Father Deneen, directly. Swiftly, rectly, creaking, rectly, rectly, he was rectly gone. John Eglinton touched the foil. Come, he said, let us hear what you have to say of Richard and Edmund. You kept them for the last, didn't you? In asking you to remember those two noble kinsmen, Uncle Richie and Uncle Edmund, Stephen answered, I feel I'm asking too much, perhaps. A brother is as easily forgotten as uh, an umbrella. Lapwing. Where is your brother? Apothecary's Hall. My whetstone. Him, then Cranley, Mulligan. Now these. Speech, speech. But act. Act speech. They mock to try you. Act. Be acted on. Lapwing. I am tired of my voice, the voice of Esau, my kingdom for a drink. On. You will say those names were already in the chronicles from which he took the stuff of his plays. Why did he take them rather than others? Richard, a whore's son, crook-back, misbegotten, makes love to a widowed Anne. What's in a name? Woos and wins her. 
A whore son, Mary Widow, Richard the Conqueror, third brother, came from William the Conquered. The other four acts of that play hang limply from that first. Of all his kings, Richard is the only king unshielded by Shakespeare's reverence, the angel of the world. Why is the underplot of King Lear in which Edmund figures lifted out of Sidney's Arcadia and spatchcocked onto the Celtic legend other than history, older than history? That was Will's way, John Eglinton defended. We should not now combine a Norse saga with an excerpt from a novel by George Meredith. Que voulez-vous? Moore would say. He puts Bohemia on a sea coast and makes Ulysses quote Aristotle. Why, Stephen answered himself, because the theme of the false or the, uh, of, or the usurping or the adulterous brother of or all three in one is to Shakespeare what the poor is not, always with him. The note of banishment, banishment from the heart, banishment from the home, sounds uninterruptedly from the two gentlemen of Verona onward till Prospero breaks his staff, buries it certain fathoms in the earth, and drowns his book. It doubles itself in the middle of his life, reflects itself in another, repeats itself, protasis, epitasis, catastasis, catastrophe. It repeats itself again when he is near the grave, when his married daughter Susan, chip of the old block, is accused of adultery. But it was the original sin that darkened his understanding, weakened his will, and left in him a strong inclination to evil. The words are those of my lords, bishops of Maynooth and original sin and, like original sin, committed by another in whose sin he too has sinned. It is between the lines of his last written words. It is petrified on his tombstone, under which her four bones are not to be laid. Age has not withered it. Beauty and peace have not done it away. It is an infinite variety everywhere in the world he has created, in Much Ado About Nothing, twice in As You Like It, in The Tempest, in Hamlet, in Measure for Measure, and in all the other plays which I have not read. He laughed to free his mind from his mind's bondage. Judge Eglinton summed up. The truth is midway, he affirmed. He is the ghost and the prince. He is all... In all. He is, Stephen said. The boy of Act One is the mature man of Act Five. All in all. In Cymbeline, in Othello, he is bawd and cuckold. He acts and is acted on. Lover of an ideal or a perversion, like Jose, he kills the real Carmen. His unremitting intellect is the horn mad Iago, ceaselessly willing that the moor in him shall suffer. Cuckoo! Cuckoo! Cuck Mulligan clucked lewdly. A word of fear. Dark dome received, reverbed. And, and what a character is Iago, undaunted John Ingleton exclaimed. When all is said, Dumas fils, or is it Dumas père, is right, after God Shakespeare has created most. Man delights him not, nor woman neither, woman, Stephen said. He returns after a life of absence to that spot of earth where he was born, where he has always been man and boy, a silent witness, and there, his journey of life ended, he plants his mulberry tree in the earth, then dies. The motion is ended. Gravediggers bury Hamlet père and Hamlet fille, a king and a prince at last in death, with incidental music. And what, though murdered and betrayed, be wept by all frail tender hearts for Dane or Dubliner, Sorrow for the dead is the only husband for whom they refuse to be divorced. If you like the epilogue, look long on it. Prosperous, Prospero, the good man rewarded. Lizzie, Grandpa's lump of love. And Uncle Richie, the bad man taken off by poetic justice to a place where the bad niggers go. Strong curtain. He found in the world without as actual what was in his world within as possible. Maeterlinck says, If Socrates leave his house today, he will find the sage seated on his doorstep. If Judas go forth tonight, it is to Judas his steps will tend. Every life is many days, day after day. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, widows, brothers in love. But always meeting ourselves. The playwright who wrote the folio of this world 
and wrote it badly. He gave us light first, and then the sun two days later. The Lord of things as they are, whom the best, whom the most Roman of Catholics call Dio Boea, hangman God, is doubtless all in all of us, in all <laughs> of us, ostler and butcher, and would be bawd and cuckold too. But that in the economy of heaven, foretold by Hamlet, there are no more marriages, glorified man, an androgynous angel, being a wife unto himself. Eureka! Eureka. Buck Mulligan cried. Eureka. Eureka! Suddenly happy, he jumped up and reached in a stride John Engleton's desk. May I, he said. The Lord has spoken to Malachi. He began to scribble on a slip of paper. Take some slips from the counter going out. Those who are married, Mr. Best, thus Harold said, all save one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are. He laughed. Unmarried at Eglinton Johannes of Arts, a bachelor. Unwed, unfancied, where of wiles they finger ponder nightly each his verorium edition of the taming of the shrew. You are a delusion, said Rowley, John Eglinton to Stephen. You have brought us all this way to show us a French triangle. Do you believe your own theory? No, Stephen said promptly. Are you going to write it, Mr. Best asked. You ought to make it a dialogue, don't you know? Like the platonic dialogues, Wild wrote. John Eclicton doubly smiled. Well, in that case, he said, I don't see why you should expect payment for it since you don't believe it yourself. Dowden believes there is some mystery in Hamlet, but we'll say no more. Air Blebru, the man Piper sent, uh, Piper met in Berlin, who is working up that Rutland theory, believes that the secret is hidden in the Stratford Monument. He's going to visit the present duke, Piper says, and prove to him that his ancestor wrote the plays. It will come as a surprise to his grace, but he believes his theory. I believe, O oh Lord. Help my unbelief. That is, help me to believe or help me to unbelieve. Who helps to believe? Hugo men, who to unbelieve? Other chap? You are the only contributor to Dana who asks for pieces of silver. Then I don't know about the next number. Fred Ryan wants space for an article on economics. Fred Dream, two pieces of silver he lent me. Tied you over. Economics. For a guinea, Stephen said. You can publish this interview. Buck Mulligan stood up from his laughing scribbling, laughing, and then gravely said, Honeying malice. I called upon the bard Kinch at his summer residence in Upper Mecklenburg Street and found him deep in the study of the Summa Contra Gentilis in the company of two gonorrheal ladies, French Nelly and Rosalie, the Colquay whore. He broke away. Come, Kinch, come, wandering, Angus, of the birds. Come, Kinch, you've eaten all we left. I, I will serve you your orts and offals. Stephen rose. Life is many days. This will end. We shall see you tonight, John Anglican said. Notre ami Moore says Malachi Mulligan must be there. Buck Mulligan flaunted his slip in Panama. Monsieur Moore, he said, lecturer on French letters to the youth of Ireland... I'll be there. Come, Kinch, the bards must drink. Can you walk straight? Laughing he. Swill till eleven. Irish night's entertainment. <laughs> lover. Stephen followed a lover. One day in the National Library, we had a discussion. Shakes. After his love back, I followed. I got his card. Stephen, greeting. Then all a mort followed a lover jester, a well-kempt head, new barbered, out of the vaulted cell into a shattering daylight of no thoughts. What have I learned? Of them? Of me? Walk like Haynes now. The constant reader's room, in the reader's book. Kasha, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitzmorse, Tisdale, Farrow, Paraphs' polysyllables. Item, was Hamlet mad? The Quakers paid godlily with a pristine in-book talk. Oh, please do, sir. I shall be most pleased. Amused Buck Mulligan mused in pleasant murmur with himself, self-nodding. A pleased bottom. The turnstile. Is that blue-ribboned hat idly riding? What? Looked? The curving balustrade, smooth sliding minkus. Puck Mulligan, Panamella hamited, went step by step, iambing, trolling. John Engleton, my Joe John. Why won't you wed a wife? He sputtered to the air. Oh, 
the chinless Chinaman, Chin Chong Eglin Tun. He went over to their play box, Haynes and I. The plumber's hall. Our players are creating a new art for Europe, like the Greeks or M. Matterlink. Abbey Theater. I smell the public sweat of monks. He spat blank. Forgot any more than he forgot the whipping lousy Lucy gave him and left the femme de trente ans. And why no other children born and his first child the girl? After wit, go back. The doer, recluse, still there. He has his cake. And the douse, a youngling, minion of pleasure, Fado's toil will fair hair. Hey, I just uh, I wanted, I, I forgot. He. Uh... <laughs> Longworthy and McCurdy Ackerson was there. Puck Mulligan, footed, feedling, trilling. I hardly, hardly hear, hear the purely, purely cry. cry. Or, or tell me talk as, as I pass, I pass one by, by before my thoughts begin to run on F. McCurdy's Atkinson, the same that had the wooden leg and that filibustering filibeg that never dared to sack his druth, McGee that had the chinless mouth, being afraid to marry on earth, they masturbated for all they were worth. Just on, know thyself. Halted below me, a quizzer looks at me. I halt. Mournful murmur, Buck Mulligan moaned. Singe is left off wearing black to be like nature. Only crows, priests, and English coal are black. A laugh tripped, tripped his over his lips. Longworth is awfully sick, he said. After what you wrote about the old hate, Gregory. Oh, you inquisitionish, <laughs> inquisitionish. Jew Jesuit, inquisitional drunken Jew Jesuit. She gets you a job on the paper and then you go and Slater drivel to Jesus. Couldn't you do the Yeats touch? He went on and down, moping, chanting, with waving graceful arms. The most beautiful book that has come out of our country in my time, one thinks Homer. He stopped at the stairfoot. I have conceived a play for the murmurs, he said solemnly. The pillared Moorish hall, shadows entwined. Gone the nine men's morse with caps of indices. In sweetly varying voices, Muck, Buck Mulligan read his tablet. Every man, his own wife, or a honeymoon in the hand. He turned her happy patch smirk smirk to, to Stephen. Stephen. Saying, saying the disguise I fear I fear is thin, thin but, but listen listen he read he read Marcato, Marcato. Characters. characters Toby Tostoff Toby Tostoff Arun Pole, Arun Pole. Crab a Bush Ranger Crab a Bush Ranger Medical Dick and Medical Davy Two birds with one medical stone. Dick and medical Davy. Mother Grogan. Two birds with one stone. A water carrier. Fresh Mother Nelly Grogan, and Rosalie. Water carrier. The Colquay whore. Colquay Fresh whore. Nelly and Rosalie. He laughed. The Colquay whore. Lolling a to and fro head. Walking on, followed by Stephen. And mirthfully he told the shadows, souls of men. Oh, the night in the Camden Hall when the daughters of Aaron had to lift their skirts to step over you as you lay... In your mully, your mulberry colored, multicolored, multitudinous vomit. The most innocent son of Aaron, Stephen said, for whom they ever lifted them. About to pass through the doorway, feeling one behind, he stood aside. Part. The moment is now. Where then? If Socrates leave his home today, if Judas go forth tonight, why? Why? That lies in space, which in which I, in time, must come to, inequitably. My will, his will that fronts me, sees between. A man passed out between them, bowing, greeting. Good day again. Good day. Buck Mulligan said. The portico. We are watch the birds for angry. Angus of the birds. They go, they come. Last night I flew, easily flew. Men wandered, street of harlots after. A cream fruit melon he held to me. In, you will see. The, the wandering, wandering Jew. Jew. The wandering Jew. 
Buck Mulligan Buck, whispered. Buck Mulligan whispered. With clown's awe. With Did clown's awe. Did you see his eye? He looked upon to lust. He looked upon to lust. After you. After you. I fear, I fear the ancient mariner. I fear oh, the ancient mariner. Oh, thou art in peril. Mariner. Oh, Kinch, thou art in peril. Get, Get thee a breech pad. Manor of Oxenford. Manor of Oxenford. Day, Day. We ba- wheelbarrow, sun over arch of bridge. Sun over arch of bridge. A dark, dark back, back went before them. Step of a hard down. Step of a hard down. Up by the Step gateway. Step of a hard down. Under the portcullis bar. The gateway. Gateway. They follow. They follow. Offend me still. Offend me still. They Speak follow. on. Speak on. Kind Offend me air. still. Speak on. Define the coins of houses in Kildare Street. No birds. No birds. Frail from the house tops, two plumes of smoke ascended. Pluming. And in a flaw of softness, softly were blown. They followed. Cease to strive. Cease to strive. Cease of the druid priests. priests. Cease of the druid priests. Of Cymbeline. Of Cymbeline. From wide earth and altar. Land. Loud, Loud. we the gods, the gods. And, and let, let our, our crooked smokes climb to their, their nostrils. nostrils. From our blessed altars! End of section 9 of Ulysses by James Joyce. Yay! Jeez, that was good. To forging. Ulysses by James Joyce, section 10a. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Hugh McGuire, Kara Schallenberg, and Mike Trevino. Chapter 10. The superior, very reverend John Conmey, S.J., reset his smooth watch in his interior pocket as he came down the presbytery steps. Five to three. Just nice time to walk to Artane. What was that boy's name again? Dignum, yes. Vere dignum et justum est. Brother Swan was the person to see. Mr. Cunningham's letter. Yes, oblige him if possible, good practical Catholic, useful at mission time. A one-legged sailor, swinging himself onward by lazy jerks of his crutches, growled some notes. He jerked short before the convent of the Sisters of Charity and held out a peaked cap for alms towards the very Reverend John Conmey, S.J. Father Conmey blessed him in the sun, for his purse held, he knew, one silver crown. Father Conmey crossed to Mountjoy Square. He thought, but not for long, of soldiers and sailors whose legs had been shot off by cannonballs, ending their days in some pauper ward, and of Cardinal Wolsey's words. If I had served my God as I had served my king, he would not have abandoned me in my old days. He walked by the tree-shade of sunny-winking leaves, and towards him come the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P., very well indeed, father. And you, father? Father Conmey was wonderfully well indeed. He would go to Buxton probably for the waters. And her boys, were they getting on well at Belvedere? Was that so? Father Conmey was very glad indeed to hear that. And Mr. Sheehy himself, still in London. The house was still sitting, to be sure it was. Beautiful weather it was, delightful indeed. Yes, it was very probable that Father Bernard Vaughan would come again to preach. Oh, yes, a very great success. A wonderful man, really. Father Conmey was very glad to see the wife of Mr. David Sheehy, M.P., looking so well, and he begged to be remembered to Mr. David Sheedy, M.P. Yes, he would certainly call. Good afternoon, Mrs. Sheehy. Father Conmey doffed his silk hat as he took leave, at the jet beads of her mantilla ink shining in the sun, and smiled yet again in going. He had cleaned his teeth, he knew, with arcanut paste. 
Father Conry walked and, walking, smiled, for he thought on Father Bernard Vaughan's droll and cockney voice. Pilot, why don't you hold back that owling mob? A zealous man, however, really he was, and really did good in his way, beyond a doubt. He loved Ireland, he said, and he loved the Irish. Of good family, too, would one think it? Welsh, were they not? Oh, lest he forget the letter to the father of provincial. Father Conmey stropped three little schoolboys on the corner of Mount Joy Square. Yes, they were from Belvedere, the little house. Aha! And were they good boys at school? Oh, that was very good now. And what was his name? Jack Soan. And his name? Gurr. Gallagher. And the other little man? His name was Bruni Lynham. Oh, that was a very nice name to have. Father Conry gave a letter from his breast to Master Brunny Lynham, and pointed to the red pillar box on the corner of Fitzgibbon Street. But mind you don't post yourself into the box, little man, he said. The boy six eyed Father Conry and laughed. Oh, sir. Well, let me see if he can post a letter, Father Conry said. Master Bruni Lynham ran across the road and put Father Conmey's letter to Father Provincial into the mouth of the bright red letter-box. Father Conmey smiled and nodded and smiled and walked along Mountjoy Square East. Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company in silk hat, slate frock coat with silk facings, white kerchief tie, tight lavender trousers, canary gloves and pointed patent boots, walking with grave deportment, most respectfully took the curbstone as he passed Lady Maxwell at the corner of Dignam's Court. Was that not Mrs. McGuinness? Mrs. McGuinness, stately, silver-haired, bowed to Father Conmey from the farther footpath along which she sailed, and Father Conmey smiled and saluted. How did she do? A fine carriage she had, like Mary, Queen of the Scots, something. And to think she was a pawnbroker well now, such a, what should he say, such a queenly mane. Father Conmey walked down Great Charles Street and glanced at the shut-up free church on his left. The Reverend T. R. Green, B. A., Will, D. V. Speak. The incumbent, they called him. He felt it incumbent on him to say a few words. But one should be charitable, invincible ignorance. They acted according to their lights. Father Conmey turned the corner and walked along the north circular road. It was a wonder that there was not a tram line in such an important thoroughfare. Surely there ought to be. A band of satcheled schoolboys crossed from Richmond Street, all raised untidy caps. Father Conmey greeted them more than once, benightingly. Christian brother boys. Father Conmey smelled incense on his right hand as he walked. St. Joseph's Church, Portland Row. For aged and virtuous females, Father Conmey raised his hat to the blessed sacrament virtuous, but occasionally they were also bad-tempered. Near Aldborough House, Father Conmey thought of that spendthrift nobleman, and now it was an office or something. Father Conmey began walking along the North Strand Road and was saluted by Mr. William Gallagher, who stood in the doorway of his shop. Father Conmey saluted Mr. William Gallagher, and perceived the odours that came from bacon flitches and ample cools of butter. He passed Grogan's, the tobacconist, against which newsboards leaned, and told of a dreadful catastrophe in New York. In America those things were continually happening. Unfortunate people to die like that unprepared, still an act of perfect contrition. Father Conmey went by Daniel Bergen's public house, against the window of which two unlaboring men lounged. They saluted him and were saluted. Father Conmey passed H. J. O'Neill's funeral establishment, where Corny Kelleher totted figures in the day book, while he chewed a blade of hay. A constable on his beat saluted Father Conmey, and Father Conmey, Conmey saluted the constable. In Euke Setters, the pork butchers, Father Conmey observed pig's pudding, white, black, and red, lying neatly cubed in tubes. Moored under the trees of Charleville Mall, Father Conmey saw a turf barge, a tow-horse with pendant head, 
a bargeman with a hat of dirty straw, seated amidships, smoking and staring at a branch of poplar above him. It was idyllic, and Father Conmee reflected on the providence of the Creator who made turf to be in bogs where men might dig it out and bring it to town, and hamlet to make fires in the houses of poor people. On Newcomen Bridge, the very Reverend John Conmee, S.J., of St. Francis Xavier Church, Upper Gardiner Street, stepped on to an outward-bound tram. Of an inward-bound tram stepped the Reverend Nicholas Dudley, C.C., of St. Agatha's Church, North William Street, on to Newcomen Bridge. At Newcomen Bridge, Father Conmee stepped into an outward-bound tram, for he disliked to traverse on foot the dingy way past Mud Island. Father Conmee sat in a corner of the tram car, a blue ticket tucked with care in the eye of one plump kid glove, while four shillings, a sixpence, and five pennings shooted from his other plump glove palm into his purse. Passing the ivory church, he reflected that the ticket inspector usually made his visit when one had carelessly thrown away the ticket. The solemnity of the occupants of the car seemed to Father Conmee excessive for a journey so short and cheap. Father Conmee liked cheerful decorum. It was a peaceful day. The gentleman with glasses opposite Father Conmee had finished explaining and looked down. His wife, Father Conmee supposed. A tiny yawn opened the mouth of the wife of the gentleman with the glasses. She raised her small gloved fifth fist, yawned ever so gently, tip-tapping her small gloved fist on her opening mouth and smiled tinily, sweetly. Father Conmee perceived her perfume in the car. He perceived also that the awkward man at the other side of her was sitting on the edge of the seat. Father Conmee at the altar rails placed the host with difficulty in the mouth of the awkward old man who had the shaky head. At Annesley Bridge, the tram halted, and, when it was about to go, an old woman rose suddenly from her place to alight. The conductor pulled the bell straps to stay the car for her. She passed out with her basket and market net, and Father Comney saw the conductor help her and net the basket down. And Father Conmee thought that, as she was nearly past the end of the penny fare, she was one of those good souls who would always to be told twice, bless you, my child, and they have been absolved, pray for me. But they had so many worries in life, so many cares, poor creatures. From the hoardings, Mr. Eugene Stratton grinned with thick nigger lips at Father Conmee. Father Conmee thought of the souls of black and brown and yellow men and of his sermon of St. Peter Calver, S.J., and the African mission, and of the progression, propagation of the fate and of the millions of black and brown and yellow souls that had not received the baptism of water when their last hour came like a thief in the night. That book by the Belgian Jesuit Le Nom des Élus seemed to Father Conmee a reasonable plea. Those were millions of human souls created by God in his own likeness to whom the faith had not dv been brought. But they were God's soul created by God, it seemed to Father Conmee a pity that they should be lost, a waste, if one might say. At the house road, Father Conmee alighted, was saluted by the conductor, and saluted his turn. The Malahide road was quiet. It pleased Father Conmee, road and name. The joy bells were ringing in gay Malahide. Lord Talbot de Malahide, intermediate hereditary lord admiral of Malahide and the seas adjoining. Then came the call to arms, and she was made wife and widow in one day. Those were old, worldish days, loyal times in joyous townlands, old times in the barony. Father Conmee, walking, thought of his little book, Old Times in the Barony, of the book that might be written about Jesuit houses and of Mary Rochford, daughter of Lord Molesworth, first countess of Belvedere. A listless lady, no more young, walked along the shore of Loch Enel, Mary, first countess of Belvedere, listlessly walking in the evening, not startled when an otter plunged. Who could know the truth? Not the jealous Lord Belvedere, not her confessor, if she had not committed adultery fully. 
eaculatio seminis inter vas naturale mulieris, with her husband's brother. Hmm. She would half confess if she had not all sinned as women did, only God knew, and she and he, her husband's brother. Father Conmee thought of the tyrannous incontinence needed, however, for men's race on earth, and of the ways of God which were not our own ways. Don John Conmee walked and moved in times of yore. He was humane and honored there. He bore in mind secrets confessed, and he smiled at smiling noble faces in a beeswax drawing room, sealed with full fruit clusters. And the hands of a bride and of a bridegroom, noble to noble, were empalmed by Don John Conmee. It was a charming day. The lich gate of a field showed Father Conmee breadths of cabbages curtsying to him with ample underleaves. The sky showed him a flock of small white clouds going slowly down the wind. Mutoner, the French said. A homely and just word. Father Conmee, reading his office, watched a flock of muttoning clouds over Rath Coffee. His thin socked ankles were tickled by the stubble of Conglo's field. He walked there reading in the evening and heard the cries of the boys' lines at their play, young cries in the quiet evening. He was their rector. His reign was mild. Father Conmee drew off his gloves and took his redredged breviary out. An ivory bookmark told him the page, Nones. He should have read that before lunch, but Lady Maxwell had come. Father Conmee read in secret Pater and Ave and crossed his breast, Deus in auditorium. He walked calmly and read mutely the Nones, walking and reading till he came to rest in Beati Immaculati, Principium Verborum Tuorum Veritas, in Eternum Omnia Uisia Institutiae Tue. A flushed young man came from a gap of a hedge, and after him came a young woman with wild nodding daisies in her hand. The young man raised his hat abruptly, the young woman abruptly bent and with slow care detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. Father Conmee blessed both gravely and turned a thin page of his breviary. Sin, principes persecuti sunt me gratis, et a verbis tuis formidavit cor meum. Corney Kelleher closed his long day-book and glanced with his drooping eye at a pine coffin lid sentried in a corner. He pulled himself erect, went to it, and, spinning it on its axle, viewed its shape and brass furnishings. Chewing his blade of hay, he laid the coffin lid by and came to the doorway. There he tilted his hat-brim to give shade to his eyes and leaned against the door-case looking idly out. Father John Comney stepped out, stepped into Dolly Mount Tram on Newcomen Bridge. Corney Kelleher locked his large-footed boots and gazed, his hat down-tilted, chewing his blade of hay. Constable 57C, on his belt, on his beat, stood to pass the time of day. That's a fine day, Mr. Kelleher. Aye, Corney Kelleher said. It's very close, the constable said. Corney Kelleher sped a silent jet of hay juice arching from his mouth while a generous white arm from a window in Eccles Street flung forth a coin. What's the best news? he asked. I seen that particular party last evening, the constable said with bated breath. A one-legged sailor crutched himself round McConnell's corner, skirting Rabiotti's ice cream cart and jerked himself up Eccles Street. Towards Larry O'Rourke, in shirt sleeves in his, door, in his doorway, he growled unamiably, For England! He swung himself violently forward past Katie and Booty Dedalus, halted and growled, Home and beauty! J.J. O'Malley's white careworn face 
was told that Mr. Lambert was in the warehouse with a visitor. A stout lady stopped, took a copper coin from her purse, and dropped it into the cap held out to her. The sailor grumbled thanks and glanced sourly at the unheeding windows, sank his head, and swung himself forward four strides. He halted and growled angrily, For England! Two barefoot urchins, sucking long licorice laces, halted near him, gaping at his stump with their yellow slobbered mouths. He swung himself forward in vigorous jerks, halted, lifted his head towards a window, and bayed deeply, Home and beauty! The gay, sweet chirping, whistling within, went on, went on a bar or two, ceased. The blind of the window was drawn aside. A card, unfurnished apartment, slipped from the sash and fell. A plump, bare, generous arm shone, was seen, held forth from a white petticoat, bodice, and taut shift straps. A woman's hand flung forth a coin over the area railings. It fell on the path. One of the urchins ran to it, picked it up, and dropped it into the minstrel's cap, saying, There, sir. Katie and Booty Dedalus shoved in the door of the closed, steaming kitchen. Did you put in the books? Booty asked. Maggie at the range rammed down a grayish mass beneath bubbling suds twice with her pot stick and wiped her brow. They wouldn't give anything on them, she said. Father Kami walked through Klongau's fields, his thin-socked ankles tickled by stubble. Where did you try? Booty asked. McGinnis's. Booty stamped her foot and threw her satchel on the table. Bad cess to her, big face, she cried. Katie went to the rang and peered with squinting eyes. What's in the pot? she asked. Shirts, Maggie said. Booty cried angrily. Crikey, is there nothing for us to eat? Katie, lifting the kettle lid in a pad of her stained skirt, asked, And what's in this? A heavy fume gushed in answer. Pea soup, Maggie said. Where did you get it? Katie asked. Sister Mary Patrick, Maggie said. The lackey rang his bell. Barang! Booty sat down at the table and said hungrily, Give it us here. Give us it here. <laughs> Maggie poured yellow thick soup from the kettle into a bowl. Katie, sitting opposite Booty, said quietly, as her fingertip lifted to her mouth random crumbs. A good job we have that much. Where's Dilly? Gone to meet father, Maggie said. Booty, breaking big chunks of bread into the yellow soup, added, Our father, who art not in heaven. Maggie, pouring yellow soup in Katie's bowl, exclaimed, Booty, for shame. A skiff, a crumpled th throwaway. Elijah is coming, rode lightly down the Liffey, under Loop Line Bridge, shooting the rapids where water chafed around the bridge piers, sailing eastward past hulls and anchor chains between the Custom House Old Dock and George's Quay. The blonde girl in Thornton's bedded the wicker basket with rustling fibre. Blazes Boylan handed her the bottle swathed in pink tissue paper and a small jar. "'Put these in first, will you?' he said. "'Yes, sir,' the blonde girl said. "'And the fruit is on top.' "'That'll do, game ball,' Blazes Boylan said." She bestowed fat pears neatly, head by tail, and among them ripe, shame-faced peaches. Blazes Boylan walked here and there in new tan shoes about the fruit-smelling shop, lifting fruits, young, juicy, crinkled and plump red tomatoes, sniffing smells. H.E.L.Y.'s filed before him, tall white-hatted, past Tangier Lane, plodding toward their goal. He turned suddenly from a chip of strawberries, drew a gold watch from his fob, and held it at its chain's length. "'Can you send them by tram, now?' A dark-backed figure under Merchant's arch scanned books on the hawker's car. "'Certainly, sir. Is it in the city?' "'Oh, yes,' Blazes Boylan said. Ten minutes.' The blonde girl handed him a docket and pencil. "'Will you write the address, sir?' Blazes Boylan at the counter wrote and pushed the docket to her. "'Send it at once, will you?' he said. "'It's for an invalid.' "'Yes, sir. I will, sir.' 
Blazes Boylan rattled merry money in his trousers' pocket. "'What's the damage?' he asked. The blonde girl's slim fingers reckoned the fruits. Blazes Boylan looked into the cut of her blouse, a young pullet. He took a red carnation from the tall stem-glass. "'This for me?' he asked gallantly. The blonde girl glanced sideways at him, got up regardless, with his tie a bit crooked, blushing. "'Yes, sir,' she said. Bending archly, she reckoned again fat pears and blushing peaches. Blazes Boylan looked in her blouse with more favour, the stalk of the red flower between his smiling teeth. "'May I say a word to your telephone, Missy?' he asked roguishly. Ma, Almidano Artifoni said. He gazed over Stefan's shoulder at Goldsmith's knobby paw. Two, carf two carfuls of tourists passed slowly, their women sitting fore, gripping frankly the handrests. Pale faces. Men's arms frankly round their stunted forms. They looked from Trinity to the blind columned porch of the Bank of Ireland, where pigeons rococooed. Ancio ho avuti di queste idee, Almidano Artifoni said, Condero giovine com lei, e poi mi sono convinti che il mondo è una bestia, e peccato, perce la sua voce, sarebbe un cep cespite di rendita via, invece lei si sacrifisa. Sacrificio incruento, Stefan said, smiling, swaying his ash-plant in slow swing-swong from its midpoint lightly. That would be Stephen, wouldn't it? Speriamo, the round, mustachioed face said pleasantly. Ma diaretta a me, si rifletta. By the stern stone hand of Grattan, bidding halt, an inchicor tram unloaded straggling highland soldiers of a band. Si riflettero, Stephen said, glancing down the solid trouser leg. Ma sul serio, eh? Almidano Artifoni said. His heavy hand took Stephen's firmly. Human eyes. They gazed curiously an instant, and turned quickly towards a dalky tram. Eccolo, Almidano Artifoni said in friendly haste. Venga a trovarmi e ci pensi. Adio, caro. Arrivederla, maestro, Stephen said, raising his hat when his hand was freed. E grazie. Dice, Almidano Artifoni said. Artifano said. Scusi, eh? Tante belle cose. Almidano Artifoni, holding up a baton of rolled music as a signal, trotted on stout trousers after the dalky tram. In vain he trotted, signalling in vain among the rout of bare-kneed gillies smuggling implements of music. Through Trinity Gates. Miss Dunn hid the Capel Street Library copy of the, Wom the Woman in White far back in her drawer, and rolled a sheet of gaudy notepaper into her typewriter. Too much mystery business in it. Is he in love with that one, Marion? Change it and get another by Mary Cecil Hay. The disc shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, and ogled them. Six. Miss Dunn clicked on the keyboard. 16 June, 1904 Five tall white-hatted sandwich men between Monypenny's corner and the slab where Wolf Tone's statue was not, eeled themselves turning H-E-L-Ys, and plodded back as they had come. Then she stared at the large poster of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette and listlessly lolling, scribbled on the jotter sixteens and capital S's. Mustard hair and dauby cheeks. She's not nice-looking, is she? The way she's holding up her bit of a skirt. Wonder will that fellow be at the band tonight? If I could get that dressmaker to make a concertina skirt like Susie Nagel's, they kick out grand. Shannon and all the boat club swells never took his eyes off her. Hope to goodness he won't keep me here till seven. The telephone rang rudely by her ear. "'Hello? Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. 
Only those two, sir, for Belfast and Liverpool. All right, sir. Then I can go after six if you're not back. A quarter after. Yes, sir. Twenty-seven and six. I'll tell him. Yes. One, seven, six. She scribbled three figures on an envelope. Mr. Boylan, hello. That gentleman from Sport was in looking for you. Mr. Lenahan, yes. He said he'll be in the Ormond at four. No, sir. Yes, sir. I'll ring them up after five. Two pink faces turned in the flare of the tiny torch. Who's that? Ned Lambert asked. Is that Crotty? Ringabella and Crosshaven, a voice replied, groping for foothold. Hello, Jack. Is that yourself? Ned Lambert said, raising in salute his pliant lath among the flickering arches. Come on, mind your steps there. The vesta in the clergyman's uplifted hand consumed itself in a long soft flame and was let fall. At their feet its red speck died, and mouldy air closed round them. "'How interesting!' a refined accent said in the gloom. "'Yes, sir,' Ned Lambert said heartily. "'We are standing in the historic council chamber of St. Mary's Abbey, where Silken Thomas proclaimed himself a rebel in 1534. This is the most historic spot in all Dublin. O Madden Burke is going to write something about it one of these days.' The old Bank of Ireland was over the way till the time of the Union, and the original Jews' temple was here too before they built their synagogue over in Adelaide Road. You were never here before, Jack, were you? No, Ned. He rode down through Dame Walk, the refined accent said, if my memory serves me. The mansion of the Kildares was in Thomas Court. That's right, Ned Lambert said. That's quite right, sir. "'If you will be so kind, then,' the clergyman said, "'the next time to allow me, perhaps.' "'Certainly,' Ned Lambert said. "'Bring the camera whenever you like. "'I'll get those bags cleared away from the windows. "'You can take it from here or from here.' "'In the still faint light he moved about, "'tapping with his lath the pile of seed-bags "'and points of vantage on the floor. "'From a long face a beard and gaze hung on a chessboard. "'I'm deeply obliged, Mr. Lambert,' the clergyman said. "'I won't trespass on your valuable time.' "'You're welcome, sir,' Ned Lambert said. "'Drop in whenever you like. Ni next week, say? Can you see?' "'Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Mr. Lambert. Very pleased to have met you.' "'Pleasure is mine, sir,' Ned Lambert answered. He followed his guest to the outlet, and then whirled his lath away among the pillars. With J. J. O'Malloy he came forth slowly into Mary's Abbey, where draymen were loading floats with sacks of carob and palm-nut meal, O'Connor, Wexford. He stood to read the card in his hand. The Reverend Hugh C. Love, Rathcoffee, present address, St. Michael's, Salins. Nice young chap he is. He's writing a book about the Fitzgeralds, he told me. He's well up in history, faith. The young woman, with slow care, detached from her light skirt a clinging twig. "'I thought you were at a new gunpowder plot,' J. J. O'Malloy said. Ned Lambert cracked his fingers in the air. "'God!' he cried. "'I forgot to tell him that one about the Earl of Kildare after he set fire to Cashel Cathedral. You know that one? I'm bloody sorry I did it,' says he. "'But I declare to God I thought the Archbishop was inside. He mightn't like it, though.' "'What?' "'God, I'll tell him anyhow. "'That was the great Earl, the Fitzgerald Moore. "'Hot members they were, all of them, the Geraldines.' "'The horses he passed started nervously under their slack harness. "'He slapped a piebald haunch quivering near him and cried, "'Whoa, Sonny!' "'He turned to J. J. O'Malloy and asked, "'Well, Jack, what is it? What's the trouble? "'Wait a while, hold hard.' With gaping mouth and head far back he stood still, and, after an instant, sneezed loudly. "'Chow!' he said. "'Blast you!' "'The dust from those sacks,' J. J. O'Malloy said politely. "'No!' Ned Lambert gasped. "'I caught a cold night before. Blast your soul! Night before last! And there was a hell of a lot of draught!' He held his handkerchief ready for the coming. "'I was, this morning—' "'Poor little—what do you call him? Cha, Mother of Moses!' 
Tom Rochford took the top disc from the pile he clasped against his claret waistcoat. See, he said, say it's turn six. In here, see. Turn now on. He slid it into the left slot for them. It shot down the groove, wobbled a while, ceased, ogling them. Six. Lawyers of the past, haughty, pleading, beheld pass from the consolidated taxing office to Nisi Prius Court, Richie Golding carrying the cost-bag of Golding, Collis, and Ward, and heard rustling from the Admiralty Division of King's Bench to the Court of Appeal an elderly female with false teeth, smiling incredulously, and a black silk skirt of great amplitude. "'See,' he said, "'see now, the last one I put in is over here, turns over, the impact, leverage, see?' He showed them the rising column of discs on the right. "'Smart idea,' Nosy, fin Nosy Flynn said, snuffling. "'So a fellow coming in late can see what turn is on and what turns are over.' "'See?' Tom Rochford said. He slid in a disc for himself and watched it shoot, wobble, ogle, stop. Four. Turn now on. I'll see him now in the Ormond, Lenahan said, and sound him. One good turn deserves another. Do, Tom Rochford said. Tell him I'm boiling with impatience. Good night, McCoy said abruptly, when you two begin. Nosy Flynn stooped towards the lever, snuffling at it. "'But how does it work here, Tommy?' he asked. "'Turaloo,' Lenahan said. "'See you later.' He followed McCoy out across the tiny square of Crampton Court. "'He's a hero,' he said simply. "'I know,' McCoy said. "'The drain, you mean.' "'Drain?' Lenahan said. It was down a manhole. They passed Dan Lowry's music hall, where Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, smiled on them from a poster, a dauby smile. Going down the path of Sycamore Street beside the Empire Music Hall, Lenahan showed McCoy how the whole thing was. One of those manholes like a bloody gas-pipe, and there was the poor devil stuck down in it half-choked with sewer gas. Down went Tom Rochford anyhow, bookie's vest and all, with the rope round him and be damned, but he got the rope round the poor devil, and the two were hauled up. "'The act of a hero,' he said. At the Dolphin they halted to allow the ambulance car to gallop past them for Jervis Street. "'This way,' he said, walking to the right. "'I want to pop into Linham's to see Scepter's starting price. What's the time by your gold watch and chain?' McCoy peered into Marcus Tertius Moses's sombre office, then at O'Neill's clock. "'After three, he said, "'who's riding her?' "'Oh, Madden,' Lenahan said, "'and a game filly she is.' While he waited in Temple Bar, McCoy dodged a banana peel with gentle pushes of his toe from the path to the gutter. Fellow might damn easy get a nasty fall there, coming along tight in the dark. The gates of the drive opened wide to give egress to the Viceregal cavalcade. "'Even money,' Lenahan said, returning. "'I knocked against Bantam Lyons in there, "'going to back a bloody horse someone gave him "'that hasn't an earthly. "'Through here.' "'They went up the steps and under Merchant's arch. "'A dark-backed figure scanned books on the hawker's cart. "'There he is,' Lenahan said. "'Wonder what he is buying,' McCoy said, glancing behind. "'Leopoldo, or the bloom is on the rye,' Lenahan said. "'He's dead nuts on sales,' McCoy said. "'I was with him one day, and he bought a book from an old one in Liffey Street for two bob. "'There were fine plates in it, worth double the money, "'the stars and the moon, and comets with long tails. "'Astronomy it was about.' "'Lenahan laughed. "'I'll tell you a damn good one about comets' tails,' he said. "'Come over in the sun.' They crossed to the metal bridge and went along Wellington Quay by the river wall. Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam came out of Mangan's, late Fahrenbach's, carrying a pound and a half of pork steaks. There was a big spread out at Glencree Reformatory, Lenahan said eagerly. The annual dinner, you know, boiled shirt affair, 
The Lord Mayor was there, Val Lillen it was, and Sir Charles Cameron and Dan Dawson spoke, and there was music. Bartell Darcy sang, and Benjamin Dollard. I know, McCoy broke in. My missus sang there once. Did she? Linehan said. A card, Unfurnished Apartments, reappeared on the window sash of number seven Eccles Street. He checked his tail a moment, but broke out in a wheezy laugh. "'But wait till I tell you,' he said. "'Della Hunt of Camden Street had the catering, and yours truly was chief bottle-washer. Bloom and the wife were there. Lashings of stuff we put up, port wine and sherry and caracoa, to which we did ample justice. Fast and furious it was. After liquids came solids, cold joints galore and mince pies.' "'I know,' McCoy said. "'The year the missus was there.' Lenahan linked his arm warmly. "'But wait till I tell you,' he said. "'We had a midnight lunch, too, after all the jollification, "'and when we sallied forth it was blue o'clock the morning after the night before. "'Coming home it was a gorgeous winter's night on the Featherbed Mountain. "'Bloom and Chris Callanan were on one side of the car, "'and I was with the wife on the other. "'We started singing glees and duets.' low the early beam of morning. She was well primed with a good load of Delahunt's port under her belly-band. Every jolt the bloody car gave I had her bumping up against me. Hell's delights! She has a fine pair, God bless her, like that! He held his caved hands a cubit from him, frowning. I was tucking the rug under her and settling her boa all the time, know what I mean? His hands moulded ample curves of air. He shut his eyes tight in delight, his body shrinking, and blew a sweet chirp from his lips. "'The lad stood to attention anyhow,' he said with a sigh. "'She's a gamey mare, and no mistake. Bloom was pointing out all the stars and the comets in the heavens to Chris Callanan and the Jarvey, the great bear and Hercules and the dragon and the whole jing-bang lot. But by God I was lost, so to speak, in the Milky Way. He knows them all, Faith.' At last she spotted a weeny weeshy one, miles away. "'And what star is that, Poldy?' says she. "'By God, she had Bloom cornered.' "'That one, is it?' says Chris Callanan. "'Sure, that's only what you might call a pinprick. "'By God, he wasn't far wide of the mark.' Lenahan stopped and leaned on the river wall, panting with soft laughter. "'I'm weak,' he gasped. McCoy's white face smiled about it at instants and grew grave. Lenahan walked on again. He lifted his yachting cap and scratched his hind head rapidly. He glanced sideways in the sunlight at McCoy. "'He's a cultured all-round man, Bloom is,' he said seriously. "'He's not one of your common or garden, you know. There's a touch of the artist about old Bloom.' Mr. Bloom turned over idly, pages of the awful disclosures of Maria Monk, and then of Aristotle's masterpiece, crooked botched print, plates, infants cuddled in a ball, in blood-red wombs like livers of slaughtered cows, lots of them like that, at this moment all over the world, all budding with their skulls to get out of it, child born every minute somewhere, Mrs. Purefoy. He laid both books aside and glanced at the third, Tales of the Ghetto, by Leopold von Sacher Massok. That I had, he said, pushing it by. The shopman let two volumes fall on the counter. Them are two good ones, he said. Onions of his breast, breath came across the counter out of his ruined mouth. He bent to make a bundle of the other books, hugged them against his unbuttoned waistcoat and bore them off behind the dingy curtain. On O'Connell Bridge, many persons observed the grave deportment and gay apparel of Mr. Dennis J. McGinney, professor of dancing and company. Mr. Bloom alone looked at the titles. Fair Tyrants by Lane James Lovebirch. Know the kind, that is. Had it? Yes. He opened it. Thought so. A woman's voice behind the dingy curtain. Listen. The man. No. She wouldn't like that much got her at once. He read the other titles, Sweets of Sin. More in her line, let us see. He read where his finger opened. All the dollar bills her husband gave her were spent in the stores on wondrous gowns and costliest frillies. For him, for Raoul. Yes, this, here, try. 
her mouth glued on his in a luscious, voluptuous kiss while his hands felt for the opulent curves inside her déshabillé. Yes, take this, the end. You are late, he spoke hoarsely, eyeing her with suspicious glare. The beautiful woman threw off her stable-trimmed wrap, displaying her queenly shoulders and heaving and bun point. An imperceptible smile played round her perfect lips as she turned to him calmly. Mr. Bloom read again, the beautiful woman. Warmth showered gently over him, cowing his flesh. Flesh yielded amid rumpled clothes, whites of eyes swooning up. His nostrils arched themselves for prey, melting breast ointments for him, for Raoul, armpits, onion, oniony sweat, fish gluey slime, her heaving umbun point, feel, press, crished sulphur dung of lions, young, young. An elderly female, no more young, left the building of the courts of Chancery King's Bents at Chequer, and common pleas having heard in the Lord Chancellor's court the case in lunacy of Potterton. In the admirability divisions of the summons, ex parte motion of the owners of Lady Cairns versus the owners of Barque Mona, in the Court of Appeal, reservation of judgment in the case of Harvey versus the Ocean Accident and Guarantee Corporation. Flemmy coughs shook the air of the bookshop, bulging out the dingy curtains. The shopman's uncombed grey head came out and his unshaven reddened face coughing. He raked his throat rudely, spat phlegm on the floor. He put his boot on what he had spat, wiping the sole along it and bent showing a raw-skinned crown, scantily haired. Mr. Bloom beheld it. Mastering his troubled breath, he said, I'll take this one. The shopman lifted eyes, bleared with old room. Sweets of sin, he said, tapping on it. That's a good one. End of Ulysses, section 10a. Ulysses by James Joyce, section 10b. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The lackey by the door of Dylan's auction rooms shook his handbell twice and viewed himself in the chalked mirror of the cabinet. Dilly Dedalus, listening in the curbstone, heard the beats of the bell and the cries of the auctioneer within, four and nine, those lovely curtains, five shillings, cosy curtains, selling new at two guineas, any advance on five shillings, going for five shillings. The lackey lifted his handbell and shook it. Barang! Bang of the last lap bell spurred the half-time wheelmen to their spirit. J. A. Jackson, W. E. Wiley, A. Monroe, H. T. Gayen. Their stretched necks wagging negotiated the curb by the college library. Mr. Dedalus, trudging a long mustache, came round from William's row. He halted near his daughter. It's time for you, she said. Stand up straight for the love of Lord Jesus, Mr. Dedalus said. Are you trying to imitate your uncle John, the coronet player, head upon shoulders? Melancholy God! Dilly shrugged her shoulders. Mr. Dedalus placed his hands on them and held them back. Stand up straight, girl, he said. You'll get curvature of the spine. Do you know what you look like? He let his head sink suddenly down and forward, hunching his shoulders and drooping his under jaw. Give it up, father, Dilly said. All the people are looking at you. Mr. Dedalus drew himself upright and tugged again at his mustache. Did you get any money? Dilly asked. Where would I get money, Mr. Dedalus said. There is no one in Dublin would lend me fourpence. You got some, Dilly said, looking in his eyes. How do you know that, Mr. Dedalus asked, his tongue in his cheek. Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked, walked boldly along James Street. I know you did, Dilly answered. Were you in the Scotch house now? I was not then, Mr. Dedalus said, smiling. Was it the little nuns taught you to be so saucy? Here. He handed her a shilling. See if you can do anything with that, he said. I suppose you got five, Dilly said. Give me more of that. Wait a while, Mr. Dedalus said threateningly. You're like the rest of them, aren't you? An insolent pack of little bitches since your poor mother died. 
But wait a while. You'll get a short shrift and a long day for me, low blackguardism. I'm going to get rid of you. Wouldn't care if I was stretched out stiff. He's dead. The man upstairs is dead. He left her and walked on. Dilly followed quickly and pulled his coat. Well, what is it? he said, stopping. The racky, lackey rang his bell behind their backs. Barang! Curse your bloody blatant soul! Mr. Dedalus cried, turning on him. The lackey, aware of comment, shook the lolling clapper of his bell, but feebly. Bang! Mr. Dedalus stared at him. Watch him, he said. It's instructive. I wonder will he allow us to talk? You got more than that, Father, Dilly said. I'm going to show you a little trick, Mr. Dedalus said. I'll leave you all where Jesus left the Jews. Look, that's all I have. I got two shillings from Jack Power and I spent twopence for a shave for the funeral. He drew forth a handful of copper coins nervously. Can't you look for some money somewhere, Dilly said. Mr. Dedalus thought and nodded. I will, he said gravely. I looked all along the gutter in O'Connell Street. I'll try this one now. You're very funny, Dilly said, grinning. Here, Mr. Dedalus said, handing her two pennies, get a glass of milk for yourself and a bun or something. I'll be home shortly. He put the other coins in his pocket and started to walk on. The vice-regal cavalcade passed, greeted by obsequious policemen out of Parkgate. I'm sure you have another shilling, Dilly said. The lackey banged loudly. Mr. Dedalus, amid the din, walked off, murmuring to himself with a pursing, mincing mouth. The little nuns, nice little things, oh, sure, they wouldn't do anything. Oh, sure, they wouldn't really. Is it little sister Monica? From the sundial towards James's gate walked Mr. Kernan, pleased with the order he had booked for Pulbrook Robertson, boldly along James's street, past Shackleton's offices. Got round him all right. How do you do, Mr. Crimmins? First rate, sir. I was afraid you might be up in your other establishment in Pimlico. How are things going? Just keeping alive. Lovely weather we are having. Yes, indeed. Good for the country. Those farmers are always grumbling. I'll take a thimbleful of your best gin, Mr. Crimmins. Small gin, sir. Yes, sir. Terrible affair, that General Sulcum explosion. Terrible, terrible. A thousand casualties. And heart-rending scenes. Men trampling down women and children. Most brutal thing. What do they say was the cause? Spontaneous combustion, most scandalous revelation. Not a single lifeboat would float, and the fire hose all burst. What I can't understand is how the inspectors ever allowed a boat like that. Now you are talking straight, Mr. Crimmins. You know why? Palm oil. Is that a fact? Without a doubt. Well, now, look at that. And America, they say, is the land of the free. I thought we were bad here. I smiled at him. America, I said quietly, just like that. What is it? The sweepings of every country, including our own. Isn't that true? That's a fact. Graft, my dear sir. Well, of course. There's plenty of money going. There's always someone to pick it up. Saw him looking at my frock coat dress, does it? Nothing like a dressy appearance. Bulls him over. Hello, Simon, Father Crawley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. Mr. Kernan halted and preened himself before the sloping mirror of Peter Kennedy, hairdresser. Stylish coat, beyond a doubt. Scott of Dawson Street. Well worth the half-sovereign I gave Neary for it. Never built under three guineas. Fits me down to the ground. Some Kildare Street Club toff had it, probably. John Mulligan, the manager of Hibernian Bank, gave me a very sharp eye yesterday on Carlisle Bridge, as if he remembered me. Ahem, must dress the character of those fellows, knight of the road, gentlemen. And now, Mr. Crimmins... May we have the honor of your custom again, sir, the cup that cheers but not inebriates, as the old saying has it. North Wall insured Sir John Rogerson's K, with hulls and anchor chains, sailing westward, sailed by a skiff, a crumpled throw ray, rocked on the ferry wash, Elijah is coming. Mr. Kernan glanced in farewell at his image, high color, of course grizzled mustache. Returned Indian officer, bravely he bore his stumpy body forward on spatted feet, squaring his shoulders. Is that Lambert's brother over the way, Sam? What? Yes. He's like it as damn it. No, the windscreen of the motor car in the sun there. Just a flash like that. Damn like him. Ahem. 
Hot spirit of jun juniper juice warmed his vitals in his breath. Good drop of gin that was. His frock tails winked in bright sunshine to his fat strut. Down there, Emmett was hanged, drawn and quartered, greasy black rope. Dogs licked the blood off the street when the Lord Lieutenant's wife drove by in her naughty. Let me see, is he buried in St. Mickens? Oh no, there was a midnight burial in Glasnevin. Corpse brought in through a secret door in the wall. Dignam is there now. Went out in a puff. Well, well, better turn down here, make a detour. Mr. Kernan turned and walked down the slope of Watling Street by the corner of Guinness's visitor's waiting room. Outside the Dublin Distillery's company stores, an outside ear without fare or jarvy stood. The reins knotted to the wheel. Damn dangerous thing. Some tipperary bosthoon endangering the lives of the citizens. Runaway horse. Dennis Breen, with his tomes, weary of having waited an hour in John Henry Menton's office, led his wife over a Connell bridge, bound for the office of Messrs. Collis and Ward. Mr. Kernan approached Island Street, times of the troubles. Must ask Ned Lambert to lend me those reminiscences of John a Jonah Barrington. When you look back on it all now, a kind of retrospective arrangement. Gaming at dailies, no card sharping then. One of these fellows got his hand nailed to the table by a dagger. Somewhere here, Lord Edward Fitzgerald escaped from Major Sir. Stables behind Moira House. Damn good gin that was. Fine, dashing young nobleman, good stock, of course. That ruffian, that sham squire with his violet gloves, gave him away. Of course, they were on the wrong side. They rose in dark and evil days. Fine poem, that is, Ingram. They were gentlemen. Ben Dollard does sing that ballad touchingly, masterly rendition. At the siege of Ross did my father fall. A cavalcade, an easy trot along Pembroke Cay, passed, outriders leaping, leaping in there, in their saddles, frock coats, cream sunshades. Mr. Kernan hurried forward, blowing pursily, his excellently too bad. Just missed that by a hair. Damn it, what a pity. Stephen Dedalus watched through the webbed window, the lapidary's fingers prove a time-dulled chain. Dust webbed the window and the show trays. Dust darkened the toiling fingers with their vulture nails. Dust slept on dull coils, bronze and silver, lozenges of cinnabar, on rubies, leprous and wine-dark stones. Born all in dark, wormy earth, cold specks of fire, evil lights shining in the darkness, where fallen archan archangels flung the stars of their brows, Muddy swine snouts, hands root and root, gripe and rest them. She dances in a foul gloom where gum burns with garlic. A sailor man, rust bearded, sips from a beaker, rum and eyeser. A long, sea fed, silent rut. She dances, capers, wagging her sowish haunches and her hips, on her gross belly flapping a ruby egg. Old Russell, with a smeared chamois rag, burnished his, again his gem turned it and held it at the point of his Moses's beard, grandfather ape gloating on a stolen hoard, and you who rest old images from the burial earth, the brain-sick words of sophist, antithesines, a lore of drugs, orient and immortal wheat standing from everlasting to everlasting. Two old women, fresh from their whiff, of the briny trudge through Irish town along London Bridge Road, one with sanded umbrella, one with a midwife's bag in which eleven cockles rolled, the whir of flapping leather bands and hum of dynamos from the powerhouse urged Stephen to be on. Beingless beings, stop, throb always without you and throb always within. Your heart you sing of, I between them, where? Between two roaring worlds where they swirl, I shatter them one and both but stun myself too in the blow shatter me you who can bod and butcher were the words i say 
Not yet a while. Look around. Yes, quite true. Very large and wonderful and keeps famous time, you say, right, sir? A Monday morning, twas so indeed. Stephen went down Bedford Row, the handle of the ash clacking against his shoulder blade. In Clohissy's window, a faded 1860 print of Heenan boxing sayers held his eye. Staring backers with square hats stood round the rope prize ring. The heavyweights in light loincloths proposed gently to each other his bulbous fist. And there throbbing heroes' hearts. He turned and halted by the slanted book cart. Two pence each, the huckster said. Four for six pence. Tattered pages of the Irish beekeeper. Life and miracles of the cure a of arts pocket guide to killarney i might find here one of my pawn school prizes stefano didolo alumno optimo palman ferenti father conmi having read his little hours walked through the hamlet of don carney murmuring vespers binding too good probably what is this eighth and ninth book of Mo moses secret of all secrets seal of king david Thumbled pages, rid and red. Who has passed before me? How to soften chapped hands. Recipe for white wine vinegar. How to win a woman's love. For me this. Say the following talisman three times with hand folded. Say el yilo nebracar feminum amor me solo sanctus amen. Who wrote this? charms and invocations of the most blessed abbot peter salanka to all true believers divulge as good as any other abbot's charms as mumbling joachim's down bally noddle or we'll wool your wool what are you doing here stephen dilly's high shoulders and shabby dress shut the book quick don't let see what are you doing stephen said a Stuart face of none such Charles, lank locks falling at its sides. It glowed as she crouched, feeding the fire with broken boots. I told her of Paris, late lie abed under a quilt of overcoats, fingering a pinchbeck bracelet, Dan Kelly's token. Nebracadaba feminum. What have you there? Stephen asked. I bought it from the other cart for a penny, Dilly said, laughing nervously. Is it any good? My eyes say she has. Do others see me so? Quick, far, and daring, shadow of my mind. He took the coverless book from her hand. Chardinal's French primer. What did you buy that for, he said, to learn French? She nodded, reddening, and closed tight her lips. Show no surprise, quite natural. Here, Stephen said, it's all right. Mind Maggie doesn't pawn it on you. I suppose all my books are gone. Some, Dilly said. We had to. She is drowning. Agenbite, save her. Agenbite, all against us. She will drown me with her eyes and hair, lank coils of seaweed hair round me, my heart, my soul. Salt, green, death, we. Agenbite of Inwit. Inwit's Agenbite, misery. Misery. Hello, Simon, Father Crowley said. How are things? Hello, Bob, old man, Mr. Dedalus answered, stopping. They clasped hands loudly outside Reddy and daughters. Father Cowley brushed his mustache off and downward with a scooping hand. What's the best news? Mr. Dedalus said. Why, not much, Father Cowley said. I'm barricaded up, Simon, with two men prowling around the house trying to effect an entrance. Jolly, Mr. Dedalus said. Who is it? Oh, Father Cowley said, a certain gombean man of our acquaintance. With a broken back, is it? Mr. Dedalus asked. The same, Simon, Father Crowley answered. Reuben of that ilk, I'm just waiting for Ben Dollard. He's going to say a word to Long John to get him to take those two men off. All I want is a little time. He looked with vague hope up and down the quay, a big apple bulging in his neck. I know, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding. Poor old Badaki Ben. He's always go doing a good turn for someone. Hold hard. He put on his glasses and gazed towards the metal bridge an instant. There he is, by God, he said, arse and pockets. Ben Dollard's loose blue cutaway and square hat above large slops crossed the quay in full gait from the metal bridge. 
He came towards them at an amble, scratching, the act, scratching actively behind his coat tails. As he came near, Mr. Dedalus greeted. Hold that fellow with the bowed, bad trousers. Hold him now, Ben Dollard said. Mr. Dedalus eyed with cold, wandering scorn various points of Ben Dollard's figure. Then, turning to Father Cowley with a nod, he muttered sneeringly, That's a petty garment, isn't it, for a summer's day? Why, God eternally curse your soul, Ben Dollard growled furiously. I threw out more clothes in my time than you ever saw. He stood beside them, beaming on them first on his roomy clothes, from points of which Mr. Dedalus flicked fluff, saying, They were made for a man of his health. Ben, anyhow. Bad luck to the Jew man that made them, Ben Dollard said. Thanks be to God, he's not paid yet. And how is that... Basso profundo, Benjamin, Father Cowley asked. Cashel, Boyle, O'Connor, Fitmaurice, Tisdall, Farrell, murmuring, glassy-eyed, strode past the Kildare Street Club. Ben Dollard frowned and, making suddenly a chanter's mouth, gave forth a deep, deep note. Ah, he said. That's the style, Mr. Dedalus said, nodding to its drone. What about that, Ben Dollard said, not too dusty, what? He turned to both. That'll do, Father Cowley said, nodding also. The Reverend Hugh C. Love walked from old chapter house of St. Mary's, Abbey Past Jane, and Charles Kennedy's rectifiers, attended by Geraldine's tall and personable, towards Thalsell beyond the ford of hurdles. Ben Dollard, with, heavy, with a heavy list towards the shop fronts, led him forward his joyful fingers in the air. Come along with me to sub-sheriff's office, he said. I want to show you the new beauty rock has for a bailiff. He's a cross between Lobangula and Lynchehan. He's well worth seeing, mind you. Come along. I saw John Henry Menton casually in the bodega just now, and it will cost me a fall if I don't wait a while. We're on the right, lay, Bob, believe you me. For a few days, tell him, Father Cowley said anxiously. Ben Dollard halted and stared, his loud orifice open, a dangling button off his coat wagging bright back from its thread as he wiped away the heavy shrums that clogged his eyes to hear aright. What few days, he boomed. Hasn't your landlord distrained for rent? He has. Father Cowley said. Then our friend's writ is not worth the paper it's printed on, Ben Dollard said. The landlord has the prior claim. I gave him all the particulars. 29 Windsor Avenue. Love, the, love is the name? That's right, Father Cowley said. The Reverend Mr. Love. He's a minister in the country somewhere. But are you sure of that? You can tell Barbarus from me, Ben Dollard said, that he can put that writ where Jacko put the nuts. He let Father Cowley boldly forward, linked to his bulk. Filberts, I believe they were, Mr. Dedalus said, as he dropped his glasses on his coat front, following them. The youngster will be all right, Martin Cunningham said, as they passed out of the castle yard gate. The policeman touched his forehead. God bless you, Martin Cunningham said cheerfully. He signed to the waiting Jarvie, who chucked at the reins and set on towards Lord Edward Street. Bronze by gold, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head, appeared above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel. Yes, Martin Cunningham said, fingering his beard. I wrote to Father Conmy and laid the whole case before him. You could try our friend, Mr. Power suggested backward. Boyd? "'Martin Cunningham said shortly, "'Touch me not.' "'John Wise Nolan, lagging behind, reading the list, "'came after them quickly down Cork Hill. "'On the steps of the city hall, Councillor Nanetti, descending, "'hailed Alderman Cowley and Councillor Abraham Lyon, ascending. "'The castle car wheeled empty into Upper Exchange Street. "'Look here, Martin,' John Wise Nolan said, "'overtaking them at the mail office.' I see Bloom put his name down for five shillings. Quite right, Martin Cunningham said, taking the list, and put down the five shillings, too. Without a second word, either, Mr. Power said. Strange but true, Martin Cunningham added. 
John Wise Nolan opened wide eyes. "'I'll say there is much kindness in the Jew,' he quoted elegantly. They went down Parliament Street. "'There's Jimmy Henry,' Mr. Power said, just heading for Kavanaugh's. "'Right o,' Martin Cunningham said. "'Here goes.' Outside La Maison Claire, Blazes Boylan waylaid Jack Mooney's brother-in-law, humpy, tight, making for the liberties. John Wise Nolan fell back with Mr. Power, while Martin Cunningham took the elbow of the dapper little man in a shower of hail suit, who walked uncertainly with hasty steps past Mickey Anderson's watches. "'The assistant town clerk's corns are giving him some trouble,' John Wise Nolan told Mr. Power." They followed round the corner towards James Cavanaugh's wine-rooms. The empty castle car fronted them at rest in Essex Gate. Martin Cunningham, speaking always, showed often the list at which Jimmy Henry did not glance. "'And Long John Fanning is here, too,' John Wise Nolan said, as large as life. The tall form of Long John Fanning filled the doorway where he stood. "'Good day, Mr. Subsheriff. Martin Cunningham said, as all halted and greeted. Long John Fanning made no way for them. He removed his large Henry Clay decisively, and his large fierce eyes scowled intelligently over all their faces. "'Are the conscript fathers pursuing their peaceful deliberations?' he said, with rich, acrid utterance to the assistant town clerk. "'Hell open to Christians they were having,' "'Jimmy Henry said pettishly, about their damned Irish language. "'Where was the marshal, he wanted to know, to keep order in the council chamber? "'An old Barlow, the mace-bearer, laid up with asthma. "'No mace on the table, nothing in order, no quorum even, "'and Hutchinson, the Lord Mayor, in London, no, "'and little Lorcan Sherlock doing locum tenens for him. "'Damned Irish language, language of our forefathers.' Long John Fanning blew a plume of smoke from his lips. Martin Cunningham spoke by turns, twirling the peak of his beard to the assistant town clerk and the sub-sheriff, while John Wise Nolan held his peace. "'What dignum was that?' Long John Fanning asked. Jimmy Henry made a grimace and lifted his left foot. "'Oh, my corns!' he said plaintively. "'Come upstairs, for goodness' sake, till I sit down somewhere. Oof! Ooh!' mind testily he made room for himself beside long john fanning's flank and passed in and up the stairs come on up martin cunningham said to the sub-sheriff i don't think you knew him or perhaps you did though with john wise nolan mr power followed them in decent little soul he was mr power said to the stalwart back of long john fanning ascending towards long john fanning in the mirror "'Rather low-sized, dignum of Menton's office that was,' Martin Cunningham said. Long John Fanning could not remember him. "'Clatter of horse-hoofs sounded from the air. "'What's that?' Martin Cunningham said. All turned where they stood. John Wise Nolan came down again. From the cool shadows of the doorway he saw the horses pass Parliament Street, harness and glossy pasterns in sunlight shimmering.' Gaily they went past before his cool, unfriendly eyes, not quickly. In saddles of the leaders, leaping leaders, rode outriders. "'What was it?' Martin Cunningham asked, as they went on up the staircase. "'The Lord Lieutenant General and General Governor of Ireland,' John Wise Nolan answered from the stairfoot. As they trod across the thick carpet, Buck Mulligan whispered behind his Panama to Haynes, Parnell's brother, there in the corner. They chose a small table near the window opposite a long-faced man whose beard and gaze hung intently down on a chessboard. "'Is that he?' Haynes asked, twisting round in his seat. "'Yes,' Mulligan said. "'That's John Howard, his brother, our city marshal.' John Howard Parnell translated a white bishop quietly, and his grey claw went up again to his forehead, whereat it rested. An instant after, under its screen, his eyes looked quickly, ghost-bright, at his foe, and fell once more upon a working corner. "'I'll take a melange,' Haynes said to the waitress. 
Two melanges, Buck Mulligan said, and bring us some scones and butter and some cakes as well. When she had gone, he said, laughing, We call it DBC, because they have damn bad cakes. Oh, but you missed Daedalus on Hamlet. Haynes opened his new-bought book. I'm sorry, he said. Shakespeare is the happy hunting ground of all minds that have lost their balance. The one-legged sailor growled at the area of 14 Nelson Street. England expects. Buck Mulligan's primrose waistcoat shook gaily to his laughter. You should see him, he said, when his body loses its balance. Wandering Angus, I call him. I am sure he has an idée fixe, Haynes said, pinching his chin thoughtfully with thumb and forefinger. How I am speculating what it would be likely to be. Such persons always have. Buck Mulligan bent across the table gravely. They drove his wits astray, he said, by visions of hell. He will never capture the attic note, the note of Swinburne, of all poets, the white death and the ruddy birth. That is his tragedy. He can never be a poet, the joy of creation. Eternal punishment, Haynes said, nodding curtly. I see. I tackled him this morning on belief. There was something on his mind, I saw. It's rather interesting, because Professor Pokorny of Vienna makes an interesting point out of that. Buck Mulligan's watchful eyes saw the waitress come. He helped her to unload her tray. He can find no trace of hell in ancient Irish myth, Haynes said, amid the cheerful cups. The moral idea seems lacking, the sense of destiny, of retribution. Rather strange he should have just that fixed idea. Does he write anything for your movement? He sank two lumps of sugar deftly longwise through the whipped cream. Buck Mulligan slit a steaming scone in two and plastered butter over its smoking pith. He bit off a soft piece hungrily. Ten years, he said, chewing and laughing. He is going to write something in ten years. Seems a long way off, Haynes said thoughtfully lifting his spoon. Still, I shouldn't wonder if he did after all. He tasted a spoonful from the creamy cone of his cup. This is real Irish cream, I take it, he said with forbearance. I don't want to be imposed on. Elijah, skiff, light, crumpled throwaway, sailed eastward by flanks of ships and trawlers, amid an archipelago of corks, beyond New Wapping Street, past Benson's Ferry, and by the three-masted schooner Rosevian from Bridgewater with the bricks. Almidano Artifoni walked past Hollis Street, past Sewell's Yard. Behind him Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell, with stick-umbrella a just coat dangling, shunned the lamp before Mr. Law Smith's house and, crossing, walked along Marion Square. Distantly behind him, a blind stripling tapped his way by the wall of College Park. Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell walked as far as Mr. Lewis Werner's cheerful windows, then turned and strode back along Marion Square, his stick-umbrella adjust coat dangling. At the corner of Wilde's he halted, frowned at Elijah's name announced on the Metropolitan Hall, frowned at the distant pleasance of Duke's lawn. His eyeglasses flashed, frowning in the sun. With rat's teeth bared, he muttered, Coactus volui. He strode on for Clare Street, grinding his fierce word. As he strode past Mr. Bloom's dental windows, the sway of his dust-coat brushed rudely from its angle a slender tapping cane, and swept onwards, having buffeted a thewless body. The blind stripling turned his sickly face after the striding form. "'God's curse on you,' he said sourly. "'Whoever you are, you're blinder nor I am, you bitches bastard!' Opposite Ruggy O'Donohue's Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, pawing, uh, pawing the pound and a half of Mangan's, late Fahrenbach's pork steaks he had been sent for, went along warm Wicklow Street, dawdling. 
It was too blooming dull sitting in the parlour with Mrs. Stower and Mrs. Quigley and Mrs. MacDowell and the blind down and they all at their sniffles and sipping sups of the superior tawny sherry Uncle Barney brought from Tunney's, and they eating crumbs of the cottage fruit cake, jawing the whole blooming time and sighing. After Wicklow Lane, the window of Madame Doyle, court dress milliner, stopped him. He stood looking in at the two puckers, stripped to their pelts and putting up their props. From the side mirrors, two mourning masters, Dignam gaped silently. Myler Keogh, Dublin's pet lamb, will meet Sergeant Major Bennett, the portobello bruiser, for a purse of fifty sovereigns. Gob, that'd be a good pucking match to see. Myler Keogh, that's the chap sparring out to him with the green sash. Two bar entrance, soldiers half price. I could easy do a bunk on Ma. Master Dignam on his left turned as he turned. That's me in mourning. When is it? May the twenty-second. Sure, the blooming thing is all over. He turned to the right, and on his right Master Dignam turned, his cap awry, his collar sticking up. Buttoning it down, his chin lifted, he saw the image of Marie Kendall, charming soubrette, beside the two puckers. One of them mots that do be in the packets of fag stores smokes, that his old fellow welted hell out of him for one time he found out. Master Dignam got his collar down and dawdled on. The best pucker going for strength was Fitzsimmons. One puck in the wind from that fellow would knock you into the middle of next week, man. But the best pucker for science was Jem Corbett before Fitzsimmons knocked the stuffings out of him, dodging and all. In Grafton Street, Master Dignam saw a red flower in a toff's mouth and a swell pair of kicks on him, and he listening to what the drunk was telling him and grinning all the time. No Sandy Mount tram. Master Dignam walked along Nassau Street, shifted the pork steaks to his other hand. His collar sprang up again, and he tugged it down. The blooming stud was too small for the buttonhole of the shirt blooming end to it. He met schoolboys with satchels. I'm not going tomorrow either. Stay away till Monday. He met other schoolboys. Do they notice I'm in mourning? Uncle Barney said he'd get it into the paper tonight. Then they'll all see it in the paper and read my name printed, and Pa's name. His face got all grey, instead of being red like it was, and there was a fly walking over it up to his eye. The scrunch that was when they were screwing the screws into the coffin, and the bumps when they were bringing it downstairs. Pa was inside it, and Ma crying in the parlour, and Uncle Barney telling the men how to get it round the bend. A big coffin it was, and high and heavy-looking. How was that? The last night Pa was boozed, he was standing on the landing there, bawling out for his boots to go out to Tunney's, for to booze more, and he looked buddy and short in his shirt. Never see him again. Death, that is. Pa is dead. My father is dead. He told me to be a good son to Ma. I couldn't hear the other things he said, but I saw his tongue and his teeth trying to say it better. Poor Pa. That was Mr. Dignam, my father. I hope he is in purgatory now, because he went to confession to Father Conroy on Saturday night. William Humble, Earl of Dudley, and Lady Dudley, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel Heseltine, drove out after luncheon from the Viceregal Lodge. In the following carriage were the Honourable Mrs. Paget, Miss de Courcy, and the Honourable Gerald Ward A.D.C. in attendance. The cavalcade passed out by the lower gate of Phoenix Park, saluted by obsequious policemen, and proceeded past Kingsbridge along the northern quays. The viceroy was most cordially greeted on his way through the metropolis. At Bloody Bridge Mr. Thomas Kernan, beyond the river, greeted him vainly from afar. Between Queen's and Whitworth Bridges, Lord Dudley's viceregal carriages passed, and were unsaluted by Mr. Dudley White, B. L. M. A., who stood on Aaron K. outside Mrs. M. E. White's, the pawnbroker's, at the corner of Aaron Street West, stroking his nose with his forefinger, undecided whether he should arrive at Fibsborough more quickly by a triple change of tram, or by hailing a car, or on foot through Smithfield, Constitution Hill, and Broadstone Terminus. 
in the porch of four courts, with Richie Goulding, with the coat's bag of Goulding, Collis, and Ward, saw him with surprise. Past Richmond Bridge, at the doorstep of the office, of Reuben J. Dodd, solicitor, agent for the Patriotic Insurance Company, an elderly female about to enter changed her plan, and, retracing her steps by King's windows, smiled credulously, credulously, on the representative of His Majesty. From its sluice in Wood K. Wall, under Tom Devon's office, Poddle River hung out in fealty a tongue of liquid sewage. Above the cross-blind of the Ormond Hotel, gold by bronze, Miss Kennedy's head by Miss Deuce's head watched and admired. On Ormond K., Mr. Simon Dedalus, steering his way from the greenhouse for the sub-sheriff's office, stood still in mid-street, and brought his hat low. His Excellency, grace, his Excellency graciously returned Mr. Dedalus's greeting. From Cahill's corner the Reverend Hugh C. Love, M.A., made obeisance unperceived, mindful of Lord's deputies whose hands, benignant, had held of your rich advowsons. On Grattan Bridge Lenehan and McCoy, taking leave of each other, watched the carriages go by. Passing by Roger Green's office and Dollard's big red printing house, Gertie McDowell, carrying the Catesby Cork lino letters for her father, who was laid up, knew by the style it was the Lord and Lady Lieutenant, but she couldn't see what Her Excellency had on, because the tram and Spring's big yellow furniture van had to stop in front of her on account of its being the Lord Lieutenant. Beyond Lundy's Beyond Lundy Foots, from the shaded door of Kavanaugh's wine-rooms, John Wise Nolan smiled with unseen coldness towards the Lord Lieutenant-General and General Governor of Ireland. The Right Honourable William Humble, Earl of Dudley, G.C.V.O., passed Mickey Anderson's all-times ticking watches, and Henry and James's wax-smart-suited fresh-cheeked models, the gentleman Henry, Dernier Cree James. Over against Dame Gate, Tom Roachford <clears throat> and Nosy Flynn watched the approach of the cavalcade. Tom Roachford, seeing the eyes of Lady Dudley fixed on him, took his thumbs quickly out of the pockets of his claret waistcoat and doffed his cap to her. A charming soubrette, great Marie Kendall with dauby cheeks and lifted skirt, smiled daubily from her poster upon William Humble. Earl of Dudley, and upon Lieutenant Colonel H. G. Hesseltine, and also upon the Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C. From the window of the D.B.C., Buck Mulligan gaily and Haynes gravely gazed down on the viceregal equipage over the shoulders of eager guests, whose mass of forms darkened the chessboard whereon John Howard Parnell looked intently. In Fauna Street, Dilly Dedalus, straining her sight upward from Chardinal, Chardinal's first French primer, primer, saw sunshades spanned and wheel-spokes spinning in the glare. John Henry Menton, filling the doorway of commercial buildings, stared from wine-big oyster eyes, holding a fat gold hunter watch not looked at in his fat left hand not feeling it. Where the foreleg of King Billy's horse pawed the air, Mrs. Breen plucked her hastening husband back from under the hoofs of the outriders. She shouted in his ear the tidings. Understanding, he shifted his tomes to his left breast and saluted the second carriage. The Honourable Gerald Ward, A.D.C., agreeably surprised, made haste to reply. At Ponsonby's corner, a jaded white flagon, H., halted, and four tall-hatted white flagons halted behind him, E-L-Y-S, while outriders pranced past and carriages. Opposite Piggott's music ware-rooms, Mr. Gen Dennis J. Magini, professor of dancing, etc., gaily apparelled, gravely walked, out passed by a viceroy, and unobserved. By the provost's wall came jauntily Blazes Boylan, stepping in tanned shoes and socks with sky-blue clocks, to the refrain of, My girl's a Yorkshire girl. Blazes Boylan presented to the leaders sky-blue frontlets and high action a sky-blue tie, a wide-brimmed straw hat at a rakish angle, 
and a suit of indigo serge. His hands in his jacket pockets forgot to salute, but he offered to the three ladies the bold admiration of his eyes, and the red flower between his lips. As they drove along Nassau Street, His Excellency drew the attention of his bowling consort to the programme of music which was being discoursed in College Park. Unseen brazen Highland laddies blared and drum-thumped after the cortege. But though she's a factory lass and wears no fancy clothes, barabum, yet I've a sort of a Yorkshire relish for my little Yorkshire rose, barabum. Thither of the wall the quarter-mile flat handicappers, M. C. Green, H. Thrift, T. M. Patty, C. Scaife, J. B. Jeffs, G. N. Morphy, F. Stevenson, C. Adderley, and W. C. Huggard started in pursuit. Striding past Finn's Hotel, Cashel Boyle O'Connor Fitzmaurice Tisdall Farrell stared through a fierce eyeglass across the carriages at the head of Mr. M. E. Solomons in the window of the Austro-Hungarian Vice-Consulate. Deep in Leinster Street, by Trinity's postern, a loyal kingsman, hornblower, touched his tally-ho cap. As the glossy horses pranced by Marion Square, Master Patrick Aloysius Dignam, waiting, saw salutes being given to the gent with the topper, and raised also his new black cap, with fingers greased by pork-steak paper. His collar, too, sprang up. The viceroy, on his way to inaugurate the Myrus Bazaar in aid of funds for Mercer's Hospital, drove with his following towards Lower Mount Street. He passed a blind stripling opposite Broadbent's. In Lower Mount Street a pedestrian, in a brown mackintosh, eating dry bread, passed swiftly and unscathed across the viceroy's path. At the Royal Canal Bridge, from his hoarding, Mr. Eugene Stratton, his blub-lips a-grin, bade all comers welcome to Pembroke Township. At Haddington Road Corner two sanded women halted themselves, an umbrella and a bag in which eleven cockles rolled to view with wonder the Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress without his golden chain. On Northumberland and Lansdowne roads His Excellency acknowledged punctually salutes from rare male walkers. The salute of two small schoolboys at the garden gate of the house, said to have been admired by the late Queen when visiting the Irish capital with her husband, the Prince Consort, in 1849, and the salute of Almidano Artifoni's sturdy trousers, swallowed by a closing door. End of chapter 10 Read by Hugh and Kara and Mike on August 21st, 2006, and 22nd, 2006.